Yes. Now, uh, everything being uh, technology driven, today I would say that with good checklists, it's very easy to do a good hip. At least the planning part is something we can uh, control. There are things that we cannot control, and that is, of course, what happens inside the surgery. Uh, with good uh, preoperative planning and with good preoperative, um, I would say, a checklist or a list that you can actually follow and tick off, like a good flight, you won't have problems in a surgery. Why do you need to plan? I think we all know why you need to plan. Uh, what we're going to plan for, how we plan, I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to summarize. The idea is to achieve all desired objectives, not some desired objectives of a total hip. We want to get everything right. And of course, we want to make sure we have all the inventory available. So what do we do is we need to understand each individual patient's anatomy and restore it. At the same time, restore the biomechanics because we need to get everything right as it was. And that, of course, will help us uh, improve outcomes. The surgical approach is dictated by what problems we face during the plan or what problems we have in the patient's uh, pathology. And of course, identification of the implant, the type, the size is something that we can do with a good te template and prepare for whatever can happen during surgery, especially untoward events. And planning really begins in the clinic when you see the patient for the first time. You need to understand that nothing takes away the importance of a good history and physical exam. And of course, you've got to back that up with good investigations, appropriate investigations, and then template for the sizing and for the, uh, the instruments and implants that you will need, which is inventory management. So what are the questions you need to ask? What are the uh, questions you need to tick mark are these? What is the underlying pathology? Is the pain enough to justify replacement? What is the life expectancy of this patient? Because then you've got to choose your implant as well. And what medical conditions are limiting this patient? Is the patient able to tolerate uh, major surgery? Uh, one or two instances I would like to sort of remember, uh, remind you of is when we were doing a patient who had sickle cell anemia and uh, we had a little problem during surgery. So we learned by our mistake that we need to prepare for that patient because you're going to find difficulty entering the medullary canal of such patients. So be prepared for such red flags beforehand by taking a good history and examining. The leg length can be determined by many methods, uh, starting from the most recent to the most outdated, but all of them work as long as you know how to use them. The question that you need to ask when you're doing a lab test is, is there any inflammatory pathology to identify, determine whether the bone itself has a pathology like infection or tumor? And what, can we actually have a diagnosis before we do uh, any surgical procedure? In, in radiology, we need to understand and look for any altered anatomy and bone quality itself, which will tell us whether you need to take care of any minor or major bone defects which are either existing primarily or have been induced by a prior surgery? And is there any extra artillery deformity, again, something that you will see post-surgery or post-pathology <clears throat> uh, in the childhood? So after answering these questions, you can then talk about whether off-the-shelf uh, processes are adequate or do you need additional implants? And then take a decision on whether you want to do a cemented or uncemented or change your plan before you actually go for surgery. The minimum data that you need, of course, is an x-ray, a good, well-done x-ray, which makes sure that the cat's eyes are in the right shape. But you also need x-rays of the lumbar spine to uh, pick up and make sure you don't have a problem in the spine because we have spinopelvic um, uh, movement that occurs and which can get fused. And I think Nirad is going to talk about that today, a little later in the afternoon. So I'll skip that. But we do have scanning, a standing scanogram, which is the go-to uh, investigation for radiology, sometimes the CT scanogram. The idea is to get an idea of the radiological anatomy, the altered orientation where it is present, the effects, the stock, and then template based on this radiology for not only the integrity of the bone, but also the orientation and sizing of both the components. And at the same time, make sure you're not missing out on any extra artillery deformities. This I mentioned earlier, but this is going to be taken by another uh, uh, speaker, friend of mine. Nirad is going to talk about this, so I won't talk much about this, but spinal pelvic. Uh, fixed spinopelvic deformities can actually change the way you want to orient your astablum. So ultimately, you're looking at this x-ray and these lines in radiology, and you want to recreate these lines either to the opposite side or as normal as possible if you have a bilateral pathology. So again, restoration of uh, anatomy is something that we aim for. So the preoperative plan should consist of positioning of both the astral and the femoral components and look at the combined version so that you can get adequate limb lengths. Now, offset is something that we have to understand is, uh, uh, well, we all know biomechanics, but medial lateral offsets, are, uh, medial and vertical offsets are something we need to take care of. 
and we need to restore this relationship so we can get good hip biomechanics. And remember that the medial offset is actually something that can change even on the basis of the femoral antiversion. So keep this in mind as well, so you have to make sure all this is done. But luckily, today, with templating, we can take care of all this. The questions that we need to answer when you're doing a template plan is to check again whether you can manage with an off-shelf, off-the-shelf prosthesis or you need some customized implants and whether the instruments itself are adequate. Say any uh, extra packets of cement available if you need to do a cementing or all sizes available. And of course, the whole team has to be ready with that plan. Now, today there's a lot of digital so templating software available. I'm going to talk about two of them, again very briefly, but the PeakMed and the TraumaCAD. And these actually help us either by using uh, different uh, sort of uh, landmarks on the X-ray to identify the center of the femoral head, for example, or the margin, then the teardrop. And these then uh, used on the normal side compared to the opposite side, again looking at the uh, say tip of the trochanter, uh, lesser trochanter and the medial part of the neck or other such parameters marked as you would do when you're doing a registration uh, say for a total hip or a total knee intraoperatively using robotics or computer assisted surgery you mark these points on the x-ray itself using this software which is available on any of the iMac or the uh, Mac uh, or system then you can actually recreate the center of the head you can get an idea of your offsets you can get an idea of what size you want as long as you have something that you have validated this radiological uh, marker with a small uh, sort of measuring device which can tell you and then you can choose your implant on this uh, radiological software and actually place it on this change the size play it up play it down and you can get a good template and with a good idea of the approximate size you're going to use during surgery again the idea is uh, to be prepared and to be planned beforehand because you want to tick this uh, checkbox you don't want to do this and you don't want to have you know, a surprise during surgery that you didn't sort of prepare for beforehand. After you've put in the stem on your, uh, uh, say, you can move it up and down, you can increase the offset, you can reduce the offset, you can separate the uh, femoral component off from the uh, uh, astabular component and you can then uh, sort of ask it to uh, re-engage and then you can get an approximate idea of how your, uh, in fact, a pretty good idea of how your final uh, implant is going to look at at the end of surgery on the same x-ray and you can check that again once you've finished surgery so this is one of the softwares the peak med software and the other one is of course trauma cat some, something which is much more commonly used also for uh, trauma soft, uh, trauma this thing sorry this is the same one also used for um, uh, trauma surgery and for other uh, surgeries and pediatric surgeries so in this of course the process is very simple it's actually you just have to define which size you, you uh, which side you're going to be operating on and what x-ray you have taken and you can do an auto calibration based on a preset marker that you have placed on your x-ray these preset markers will actually tell you that what size is and then you simply choose what company implant you want and uh, you know what uh, specific implant that you want and it will automatically create uh, a sort of template on that which then you can play with and you can move up and down and you can uh, sort of even again like I told you about the previous offer you can disengage the femoral component from the femoral component and you can automatically ask it to centralize the, the uh, center of rotation bring it the femoral stem down to the same center of rotation as the astabular component which is of course what decides your original center of rotation of the hip and then you can check again uh, your limb length you can check your offset medially you can check your lateral offset and then you can you then have a plan so you've you've ticked all the boxes you've got the uh, checklist completed as far as what implants you're going to be using of course you don't go with only these implants you always keep other implants ready with you the uh, cemented versions if you're using uncemented or you use uh, sizes up and down in case you're surprised during surgery so the idea is of course to have all this ready before the surgery itself you can also do it the traditional way where you actually use a good AP view and then you can measure the templates and you can get these lines again uh, back and then you can decide whether you're oversized or undersized as you would do in the past. But then of course they have a problem because you have uh, uh, no real uh, magnification clarity on radiographs, so in, especially in today's day and age digital uh, radiography. And also sometimes with the external, de ex external rotation deformities, you may have difficulty in uh, sort of templating. And there are inter-observer variations. So we sort of try to move towards digital templating rather than um, manual templating. So the algorithm is really, if you want to do a successful EHR like an expert, is do 
like how an expert does, which is by repetition, by doing the same steps again and again, by having a checklist. And the checklist should make sure you have a diagnosis first. You're able to identify the pathology that is there in the bone, the radiological anatomy that the bone has, both on the, uh, the acetabular side and the femoral side. Look at all possible risk factors that may affect your surgery during uh, actual execution of that plan template to get an idea of the size. Recreate that on that template whether it is version, inclination, leg length, or alignment, and so that you can get normal hip biomechanics. Have adequate implants ready with you, extra instruments ready with you, a backup of cemented implant if you're using a cementless one, and modify through real-time feedback during your surgery if you're using robotics or if you're using your own common sense. So this is all for today, I think. If there's any question, and happy operating today, waiting for the first surgery. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Great talk, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you, I mean, the most commonly one done is supine, but only in special circumstances you would prefer a standing AP, especially if you're looking at a spinopelvic, uh, say, fixed uh, deformity or something like that. I think it should be made mandatory to get a standing AP for hip also. As a general rule, so that that would be nice. Many patient comes with post spine fixation also, ankylosing and other stiff spine degeneration. Absolutely fine. I mean, uh, you see, with technology and with more and more availability of this technology to even the common surgeon, you are going to end up with what you're saying. But Thank today, you. I think it's still the you know a supine X-ray which you would go with. I think uh, your point is for spinal pelvic. So. Yeah, so whenever there is a, you see any complex deformity, some spine surgeries. So basic thing is uh, today's world is a spinopelvic evaluation, pre-op planning. So standing X-ray and sitting X-ray is basic if you want to go depth in the spinopelvic. It's a complex issue. I think we'll study. But I think Virad is going to talk about that. Yes, that's why I didn't touch upon it. Uh, I just one question. Suppose you don't have access to software. So how good is a plain x-ray and a marker pencil? It's been working for this long. It will work. The only thing is you need to understand that there are pitfalls and errors. As long as you keep those in mind, you can do pretty well even with that. You have to work with what you have. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can't use digital or you have to have a properly uh, collab calibrated x-ray so you know what is your magnification and then use the appropriate magnification in your uh, uh, implant uh, template. So one more question means intraoperatively, how do you assess the offset if you want to? Okay, yeah. Do you use anything? So I can tell you what I do, but uh, there are again, there's a talk on that today. Okay. And I would prefer that that person actually speak about it. But what I do is I look at the uh, tip of the trochanter, greater trochanter, and look at the distance from that to the center of the head, which I'm uh, sort of getting or I have planned before surgery, as well as from the same tip of trochanter down to the lesser trochanter. Now, uh, there are, again, many ways, and Ranabath has given lectures on this topic repeatedly about how to get uh, leg length and how to get the offset, and depending upon the anatomical uh, landmarks that you have with uh, markers placed out there in the cotyloid fossa or in the uh, uh, greater trochanter or in the lesser trochanter. But the simplest way is to look at the X-ray, and my sincere advice is for a surgeon who's doing hip replacement regularly is to just do a single X-ray shot in surgery with the trials in place. But in a supine, it is easy. But no, in, in a lateral, lateral in a lateral also, you can just do a lateral CM short for so AP view, yeah. and you will have a very good idea of whether you recreated what you've started off with. So there the comes the advantage of the direct anterior approach, which we will be seeing right now. But maybe so he's talking about. That. Maybe he's talking about it. That's why he's uh, propagating it. No, right? no, no, I do that. <laughs> right. All right. So, okay. so thank you, thank you, and we'll have. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for a wonderful talk. I'd like to invite Dr. Darai Sunawala for a very important topic or of what's on our plate, implant choices for total hip. Uh, good morning, everyone. For uh, shortage of time in this talk, I'm going to stick to the femoral side of uh, things only. 
Now, most surgeons, based on a variety of factors, and especially in India, including the service and availability of implants, they choose a baseline implant which they use for most cases, and that's their stock implant. And then for the occasional case, they use a different uh, implant as and when required. Now, the three commonly used uncemented implants are the flat wedge, probably the most widely used in the world, the metaphyseal filling wedges, which are popular in USA, and the rectangular hydroxyapatite coated wedges, like the Corel and its multiple copies. Now, my personal uh, now the results of all these three are excellent. So, whichever implant you opt for, I don't think it really matters. My personal choice, I opt for the Corel for the simple reason is they offer far more choices to me than the other implants. Internationally, they have these five different neck options and on a good day in India, you can get four of them. So this allows me to recreate the patient's anatomy more accurately and more perfectly. Now, if you tell me, uh, any patient about 70 years, I'm using cemented implants. I'll have no argument with that at all. Look at these studies from the NJR. 17 year results of the cemented hips in UK are equal to that of uncemented hips. So that's perfectly all right. What are my indications for using a cemented hip? The first is I'll always go try and go with an uncemented hip. If on table I'm unhappy with the fixation I achieve, I'll switch over to a cemented hip. The second, if I get a, crack, a small crack while uh, rasping, one option is to wire it like you can see here and proceed with an uncemented, but I'll just convert to a cemented usually. And the third is when you have a very wide canal. In this sort of situation, I prefer to use a cemented hip in the elderly patient. Now let's look at some specific indications and how you uh, have to manipulate your implants for that. The first is when you have a very narrow femur, uh, diaphysis. The aim of an uncemented implant is to achieve metaphyseal or occasionally in your Corel prosthesis, you achieve metadiaphyseal fixation. What you want to strictly avoid is diaphyseal point contact. So in this sort of situation, what you need to do is ream out the distal canal and try and achieve a high degree of metaphyseal fill. If you fail to do that and you get diaphyseal fixation, this is the situation you'll see. Over a period of years, the patient will start developing thigh pain. You'll get cortical ballooning. You'll get proximal stress shielding and then you'll develop pro progressive lucencies proximally. And finally, that patient will need to go in for a revision. So now, what do I prefer for young patients? I use, uh, prefer to use a mid-sized stem with a high degree of metaphyseal fill because I feel this is bone preserving because of the proximal loading. Is there a role for these sort of multiple short stems which were fashionable maybe a decade ago? My personal feeling is they offer no significant advantage at all and they have a higher revision risk, so I absolutely don't use them. Coming to resurfacing, I think the results of resurfacing are excellent. It's the only implant which mimics the normal hip and it's unfortunate that the resurfacing implant has been removed and it's not available to us anymore. If you look at this 2020 study from Hip International, 11,000 plus cases, 28 different surgeons, and at 20 years, 90% results. Very few implants can mimic this sort of thing. So is the, the, obviously all of us have a metal on metal fear. Is it a uh, really justified fear? I personally feel if you remove the results of ASR and the large metal heads, then the metal and metal fear was totally unfounded with correct patient selection, correct component placement. I don't think that's an uh, issue at all. But even if you're a surgeon with a metal on metal fear, you'll have to wait for these newer implants to come into circulation and then you can go back to resurfacing. 
Now look at, let's look at some specific indications. It's pretty, this patient has had a girdle stone with a pelvic support osteotomy close to 20 years ago. Now he's come for a total hip. It's pretty obvious your standard implant is not gonna work. You need something to address the metaphyseal diaphyseal mismatch. You need something to allow you uh, independent version. And for this sort of uh, situation, the SROM is probably the most uh, optimum prosthesis. It has a very dis uh, narrow distal uh, uh, size starting from 6 mm, so it can be used in even the smallest of cases. And it allows you to address the version independent of the bony anatomy. It's a great prosthesis even when in a DDH when you're doing an osteotomy because the metaphyseal sleeves and the distal stem being independent, they both control the osteotomy perfectly. You almost never need to do an additional fixation for the, in these sort of cases. Another option you can use in DDH cases is your Wagner cone, the prime short cone. That again allows you to adjust your version independent of the bony anatomy and it comes in very short necks so it's ID, it's another stem you could use uh, for your DDH cases. Now occasionally you may need to use a distal fixation stem in a primary. There are three options available. You have the fluted cones, your fully coated uh, porous coated stems like the solution and echelon or you have the revision corel, which is the one I'm using more and more nowadays. Remember, though, for the revision corel, you need some degree of metaphyseal bone to be intact, and you can't rely on pure distal fixation for this. So what are the situations in a primary? The common situation we use it in is in these sort of fractures where you feel fixation will not be a viable option. And occasionally in these sort of revision situations. So in conclusion, I think whatever prosthesis you use, they all have good results. It's just your technique which is important, but you need to plan preoperatively carefully so you're not stuck in the OT with a situation where the prosthesis you require is not available on the table. Thank you. Uh, great talk, Dr. Daras. Uh, there's time for just one question before we move on to the OT. The live surgery is being started. So, any one question? Uh, so, you for, you're so talking of DDH, right? So, first you uh, expose the femur. Then you ra ream the femur. You put in your sleeve, trial sleeve. Then you cut the osteotomy below the, so you do the femur first. This is what I do before the acibulum. You cut the femur below the, uh, just below the uh, sleeve. Now you do the acibulum. Having cut the femur, your acibulum exposure becomes much easier because you don't need to then push the femur. So you can go through the osteotomy site and approach the acibulum. You complete the acibulum. Then you put the sleeve in. You pull the proximal part, which is now separate, reduce it into the hip. See the amount of overlap you get on your uh, femur and do the osteotomy at the level of the overlap. How about the soft tissue releases on the top? The glutei and all. You don't release the glutei. You just do a complete excision of the capsule or you, or you do an extensive capsular release. You never release the glutei at all. Never ever release the glutei. The Maximus, yes, Julius but not Maximus. the, not, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I Maximus, mean. not the Medius and, huh. Well, the Maximus. Yeah, you always, you, so you may have to release the IT band, you may have to release the gluteus Maximus tendon, you have to go completely, uh, do a complete release of the capsule. You may have to, and usually when you're doing these osteotomies, you're exposing the femur, so you're doing a significant proximal uh, release of the femur as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for a good talk. So we'll move to the uh, OR for the first case of the day, the DAA. Can you hear us in the OR?
So, no, no, not the. Yeah, we can have your, uh, we can see you in the OR. This one could, could be good for the femoral elevator. Can you, can you uh, hear us in the OR? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll manage. Yeah, we can, can you hear us there, yeah. Anu? Yes, good morning. Yeah, we can hear you. Good morning. Uh, we'll be focusing on the x-ray. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you see the x-rays here? Yes, we can. Uh, Professor Nabil is here with us and he would just take us through the steps. Um, the standard AVN case that you could see. Uh, yeah. Over to you, Professor Nabil. And I believe Krishna is there in the theater, uh, in the hall, and he can take us through the steps. Okay, so you, right. can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, sir. Good yeah, morning. Okay. Oh. okay, so we have prepared. I use I do the anterior approach without a traction table. So we prep both legs in order to. I during the femoral preparation, I do a figure of four on the operated leg and put it below the other leg. So we have marked here the ASIS and the incision, the longitudinal incision would be two, three centimeters laterally and a little bit distally, the beginning. If I would do a bikini incision, I would take six centimeters parallel to the inguinal crease. Okay, so may we have a scalpel, please? Uh, is the field <coughs> is the field visible? Uh, uh, Vibe of they need to zoom out a little bit and uh, reduce the brightness. Long tip. Zoom out a little bit and. Ah, yes. uh, this is better, but uh, reduce the brightness. It's too bright. Use the brightness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay for you. Yeah, for me it's okay. <coughs> Actually, can can you give a feed from this one? This might be a better way because I can yeah, see that. Better, yeah, this is better. Stick with this. Yeah. Iska feed de sakte hai. Push lo. Iska feed de sakte hai. Push lo. Just check if we can give overhead camera feed. We can see you. We can. We can see, see you. you. Vibha, we can see you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just stick with this. Don't change anything. Okay. So. We're ready to go. We have the. So, uh, Professor Babin, if you could tell us the landmark, this is the ASIS. That's, that that's the in. only landmark I need. Okay, the only landmark that he needs is the is ASIS. ASIS, and I go for longitudinal incision. It doesn't matter if it goes a little bit medial, a little bit lateral, just the longitudinal, and it, it's enough for me. Do you have rakes, please? Rakes, cat's paws, rake. Is it important to do a preoperative CM shoot to ensure that you can get an AP X ray before you start off with the DA? Professor Nabil doesn't use CM, right? Professor Nabil, you, you don't need a CM. No, CM? no imagine. No, no, no. no. But for the beginning, I advise everyone to use. One more catch for oh, So, Professor is, is this your standard approach for all your hips now? Yes, most, yes. Okay. 100%. Uh, sometimes for revision, I still use the posterior approach. If it's a, a, a difficult uh, femoral revision, femoral stem, but for an aspect revision, you will use this approach. Yes. Okay. So yeah, even for revision, is using this approach. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Vaibhav, can you tell them to zoom in a little bit and adjust the contrast? It's to, looking too yellow. Okay. So now after the cameraman, if you're listening to me, just zoom in, zoom in, not out, zoom in, and adjust the contrast. Yeah. Zoom in more. Yeah, yellow, yellow, the cray, thoda yellow. Um, zoom in more. We we have reached the fascia now, so I feel the ASIS from the inside and go lateral. And here you you can see that the transparency of the fascia of the tensor fascia lata, which I will open now. Inside my yes.
Yeah, yeah, this is better. Yeah, let it be like that. Yeah. Forceps. So this is the fascia open, and now I will feel the anterior part of the fascia from the muscle. Okay. So this is the belly of the tensor fascia lata. Blunt retractors. Lang and back. Another one. Lang and back. So, yeah, we can see that, yeah. At the inner part, we can see we have here the rectus. And I can already see some the vessels here, if you can see and here. Can you see the vessel there? It's not very clear. Yeah. So I, I difficult to see the vessel. Do a little bit release of the lateral border of the rectus to mobilize it medially. Yeah. And uh, now I'm gonna coagulate the vessels. Yeah. So here we have one part, second part, and they join to the me medial one. Yeah. So the three branches of the ascending branch of lateral circumflex. So that needs to be coagulated. Top view has moved out of focus. Can we have that in the picture? Ah, yeah, yeah. Thoda or karo. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm starting to see the gluteus medius here. Okay. Action. Action at this part, please. Can we have the uh, field in the center of the image? So now we're opening the deep fascia just above the uh, capsule. So we have here now the gluteus medius. So I'm gonna use the retractor between the capsule and the gluteus medius to protect it. So we are now below the rectus. Laterally, we are between the trochanter, uh, the capsule, and the uh, the the, the so gluteus medius. Between the, the upper part of the neck. Can we have a better focus of the camera? Just zoom in. Zoom in the. The, yeah, now the top we can down. see the fat over the capsule. I'm gonna have these. This, this retractor goes medially on the medial neck part. We have some joint fluid. 
تھوڑا فوکس کرنا پڑے گا on the lateral border of the femur so now we have the lower part of the of the neck the upper part of the neck and the, at the lateral just at the trochanteric area lower part of the trochanter the gt can you zoom in zoom so in that zoom image in. yeah we'll Not clean the fat over the capsule yeah just stay there this is a good image And I now slide over the capsule to the anterior cortex with the cup. Can, can, you, just show, can you just show us the landmarks on that image? Just stay there on that so, image. That earlier image was better. So we have... Yeah, yeah, this is better. Yeah, this is better. So we feel the neck. You can move the hip joint. We see the uh, gluteus medius and put just distally to it and above the neck. <coughs> First retractor, second retractor on the lower part. It's actually you see, you should see the upper part of the vastus lateralis here. This is the upper part of the vastus lateralis. And if you go medially with this uh, retractor, you should hit the mid, 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 inferior uh, neck. So. I will clean some of the fat around the capsule to show you a little, a better, uh, to have a better look. So you see now the neck moving. This is the anterior part of the uh, <clears throat> acetabulum. Then, and I develop this space to put in another retractor. Well, it's not the specific retractor which I use, but we should manage. So this retractor is sitting on the acetabulum, the anterior, co anterior yes. column. May I have anterior the longer... Uh, anterior column. It's on the anterior wall uh, over the iliopectineal eminence yes, exactly. in the direction of the contralateral kidney. It should not be in the direction of the so contralateral kidney. So now we can hip. start. I do excision. I don't uh, keep the anterior capsule. This is not the same one. So I do a long longitudinal incision at the mid center of the anterior capsule till i reach the medial border of the of the ten, of the vastus lateralis We just open the anterior capsule here. You yes. can see the joint fluid coming out. Yes, can we have the top view? Okay. Now we do the T incision. Uh, forceps, please. Forceps. The other view? Can we have a it's, PIP? It's a, you should reach the vastus tubercle at the anterior part. And and I reject the superior part. Is resecting the superior part of the capsule may not be very yes. clearly visible there, but um, we can see, we can see. Yeah, okay, great. So the incision is so small that perhaps you are seeing it better than I can see. 
That is true, yeah. <laughs> uh, may I have a poker, please? And a uh, long knife. Do you have a long knife? Yes, and a poker. It's with the recovery that uh, there is a lot of difference in the post-op because it's an internervous intermuscular plane, so and no restrictions. So usually I use a more curved retractor here, so we have a better vision for you. For I, for me, I can see everything, but. Uh, we also can see very well, sir. Yeah. A nibbler, please, otherwise, a big number of holes. Uh, you hold it, I'll cut it. Okay. Suction. Yeah, go ahead. All the way till here. You see a big difference between a man's anterior capsule and a woman's. It's much thicker with men. There for some time, so I guess that is one of the reasons. You could see a lot of inflammatory fluid as well. So. Yeah. Okay. So once we're done with that, we'll move the superior retractor into the joint. So here we can see the upper part of the neck. We'll just give a wash. The, uh, we can't see much, actually. I know it's... Uh, yeah, we can't see anything, actually. The, suddenly we lost it. Okay. Uh, yeah, now a little bit, but... And for same, I will do for the lower capsule, I just detach the lower part of it, the lateral part of it. Can we have the top view a little superior towards the from the head end? Because then sir's headgear is coming in our way. Correct. Excuse me? The, the cameraman, can you take the boom stand camera a little ahead? From the head head end, we can have a better view. Okay, can you see the neck now? Yes. Now, now yeah, it's better. Stay there. That's it. So just zoom Please in. Zoom in. Zoom in. So we see the neck, we already see the collapse of the cartilage here. I can also see what's happening. You can see the movement of the hip there, yeah, clearly. Just have the image in the center. To facilitate the excision of the head. Can you go up upwards to a little bit? Incision in the capsule. Okay, so this is the image be in the center. Now we'll go for the a neck cut. It's an in situ neck cut. Yes. yes. So I go from the lateral. Viva, you need to see what is being transmitted the there. Upper, uh, then you can guide them better. I think we can't see much. The lateral border of the uh, upper homan to the middle of the lower one. Just if you could just take if, your head back. Uh, just okay. tell them once. For, just so, so they can see there. Yeah. Since is we're using. Just telling the landmark for a minute. Yeah. Since we are using an active stem, which is a mid-neck resection stem. The surgical field is not in the center of the image. If the cameraman can get it in the center, it will be great. So this should be my. Okay. Just move it a little bit towards the patient. Now we can't see that. Surgical field is not in the center. Yeah. It's going out of focus. Sometimes a good idea to put in a corkscrew beforehand. Otherwise the head, once you break it, it will not come out. Okay. May I have an osteotome, please? To bend leg straight. Okay. Can, uh, can it is preferable one? to do two level osteotomy. Use a blunt retractor. So, but some people do a single osteotomy if the hip is mobile and stuff like that. Go to protect the tensor. 
You don't need all that. You don't need all that. You need soft tissue releases in sequences. So I, I raise the neck to put in the corkscrew. Exposure is not a problem at all. It's about femoral mobilization. Exposure is very straightforward. Once I do that, I will detach some remnants of the capsule to the... So you can take a, a section of the neck uh, put the corkscrew before you cut the neck so that the movement of the corkscrew indicates that the neck cut is complete. Then you move the uh, hip through five cycles clockwise and then the tad, the ligamentum teres will get detached and you can easily pull out the head. So that's how you have to do it. Otherwise, acetabulum is easier, yes, that's right. Vaibhav. Yep. Yes, is there a monitor inside the OT where you can see what we are seeing? Yeah, we are, we are seeing, but the inc as I said, the incision is so small that I can know that... No, the cameraman has to adjust accordingly. So he has to zoom in and he has to adjust the... Keep on adjusting the camera. Tell him to pay attention. Okay, so can you see better now? The, the head, head is removed. Yeah, now it is much better. Yeah, huh? And the that. top end also has to be zoomed in. The neck for uh, the active. <laughs> like, uh, give me for a uh, five. So... Is it better now? So this is the Let's say, keep it zoom, in. Yeah. Zoom, in. zoom in, zoom in the top camera. Okay, so before I go for the acetabular preparation, I usually do my soft tissue releases for the the capsular releases for the <coughs> femoral part. So I put the the operated leg over above the other leg, and if you see here. Can you zoom out and see the position of the limb? So, I do some release of the capsule around the calcar. Main, main thing is to palpate the lesser trochanter and feel how high is my cut above it. So, you have three teethers for the femur, the iliofemoral ligament which is released. Now, it's so releasing the pubofemoral here. ligament so we and they have to release the ischiofemoral ligament. So, these three have to be released to mobilize the, the femur out of the way. Seven millimeters above the lesser trochanter. Next step, if you can able to see get here, full external rotation, so this is the tensor. We are able to lift the femur up. We remove it, then we see the gluteus and we remove it. Take it also to the side. Do we have a bone hook, please? Bone hook, please. And this is my superior release. You have a camera, this right? So he's he's a flexible guy. You don't have to do a lot of release to. You have a So it's like a split between the posterior and the anterior part of the superior capsule. So you, you have to release it at a uh, 10 o'clock position for the right hip on the under surface of the greater trochanter till you feel the thing. So you're releasing the superior capsule, piriformis and sometimes the conjoint tendon. And then the trochanter will flip from the posterior border into the wound. Otherwise, you can't do the femoral exposure. So he's pulling it with a hook so that the capsule gets tight. So you don't do posterior release, otherwise it will be posterior so approach to the anterior incision. So that's not what is done. So you should never cut operator externus. Have to be careful. But the piriformis flips sometimes and the conjoint tendon does. This goes on the posterior uh, wall of the acetabulum. Correct. Do you have a uh, narrow one? This retractor here is on the posterior wall and this is the anterior all of the acetabulum and you can when you yes. they have to imagine so it's like so and i put another one below the transverse ligament no it's uh, I, I need a uh, bento maybe a cobra just a regular cobra so web of there is merrill set also there is one better retractor for inferior if okay. you need please yeah. open the merrill set as well show so, him that uh, there will be one inferior retractor sometimes which is better. you can put a uh, Another uh, home and on the upper part, just like you put a uh, Charlie pin with the, the lateral uh, approaches. 
can you zoom the uh, left one so we see that this, this is yeah this is okay just stay there yeah you can see the transfer acceptable ligament there down yeah you can see very clearly the white one again somebody come in we come in the way <laughs> yes now it's better so we see the transverse ligament here we and can't we see, see anything the ligament from teres going from the inner part so it's good that it is the um, yeah, yeah stay there stay there don't change anything cameraman yeah stay here yeah stay here don't do anything yeah this is better yeah and the long knife I'm going to remove the lab room. The conventional plants and mushrooms. Also, and then it goes down. Yeah. So let's start with the forty seven. That's right. I use an offset trimmer, yeah. but, but you, you can, can also use a straight trimmer. Okay, 49. You can see the tail there now, and you can uh, position the cup on the inner margin of the tail, so that will give us the uh, thing. So it's an exact opposite of the lateral position. So the uh, horizontal limb will indicate inclination and the vertical limb will indicate torsion here. So you have to go up and down. It's the exact opposite of the lateral position. 51. So if, if, you, if you are perpendicular to the limb, that is 90 degrees. And as you go down, you are in the inclination of the leg. And now as you go away from the table, up or down, that is the version. So you have to... Be, Ha. So your tendency is to go up and like yes. this. So, so when, put it when we do some reaming, and uh, that will problem. Labrum is a better visible to yeah. us. Yeah. Can we just have uh, uh, the reamer and the inclination and the version? Uh, Vibhav, can they show the uh, just once? Uh, since it is a live demonstration, let him show once. What is the inclination and version that will be, you know, useful? Will you tell them the reamer's position, how to hold that? Yeah, you br bring me the straight handle. Well, it's it's the same thing as just I'm because I want to protect the muscles from injury. Sometimes with the straight reamer, you can injure the uh, tensor on the lateral part. This is so. So it's the same thing. You put it and do yeah, so this the reaming. Is a, a vertical. We have a 51 and it's going to be a 52 cup. This, this, this direction no, is, this is 51. This is 45 now. Here. We did 51. And if you lift your hand I don't up, think it is anti-version. And if you go towards the uh, floor, then it becomes retroversion. Retro yeah. uh, always check. You have yeah, to go away from the leg. The leg and away from at an angle of 45 degrees. So you can and bring the starters. Cups. You can use a CM actually to see that how you are behaving. And the polyliner, or a... you use no no whichever you use a XLP. Altrex liners have non lift. I think that is kept there. Altrex liner. Altrex non lift liner. That is better. Yeah. No, no need for trial. So, <laughs> so wash, please. So we are going ahead with directly with the cup now. Size yes. 52, is it? You want uh, to 
I usually don't uh, uh, do trials. So he would straight away go for the cup now. Yes. Here Especially it is always the, the acetabulum cup first, or would you do the femur first and then remove it? So going ahead to the cup right now. Yes, directly to the cup, to the actual cup. 52. No, uh, Porokot, so fine. Uh, can you explain the position of the three retractors? So this, this is underneath so the So this is, this ligament. one is below the transverse ligament. This one is uh, on the posterior wall. So I go inside the, the acetabulum, slide backwards and put it like that. This one, I placed it from the beginning on the anterior wall of the acetabulum below the rectus femoris and uh, below the iliocapsularis. If you t sometimes there's a small muscle there, the iliocapsularis, you can, it doesn't matter if you, if you, it's very, very small. It's like capsular muscle. So this has to be in the direction of the contralateral kidney. It should not be in the direction of the contralateral hip, otherwise you will cause damage to the vessels. And it should have a blunt tip, otherwise it will go into the wall sometimes. So you have to be careful with that. Blunt retractors, yes. So just to rearrange, this is the this is the uh, top end. We are like this. This is so the it's flat. a supine. Okay. It's much this is the easier. Here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom out a little bit to show the. So how? It's so not flat. Is... Okay. So you can see that. So. This yeah. part goes upwards. In 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 the case you need some screws. But I put screws like once a year. So this is the position you keep, you have to keep the handle close to the leg as possible and keep it low. So this is like zero degrees antiversion. This is at 10 degrees of antiversion. Okay, the whole pelvic is moving. You should check by rotating the cup. If you rotate and there is no movement, that means the anteroposterior capture is reach, reached. And then you move it at a plane perpendicular to the AP capture so by toggling. We can check it also with the should be right positive. to pull it out. Liner, please. <laughs> neutral, neutral. So we see that, so the acetabulum is actually 60% of the ball. It's not a fifth, it's not a half a ball. So you will always have some lower part on the uh, inferior uh, medial wall exposed. The one thing you must avoid is anterior uncoverage here, because if you oversize the socket and cause anterior uncoverage, psoas impingement is a problem. So and here approach. we can feel that it's, it's clear from the anterior inferior part of the acetabulum. Yeah. So you don't worry about impingement for the iliopsoas. Yeah, excellent, yeah. Thirty-six, sir. Eight to thirty-six. Okay, now we're done with the acetabular part. We take this uh, retractor that was on the a posterior uh, wall and put it on the medial calcar Re uh, blunt retractor bone hook and the two spike uh, this one yes can you show so the this position goes, of the limb? as yeah, i said yeah. before i don't have the specific tools that they usually use. Please open the Merrill set. Merrill set retractors, please. Yeah, Merrill may have, there'll be retractors. Merrill set retractors, please open. Merrill set retractors, yes. So he's completing the superior capsule release. Yeah, maybe. So initially he did a little bit, now he's completing that. Take Otherwise, you can't Take prepare the femur. It will not flip up. It has to be delivered into the wound. Yes. yes. So now it is delivered. Okay, much better. So. 
the camera can go to the head end now so that they can show what the exposure of the femur is and somebody can zoom out and show the leg position so we have we now put the leg below so below the other leg can you please lift zoom out and show figure of four you don't bend the knee too much because it will put pressure on the rectus and pull it down okay so we if you need you can drop the leg now drop the legs and you will have a better approach but since we are using an active stem it's you don't need that so we start with a you have to push on the knee just, just hang on a second just let them see the femur first so we have the yeah yeah they, they are not able to so, see it so just just zoom out and show the leg position we'll take okay. a break in so we'll show the leg position the assistant here. on the other side will have to push a little bit yeah so now you can see the, the leg position rotation. underneath the opposite uh, this thing and the leg must be adducted otherwise the hip will not be delivered the femur will not be delivered that's why out. we press the other leg and this to have to be yes and you have uh, like side specific rasps right and left otherwise it's very difficult because it has to be close to the uh, uh, to the uh, edge of the wound and if you have a straight rasp it will not go in especially in obese patient it will not go in so you have to be careful with that so you need to have this do we have a rasp for uh, yes this one so i usually use this rasp to enter the canal just place it on the medial part a little bit and mallet yes this is the one i use it's it's okay so the the most common problem with this is the femoral preparation perforation all these things because you don't have idea about it it's a good idea to enter from the top of the see, wound and then go back when you see this rasp turn around you know that you're in the canal yeah so very interesting way of ensuring that you are in proper canal yes would you explain it once again for the benefit so of if the... if uh, anyone from trauma here when you put this uh, trochanteric nail you start with the nail uh, with the handle up straight then it bends it rotates yeah. right yeah. to take the curve of the femur the same thing and also it will not cause damage to the tfl because you don't want to end up with a damaged so tfl usually at the end of the this, procedure. this table can't drop if i see that should be any damage to the tfl i will uh, drop the legs yeah, yeah yeah makes sense so we tend to use a, uh, a mop with uh, saline to protect the tfl throughout the procedure maybe okay so i will show you let's uh, take the leg out i we have now the usual um, retractor, retractor that i use the retractor that we use it's a, i call it the bunny because of like two ears for <laughs> and the uh, bone hook please bone hook please Yeah, yeah. Now you can see the femurs come out. Yeah. Okay. So this. Okay. So you have a better look now. Okay. So well, let's start with the starter. So this is a active stem, which is a collared mid mid uh, neck resection type of stem. From the it's a short stem. and it's very useful for the direct anterior approach the incidence of uh, periprosthetic fractures with direct anterior approach is around 28% when you use a tapered wedge type of design and so no no you should not undersize that is a problem so if you uh, the yes, if you are doing direct right. anterior the risk other is periprosthetic fracture you have to acknowledge it's that just like when uh, when you drop the leg with the when you do the lateral position and you drop the leg into the bag do external rotation and adduction it's the same position yeah sorry the collar will pre, the reason why it, uh, uh, there is a tendency to undersize because of the femoral difficult access and all so uh, one of the reasons for fracture is when the stem sinks there is torsion 
so if you put a collar it prevents torquing of the femur it will although it may subside main, and it will prevent subsidence the main reason for fractures is uh, not suffi uh, insufficient superior release and yeah. not mobilizing the femur anteriorly enough. correct absolutely right that's right so he has followed the sequence of releases iliofemoral from the capsule pubofemoral from the lesser trochanter palpation ischiofemoral from the back and the superior capsule so these are the four steps which has to be followed in sequence it becomes easy. less much less it's controlled <coughs> Because you can tension the tissues. That's some heavy hitting. That's a good gear of a good small mallet. <laughs> Posterior lateral. So for a young patient with co good cortices, I expect four or five. I usually template for each case I do. To know what to expect from the size, to the offset. One challenge with this is the leg length and offset you cannot measure because you are cutting the neck in C2. So you will have to use help from the... the four? Is that a four? A four. four. So okay. give me the four five neck. And with the, the head that we removed. So we see that the... It's one millimeter above my osteotomy, and I check it, so it's probably going to be a plus five. Give me a plus five head. So this will reproduce the offset and the length. So at this point, I do the trial. Take the leg out. I will try. You see how it's it's very easy to relocate with the anterior approach. It's very hard to dislocate. So I check it. Adduction, external rotation. I put my finger on the head liner junction to see if it elevates or just rotates. So it just rotates. But maybe it's a little bit too uh, much telescoping, so maybe I will go for a, a higher size of head. Or okay, can, can I make a suggestion? This, I, this... I can check now. Okay, can I make a suggestion? This is probably a better case for Corel because it's a so, larger neck length and offset. Actis has got a very short neck length and offset, so it's not... No, but Actis, you should place it mid-neck. The Actis, you usually put it just above the lesser trough. Uh, of course, you have to template for each case. And yeah, yeah. This patient, I thought, had a larger so neck the, and an the offset. Possibility, the next possibility for me is to go up for five and leave it a little bit prouder. Yeah, that may be a better option. I see, I see that it's still shortened a little bit by two, three millimeters. Yeah. So I will, I will go for a five uh, and they still st stay with the plus five head. Yeah, I think that makes sense. One hook, please. So you see, even even though it's a little bit shortened, it's it's not easy to dislocate. You have to pull it out. Again, blunt. Bone hook. So, he doesn't have the rubber, I think. He's using Wellis. Wellis. He, at his place also, he's using Wellis for the TKR. Wellis. Wellis is the uh, only knee. They don't have hip. Wellis don't have hip. Uh, are you using the robo? There's a question from the audience in, in your uh, hip practice. Again? You use robotics for hip. Yes. Sometimes I use the MACO for... Uh, Specific cases, well, well, I, I work in several hospitals, and one of the private hospitals have MACO, so if a patient wants, I use it, but I don't think it's, uh, it's necessary, because with, with templating and the way we do it, you will 
easily feel if you are too much along with the with this stem with this uh, approach sometimes it's difficult to introduce the robotic arm through direct anterior i found in uh, my practice yes well, incision is so small they have, they have an offset uh, reamer also and the uh, offset uh, impactor for the robot they do yeah they do bula ke rakh Okay, it's gonna be five, please. So, is it always an active for you, or you you kind of no no? Side on the places of it's like fifty uh, percent. So, okay. in my public hospital, I still use the coral. Coral. Okay. So, is it, is it the? Is But the I think the that is a very good stem. Okay. and i i like using it because it's it really like i think it's the first cementless really stem because it lies on the calcar and the lower part lies uh, touches the lateral cortex of the shaft and it's very stable if you are one size under it's it, it's not going to move So we know that various stems in 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 cemented hips will get loose, but not for cementless. Right. You, so okay. does the patient uh, X-rays also determine the choice of your stem, or is it the hospital? Meaning no, public it, hospital. No, at, at the beginning when I started using the Actis, I had the backup of Coral all the time. Okay. But nowadays uh, we don't. I don't need it. So I'm familiar with the prosthesis. I've been using it for five years. So I have uh, both uh, standard and high offset. And does it come only as colored or colorless option as well? There's there's a colorless in the states. It's not not uh, available, but it doesn't really matter. For like for instance, in this case, the color will be in the air. Yeah. impactor uh, can you uh, show the orientation of the trunnion with respect to the leg can you uh, can the cameraman zoom so out i go by the cortices of the neck and this stem takes like the antiversion of the specific neck uh, that's way if you fill the canal you will get the antiversion of the of the original antiversion of the patient patient uh, malik and plus 5 please you can open we see the vertical leg why bob there is a question uh, yeah. uh, if there is rotational deformity of the femur down in the shaft or somewhere is it possible to check the rotation still or you would have to do something else rotation of so if there is a deformity in the femur yes there is deformity this is a short stem So you can cut the neck a little bit lower, and uh, usually with deformity, you have a shorter neck with dysplasia, and you have to put you have to put the stem a little bit deeper to avoid over lengthening the patient. So when you take the stem a little bit deeper, you will overcome this uh, antiversion. Uh, Uh, issue with the with the neck, so you can control the version. You can always control the version, of course. You, do you, do you, you think that uh, this you can put stem in a various neutral and valgus positions as well safely, or it needs so to be this, only positioned? This stem, this stem, the proximal part has to lie on the calcar. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have to touch the lateral proximal cortex of the femur. it the lower if you show me please one of the uh, brochures yes this one give it to me it's a so this part lies on the cortex on the calcar and this part touches the lateral cortex you see the curve here yeah so you so this this is these two point and with 
it's a very uh, relatively to other stems it's a wider stem so it fills out the canal so from the filling this that touching the calcar and the lateral border it it's an excellent stability okay i i had only one case of revision for actis and it was due to infection so uh, uh, my question is if uh, this like a cfp you're preserving the neck and then you know trying to put it in a little bit of varus but is it okay to put it in neutral or valgus position as well yes yes right. so not all not all patients are the same sometimes when you enter uh, put it uh, in the right place it will go into valgus uh, if to be in varus you have to be undersized yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. got it yeah thank okay. you Okay, that's it. If you are doing a surgery in an osteoporotic bone, where sometimes you have an micro fractures of the calcar, so in those cases, and someone pull how do you uh, manage that area? Yeah, if you have a calcar crack during this operation, yes. So that's a so tough one. You you can put a one wire, but you cannot go down because the femoral nerve will become so into multiple branches. You can check for branches. posterior stability also. It's very stable. You don't feel the click of dislocation. I don't give any limitation for the patient after surgery. They can do whatever they want, lie on wherever they want. Wash. It's a great presentation, Our, Mr. Tabel. We are, we are ready on the next theater. Okay. That looks excellent. Thank you very much. Excellent case. Fantastic demonstration. Yeah, thank you. You can close here. Just this part. This part. One wire you can put. If there is a calcar crack. Thank, Thank you, all the panel, uh, and uh, we can take the questions. This particular implant you're asking. There. there is a collar as well, so if you have a small crack, it's a good option with a collar. It will not allow to subside. Is the next case ready in the other theater? No, no this yes, you can yes, put in. Move on to the next theater, please. It will work yeah. like a standard. Uh, can we switch to the next OT? Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the stability is not on the calcar. It's like any other stem, but it will tolerate varus. That's the right way of looking at it. Picture uh, Sir, we'll have a picture together. Yeah. Come, 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 sir. No, no, I was keep it in For D. No, I went to Direct. We went to Taj for dinner. So we'll so try to squeeze in talks between the cases. Uh, we have Dr. Mutit Khanna talking on on cruise mode. Preventing complications is the best cure. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. So oh. Very well done. Very well. Very nice. And you have know to remember, we didn't drop the leg. Yeah, and so it's very, usually it's very difficult without your own set of instrument. Only. Yeah, hello. Uh, very good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'm probably doing the most boring part of the entire uh, conference in the sense of saying that, you know, we're, we're seeing some exciting live surgeries and we're learning how the techniques are and nobody wants to look at complications. Uh, uh, but essentially the purpose of the talk is not, um, is to sort of look at uh, what all you need to look at when you're trying to doing uh, trying to do a standard uh, out of the box hip replacement surgery, so um, so so I've sort of divided this into common intraoperative difficulties, and, um, which you could possibly call as complications. And I think you know, as a as a surgeon starting to do hip replacements, um, you know the problems that we face are gaining a sufficient exposure, getting a 360 degree exposure, that's the first thing. 
I think we need to take a step back. I think we've got esteemed faculty out here. Uh, for them, that's probably a no-brainer. Uh, but we're talking about people who are just beginning to do their first hip replacement. For them, probably getting a right exposure is a big, big, big thing. Because unless you get the right exposure, you won't get to do a hip replacement adequately. And then I think the second problem that we face is a um, problem with the cup fixation. Um, you know, you, you try and put the cup in, sometimes it fits well and you feel you're the best surgeon in the world and sometimes it just doesn't hold up. Uh, so I think um, uh, the, the problems we face is that the, the cup press fit is not good or the cup, uh, the, the socket is uh, cracked. Um, you know, something, some, something that is not going right with the socket itself. Um, and the next thing is we wonder we've done everything absolutely correct. We put the socket in the way we wanted to put in. It's just got the perfect fit. Um, and we sort of put in our stem and we reduce it, but you find that it's too loose. It's dislocating and we, we have no clue why. Uh, we said, oh, I've got my uh, sort of acetabular version right. I've got my femoral version right. And yet the socket keeps on. Uh, you know, the, the, the hip is not stable, it keeps dislocating. So that's another worry that happens to a surgeon beginning doing a hip replacement and even surgeons sort of pretty much experience in doing the procedure. So let's uh, look at uh, each and every problem uh, one at a time. So the first step is to anticipate a problem because unless you anticipate that this is going to be a difficult case, this is going to be an easy case, you get a patient, you post him for the OT, um, you go into the operation theater, and you say, okay, it's just going to be a standard out of the box hip replacement surgery, but uh, you've got to go a step back and probably look at, did this patient have a prior surgery? Um, does he have a deformity, which is not usual? It's not a standard out of the box AVN or, a, or, or osteoarthritis. He might have, a, you know, it looks like arthritis, but he might have a, you know, a, a congenital post-traumatic or a protrusio. Um, uh, the, the hip may be very stiff um, and, 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 you know, everything goes out of the box when you start doing your surgery. So does he have stiffness? Does he have joint contractures? Is there a lot of heterotropic bone around the hip when you do the surgery? Um, is he very bulky, very obese? Uh, you know, and uh, that's the, these are the things that you've got to sort of look at before you start uh, a case. And that's that's probably one of the keys to get an adequate exposure uh, so that you can avoid the complications that you're going to see. Um, now, one of the exposure problems in that, and I have put this slide specifically because a lot of people get confused between the posterior capsule itself and the TAL. So let's go back all the way to the basics. You know, the posterior capsule can actually mimic the TAL pretty, pretty well. Um, so what we, we're trying to do here is we, we've just opened the capsule and it's difficult to make out where the posterior capsule is and, and, and where the tal is. So at times to get a proper exposure, you've got to release the posterior capsule. And that's uh, what we're trying to do. It's not an excellent video. This is the one that I could get um, in the last couple of days. But uh, this is the posterior capsule and we need to, our, all our orientation that we talk about is with, with regards to the tal uh, or the transverse acetabular ligament. So you can, you can just excise the posterior capsule all the way till you reach uh, uh, the transverse acetabular ligament because that's your guiding principle overall to assess both version, inclination, um, you know, and, and, and the placement. So if you see here, uh, what you see here is that's the transverse fibers that are going and the capsule overall tries to sort of mimic uh, uh, you know, where the, where, where the transverse acetabular li ligament lies. And unless you really expose the transverse acetabular ligament, you will struggle with probably all of the components that you want to, all, all of the variables that you want to control during a surge. Um, so, I mean, in a nutshell, um, we've got to translate the femur anteriorly and, uh, and, and we need to get a good exposure. Uh, what do you do? The first thing that you need to do is to expose the inferior capsule. We often let the inferior capsule be there and try and put our reamers. Our reamers are not able to give us the, the inclination that we want to because the posterior capsule is coming in the way. So get rid of the posterior capsule all the way to the level of the transverse acetabular ligament. Um, 
release the anterior capsule if you have to, partially or completely resect the rectus uh, or the reflected head of the rectus. And uh, rarely do we need to actually get rid of the gluteus maximus, but if the hip is tight, don't hesitate, just mark it and, 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 and release the uh, uh, gluteus maximus insertion because what, you, what is more important than um, you know, whether how much you expose is how well you expose it because you will need a complete 360 degree exposure of the hip uh, to be able to uh, perform the surgery with the less or the least amount of complications. Now, in terms of the retractor placement, that is the second most important thing. And, and that's something, uh, you know, surgeons who've been doing it for years, probably it, it comes reflexly to them. But if I go back 15 years down the line, I just didn't know how to put the retractors right. Uh, I just didn't know where to put them. So I think it's something that you cannot ignore. It's something that you've got to learn first. Um, if you wish to avoid, if you wish to get the right acetabular socket in, you've got to know where to keep the retractors. Um, and, 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 and if you ever visit uh, someone who's been doing it, I think don't focus on how well they do the surgery, focus on how, on how they expose the hip and how they uh, sort of put their retractors to get the kind of exposure that they want to. So, um, I mean, I, in, in, you, you, you've got a superior pin that we put. We generally tend to put an inferior pin into the ischium. Uh, so, uh, I mean, they've shown it with a retractor, but I would, as you put the pin in the ischium, which is the second most important one, it's relatively easier to put the pin superiorly. It's, it's probably a bit difficult to identify exactly where the ischium lies. So you've got to make sure that you keep the leg in complete extension, completely relax the sciatic nerve, get it completely out of the way, find your way, gradually go slowly, bit by bit, into the ischium, feel it with your pin, direct it sort of away from the sciatic nerve. And as soon as you can feel that bone, you can go all the way, like you sort of feel the femur when you're putting uh, sort of navigation pins uh, to feel, okay, this is the anterior border, this is superior border, this is the inferior border, and just drag that pin a little bit down, angle it away from the socket, and then sort of mallet that pin in. If you don't angle it away, it's gonna come in your way of reaming. So, so be very, very clear with that. What you need is a great exposure. Um, now, coming to the next problem that we face, uh, you know, Again, it's not a complication, but that's that's a problem. We, what we're talking about is what problems we can probably face while doing a primary hip uh, is an inadequate exposure. So you put the cup in, it doesn't fit in. What is the first thing you've got to look at? The first thing you've got to look at, is there a soft tissue interposition? Have I released my soft tissues? Is there something coming in between the bone and the, and the socket that I'm trying to, or my trial that I'm trying to put in? So get the soft tissue out of the way. If you've got all the soft tissue out of the way and still you can't fit, the most common problem that we perceive is uh, that we haven't reamed it enough. So that's the under reaming, which is the most common cause, but don't go overboard in over reaming to get that size because um, mostly when you start off doing the surgeries, uh, you end up thinking, okay, it's not fitting in and I've under reamed it, let me over ream it and you ream it way too much, uh, which will then again not let you get the, ream, the the fit that you're looking at. And obviously eccentric reaming is something that we've got to look at. So when the cup press fit is not good, um, just hold on, stop for a second, give yourself time, breathe in, breathe out, and uh, see whether you've reamed in correctly and, uh, and go back and review things. Uh, what was the size of the ball that came out? So if your ball that came out was 44 and you were at 50, you're probably, and, and you're still not getting a fit, you're probably over-reamed already, probably you, you've reamed eccentrically, probably you haven't reamed correctly, and you will go on and find yourself in a place where you, you, you're converting a primary hip into a complicated hip. So um, essentially, I think the benchmark is about four millimeters bigger. You could probably go five or six, but if you're anywhere there and you're still not getting a fit and you're continuing to ream it to make it make the socket bigger and bigger to get a press fit, then somewhere something some something somewhere is going wrong. So four millimeters ahead of the size of the native sort of ball is where you should 
uh, uh, Mudit uh, just request they are waiting for us yeah, in the yeah, OT. Can, can we I wind can, up? I, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. So I'll continue later. Let's go on for the video, for the more interesting continue part. Continue for one minute and then okay. we'll wind. Fair up. enough. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Just let me know. I'm I'm happy to sort of stop there. Okay, now the other problem that we often face is that we keep reaming, but there's a sclerotic part right at the dome, uh, which doesn't let us ream, uh, convert the socket into a real hemisphere, which we want to. So we keep reaming the anterior and posterior walls, but we are not able to ream the superior part, which is extremely scler sclerotic. So I think a good idea at that point is to again, you know, if you're going beyond your limits, you, you've got to keep a target in mind. And if you're going beyond your limits, you've got to start reaming. You can, you can just take off that sclerotic bone with a small reamer the same way as you take sort of the medial reamer and uh, sort of ream the, the, the medial part. So take off that sclerotic part of the bone away and then start your reaming exactly the same way as you would do. That would help you significantly in getting uh, a good press fit. Okay, uh, Modi. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Thanks. Really sorry about this. Okay, but, but I am enjoying the surgeries more than I am enjoying my talk. So okay, I yeah. am happy. Yeah. To... So, uh, can we switch to the OT? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Are we live in the hall? Yes, sir. You're audible. All right. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, so good morning. morning. I'm Dr. Manan. I'm with Dr. Zostheim and Dr. Neifeld, and they are going to be doing a mini anterolateral hip through a really small incision. I'll let him take over. Good morning, everybody. I hope you hear me well. I hope you had a good Yes, we can. Yeah. So do some more hip surgery now. I'm going to show you the anterolateral approach to the hip. It's also a muscle sparing approach, just as like direct anterior. We're just using a different interval, but we don't cut any muscle um, and to go through the hip. You can do that in supine position, just like the direct anterior approach, but we do it in lateral position. So lateral position, we have a neutral position for the femur. We are already marked the greater trochee area in the ASS right here. And for your skin incision, you want to stay anterior of the trope. So let's go. Nice. So here's the ASS, posterior of the trope, front of the trope, tip of the trope. And you just stay anterior. Nice. Uh, meanwhile, can we have the X-ray put up on the screen just for a sec? The pre-op X-ray. Yeah, and and uh, please zoom in on the X-ray. Battery, battery, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And then we just yeah, go. Yeah, through thanks. This thanks. Back thing. to the operative field. Down to the IT band. See it coming here, shiny white. Oh, swap. Cat spot. The trip. So, and then if you go down to the IT band, it show it to you a little more. 
you want to stay anterior of the greater trope. Can you appreciate the IT band in the hall? Yes, we can see that. Yeah. You see, it's red in front, and if you go more posterior, it's turning white. Maybe give me a knife again to show them. A little bit better. Get rid of the fat tissue here. Right. So, my finger touches the greater trope, and then I incise the IT bend in the direction of the fibers. Uh, the cameraman, please uh, have the incision centered in the wound, in the, and please zoom in slightly. Can you see? Uh, no, no see the, the, the other can camera, the, the other camera, field. the surgical yeah, field. Just yeah. let it center. Yeah. Soda or come lower down, please. A yeah, little zoom out. Yeah. So Dr. No, no, Zoster, uh, that's just uh, inside the IT band. Can you go a little bit further down? Focus it a little the down. Wound in the center. That the wound is in the center. Yeah. Take the camera cordially a bit. Towards the leg. Better, better, better. better, better okay. Yeah. So, and then you see the gluteus muscle here. Coming out right yeah. there. Please zoom in on the wound. The camera muscle. person, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, can you have them zoom in on the wound? Uh, okay, can you zoom in for a second, please? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We can see zoom that. Further. Yeah, better. Yes, better. Yeah, just uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just stabilize and um, uh, that position. Yeah, Perfect. we can see it beautifully. This is excellent. Please hold it at this. Yeah. So I just incised the IT band, and then there's the gluteus muscle you see coming forward. There's a little fat pad right here, and that's where you usually find the entrance to the interval. And then it's a digital preparation, and then you're right there on the head. And when did we take two retractors, the ones I showed you before, this can go out. Uh, that's the one we want in front. Is the smaller one? Yes, the small the one. And go around the head. And then the, the wider one. This is slip. Stable. Okay. We have some forceps, please. And then we're right on the capsule. So this is capsule right here. We're around the head. And then I personally use the bowie to incise my capsule. Can you use the suction? Can you focus in the wound? So you can have the PIP which is zoomed out. The other picture you can make it uh, a little bigger. Yes, can you zoom that a little? Yeah, yeah that's fine. We have a little more light. Can you see? Not really. Can we can we just have a different right. angle to that? In the wound? Can you place this maybe a little different. Can you hold that for a quick? 
not like the posterior portrait you really need to attach the capsule can we zoom have have two images side by side both the, both the cameras can you move the head can you turn michael just turn the leg a little bit so we're right there just a really thin capsule Can you take that? So I think once we finish dissecting a little bit, we'll uh, give it a second to show the plane that is developed. Can we use the other Bowie? The other. Maybe that's working better. Would would we mind increasing the skin incision now? We we'll be able to see better. No, not at all. Let's let's do, just do that. Yeah, we we'll we'll do that so that we can see something in the wound. Skin, the knife for the skin again. Skin, the other one. Yeah, we're just gonna make it a little bigger. So it's probably distally we're gonna enlarge, right? Here too. A deep knife. So does that help? Yeah, that does help. Yes. So I'm just trying to get rid of the capsule here. It's pretty attached to the head. It's a fracture case. With fractures, you never know what to expect, actually. Usually we do a double osteotomy of the head. So we do a most proximal cut first through the head, a little oblique, and then you can slide up the head. But here's the fracture. Get rid of this tissue here. Not really doing anything. So let's see where we can go. Give me the four steps again. You know, this side, there is a subcapital fracture. Okay. Yeah, there is a subcapital fracture. And uh, we have dissected down to the Give point. me a knife. It doesn't do it. Right. The proximal dissection of the gluteus medius uh, is up to the acetabulum. 
any the landmark? The medius is behind this retractor. Right, right. So it is on only the, till the acetabulum. And then the tensor postulate is behind the other retractor up front. That's the fractured head. So, and then what we do for the positioning of the leg, um, what you used to do with the posterior or lateral approach is usually you put the leg up front to work on the femur. We pose it posteriorly. So, could we have the leg position camera on the screen, please? That's why I brought Michael along. Because your first assistant is really important in this approach. So he knows what you're doing and you can position the leg. Yeah. So we are going to pause for a second well, while uh, the camera can show you the limb position. Uh, we again. Can we zoom out and see the leg? Can we have the cameraman show the position of the leg? Yeah, we'll just show you the position of the leg. Michael, can you twist the leg a little bit? So can you, uh, yes. in a 1990 position, and uh, this is really... how the first assistant will take, receive the limb in a bag here to further expose the femoral neck capsule and try to attempt to uh, remove the femoral head. Switch, switch cameras again, please. It's important to drape the the uh, the side of the leg very low down and deep because that can get infected if we don't have uh, adequate drapes on. No, no. Uh, uh, the first the is in a, a bag. bag. A so bag. That's right. That's, right. That's right. And the limb is prepared yeah. in a sterile fashion anyway with the That's standard right. stockinette and uh, our standard preparation. So the limb goes straight from a sterile. Uh, preparation into the sterile okay. bag. So That's there right. isn't uh, any kind of sort of risk of infection or unsterility or anything of that sort. So can you guys see that? That neck part. Just give me some forceps to show. Uh, can we zoom in and focus on the femoral head? Here. Mm -hmm. Femoral neck right here. Yeah, we can see the see the neck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. And then there's the facet of Ontario right here. So this retractor is in the fossa. And then back here is the greater trope. Okay? So this is the calca region here. And then according to my preoperative planning, I can do my resection cut now. Just give me the saw. Just turned it off. My fault, probably. And the leg is in ninety degrees of external rotation. The upper part is parallel to the floor, and the lower leg is perpendicular to the floor. So you're ninety ninety, and then you have the axis of the femur right there. And it's critical and that, that this, this cut is made in the 1990 position. And this is just the angle. 
determined by my preoperative planning and my STEM. Okay, so now I need the other attractor with the two branches. So this attractor now goes from the car path. Take this one out real quick. And then Michael will put the leg in extension. Can we have the limb camera again, please, for a second? Ek second ke liye camera switch. Have the ke other retractor again. Perfect. Can we switch back? The same he had. Yeah, that, that's the one. And I go behind the greater trail. Oh, sounds clear. And then this is actually the most important step of the whole procedure. So can we really just have you adjusting a little bit again? Can we have the surgical field in the center, center of the picture? It focus. Doesn't look focused. The focus a little more. You can see it better. Yeah, perfect. Gonna put some capital away here. Don't do the release yet. Can you can you focus from the uh, foot end a little so that we can see into the wound? You can just reorient the camera. I don't know if that is going to be possible. So that's the greater choke area here, right here. So we're releasing the capsule and then the femur comes up. So Michael is pushing it down in adduction. It's still in external rotation of 90 degrees. And with my release, you can go further in adduction. So it's hyperextension, adduction, and external rotation for the leg. And then you can easily work on the femur and I do that step now because it gives us a little more freedom for the acetabulum also I think this will do can I have a lure Can we have the other view as well? Oh, this is completely out. The earlier camera, if he can, yeah, just zoom in a little. Yeah. We're going to switch to the acetabulum now. Right. So the leg comes out again. And Michael has a little sack in front of him, so the leg stays sterile. And then I take the one branch retractor again. No, retractor. Retractor. And then maybe the cup. Find the fractured head. And then a homing, just a straight homing. And you pull in the leg a little bit. Why not get out with a section?
Give me a bone can. Bone clamp. Bone clamp. Is the head being delivered? The bone clamp just to get the head off. Yeah. So the other one you had it stronger. So that's part of the fracture. It's all in pieces actually by now. As I said, you never know what to expect with the fractures. Not the normal anatomy anymore. All in pieces. An AVN case. So those are the smaller pieces. Give me the um, cup again. We can reach it. The cup, the bigger cup we just got before. It's not going to make sense to use the cork screw with that fragment. So So let's try it differently. Give me the two branch retractor. I'm going to put that behind the posterior wall. And I hope I can finally see the head a little bit better. Give me a knife. And let's put in the other retractor up front. The wider one. Just gonna say some more capsule knife. Okay, that knife just went off. As soon as we have this fragment out, um, we can work on the acetabulum and I can show you the view on the acetabulum. Well, actually, usually in most of the approaches, the acetabulum isn't the problem. Um, that's the same with this approach. You have good visualization of the acetabulum. I just need to get this fragment out of the way. All the head fragments are out? One fragment is there. It's just the rest of the capsule. We can place that right in properly yet. So the bone clamp again. Do we have a bigger caucus? Mm -hmm. So this is all partly fractured. I think we almost have everything now. Actually, most of the head is gone. Okay. Hmm? Can you give me the pieces of the head? It's actually, when was that actually taken? Where do we have the last parts of the head? I just took out. So. There's not much left here of the head. All in pieces. 
So sizing of the head is kind of difficult in that case. All righty. So we already have this retractor in place. This retractor goes at say five o'clock of the acetabulum. Can I have a knife again, please? Knife, please. Yeah. It's going to incise the anterior part of the capsule a little bit to be able to place this retractor. It's front of the wall, anterior wall. And then, if you could give me the other retractor we prepared, no, the bended one. Maybe I use this so you guys can see a little bit better. Can we have a view from the so, little yeah, I mean, the the now, yeah. spikes are in place? Yeah, now camera, please uh, adjust because now the acid emblem is visible in the depths. So forceps, knife, please. Yeah, just zoom in. And the position of the limb, if at all, you can just show that. Hmm. Yeah, just give us a second. Yeah. Just set up a nice view so that uh, we can show you. Whose head is this? No. It's okay. Uh, we we just finish and then we show this. I just clean the room in the meanwhile. I'm sorry, this is okay. Set. Hold it. Nice. I think you're going to see better as, as soon as I have the room cleaned. Yeah, I think we have a nicer view now. Could we zoom in into the wound now? Can we have a view from the foot end a little so that we can look into the well? Can you tilt the camera slightly, please? Just tilt it a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Tilt, please. Can we have the other image? Yeah, tilt it a little more so that we can see it, if at all it's so we, we are just organizing. We are okay. changing the technician so that uh, the one more worse with tilting the camera is available. Right. You have knife and forceps again, please. Do a little more cleaning here. Issue. How are we doing in terms of vision? I actually don't see anything either. So can you guys see the acetabulum here? We can see a part of it. If we can have part a... Which part? <laughs> Yeah, the inferior part. So if we can get the camera to look into the wound, into the well, so that we can see the acetabulum end on. Can we wash? Yeah.
Let me swap. Yeah, that's a little better. Can we switch to the other camera, please? Yeah, this is, you can zoom in a little, we can see the acetabulum, just zoom in, yeah. Zoom in, please. Keep zooming, yes. please. Yes, I, I think that's. We should start so with the yeah, that's better. That's better. Yeah, that's better. Four, four, yeah, that's four, better. four zero as the first streamer, and then we see. So you guys let me know when you yes. finally yes, can you can see, what yes, I'm see doing. the acetabulum. We have swap again to clean the acetabulum. Dr. Zostan, you have this platform that you when when you're reaming, you have to be careful. This is not a really aesthetic acetabulum. It's an AVN case. Sclerosis is not going to be too bad. Yeah, let's go. We will proceed. Is ream. And reamers, please. Four zero. Four zero. And I'm going to medialize first to find the true flaw of the acetabulum. And now give me forty four. Give me those half reamers we prepared. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, forty six. We may just have the couple. We are using reason. half reamers, uh, right. not the whole reamers. Next one. Forty six. Probably going to be fine with the forty eight. We can have the direction of reaming if at all the, the cameraman can zoom out. Direction of reaming. So this is the shoulder. Can we zoom out? Zoom out for a second, please. Can we zoom out? Fully zoomed out. And can we have the other camera on the screen as well? Both cameras at the same time? Zoom out. Zoom out completely. Forty-eight. 
Can go one quicker. We're fifty. We might up might end up with a fifty two or fifty four cup in this case. This is a reamer fifty. Can we have the other image which is uh, right now? have some grip here? Right. Can you reposition this spike, please? Let's reposition the retractors. Maybe you guys see a little bit better. So as I said, one goes behind the posterior wall. Say four or five o'clock. And another one goes up front. Around eight o'clock position can you give me a knife again Okay, Michael. And the third retractor. Yeah. This is more for visualization for you guys. Hopefully. So let's clean the acetabulum again. Wash. And clean. Manan knows because he was with us last year when he came to Munich for three months that it's mostly a 30 minute approach. So, how are we doing on vision here? I have my last streamer again. 50 Rima, please. If you use those half reamers, you have to pay attention. They like to go eccentric. They usually like to go up one size below my measured size to have some support by the acetabulum. Can we focus on the image here? Yeah. Stay central. Focus a little, yeah. Just thinking if I go one more or not. Can we have a better focus? The cameraman. It seems that the speed is a little blurry. Is there something we can do about that? Yeah. So let's take the 52 original cup. We stay with the 50. We're taking a 52. Could you open 52, please, the cup? 52. So with that cup, you under ream by two millimeters. Well, you got to know your cup because the numbering is different with any company. Sometimes it's one to one, line to line with this cup. If you want a press fit of two millimeters, you have to use a cup two millimeters bigger than your last reamer.
Can you give me the injection of the LIA? The LIA injection, do you have that? Infiltration. Local anesthetic. As we have time right now, just going to put some local anesthetic posterior. It's not a big game changer in hips. It definitely is in knee patients. Um, pain is usually not the problem in hips. But why not be nice to your patient? Give a little more relief and get them up the first day. So what we do in Munich, as they go on the ward after two hours on the ICU unit, and then we get them up in the afternoon. Up on their feet. We have the cup? Yeah. So, for the insertion of the cup, I used the offset hanger, makes lives a lot easier in this approach. I have the screwdriver and then the hammer, I just push it down a little bit. And then there's a, an alignment rod on a. So for your positioning, you can use this device. And if this is parallel to the floor, you're in 45 degrees. And this should point to your anterior part of the shoulder. You probably need to zoom out a little bit here. So this thing here points towards the shoulder. Yeah, we can see that, sir. You can also use the transverse ligament for orientation of your antiversion of the cup, of course. And I can clearly see that. Yes, sir, we can see that, really. Okay, Let's take that off because it's always going to fall off. And we have a swap here because it's going to be bloody. So always make sure that you still have some bony coverage anteriorly. The psoas tendon is not going to like it otherwise. Okay. Secure screwdriver. The screwdriver to yeah, exact it. Now the insert. Let's clean it. Safety tool. Uh, neutral. Neutral. Great. So from fifty two we can have thirty six. With this, yeah. So, can you guys see the cup? Yes, we can see the cup. Reflection the here. Cup. Yeah. So the difference in his approach is that the surgeon is anterior of the patient. That's what you guys are not used to with the posterior approach. So if you want to switch for the acetabulum. It's the easy part, but for the femur, it's going to be 180 degrees different than the, what you guys are used to. But I'm perfectly in line with my transverse ligament here, so antiversion is fine. Inclination is fine. 
I'm pretty happy about that. Go for the insert. Could we have the insert, please? Yeah. Okay, so this is perfectly in line. We're set with the acetabulum. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. no? Yeah, everything looks good. Thank you. The audience is happy and they're clapping. So again, we're going to put the leg in external rotation of 90 degrees. We put it posteriorly in hyperextension and then in adduction. Can we switch cameras for leg position, please? Yeah, just focus this a little bit so that uh, they get an idea of what is happening. Actually, we can do a little more neck cut here. Can you go up in 90 degrees again? 90, 90. We're going to take a little more of the neck away. Can we have the saw again? So here's the greater trope. That's going to reflect some of the carcass. Okay. No. Some surgeons actually switch positions. They go back and then do the femur on the posterior the, the side of the patient. So the socket from the front and then they switch positions. I can use this. Use this section. Anna. It clearly is a team approach. You really need the first assistant to know what he's doing, and he's going to make your life easy and the procedure easy going or pretty frustrating. So, can you guys see the femur? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So, box us to two. Can we have the other image blown up? The image that is smaller? Yes, can we can we have that in the center? Center of the of the field? Yeah. Can you give me the other approach? No, there's the angle one. Yeah. Section. Okay. Yeah. We have long spoon, like a small spoon, just the long one. We go into the canal. Next, please.
Now I just have a long spoon. Just need to check from actually where I want to be. No spoon. Do you have a long spoon? Yeah, it's fine. Do we have a bigger spoon? Okay, we're good. So in a rotation or end version of my stem right now, if I'm parallel to the floor again, I'm in neutral position. And if I twist it a little bit anteriorly, probably at my 10 degrees here. So for the benefit of the audience, can you explain how do you decide the size? Where do you start off with? What would be your uh, point on the calcar? up to which you can go further up in size. Can you elaborate on that, please? Dr. Gosling, there is a question about how you are deciding the size of your stem. Well, we did some preoperative templating, of course. And then usually what I do is I know my exact size from the templating, and then I use the smallest size, and then I jump in two sizes up just one underneath my expected or templated size, just to hurry it up a little bit. But in this case, with that bone, we go one step by one, one at a time. And then from your templating, you know where the shoulder of your stem is supposed to be. Do one more. Actually, give me the six again. I would go a little deeper. So we templated a seven. This is seven? This is six. This is six, yeah. But it doesn't feel too bad, actually. And I have a rotational stability. I think we're going to do a trial with six. So let's go for the trial adapter and standard. Standard and then a the small head that small. Standard. Okay, let's see where we are. We're out. Hold on. No, the head is off. Michael, go back. Okay. Okay. So in terms of leg sizing, I just checked shortage of the leg was like half a centimeter in supine position. Then we put the patient in lateral position and I just touched the patella. Can you zoom out, please? Zoom out the top view. So in terms of leg legs, we're good. Open, zoom out, please. Sure. And show both cameras, please. And then I look for telescoping. Mm 
check if it's stable. Both inflection, internal rotation, extension, external rotation. Michael, are you good with the size, uh, one size down? Are you good with the size six or do you plan to go up to seven that your template? Well, we're fine with six. Six is stable. Yeah. Six is where my shoulder was supposed to be. We're good in terms of leg length. So we're going to stay with the six. Right. Go for six. Right, Michael. So in, in the interest of time, thank you. That was a very elegant uh, presentation. And... Uh, You'll now go on to uh, putting in your definitive implant. So, uh, round of applause from the audience here. Great, and uh, we'll we'll keep you on screen. We'll just uh, mute you, and uh, uh, so the folks can be watching. All right. The corner. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great, great demo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can we get to the next uh, talk? The fast track protocols, Dr. Sridhar Archik. Stand up. Stand up. I just, you guys see it. I don't. Hi, Sridhar. Good morning. So just a request to all the, all the presenters. Um, in the interest of time, and we would like to encourage discussion, so may I request all of you to please keep to your time, allocated time. A minute up or down is good, but... The buck stops there. So a minute is your grace period. At one minute, your transmission will be chopped off. No retrieval analysis. Let's get this ball rolling now. I seem to have lost my laptop somewhere in the socket there. Oh, good, good morning, friends. So from the world of cartoons to the world of uh, science, if you see Journal of Arthroplasty last month, suddenly everybody is talking about short stay surgery and enhanced recovery after surgery. So why there is sudden interest? Again, though we know the enhanced recovery protocols now for almost 20 years, it's not only to reduce the cost, but the reason for interest in short stay is mainly because it improves patient satisfaction to the hilt. So the reason now the interest is because the patient satisfaction is much better if you have a short stay surgery. In Indian scenario, scenario it is even more important because all our patients are younger for THR compared to European or American counterparts. And younger the patient, unhappy the patient, which all of us know, mainly because they cannot pursue their hobbies after a surgery. And that is the reason we are going to discuss how we can perform short stay surgery in India. So I'm going to tell you in brief how to choose the right patient for short stay and what are the standard operating procedures one should follow so that you can reduce the length of stay in the hospital. So there are three filters which you use before you decide that this patient will be a good patient for short stay. There are physical filters, psychological filters and medical filters. So the first important thing now is called as the tuck test. A simple test where a patient gets up from the chair and walks three meters in your outpatient. If he can do it below 10 seconds, then he's the right candidate. It obviously also tells us a lot about physical activity of the patient. And tuck test nowadays is used almost for every single arthroplasty to find out what are the long-term outcomes. The second important thing is called a RAPT or Rapid Assessment and Prediction Tool. So again, there are simple six questions which you can ask the patient in your outpatients. And here you see about the community support, about their physical activity pre-op, and of course their sex and age. Male patients do typically well for short stay, and younger the age, obviously, they are better off for short stay surgery. 
the important thing which i learned from this was the psychological filter so apparently there is a new concept called as need based education what is need based education is that all of us human beings have got certain coping mechanisms when we are given information one third of us are in what are known as avoidant category which means if you see this patient in outpatient and you give them lot of information the anxiety builds up and they run away so beware if you give too much information leaflets one third of your patients may not come back to you whereas the vigilant coping mechanism patients are the ones who will discuss squeaking in ceramic on ceramic and show you google reports so what you need to do is ask the patient how much information you want and then give don't unnecessarily give them information the second list comes from the era society about the drugs so what was found recently that 65% of patients are on drugs which are not for any psychiatric condition or not given by a psychiatrist what i have circled are three common drugs we find in india which patients are on own taking them or the general practitioners or md physicians have given them these are red flags these patients will not do well for short stay surgery the new concepts now as far as the medical filters go have changed we used to talk about age and bmi and what not but the factors in red are more important and i would like to draw your attention to the third fact called as polypharmacy what polypharmacy by definition means is any patient taking more than 5 tablets for conditions like diabetes blood pressure hypothyroidism these are red flags and diabetes hb1c is not more important the type 1 diabetes is more important so these conditions are the most important things for short stay we discuss the psychiatric disorders and the low physical activity any which way once you choose these patients for short stay the next important part pre op is called prehabilitation a study showed that if you just teach them how to use crutches or walker pre op the length of stay reduces from there what we have done now is that younger patients may like to pursue a hobby so here you see our physiotherapist teaching a golf swing in prehabilitation mode so if you tell the patients that you can go back to their hobbies their anxiety goes down and they do well with short stay surgeries so these are the things you do pre surgery what do you do intraoperatively differently there are very few basic things as we all saw the anterior approach is better so the studies indicate that out of all the three approaches anterior approaches do well in short stay surgery your anesthetist should be able to give at least a peng or a fascia iliaca block which obviously reduces pain so the recovery is enhanced nowadays in mumbai this is very easy to give all our anesthetists are good at giving peng blocks robots increase your surgical time but the studies have indicated that you can still do a robotic surgery achieve accuracy and achieve short stay so robots are not contraindications so when you send the patient home quickly as you saw in the cartoon what becomes important is the post discharge because then the post discharge protocols become very important so you see this is persona iq ni which you all know has a sensor inside so a surgeon can track the patient for life but forget that high five thing this is how my phone looks like we have now trying an app where the patient subscribes to the app and i can actually see whether he is exercising or not so patients who come from remote places where physiotherapy is not available you can put them on app and the last important thing is now virtual real reality or augmented reality is important so here this lady is actually looking at her pre operative information as well as post operative rehabilitation in a virtual reality mode so these are the techniques which you need to use when you want to discharge the patient early but everything is not rosy what era society now says is that all of us follow the pre intra post operative protocols very easily but you need to audit this and then realize whether you can do it in your hospital setup so what is important is that a study recently found that a particular hospital in a large study the patient used to stay longer if the surgery used to start after 2 pm and specifically it was a thursday or friday surgery all of us know that if we do our surgeries on saturday most of our patients won't go home on sunday because the insurance offices are closed so in spite of learning all the protocols what you need to learn is that you interact with your hospital infrastructure and then decide whether your hospital is a good hospital for a short stay surgery so if you want a mcdonald kind of a drive through surgery and this is what you want as a reality in future uh, there are only four simple take home messages use medical and psychological filters so that you choose the right patient 
don't give them extra information harp on need based education after you find a good patient prehabilitate them well and then take them to a hospital where you have a team where there are anesthetists who are well versed with this the nursing staff is well versed with this and your administration support so that your cases get scheduled first thing in the morning and then they get discharged very fast in a short stay surgery thank you very much for your attention thank you sri that that was a great presentation um may I now invite the last speaker in this uh, session dr sanjay dhar is going to talk about the glitch alerts how i messed up and cleared the mess hi good So I'll be talking about certain in drop. So uh, most common, what we see is an in drop fracture. Most of us must have seen during our surgeries that may be minor, as minor as a small crack. or the full metaphyseal blowing up so generally these are these uh, quite often happen in uncemented stems which are like fit and fill stems uh, as you see the pro proximal femur is a very uh, unbalanced it's not a single straight tube there's a wide metaphysis and then a narrow tube and as we go from type a to type c femurs where we have a lot of bone in anterior as well as lateral views in type c these generally these uh, type c's are capacious canals where the our uh, these uh, uncemented stems fit quite well uh, if sized well but in type a and type b uh, they are very narrow funnel shaped and they are potentially cracked so as you are putting your stem there is like a pile driver or a log splitter and suddenly if you have not sized it well and uh, templated it well and reamed it well you might blow up the whole thing so it may be as you can see the different companies they sell different stems with different patterns and different sizes of tapers and all that which ultimately are going to fit in the same femur so how do biomechanically and uh, they fit in in the same femur is really a wonder so uh, it is actually a pile driver the whole funnel is pushed into the metaphysis and if your canal is not um, uh, well reamed or if you have because we have a small entry point there if you are not lateralized well you might shatter it the whole thing so as it as i said it might be a simple crack or it might be a big blow up so it can vary from a simple wiring knot around the metaphysis or in the neck or you might end up doing a tension band wiring in the trochanter or sometimes you might blow it up completely uh, if it's a metaphysial bone geriatric bone where you need to do an extra uh, uh, reinforcement on the lateral wall uh, and still uh, even if you do a, a lateral wall reconstruction the uh, tensile side the medial side if it is not well balanced and well push the hoop stresses and the forces on the varus forces tend to sag it or a period of time even this might fail if your stem is not well centralized and well fitted so uh, you can see as here uh, try to get away quickly by just uh, the medial calcar is blown up putting graft and not uh, hoping that the biology would work you have a good stem but over a period of time the whole stem starts sinking subsidence happens and uh, uh, it's a potentially devastating complication and if you have dislocations in such you might end up in infection and then ultimately a bad hip like this so you can classify them with the vancouver periprosthetic classification so b1 b2 b3 needs to be immediately dealt with you cannot sleep over it while a and c where you have a fracture below the you might do with the routine trauma uh, fixation a you might put a wire around the neck or you might even if your stem is well holding you might leave them alone so b1 b2 b c you all need to fix them and if you are depending on the stability of his stem you might need additional fixation or change the stem so i am uh, that was the common complication but what i am sharing now is 
Um, this is a bilateral hip arthritis in a young patient where we did one uh, hip on one side, he was walking with the crouch, we did the other side. Uh, because he was walking with the crouch, we tried to do an anterior release, and this is what we did in the second hip. And while he was taken up for the check x-ray in the uh, post-op period, there was dislocation, and this is an anterior dislocation. So basically, uh, it is very difficult to diagnose on table because uh, we tried to do a lot of anterior release uh, because there was crouch. So putting a uh, I always prefer to see the full rim of the estabulum and I use that as a um, uh, the rim to both sides rim and the tail as a version. So I don't actually use the version, the leg thing and uh, to see the version. So I always try to stay within the rim, uh, the rim on all sides. But in this case, since there was anterior um, release needed to be done, so we probably released much more, and that is how the dislocation happened. So uh, this is a very rare complication. Literature says that you can conserve them. You don't need to uh, re replace the uh, cup. We tried to wait for two weeks, but it didn't. It still dislocated. Uh, on he was, uh, if you put him in internal rotation, it was relocating. If you put in if allow it to, in the natural antiversion, it was dislocating, so we had to replace. So difficult to uh, diagnose these things, but if you can see the CT, you will see this version, the anterior, some section will show you, I think, you know, pointer, that the, the rim is more antiverted than this. Yeah. So you can again see the, the anterior wall is much ahead of the anterior rim. So excessive version. Generally, we worry about the less antiversion, but here it was excessive version, so we had to replace the rim. So that is, if you are oversizing, your, uh, you try to get a good fit, you try to oversize, that is where the anterior psoas hits you, uh, the psoas muscle hits in the anterior causing tendonitis, or there might be um, uh, anterior, uh, if you might have more antiverted it, you might get it dislocated anteriorly. So a rare complication, but can be seen. So always, uh, uh, version is not something very sacrosanct. You need to see the position of your table, the spine. Uh, I think probably in the afternoon we'll have some more on dual mobility, where the position, version will keep on changing. So unless, I always prefer to use the native rim as a guide, unless there are lots of osteophytes, that gives you a good uh, orientation as far as version is concerned. Same patient. You can see in the cup, in the AP view also, the cup looks a little antiverted, much more antiverted. We had to revise it in two weeks' time uh, as it was continuously dislocating, and he did well uh, after that. So this is another uh, glitch in the OT. This was a dysplastic hip. Uh, he came to us in adult, almost adulthood where we had pain, AVN on both sides. He had leg... Uh, shortening on that side. So we tried to do uh, the osteotomy and as we are trialing it, the whole thing was settling down quite well. But once we put the actual stem, it started distracting. So by that time we were uh, too much committed to the whole thing because the distal stem was holding quite well and tightly. So we uh, just packed the head buried it there and tied it all around, probably hoping for the best, and it did well. So this is over a period of one or two years. This is the final x-ray. Now, patient is walking. So God is great, but timely uh, intervention in such cases do, does help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request Dr. Vidyanand Rao to start a small panel discussion on preventing post-surgic joint replacement. So we are running short of time, so we are going to rush through things. I'll request Dr. Mohanty to join the panel, please. So this is a panel discussion on preventing prosthetic joint infection. So what things we can do in order to minimize the chances of infection? Right, so 
Uh, the patient related factors, how we are all doing elective surgery, so how important is it to optimize patients in terms of diabetes, alcohol, hygiene? Uh, Dr. Monti, can you start off? I mean, do you, do you have a particular target with respect to an HbA1c level or a sugar level, something like that? In diabetes, there are three things. Last 24 hours monitoring depends on your, you know, fasting and postprandial level, last three weeks serum proctosamine level, and last three months about HbA1c level. So if all three are good within limits, you can go ahead to surgery. It is uh, recommended that at least your HPA1C should be less than 7.5, then you should do elective total joint replacement surgery. Right, so and if it's more, you would wait? If it is, you know, say eight, nine, then still if your fasting and postprandial is well maintained, then you may go ahead with the joint replacement surgery. Okay, uh, Dr. Mudit, would you uh, ask the patient to stop smoking and smoke, stop alcohol before surgery if they are chronic smokers? Well, if the patient does ask me whether he needs to, I would. Otherwise, I would probably just uh, give it a pass. Uh, I would obviously encourage him that, you know, you know, alcohol becomes a big factor, not just for the surgery itself, but for the recovery. And I think if there's, if you're dealing with somebody who's a chronic alcoholic, who's been taking alcohol every day, and, and, and then I think you've got to be aware of the fact that he might go into withdrawal post the surgery, which is going to be a there big, is a simple big... solution to that post-op. No, no, it's, it's not. Um, um, trust me, if, if, you, if you see somebody who's been a chronic alcoholic, and I've had two such cases where, you know, you couldn't have them sort of uh, recover. They went into delirium tremens after the surgery. So I think, and you wouldn't believe it, uh, but what is the best treatment for alcohol withdrawal? The obvious one. Alcohol itself. Yeah. So it's about sedating them and keeping them within sedation into the op, you know, in the ICU, um, and which in interferes significantly with your so with your uh, post-operative recovery. So I think yes, obviously, if possible, I would definitely, definitely do that. But I think it's important that we address and we assess whether the patient coming to us yeah. consuming alcohol is a is a is a habitual alcoholic is having alcohol every day has never had an alcohol free period in the last um, one month and that's how we've got to sort of take it forward okay so Jesh, let's talk about ot infrastructure i mean do you have a do you refuse to operate in a in a ot which is not up to the mark not up to the standards that we are, that are mentioned here uh, so it's not always in a nursing home level say for example yeah so it's not always possible to get a, a HEPA filter and your laminar airflow everywhere, but uh, you can still do it. You just have to maintain the OT hygiene and OT uh, uh, the so protocols are, are to be followed. Temperature at 18 degree, humidity and pressure gradient and all those things. I think one of the most important things is the air handling unit. And so briefly, the way it works is that air conditioned air is fed to the HEPA filters, where it goes down under pressure onto the operative area and then it is vented out from the OT through the side vents. So this maintains a unidirectional flow of air so that the suspended particles do not actually come back to the operative field. And I think that's a uh, standard of care that needs to be followed in every OT, whether a nursing home level or a bigger setup. Okay, let's talk about perioperative care. I mean, these are the small points that we'll quickly run through. Uh, Just one point regarding that uh, yeah. autoclaving that picture. Now, where the air goes out, many times you have seen that there are like trolleys lying in front of that. That prevents the air to go out and then again it comes back to the operating yes, area. Yes, yes. So, as a surgeon, at least you should see that there is no trolley lying in front of those, you know, uh, exit uh, windows. Uh, so, ideally, we also, well, we should have a CSSD unit, but in a nursing home setup, it may not be possible. So, at least the horizontal autoclave which will take in our trays is essential. Flash sterilizer is uh, no longer recommended. Uh, sterilization, fumigation at least once a week with hydrogen peroxide. And after every infect infected case, we no longer use formalin because it's carcinogenic. OT washing is to be once a week minimum. All horizontal surfaces to be cleaned with disinfectant daily and OT swaps taken from the relevant areas. OT attire, uh, Mudit, 
you operate in a corporate hospital, uh, so it, this does not apply to you. But if you are operating in a smaller nursing home... No, I think it does apply to me because you, we, we see a lot of people who sort of wear these OT clothes uh, and then go out to the canteen and come back. They're ideally meant to change uh, once they come back from that canteen area or from, that, yeah. from the ICU and everything um, before re-entering the OT. But what you see is they're in their scrubs, they go out, they move around and they come back. They no, they no longer are scrub, scrub they are, suits. They are, they are, yeah, absolutely. So I think that's something that the hospital has to ensure that if you go, either you are not allowed to go out with scrubs or if you do go out with scrubs, you've got to come back and change. It's very difficult to enforce because you, you need a monitor sitting there to get that done. But it's extremely important according to me. So very important point. Disposable gowns are preferred but not essential. OT discipline. In terms of number of people in the OT, Dr. Mohanty, can you comment on this when you're doing a yeah. joint? Uh, I'll just, before that, I'll highlight that one point you had written. Change your mask after a break is. Stress should be post, put on this. People wearing masks throughout the day, the same mask they're using and operating. The mask so, acts as a filter. And so the filter has to be cleaned out after every case. So after every case, one should use a new mask. That's what the message should be given. Important yeah. point. Yeah. So I'm just rushing through it because we are actually running uh, yeah. out of time. Uh, how many people in the OT, how, how is that relevant um, with respect to preventing infection? Because, you know, that disturbs the airflow, that HEPA filter, whatever airflow, whatever you have shown in the picture. The number of people, they increase the movement of the people that disturbs that flow of the air. That is why you tell that minimum number of people should be there, your surgeon, your assistant or whatever, your operating team, maybe four people maximum, your scrub nurse and one circulating nurse and uh, your ward boys, uh, one or two ward boys and an assist and uh, one of the anesthesia assistant. So these are the you know minimum number of people who are there inside the OT, and repeatedly one should not open the door and close, so that that also disturbs the airflow. The implant in inventory should be preferably be kept uh, in within the OT itself. Yeah, yeah, everything should be kept inside the OT, so that you should not open the doors. You know, what it will not more than five door openings during the surgery. So that is important. And movement of the people should be minimized. Yeah. Once the people for, walks from one place to the other place, that also disturbs the air. Right. And that yeah. affects the you know, sterility. So this is a no-brainer. I mean, these things are not to be allowed because a high number of gram-negative organisms have been uh, found in these areas. Uh, scrubbing and hand washing. Uh, Mudit, again. Uh, so do you follow any particular protocol that you insist or your team to um, have? Um, no, I think I think we're pretty. Uh, uh, chlorhexidine is what we typically use, and uh, and and we we sort of are trying to encourage people putting a timer, putting you know various kinds of things around so that they spend the desired amount of time. I think you know from the Indian perspective, I think surgeons and nurses do what they've got to do, but you've got a wide range of implant people coming and scrubbing in, yeah. um, which probably is not ideal. I think if, I think every hospital should have a protocol of teaching and educating right. those people specifically um, so that they understand the importance of uh, hand hygiene. Yeah. The point that needs to be highlighted with every member of the team is that there are two types of disinfectants. The non-alcohol based disinfectants like soap or beta scrub or chlorhexidine are used to decontaminate the hand, hands to take out the dirt and the grit. And the actual disin the sterilization would occur with the alcohol-based disinfectants because they would kill the germs. So, steri putting sterilium on the hands is equally important after washing up. Five minutes of scrubbing are sufficient, uh, more than that and actually. drying out of the sterilium. After you put the sterilium, it should dry. It should dry. Then only you are gone. In the wet stage, if you are, that doesn't you know mean anything. Yeah. So, uh, dry hands with a sterile towel and then apply sterilium and then allow the sterilium to dry before you go on to wear your gowns and gloves. Uh, Jayesh, do you always use disposable, uh, I mean, uh, disposable gowns and surgical hoods and all those things? Disposable gowns, yes. Surgical hoods, no. Okay. Not in my government setup. <laughs> okay. But uh, if it's available, it's good. Surgeon comfort is better. Effective barrier between the surgeon and the uh, uh, patient. Uh, sorry, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but the OT is ready. So okay. we'll just show it for 15 minutes and then we can continue for remaining five minutes of this uh, discussion. So we'll stop now? Yeah. yeah, we'll stop now and then we'll re resume after 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so. okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah, we'll so have to we, wait. We, we're on the same equation now. Yeah. I, I get to stop you because you stopped me. <laughs> No, I'm still muted. Yeah, sir, uh, we can hear you. Got a view. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so can you see the knee? No, sir. We cannot see it now. Can the knee be seen? No, sir. Just, uh, uh, no, just... I mean, you're audible, okay, but not so visible. There is no visual input yet. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah, it yeah, now. We got it. You got it? Yeah, can, can the cameraman orient the knee so that we can, yeah, yeah, that's a better view. Yeah, so that's fine, sir. Both the things, this is the foot end. Okay. This is the top end. This is the medial side. This is the lateral side. Okay. And I want the top camera also to show and the lower camera. Am I good to go? Yes, sir. Can we have the PIP? Yeah, yeah thank you. you. Yeah. So we have just marked the landmarks and I have, there is no tunicate and I am making a knife cut. In one of the steps, can we have the x-ray also shown, please? Yeah, we'll show you the x-rays in a little while. The knife is not cutting. So while I am making this incision, you can show the x-rays also. Yes, we can see the x-rays. So, so I have made an anterior incision. I've just divided the deep fascia. Can you see this? Yes, sir. The Clean. other knee has been done around 12 years ago. <laughs> sir, what was the magic uh, solution that you just injected into the knee? I've just put a little bit of saline adrenaline to develop this plane a little more. And now I'm just peeling off the medial tissues a bit. So now we are going to extend the knee. So there are zoom out the cameras. Table up, please. We are going to use these skin hooks. Artery, please. Okay. Can this be seen? Yes, sir. Table a touch up, please. So this is the vastus medialis. So I'm just separating the vastus medialis from the fascia. And now my finger is underneath the quads. So I'm feeling where the patella is and I'm just going a little medial to that. There will be some bleeding because there is no tunicate. 
but I am happy with that. So now this retractor retracts the whole muscle and I am on the supra patella pouch. My finger is underneath the patella and I am dividing the supra patella pouch. So now the whole quadriceps is retracted. Is the knife cut? Knife is not cutting only. So the basic kind of dissection is done right now. What is uh, this cautery, please? Forceps and knife. So I'm going to divide the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and take these tissues as one layer. So the other camera can it just show, yeah. It's important to elevate this sleeve distal to proximal as much as possible. There was a question asked to me what I do in a uni. So in a uni, I would stop here. But when I'm doing a total, I just elevate this a touch more. I put this retractor, the limb goes in a figure of four, zoom out and show the position of the limb. And I would just release this. So this is kind of my basic release before I do anything. So now you can see the opening of the joint. Under the cow, Yeah. Yes, so the release is done. The knee goes into a touch of recurvatum. So I'm going to undercut the distal femur. So this is retracted. One more spike. Forceps and knife, please. Is everything seen? Yes, sir. There are no comments. It's going very smoothly, sir. So I remove this fat pad if required. I don't always remove it. This is a touch of ACL. So I remove, take that off as well. Now the planning... knife is not as sharp as it is generally is. So we are planning to do a CR or a PS knee, sir? Uh, the plan is always CR. Yes, sir. So that's that's an unusual step, sir. Could you elaborate on what 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 this step is that we're doing right now? So we are going to navigate the distal femoral cut. So this is a this is a system which is called as articular surface mounted navigation. So where the navigation pins go through the there a hammer then articular surface, as the name says, articular surface mounted navigation. Right? So, show this screen if possible. So, there are femoral trackers, there is a tibia tracker and there is a pointer. So, it is asking us to confirm we are on the left side, so that's good. The hip is in <coughs> flexion. So now I have to get the hip center. So 
the hip center is there then i get the knee center then i get the ap axis then i map the medial condyle then i map the lateral condyle table a touch down please la bhai zara bahut zyada khul ke diya hai so then there is a bit of an approximation you are supposed to cut 9 of the distal femur of the lateral side so we are cutting 9 or 10 so uh, i mean the standard instrumentation would have asked you to cut 9 but i am going to undercut here so i decide that with the feel of the knee i want to put it in neutral and i want to cut less yeah yes so it tells me the depth it tells me the flex uh, slope the flexion so you have kept it in neutral and you have under resected it and you have kept a flexion of 1 degree What? yeah uh, so the flexion thing sir a lot of people put it 1 degree 3 degree 5 degree what determines the degree of flexion that you want to keep the degree of flexion is it changes does it changes with the feel of the knee or is it a fixed parameter that you have no that is a fixed parameter depending upon the uh, implant that you use okay ye nikal do usko nikalne do screw driver dena jana mere ko one thing different is that we don't get sizes here pattern for the fever compared to the uh, robotics uh, no we don't get sizes things which are most important the depth of the resection the varus valgus and the flexion extension yeah That's all been done yeah varus kitna 00 table a touch down So, so was the deformity a uh, correctable uh, or was it a fixed varus I think when I did my uh, initial preliminary release I showed you that the deformity is correctable after that Yeah sure sir thanks ye ye nikal ye nikal kind of my use of technology is done now i have got what i wanted chotu regular spike table a touch down please table down please and now i take this cut so this navigation is neutral to the vice of implant sorry what are what are you saying 
So this this system is neutral to the choice of implant you make. You can use yeah. You can make use any. So I can use whatever I want. Lateral kitna? Does it help with the rotation as well? Uh, I think there is provision that I can rotate, but I don't use uh, navigation after this. So what I do after this is zoom out this upper camera. Zoom out the upper camera, get it in the center. So I see that I have got a reasonable gap. So I'm not going to be tight. Can you all see that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So now I have the option of either cutting the proximal tibia, but more often than not, I actually finish off the femur. One more spiky. Stable up, please. So when would you also do tibia uh, before you finish off these cuts, just for the benefit of all the audience? I mean, I could do the tibia here, but finishing off the femur is a little easier. We always cross-check with this extra medullary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is table up, please. So this is a size C. Yeah? Yes, sir. So size C per se looks good, but we can also see a size D. So that looks a touch big to me. Table up, please. So, so you wouldn't, well you, 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 you don't prefer to use a sizer, you just um, uh, prefer to use uh, the block itself, the, the, the trial yeah, itself. I, I prefer to use the block itself. Take mark, your pin mark. Yes, sir. Okay. How did you determine your rotation now? I mean, you manually decided on that? So, uh, I can see the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle, the way you would use robotics to do it. <laughs> and the way robotics would tell you. I can see the rotation, <coughs> the, way, the way robotics would. So I have put this AP cutting jig. Does the tightness of gap medially would also uh, change your orientation just the way we do in robotics? So if the medial side was tight, would you dial in a couple of degree of rotation because... Why Bob, just, just one minute, let me take this cut. Sorry, what are you saying? No. I would, if required, do a little release. Table a touch down, please.
So any questions from audience there? Yeah. So the posterior cruciate ligament is still there. Actually, the stump of that ACL is also still there. Knife, please. So at this time, I will again put the limb in a figure of four. If there is anything really tight, I will release a little bit forceps and knife so that I get good. Sir, would it be possible to know the thickness of the posterior uh, sort of uh, resections uh, measured by a caliper? The posterior cut is 10 and a half and 11. So we've removed the lateral meniscus. Upar ka dikta hai and knife. Chhoto spike. Piche ka bhi dena. Forceps and knife. We've got a good view of the proximal tibia. So where Can does you your posterior it? spike go uh, in relation to your posterior PCL? Posterior spike is behind the PCL. Forceps and knife. This goes in front of the PCL. Now, once the retractors are in place, I'll get the leg in the position that I want. Well, it was simple pin like. Possups and knife, please. So we like reasonably good exposure. So your osteotome is protecting the PCL. Broad osteotome, please. Knife, please. Nibblers, please. Knife. 
knife please Focus, please. Knife, please. The gap jada ho gaya yaar. Tera gyara dikha mere ko. ये निकाल दो तो इन एक्सटेंशन एंड इन फ्लेक्शन ये स्टिल अ लिटिल लैक्स बट आई हैव नॉट डिसाइडेड ऑन द फाइनल इंसर्ट But per se things are okay. Somebody on the bell. Got two spikes. Dilan, if you have a flexion extension inequality at this stage, how will you manage that? See if my flexion is tight, I will release the PCL. If my extension appears to be tight, I'll have a very very close watch on the posterior osteophytes, and I will release the posterior capsule and remove the osteophytes from there. They are not normally removed. Sorry. Normally they are not removed. No, normally also they would be removed. But if I find that it is tight, I will be much more uh, watchful. Normally, also they will be removed. You are absolutely right. So we are a center. Kar jara. Yep. so this is the other thing that if the extension is a little tight whatever is beyond the tibial margin is not really required and this was a relatively lax knee table up please focus please सो एट दिस स्टेज जरा नीचे का पीछे से दिखा जरा इधर कैन यू सी दिस यस यू आर ट्राइंग टू फील फॉर द पोस्टर ऑस्ट्रोफाइट ये दिखाओ जरा ये दिख रहा है आर्ट्री प्लीज नहीं नहीं ये इधर का दिखा ये कैमरा से दिखाओ ये कैमरा से अंदर दिखाओ जरा ये हरीश वो सिंह थोड़ा और अंदर दिखा जरा टेबल अप प्लीज एंड अ लिटिल हेड लो हेड लो करो जरा सो दिस इज द पोस्टीरियर कॉन्डाइल एंड देर इज अ लिटिल कॉटिकल रिम यर कैन यू सी दिस वी कैन सी या So if that cortical rim is there, that means there's a little osteophyte there.
nibblers, please. So you must be able to feel the posterior recess. So my finger is going at the back of the femur. Yeah? Yes, sir. Similarly, on this side, on the lateral side also, even in varus knees, sometimes you find that there are osteophytes and all that. Artery, please. This is the popliteus. Can you see the popliteus? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes in varus knees, this is still tight. If it is tight, I would release it. And I am actually feeling beyond the condyle. Oh, Lele, your implant Lele. There is nothing there. Now, resurfacing the patella in the subvastus approach is thought to be difficult. I have not really resurfaced on the other side. So, I may not resurface it here also, but I will just show you what I do. So, I put this retractor. Table down, please. And I get this exposure of the patella. Can you all see it? Yes, sir. Very well. So, we so just. Would it, would, uh, I mean, would it be more difficult if you're using an implant like an attuned implant where you've got to have the sort of uh, implant in and then sort of avert the patella. Right now we don't have the implants in um, and we can do it without um, the trials. Say that again, please. So if we have the trials in, would it still be as easy to avert the patella? Um, as, no. as no, 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 no. Absolutely not. So this patella for... evasion is easy because the femur and tibia both are cut, the quads is relaxed. So if you fill it up, it's not as easy, but it can still be done. Sure, sir. Thank you. Hello. Start mixing, huh? So you drilled the patella with a small uh, wire. What was that step, sir? I have just kind of decompressed it a little bit. So I want you all to be reminded that there is no tunique. I have not used the diathermy as well. I have not actually cauterized anything. But your field is fantastic. Very good field. Even without tunique, without using, you know, cautery. So probably good hypertensive anesthesia. No, no, I, we, we don't ask the anesthetist to give hypotensive anesthesia. Because in case something goes wrong, they will tell us that you asked us to do this. <laughs> what is the BP now? So you don't have to ask, we have to ask. Cementing dekhna hai to dekh le, nahi karne ka to karo. Ki do minute lagega aur. Table down, please. Table down, please. So you are putting in the trials now or directly cementing? No, I am putting the final components. Okay. I think this is a particularly bloodless field. Huh? You don't always get this.
Which system are you using? This is Apnawala Max. Freedom. Yara. Table up, please. Fresh mop, please. Artery. Correct the head low, please. Make it neutral and a table up. Are there any questions? So if you're happy with the balancing, can we proceed with the next session? Yeah. Uh, yeah, unless there are any questions. Dr. Nilay, one question. Uh, you said that if there was a problem in rotation and you had a you know flexion extension mismatch in terms of the medial being tight, you would do more release. So what release would you do if you found that your medial a space was tighter in flexion only. Uh, Can you load the panel? One display? is I would release the posterior medial capsule and I could also do pie crusting of the MCL. So if I did posterior fibers of the MCL, I will get a little more release in extension. And if I release the anterior fibers pie crusting, I would get a little more flexion. So Please. would so would you then say that there's always a little bit uh, room for uh, error there because you've done a freehand rotation here? Uh, see the I feel that the femoral rotation, if you just hang on for a minute, you will see that the patella is tracking absolutely beautifully, and the gaps also are going to be all right. So I haven't really paid any price for doing this. Oh. Uh, in a large number of cases. And whether it is freehand or it is not freehand, if you put it parallel to the epicondylar axis, I feel your rotation is correct. And I put it parallel to the epicondylar axis. So we are actually now giving a wash with a little bit of warm saline so that the cement sets a little earlier. Uh, sir, can we proceed with the next session now? Sure, please do. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have been asked to sort of fast track the panel discussion at bullet train speed. Can you load that panel again? Hey, laptop kidder again.
ओके सो वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट ऑफ वेयर वी लेफ्ट सो मुदी एनी पर्टिकुलर रिमार्क्स अबाउट ड्रेपिंग um i i i mean honestly enough i don't think it really makes a difference we use disposable drapes for every case okay. but i do you use ioban we use ioban for every case yes okay. and do you re you recommend that for every patient i mean right? i would recommend that um i mean i i think it's 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 one it's one more barrier i think what we as surgeons are sincerely concerned about is is infection so i think it's 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 a useful tool why not use it yeah Dr. Monty, would you change the skin knife after the skin incision? Always, <clears throat> always we change the skin knife and we change the gloves as you have correctly mentioned after the draping. Right. Yeah. And draping is always three layers: hmm. foundation draping, then isolate the leg, then the final, you know, draping. Okay. Any particular tips about suction and cautery? You know, suction sucks everything, including organisms from the air. Yeah. So one should minimize the suction as far as possible. Switch so off the machine when not in use. Switch off the machine when not in use. And when I do bilaterals, I change the suction tip. You know, always on the during the second. This is a bad practice. Yeah, I think I would like to add something about the cautery because you know, hmm. um, when you're using disposable drapes, and if you just use the cautery and you just put it down on the drape. you'll often find a hole in the drape oh, yeah, that is made yeah. and you'll find that blue sticking thing on 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 the cautery that's 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 a warning sign i think people need to understand that you got to let the cautery cool down before you actually put it on a disposable drape because it makes a hole into the drape and then you can end up with an unsterile um, so also ot lights i mean one would uh, it stands to reason that we should not take our gloved hands away from the operative field to adjust the ot lights have someone else uh, do it for you uh jesh quickly do you use the cm does it increase the infection rate in any way uh, don't use the cm unless we are uh, using extended stem for uh, complex case do you ever get the x ray machine into the ot uh, never if the cm is there okay tourniquet is not relevant here uv, UV light is no longer used cheetal forceps or cheater forceps are again not recommended minimize the use of mobile phones and tablet because we don't really clean these things uh gloves dr bohanti uh, just one minute on the use of gloves how frequently you do you change them when when you want to when when do you change them i use double gloves in routine cases and use triple gloves in case of uh, hiv positive hepatitis b positive cases and uh, once there is a puncture in the gloves so ideally that should be you know powderless gloves inside and then white gloves you know outside so that uh, if there is slightest puncture then you realize immediately that uh, there is a change in the a color. different color helps and before cementing new pair of gloves and uh, that's all yeah murit is drain relevant to the incidence of infection i haven't used a drain for years now i think about 8 8 10 years so i don't think it is by any means yeah, yeah. leaving a drain too long might be but jesh when do you remove the foley's catheter uh next day morning if the patient is asked pass you it's no point in keeping an indwelling uh, foley's catheter pulse lavage is a go very good idea with uh, plenty of saline and we don't usually add acetic acid or uh, hydrogen peroxide to it this is no brainer brainer mm, we should not convert the ot into a sort of a studio uh we can take photos and videos as required non orthopedic cases no longer recommended post op dressing is a matter of personal choice so let's come to antibiotic pro uh, prophylaxis we have our infectious disease special, uh, specialist here madam uh, what would you recommend for a routine primary total hip replacement or a total knee replacement and uh, which when and how long so we are trying to cover the skin uh, skin germs and usually these are gram positive organisms so the idea is to uh, prevent from uh, st staphylococcus streptococcus and the other gram positives on the skin including coagulase negative staph so the drug of choice is cefurox and we for second generation cephalosporin now we also have to screen our patients for uh, mrsa because there may be a proportion of patients in the community who may be mrsa carriers and these are the patients who require additional mrsa cover with vancomycin 
So it is uh, universally cefuroxam. You screen your patients if they are positive, decolonize them. Since it's an elective procedure, you can do the screening at outpatient basis. Decolonize them by using chlorhexidine scrub baths and mupirocin ointment. Uh, and during the surgery, they require one additional dose of vancomycin apart from cefuroxam to ensure that you are covered for MRSA. What about omicacin? So routinely, the gram negatives are really not indicated. There may be certain group of high-risk patients where are the certain recommendations, but routinely, the universal drug of choice is cefuroxime or cefazolin, yeah. and plus or minus vancomycin, depending upon whether your patient is uh, 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 you know, MRSA carrier. Yeah. Another point is the timing of the antibiotic administration. Dr. Mohanty, any point, uh, pointers about that? So if it is routine antibiotics like cephalosporins, half an hour before the skin incision, Ideal is that while the anesthetist you know, puts the IV line in there, he should give the prophylactic antibiotics. But if it is vancomycin for MRI or anything, then it should be given at least two hours before because it takes longer time to give vancomycin and there are reactions involved also. Uh, how many doses post-op, Mudit? Uh, two post-op doses uh, or three, I mean three doses in total. The last dose is the next day morning typically for us. So third and fourth dose is a bit of an overkill, you would say? Um, I mean, we've been sticking to the guidelines and, and and obviously as you start practice and you start doing it, you want to over sort of do those antibiotics, but I don't think it really makes a difference as long as you've got good uh, hygiene within the OT. Okay, so thank you. I thank the esteemed panel. The take home message is that we, sh we have to create protocols for infection prophylaxis. Do not deviate from the protocols. They are there for a reason. Pay attention to minute details and use antibiotics very judiciously. So that's why, that's when we can call our theater a germ-free zone. Thank you. Any, any questions or comments from the audience? I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful, uh, debatable question. I think uh, for us, it's uh, the, the guidelines do recommend that you give sort of uh, three doses. I mean, we, we were giving it for a week at times, you know, uh, so, so leave that aside. Uh, but is there a new guideline to say a single shot preoperatively and then no more antibiotics? Do we follow that? Is, uh, not... Yeah, yeah, I'm just asking the, uh, you know, distinguished. Madam, what about the role of tycoplanin? Okay, so uh, the guidelines recommend it as a single dose therapy only for most antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, in certain conditions like in cardiac surgeries, neurosurgeries and orthopedic, there is a flexibility given for up to three doses. So one uh, dose an hour prior to the incision time, 30 minutes to an hour prior and the two doses post-op. So, but in orthopedic, there are a lot of papers which also say that an extended antibiotic prophylaxis is a, there are uh, instances of reduced infection rate. So there are few, uh, there are a lot of case reports, case series which say that uh, extended uh, antibiotic. Extended, you mean oral, oral coverage? No, after no, not that? oral coverage, just additional, these additional doses definitely bring down the risk of infection. But guidelines recommend it as a single dose or max three doses. All right, yeah. Dr. Bhendi, sir. I just want to ask one question. When you give pre-op single dose antibiotic, why are we giving it? We are giving it so that there is a airborne contamination which may happen on the operation field. That's why we give second if the surgery is very long, right? Do we presume that one single dose of antibiotic is going to kill all the airborne contamination which is going to happen? So the antibiotic prophylaxis in surgery is to prevent the skin germs from going inside when you take the skin incision. So that is the idea of using first or second generation cephalosporins because we are trying to cover the skin flora, which is basically staph aureus. So these are the germs. So the, you need adequate blood levels when we put the incision. When we breach the skin barrier, we need adequate no, no, no. antibiotics. I, I'm not debating the source of germs. Hmm. It could be from the skin, it could be from the airborne contamination of the operation field or instrument which is laid down, which you are going to use. Uh, we use laminar flow, etc. for that. I am debating question. Do you presume that one single dose of antibiotic will eliminate all the contaminating organisms? Or do we need to follow it up? Because my logic to my, you know, when I treat an infection, infection, we give antibiotic for X number of days okay, so this because is one single dose even though antibiotic sensitive 
will not kill all the bacteria. So this is prophylaxis, that is there is no infection to begin with. It's an absolutely sterile field that you're going inside and placing a, a device implant. So at that time, we do not want the skin germs to go inside. No, I think what Dr. Harish uh, sir was asking was that why do we, if the surgery goes longer than four hours, why do we, why, why do we repeat the antibiotic if, if you're only looking at the skin? The antibiotic half-life and till the time the skin breaches open, you are anticipating the germs to go inside and colonize your sterile field. Yeah, yeah. thank so you. Uh, sir, I would like to one comment. I'm Dr. Anikit Patli from uh, Pune. So we are, since two years we are following this protocol, as Madam says, we are giving two grams of uh, cefazuline half an hour prior to the surgery and all THR and TKR patients. As per the weight, we calculate up, uh, up till uh, age uh, weight uh, 80, we give two grams. Uh, 80 to 120 kilograms, we will go for 3 grams and after that 4 grams. And after 4 hours, we give, uh, as ma'am told, ki, another dose can be given after 4 hours of the uh, first dose. So, uh, uh, last 2 years, we ha haven't found any infection in our all uh, hip replacement, replacement cases. Good. good. End and of 24 now? to 48 hours, we ex expect epithelization and sealing of the skin wounds. So, then there is no concept of extending the same prophylaxis unless you've got a new infection. And the, then the Choice of antibiotic again changes. Yeah, so we so don't give any post-operative antibiotics, only single dose pre-op and now we finish it. And now we are following that, we are now JC accredited also, Joint Commission International. But 1.5 gram is the recommended dose of cefazolin. Why you give 2 grams? Cefazolin has... Unless the weight is more than 80 kg, then you can give 2 grams. Cefazolin is 1.5 grams. Pre-op. Post-phase dosing, we can go up to that, we especially... Guideline, the there's this 2 no, grams. Obese patients you can give, but uh, in normal... You know, 60 kilos, you can give uh, 1.5 grams recommended dose. So and as per the infection control, they have given the T categories up till 90, 90 to 120, more than 120. Okay. I'll request Dr. Sanjay Londe to come for the next panel discussion. Thank you, panel. Mm -hmm. Dr. Londe? Yeah, so since we are running short of time, uh, we are starting with a panel discussion that is the uh, uh, Levinick zone and its current relevance. Uh, I would like to request, uh, invite Dr. Michael Sosim. Uh, your, oh, okay, so, yeah, Professor, yeah. I'm just looking here, sorry. For, uh, for the panelists, uh, Dr. Gaurish Palikar is not here. Uh, Bosley, sir, please come. Behinde, sir, can you please uh, join as a panelist here? And uh, Michael, uh, may I request you to please join as a panelist, if you don't mind. Yeah. I think uh, we'll be very short. Uh, uh, we are already running behind the times. Uh, long back uh, in JBJS, uh, Levinek described the safe zones and uh, we wish that our hips don't dislocate, but they do dislocate. Means if you if you operate enough uh, enough of them, then you will have those complications. So what was the original paper? Uh, this is the original paper from Levinek, uh, JBJS, 1978. Dislocations after total hip arthroplasty, series of 300 cases. Nine of them had dislocated, 3%. The take home message is uh, the people, uh, they, they had a hypothetical value of 40 degrees of inclination, plus or minus 10 and 15 degrees of antiversion plus or minus of 10. So outside this safe zone, the dislocation rate was 6.1%, whereas within the safe zone, the dislocation rate was 1.5%. So they postulated that this is sort of a safe zone of an acetabular cup, especially with the advent of robotic surgery. Nowadays, a lot of uh, emphasis is given on putting the femoral implant properly, putting the acetabular cup properly. And they also sort of acknowledge that the, the other factors which included were time after surgery, greater risk in the first 30 days. And obviously any patient who had a previous surgery to that hip uh, is a more sort of uh, at risk of developing a post-THR dislocation. So I think all of us, uh, we know how to calculate the uh, inclination as well as virgin. Uh, so I want to ask the panelists, I think, uh, uh, very quick answers. Uh, how many of you still follow the safe zone concept of Levinick? Professor Vosle, then Dr. Bende, and international uh, faculty. I think it's, it's a, a basic, basic thing to understand the inclination. Now it's a two-dimensional. Now we are into three-dimensional, and there are many issues about 
spino pelvic uh, so that needs to be added to that so it is not completely gone but understanding has improved and uh, we know how to use it so in selected patient when there is a spine problem they are so we have to see take the x rays and plan spino pelvic alignment and adjust the cup uh, placement that's very important so pre operative planning is very important and you can take those minimum standing and sitting x ray to see the pelvic tilt correct so it's a basic framework it's not like a bible as you said there are a lot of other factors which have been so it is not false or it is not gone but it has given a base on which further things to be added any it is two dimensional now it is three dimensional correct. any any other other panelists would I like to add on that uh, i would call it target zone i wouldn't call it safe zone because they still dislocate and we've seen that and it's all about offset leg lengthening it's the approaches so i rather like the term target zone and as that i still use that Dr. Ben, I think the concept of having a zone in which your acetabulum placement is safe is quite right. The numbers given by Levinick are not necessarily correct because those numbers will change based on the dynamic position of your pelvis. And so we have to consider now as we understand the position of spine to pelvis, the position of pelvis in standing and sitting, is the position fixed in standing or sitting. So those dynamics we need to understand and maybe utilize in most of the cases, I mean, if there is a spinopelic problem. So, so the concept is right, the numbers could be different. So it's individualized, personalized or individualized for that particular gentleman. Uh, is that correct? I would agree the same. I would use it as an orientation. It's not a, a law that you have to follow these numbers. And especially nowadays with the pathology, you really have to address the patient with, as a whole and then uh, accept these numbers as a good orientation to follow your case. So I think. Uh, what you have said is absolutely correct. A very good paper from Matthew Abdel in CORR uh, with Mark Pagnano and Arlen Hansen. What safe zone? The vast majority of dislocated THRs are within the Levinex safe zone for acetabular component position. Very good paper in clinics uh, CORR. Uh, they studied almost a cohort of 9,784 hips. 2% of them dislocated, 2,006 THAs. And the vast majority, this is really alarming, and that, that goes very well with what you have said. 58% of the dislocated THS had a socket placed within the, uh, within the safe zone. So it's not a gospel truth for every patient. Uh, and their conclusion was uh, the stability is multifactorial. The ideal cup position for some patients may lie outside the Levinex safe zone, and more advanced analysis is required. As Professor Bosle has said, uh, uh, the relationship between the spine and the pelvis is also very important. Your cup may be in the safe zone, but still you will dislocate. So preoperative assessment, as Dr. Bhende said, is very, very important. And you have to individualize the, 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 the this target zone, but it may not be the safe zone. So I think more or less the panelists agree with that philosophy of Matthew Abdel or any, any, uh, any deviation. Uh, one more comment I want to make. A lot of patients are getting spine operated, they are plating. So this spinopelvic is very important and this basic in some cases you must look into it and not just go for THR. And many patients surgery is done and spine surgery is required. So they must have a good uh, association and see that the hip is uh, stable, you know, at the end of spine surgery. Yeah, ankylosed spines. Yeah. So what do you do? You put it more in antiversion? Uh, yeah, so that's a very important question. So basic thing is for all of us, uh, when you stand and when you sit, there's a 20 degree of pelvic inclination. So actually when you sit, there's only 90 degree of hip flexion, but actually, actually 70 degree of and 20 degree of comp by his pelvis. So 90 is 70 hip and 20 of pelvic tilt. So that tilt changes the version. So it is about uh, 20 degree of acetabular version it change, uh, anti-version or uh, uh, that is most important with the pelvis. So when the pelvis is flex, the anti-version increases to prevent dislocation in natural hip. So some patients, this pelvic tilt does not occur. So we call a stuck 
standing or stuck sitting stuck standing means the pelvis does not come back when you are standing there is a 11 degree inclination of the pelvis when you are sitting the pelvis goes back backward tilt so there is a 20 degree movement and which sometimes in stiff cases does not occur pre operatively and that's why you have to adjust the version so another interesting point uh, which showed that uh, the second bullet point the acetabular components perform through a posterior approach uh, odds ratio and confidence interval had an increased risk of dislocation compared to those performed through the anterolateral approach very controversial statement i know dr bhende does, always does with posterior approach uh, i don't know about yeah. the international faculty do you still believe that the posterior approach is more prone for a post tha dislocation or it depends on your operative technique i think the the people who use the posterior approach will say it's as safe as the other approaches because their rate of dislocation and the data shows is not explicit higher but if you take it in the whole picture the, the the posterior approach with the least has a higher risk of dislocation uh anti approach is really true intermuscular approach so that is a natural approach but in difficult cases it is difficult and posterior approach yes i agree there is a more incident more papers but at the same time when you close the soft tissues completely then the incidence is almost as good as anterior approach uh we generalize things a lot in a book by tronzo on the hip he has described 13 different in inverted commas posterior approaches now these are various ways we can approach the hip through different po portals of the muscles and to these 13 maybe few more must have been added as a mini posterior approach or super path uh, approach etc the point is if you repair the approach very well and you can do it very well in a if you go by posterior approach with a proper anchoring to the bone by bone anchoring switches you are restoring back the anatomy very well so i don't think the approach should matter what matter more is which way your acetabulum is inclined and antiverted or retroverted which way your uh, you know the stem is verted and exactly how much laxity you are left in the hip at the end of your surgery those three things are much more important than actual approach if you repair the approach very well can i ask you one thing if i go with a posterior approach i need to be very very clear yeah yeah well it is multifactorial and if we detach the external rotators or the abductors we have to reattach them so if you don't then there's no reattaching it's all there and that's why i think the dislocation rate is less in those cases there's no risk it doesn't heal so is the anterolateral approach little more forgiving if you don't get the in, uh, the the version of the cup right or it is not really so i think the the hip the surgery on the hip is successful because the hip is a forgiving joint and if you don't have everything 100% correct it will forgive you some of that but i don't think that the approach is more forgiving than the others i just think if you don't detach you don't have to reattach and that uh, lowers your dislocation rate but you still need to get everything right i think what you do routinely is most important because you can orient better with your routine approaches so don't get deflected both approaches you can do ideal things so this is modern concept i think uh, the next two three papers are completely in agreement with what you said uh, gone are the concept of safe zone maybe we can call it as a target zone as professor michael has said and now has come the concept of functional zone again a very landmark paper by larry dor from california journal of arthroplasty the conclusion of that paper is to concept of functional zone for acetabular cup placement it is patient specific so again i think the robotic people may maybe maybe uh, maybe laughing you know at that particular paper though it, it it is supposed to be allowing you to put the cup in the right position so it is patient specific safe zone to avoid instability or impingement and it is dependent on various patient specific factors as professor bhosle has said now the concept has come of uh, the combined sagittal index it 
सॉरी टू डिस्टर्ब यू आई थिंक द केस इज रेडी बिकॉज दिस इज क्वाइट अ कॉम्प्लेक्स सो वी कैन हैव चैट आफ्टर वर्ड a sincere request to all the moderators i have been instructed to say that we are behind time so everybody has to finish their talks before time a minute less than what has been assigned two minutes i'm not speaking can you hear us can you hear us nilen can you hear us audio visual team please have a look now what's happening why can't they hear yeah us? we can we can hear the we can see the screen you have shown the can you hear me, can you hear me uh, Pradeep, 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 Pradeep? can you hear us yes i can hear you okay right okay great yeah. so hello from the or so we have um, uh, dr baiba is with me uh, great to operate here with the uh, dr baiba who also uses the kori there dr kalai vanan who is my colleague from chennai and we have a great team here okay so um regarding the the core and the things uh, i think we're all now familiar with knee um, uh, robotics and uh, navigation uh, but hip is uh, sort of new to india so we'll go through a little slowly and uh, we have been using the core uh, for about two months now so we are also learning so um, i think very small uh, tips from uh, everyone will be very helpful and i hope to learn today uh, some tips from dr baibok vijay can you see the pre op X-ray before so, we begin. Uh, you can see that this is a standard posterior uh, positioning, lateral decubitus position. You can see that. So we always keep uh, so the X-ray, uh, X-ray uh, support in the anterior superior, the superior ASIS. I think that's very important. And I want my pelvis to be really rock solid. So there is another sacral support here. There is also a, a, a support along the lumbar spine, and we have a board along the lumbar spine. That is your functional pelvic plane. Okay. So it's all great to have computers. but you must understand what the computer is doing so we have a functional pelvic plane the patient is kept against this lumbar spine is kept against the board that's your functional pelvic plane that we got now now we are refining things in thr as we go along so now we are doing much more refined and we are giving values to whatever we are doing so that's the positioning okay so the first thing to put is the put the array on the pelvis so uh, the anterior superior iliac spine is here now we learned in undergraduate days that you find the anterior superior iliac spine by coming along the inguinal ligament so you guys do that every time because we don't want to give wrong uh, uh, input into the computer so along the uh, inguinal and that's why asis this is the anterior part of the iliac crest so you keep two fingers on either side of the iliac crest and give me the 11 blade please right so 11 blade stab mark so that we don't actually uh, close this incisions we just put some seri tape on finally when you finish So I'm palpating the iliac crest there. Okay, and an artery for us, please. Yeah, open that, can I please? Uh, so give me the. And a very useful tip that I learned for this uh, pin placement is that give me the pin in my hand, please, and a mallet. So instead of just driving it, you'll get uh, exactly into in between the cortices. If you're able to palpate, uh, can you can the camera see that? So I'm palpating the posterior and the anterior bar, and then I'm with my hand, and then I'm going to the center of that. Okay. and i'm going to mallet this in initially that this has to be really rigid rigid as you know otherwise you know the whole thing is going to fall apart and then uh, what, what is the diameter of the pin diameter of the pin diameter of the pin is 3 mm okay very small pin so now i know that i'm inside then we we drive it with power You want to call it, please. Call it. We should call it. Go. Call. 
Okay, that's solid. So we're given one pin in. Then you have to put the clamp, make sure that the other one is coming. And then we make a mark on the skin with that, like that. So that's that the other, then you make a nice, uh, nice piece now. So I'm palpating the eyelid crest with my knife. Artery, please, next. Okay. Okay. Again, same Picture. technique. Picture. I'm going to palpate the anterior and the posterior cortex and make sure that I'm exactly Picture. the center of that. Mallet again. Once it's stable, then 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 that's the point that I drive it in. It's not stable. So you got to make sure that it's really stable. The skin is a little off, I think. Give me a skin. Skin. Can nice you see the larger screen here on the operative field? Yes. And this smaller one with the uh, robotic screen. Mallet piece. Mallet. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Now the thing, please. Wood is a bit tough or bare. It's not rotating. Give me a give me on a yeah. Yeah, it's getting warm here. And it's not rotating at all. Take it off. Uh, Vijay. This one, the cage. This is solid. Oh, but this is solid. This is okay. He's not gone in fully. You want to drive in? Hmm? No, no, but it is uh, all the thread, thread portion has to go in. Yeah, that's solid. That's fine. Great. It's okay. You want to change that? Yeah, probably the same. We'll change it. So the same. Okay, Malik, please. Uh, flip that over again. No. <laughs> Move it first. Where is the adapter for this? Wait. Give me a skin knife, please. Give me the pin in my hand. Yeah, that's good. My leg in my hand. Pin in my pin hand. Too, sir. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, good. Solid. Okay.
That's great. Stop. Stop. Okay. Get us the uh, this thing, please, quickly. So now we can move the whole patient with the two pins, and that's very important that you get that right. So the the other point is you want to keep this uh, away from the field. The knob has to be away from the field, and that's very important as well. The other, the other thing. Yeah. Turn that. That, 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 that. That's correct. Yeah. So we are making sure that the uh, uh, the, the camera is seeing the pelvic array. Are you, are you guys able to see the uh, computer monitor as well? Switch to, the, switch to the computer monitor, please. Cameraman, please switch to the computer monitor. Uh, who is there? Uh, I, uh, Pradeep, can you see us? Uh, the computer monitor as well? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you can see that the uh, P is the pelvic array, the blue, that means the computer is seeing very well the, our pelvic array. So we tighten everything out and we have to uh, keep the same. We can, we can clip off the array if we want. But the the, um, the orientation must spatial orientation must always be maintained. So you want to tighten everything really, really tightly before you move on. Okay. So that's the pelvic area that's fixed. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. Now we're ready to go for the. Uh, may I put the uh, this one, please? We'll open and put. Okay. So this one has got a non-pin array for the uh, for the FEMA. Uh, so so we allow to put the tracker for the. So the idea of the tracker is it's not going to give you limb length and anything like that. Zoom out, please. Uh, camera zoom out, top camera. So it's, it's going to give level. you the position of the leg when you have when at the time at the time of uh, pre dislocation and trial reduction. So that's what it's going to do. And you can see this array here. So that's going to be uh, fixed onto the leg. Now the important point here is the leg must be kept kind of neutral so that you can reproduce that. Very important. Small, small things are there. Uh, and then you must make sure that the, the computer is picking up your array before you fix it. Very important, yeah. You want to keep it. Uh, yeah, okay. Can you see that, guys? So the F is uh, blue. And that's very important that you ensure it's blue before you tape it with the uh, serried drape. If you don't do that, then you find that your computer never picks up your femoral array. Second one. We'll put this, uh, what do you call that? The Blue stickies. Uh, the cling film. Cling, 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 cling film on this, please. Can you have some cling film? So it's important this array, is because it doesn't have a pin on the bone, it's important that it's really fixed rigidly. And typically, we'll use cling film on that. So the array is a little more anterior than posterior, so that you can find that the, the computer is picking up this array. So you can see that the cling film is going on now. So let me, um, so I, I love this, uh, Corey, because uh, uh, this is the, how we now do the 3D balancing of the hip. Now, um, uh, you might have, uh, those of you who have followed our work, they have published the 3D balancing. So, uh, trying to re trying to recreate, uh, you know, uh, horizontal offset, vertical offset from the two-dimensional X-ray, as you know, it is okay, but we need to move on. Just like how you know we have moved on to uh, you know alternate alignments, and we are not sticking to mechanical alignment TKR. In a THR, the usual creation of anatomy was the old concept from Insal Ranavat, uh, sorry, not Insal Ranavat, uh, from Ranavat and uh, and um, Chan Lee. But now we are moving on to more of a functional way of doing it. So we call it as a 3D balance. 
So now you can see that uh, both the arrays are seen. So we're ready to start exposing the hip. Cameraman, kindly focus on the wound now, hip. We can do then or, or, or later also we can do. Okay. So uh, we do the registration now. So for this, so the first registration is telling you, can you see the computer screen is asking me to show the ASIS. So I'm going to come along the inguinal ligament and the very first point is your ASIS. Okay, that's my ASIS. So here the registration is done by making a circular movement. And that has picked up the ASIS. Okay, there's no foot pedal here. And then we have kept a, a, a ECG lead on the L5 before we drape. So I'm going to find the ECG lead with my finger and keep this probe on the on the ECG lead quite close to the sacral support. Now leave, leave it in the vibro and just let you see. Now ah, there it is. There it is. Vibro can see that. That's the point. Yep, yep. Point are not seen, so. Do you mark it with the X-ray or? Yeah. Okay. More vertical. Yeah, I just need to. Except like this only. Vijay, doesn't your posterior post comes in a way in identifying this point? Well, one second, I just come in a second. Yeah. So now we have, we have showed the computer the L5 mark as well. So it now tells you where the, uh, the, the spinal alignment, the posterior pelvic tilt has also been taken into account. And did you see the X-rays? Uh, can the X-rays be shown, please? Have you seen the X-rays? Yeah, exact, uh, that's great, yeah. So in the X-rays, what you see is that you can see there's a mild pelvic obliquity, yeah? So all these have to be taken into consideration, very important. Left, left. You can see the side that we're operating on, the left side is slightly higher, it's the high side hip, okay? So maybe a bit of adduction contracture is there. So that's the hip. And then we also mark the values of lumbar lordosis. So the other X-ray that you see is the lateral decubitus spine film. So this X-ray was taken with a patient in the X-ray room, lying in exactly the same way as he's lying now. And that's so important to, uh, to factor in your, your spinal parameters. So we are calculated the lumbar lateral to be 40, the posterior tilt to be 7 degrees. And what's the other value written there? Posted, so posterior tilt is, is 7 degrees, lumbar lateral is 40. So all this will make a, a, some uh, impact when you're doing the surgery. Okay, so that's where we, that's the basics that we need. We also calculated the neck shaft angle, very important. Neck shaft angle is actually 131 here. Neck shaft angle is, all this is going to make a impact on what we're going to do. Right, good. So we're ready to start the, uh, please. You can take this array off. So we can keep uh, taking the array off and putting it on as required. We usually leave the pelvic array on because it doesn't come in the way, but the femoral array has to go out. So pretty standard post approach. So I'll just keep going uh, quickly with the approach. I won't be spending much time on the approach. And when we come to the uh, 3D balancing, that's where we'll spend our time. Put that, please. Let's tell them this is the foot end. What is that? <laughs> this is the head end, this is the foot end. This is the head end, yeah, yeah. and go that's on. the foot end. Go on, go on, keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing a posterior approach. Okay, deep knife, please. Uh, you must be careful about the arrays. Yeah. No, no, I'm just saying, it's not disturb the arrays. Yeah. So I normally disengage this array at this point to like 
till I completely reach uh, this thing. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, arrays can be taken off and put on as long as the pins are there. That's not a problem at all. Yeah, give me scissors, please. We just save time. We find that you know we don't have to keep doing the arrays. The pelvic array doesn't come in the way usually. Can I record it, please? Okay, ready for the Chanli, please. Be careful, be careful of the array, please. We'll take the array off. We can take it. Chanli, please. It's always posterior approach for you, sir. We saw a great uh, direct interior approach. What's, what's your take? Well, we um, are just telling where we experimented, we experimented with the anterior approach, but we have refined the post approach to such an extent. So, to me, anterior approach looks like a step backward, not a step forward. Because, you know, all these you know, parameters we are taking into account, we are doing, we are really refined the post approach. Now, the anterior approach, just because you are going anteriorly, just putting in the cup blindly where you are. And people say the CM is helpful. The CM is the most crude thing that you can do, use perioperatively. Give me a skin knife, please. So, uh, that's the last thing I want to use perioperatively to know my cup position, etc. That becomes very crude for me. So, we have gone back to the post approach. Sir, has your approach, posterior approach, remained the same over the years? I've seen you operating for the last two decades. Yeah, uh, have you, changed? you know, as, as everything, we keep, um, uh, you know, modifying things as we go along. So, I'm sure we are, as, as all of us, we are, every day is a learning experience and we keep, uh, so what what are the few different things? Yeah, I can, I can keep it that, please. Do you release GMAX always? We just, uh, uh, not the whole GMAX, just start off a little bit. If this patient is a little stiff. And if necessary, I'll release more. I'm happy with that. So any questions on the floor, most welcome to have that. Yeah, Harish, you're asking something. Sorry, I couldn't because I was putting, doing something else at the time. No, when you're identifying the posterior point on the L5, does your posterior post comes in a way? Don't, don't move around there because that's causing the connection to go away. I, I, I cannot really hear you. Give me a moment, please. This is for you, doctor. Hold on, let me pull my skin. So yeah. you can see the piriformis and the, the medius and all that very well. Don't, don't pull too much. That's fine. So I don't have the camera fix it up. Okay. This is a pretty standard uh, post approach. Yeah. Doing all camera things. can view yeah. from the other side. We have lost the feed. So this is the neck capsule preserving approach which we do routinely for primary cases. So we'll take it in two layers. We'll take the capsule separately so that we can suture the capsule back. That again, I think is a good idea because again, we want to, you know, it's all about 3D balancing now. You always take piriforms. Take piriforms off, yes. I think piriform is also comes in the way of your femoral preparation. So we're not very keen on, uh, on, on, on keeping the piriform. Some people will keep. Yes, I know the, the no. entire approach and all that from Exeter, yeah. they do that. Oh, yeah. but, but even the capsule, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that you're dissecting muscles in the capsule. That's right, yeah. Layer. So we're doing it in two separate layers. Mm -hmm. That uh, I'll show you what's the advantage of that in a second, yeah. Hold on to that, please. So, this is a step we call debulking the quadratus. 
We're not taking the entire quadratus off, we're just debulking it. And we'll uh, take the entire quadratus once we dislocate the hip. And these are the operator uh, internal uh, the gamma line. So I'm taking it off. And then I'll see the entire capsule now. Okay, put a section there, please. Yeah, give the section to connect. Okay. Your side. Okay. okay. So now you can see that the entire capsule is in my hand. From 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, we have the capsule in my hand. Okay. Give me a knife, please, deep knife. So the capsule is going to be inside separately. Uh, so that's the capsule incision the, I'm making. Small can be made bigger. I mean, change I the. Coming up. You can change the cameras. The smaller one looks better. To Alice, please. So, Cotsley for your muscles and knife for your that's capsule. True. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And just yeah, zoom, yeah. zoom in. I mean, just any rational, is there a reason why you. Vascular? Uh, you know, it, it's a question of uh, closing capsule to capsule, and that becomes an anatomical repair when you close. When you close capsule to the trochanter, it is not an anatomical capsule and an anatomical repair nicely, and the patient will not have internal rotation because you are closed anatomically. I always compare it to the bank of repair. So, you know, earlier we used to have this putty plat procedure. The putty plat procedure gave uh, good stability to the, the shoulder, but didn't allow any movement. Whereas your bank of repair is what you get both movement as well as stability. So we prefer closing capsule to capsule and it's finished. Okay, that's fine. Right, so we're done here. And you can leave that, that's fine. No stitches, sir. No, no stitches, nothing. Closed. Right, okay. So can I, I'm not able to see this, uh, what's happening there. Huh? Can we have the screen? We have lost the screen. Is it here or there? So, no, uh, we can see it. And this so, Pradeep, I am not going to hear them very well. Can you see? Can you see? Uh, yes, Pradeep? we can see it. Okay. So the two things I want to demonstrate now. The first thing is that uh, the mistake that we've been making all this while is that uh, we have been uh, concentrating on trial reduction and testing for stability. That is a very wrong concept because it detects spurious instability. Now, what is spurious instability? Is that you are doing the trial reduction at the time of actually everything is open. Okay. So now. Now is the time when I open the capsule, I'm going to do my examination. So people call this examination under anesthesia EUA, but EUA is not important. You must do it. Examination after release, EAR. Okay, so I've done the release now. I've taken the poster capsule off. Video call. That's how it's going to be at the time of trial reduction. So I'm trying to reproduce everything. Now it's what I'm seeing, what, how it's going to be. So how's the extension? How mobile is he? Is he tight? Is he, is he thing and all that? And more importantly, I'm going to see how easy is going to dislocate, okay? Now, before dislocation, I'm going to uh, do our, uh, you know, all this, before we had the quarry, we were laying the, we were doing the same thing, but we were using uh, low-cost technology. So, I'm going to do that as well, and we'll see how each one compares to what, okay? So, now I'm going to draw the uh, uh, cautery piece. So, this is the coaxial stitch that we described a long time ago. So I'm drawing the long axis of the femur. Okay. Now the concepts remain the same. So I love the Cori because it, you know, it, it just subscribes to our 3D balancing philosophy. So I'm extending this, uh, this line onto the femur. Exactly the same thing the Cori is doing. And then I'm going to get a, a this thing, please, uh, ethibone. So this is number two ethibone. So I'm going to take a stitch of the two ethibone. Yeah, so I'm giving some gap here. That's very important that you give that gap. And then I'm so this this is our coaxial stitch, which is the basis of our 3D balancing concept. So that is a thread for uh measuring the limb length discrepancy before dislocation and after trial 
So you can see that there is some uh, uh, line here. That line is important because that's how we are going to align your. This is the same thing this femoral array is doing for you. The same thing the computer femoral array is going to do for you. So here I'm going to select the point slightly off the uh, trochanter because for the uh, for the query we need to have a. So I'm putting this. Uh, this is the manual way of doing the same thing. So the most important thing is we're going to put a knot here. Can you see that knot? That makes this system very accurate. Okay, we put a knot here. So this is, this is our 3D balance. So this is pre-dislocation. It's going to be along the axis. Axis is very important. And this is going to, this uh, cross tells me vertical and horizontal axis. Touch with the cord, please. Right, okay, touch with the cord. No, no, this is this one, this one. Instrument, touch the instrument, please. Okay. Some more, some more. Right. Right, okay, that's good. Right. So this is going to be my, uh, this is not the length. This is the composite length. This is the length from the acetabulum and the FEMA. Okay. And it's also, this is the global offset. It's not the individual offsets anymore. It's the composite length of the socket and the FEMA. And that's what this, this I'm measuring now. I'm not, I'm not interested in the individual parameters. Okay. So I'm going to K wire, please. K wire. Is this a K wire. Modified... So instead of putting a screw, uh, we just put a K again. Give me K wire. No K wire. Give me the drill. So typically what we do is with a K wire, we just drill a millimeter or two. And that's where our pointer, that's the most accurate way of doing it. That's it. So, no, 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 no screw. No need for screw. Just give me the pointer. So, we're ready for the. So, uh, instead of putting a screw, you can just use that two millimeter drill bit uh, and that'll tell you the where you are. Was that? Yeah, okay. put the arrays. I'll, I'll put that. You put the down one. I'll put that. So they're doing both the manual method as well as the computer method, same principles. So this line is your array here. The array ensures that the, the limb portion is same at the time of uh, uh, dislocation, pre-dislocation and the time of trial reduction. That's the purpose of this array. And now I made this uh, small k wire mark. There it is. So I know I cannot, it's very accurate mark there. Okay, you ready for that? Yeah, okay. So. That's right. So I've shown that. So the, now the computer knows what is the composite length and the global offset. It doesn't know what is the individual offset. And that is so critical. That's what we're interested in. It doesn't tell me what is the horizontal offset, vertical offset. We are not interested in that at all. Keep this with me, please. So we're ready for dislocation. And the important thing about the dislocation is in many patients, you'll be able to dislocate very easily. The native hip. Very, very easily. I'm sure you all agree to that. Yeah. So this is also easy dislocation. And at the time of a trial reduction, we want to make it tight to dislocate. I can't understand what's the rationale behind that. How can the prosthetic hip be more uh, difficult to dislocate than the native hip? So we have been doing something wrongly all this while. It doesn't make sense at all. Okay. So never try to do trial reduction and, and try to make your hip very stable. That is detecting spurious instability. It is not real instability. Right. Okay. More connection. Give me a pad, please. Pad. Pad, pad. Any other pad? Give me some more. Pad. More, please. So you cut quadratus after dislocation? Yes. Okay. So the, uh, the advantage of cutting the quadratus after dislocation is that you can catch the bleeders very easily. Otherwise, you're struggling into the deep wounds. Now it's right before your eyes. Okay, give us the uh, capsulotomy scissors, please. Scissors. Careful, careful with the array, please. Careful, with, please be careful with the array. Yeah, that's the capsulotomy scissors. Can you explain for what we're doing here so that? Hold on. So you use that to cut the entire anterior the capsule, yes. Okay. And you've gone beneath the quadratus and, and that, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Along the ileus soas. Along the ileus soas. So that's great. So we will do a little bit of anterior capsulotomy later on. But now let us look at the head. So this is an AVN. 
So um, I'm not sure how many of you give me an, uh, an osteostome, please. A curved osteostome or some instrument like that. So they, I've done thousands of uh, avians, and we, what we find is that very typically there is a delamination of the cartilage. And a lot of people, you know, put all sorts of things inside. Uh, uh, that's okay. But I want to understand who will address the cartilage. Assuming you're reconstituting the bone, you're putting, you know, stem cell, the bone comes back. Okay, fair enough. But who is going to address this cartilage? That has always been my opinion, my, my concern. So I've got thousands of x-rays like this, delamination of the cartilage. So even is basically a cartilage disease and trying to reconstitute bone from the other side makes no sense to me at all. Okay, that's fine. Give me a saw, please. And this delamination of the whole thing is so typical, so typical of avian. So I stopped doing all these uh, so-called bone preserving procedures a long time ago, eight, nine years ago now. So I, I'm making a cut on the, on the maximum diameter of the femoral head. This is a very important mark for me because that's going to tell me what is the socket size. I'm not interested in the X-ray. Yeah, Vijay, uh, this is supposed to be a robo surgery. You don't take any parameters of the head or neck before that's cutting. Exactly my point. That's exactly my point. These were, we were all doing this individual restoration is a, uh, is okay. But now we are going to do just like you know in our alternate alignment. We have moved further and we are doing a TD balancing. So we are not interested in the individual parameters at all. Okay. You would do this for every case. Yeah, I do. This, this is a very, very important uh, thing for me. Give me a scale, please. And this tells me the socket size. Uh, the best index for socket size is this. You can, you can do all your x-rays. You can do all your uh, trauma CAD. You can do all that you want. But this is the best, x -ray, best index of what your established socket, socket is going to be. So I'm going to measure this. This is measures up to 46. 46. So usually it's 4 millimeters. So we're looking at a 50 socket. Okay, this is the most accurate way of assessing the socket. Okay, now give me the uh, uh, hook, please. But could you use a sizer for that once you have cut? So just to reduce the number of steps. The, the, the way we use for bipolar replacement, you could just have a... Fair enough, yeah, I could use that as well, yeah. The whole head, you could use that as well, yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah, use two hands to pull this, please. You want the courage to remove this, please? Okay, remove the array. Be very careful. Don't touch it with the blood. Yeah. The, the, the array markers must not be touched with blood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you be careful about it. Now pull both, please. Give me something to remove this. Okay. Give me scissors again. So now I see the anterior capsule very well. So just like how I went through the inferior capsule, I'm going to go all the way 360 degrees of the capsule there. Actually, hear me cutting the capsule. So it's a 360 degree section of Absolutely, the capsule. Absolutely, 360 degree uh, uh, cut of the capsule. Okay, give us a Homans, please. Yeah, that's right. So this is a pretty standard Homans. Nibbler, please. So again, take that off. Yes. Nibbler to Vibo, please. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to put this over the anterior column. Malik, please pull. Yeah. So how do I know the anterior column? There's a test for everything. This is the anterior column test. The anterior column test is the Homans has to stay by on by itself without me holding it. If it falls off like this, I'm still in the wall. Okay, you can see that standing by itself. That means of the column. This is the anterior column test. Okay, so I'm on the anterior column. Column is very strong. The wall is very weak. So this is the maneuver that we have. So and that then slips right across. No, no, this one, this one, this one, please hold it with both hands. And you can see how the proximal femur goes along like a like a slide. It goes really anterior to the to the thing. So we'll we'll adjust the camera once we put all the pins in place. Give me a pin, please. Is it visible down there in theater? We have just, because we have just lost our connection here. 
No, we can see it from here. Just to say that. So I need a pin, please. Is the visibility good? Because we have lost a connection here. No, we can see it. Yeah, you can see that. Okay. Thank you. The AV team, can you please ensure that we can see it on screen here also? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to say We can't see the S table number here. Table down, please. One minute. No, no, not you, not you, not you. You can't sit on this please. You can't sit on this. One more pin, please. Camera view can show us the SWM properly. Give me a hot uh, We cannot see the SWM. Can camera be adjusted to see SWM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some space, please. Give me a skin knife, please. One second. There's a good 360 degree view of the. Tell me what that? There's a good view of the entire thing. Yeah. No, we cannot see anything. Okay. We want to see camera. Please look after this because everybody is getting bored. Nobody can see the acetabulum. The surgical part is very important. Okay, okay. Yeah, so please tell somebody to adjust camera. So, so that we can see it. And uh, we'll get there. <laughs> like this. Is it better now? Yeah, it's slightly, still, it can be further adjusted. Somebody can guide cameraman so that they can adjust the view correctly. What they are showing, please. Praveen, can you come here and tell this side, please? This side, this side. From yeah, the these are very important steps. I think people should enjoy the surgery. Long, long cautery, huh? Long cautery, please. Yeah, change the long cautery, please. Forceps, please. Forceps, forceps. Why, Bhav, why have you all lost the view? What is the audiovisual guy doing? Why can't he show you what we are seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's showing us, but you know, a bit of a the hip. I, this, this camera can only show. It has to come here and show like that. No, no, no. This way. And the can, can the camera tilt like this? Because if he doesn't show us properly, you know, Vijay, yeah. everybody is going to move to either anterolateral or direct anterior. What is this? Even posterior is not good enough. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, this is not about exposure and things like that. So, we will, uh, please bear with us. We will just get on with the... Uh, that's too, too angry. No, I, I think you should waste time here. Yeah, just keep going. Uh, can the camera show a little more? Just the socket is so a little bit. It's okay. Uh, why are you showing the, the gloves? Okay. 
we switch off this camera right? just no, no, that, that 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 will never pick up the establishment yeah this camera is now on i think yeah okay let's just just keep that that's fine that's fine just hold the color you just hold this please okay so we'll have to next do the tracking and next we have to show the uh, the uh, computer our socket Yeah, so uh, Viba, we need to uh, uh, hold this from your hand gently. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we need to move away so that the computer can. Hey, careful with that. Careful with that, please. No, no, no. no, no that's okay. Just leave that. That's, that's good. Okay, that's fine. Okay, guys. Okay, can you show the computer screen? Give me the thing, please. Okay, computer screen, please. So, can you see the computer screen now? Yeah. So the computer screen is trying to tell me uh, to show. The the posterior rim of the socket. So I'm going to show the posterior rim of the socket. Again, same maneuver. This one you on, please. Abhi on kar meri baat ho. Ah, on me please. Listen, go out and. Play. Okay, got that. Okay, now the depth, now the depth. This is a sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Cavity. So they're showing the cavity now. You see the computer. Is no, we cannot see anything. It's for sizing of the. No acetabulum. view is seen of the acetabulum. Yeah, no, 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 get the computer screen on the full thing, please. Two more, please. This one. Call Pranya. So just to run through what he's doing is he's painting the acetabulum. So what you can see on the screen, can we have the screen on a larger screen, meaning the computer screen to okay. on the whole thing? This can this be on the big screen now, the computer one? Okay. So now I've shown the uh, uh, the computer. Uh, the you no, know, no. You have to come hold again, please. Okay, now now only is okay. Read redo it. Yeah, go back. Give me the probe again. Re-register. So for you guys, I'll show it again. How we register this? Re-register, please. Okay. So first thing is asking me to do is the 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 mark on the posterior wall. The so what? It, yeah. So you can see that he's. You see the computer screen is showing that. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show the computer where is my posterior wall there. Okay, yeah. and then it is telling me to paint the uh, so let's see the dimensions of the cup. It showed me that. And so now you have to map the fossa. Fossa as well. Okay. So basically, three parameters it needs to so know. Three parameters basically. So now I'm showing the depth of the cup. Okay, now let us see what reading it has taken. The reading it says a 53 cup. Uh, it, yeah, so uh, it says 53. We have given a seven degrees posture tilt based on the X-rays, and that's where we are. Okay, that's fine. Come, uh, hold this place. Yeah, that's great. Both hands you can use. You can take the array off maybe. Take the array off. Okay. That's good. Careful with that, please. Great. So we're ready to start reaming now. Now, uh, as I said, what is the computer trying to show you? You must know. Where is the suction, please? So the functional pelvic plane is now the very important point. Yeah. So you can see that we have kept a board here on the lumbar spine. Please change the camera. Please, camera be changed, please. Camera change, please. And zoom out this one. Ah, that's great. Yeah. A little back. Can you show me? Can you show me a little back? Zoom out. Yeah, that's great. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. So that's the that's the board, and the lumbar spine has been kept along on the board. So I'm going to draw. Where is the board now? By palpating the board. Give me a scale, please. Sorry, uh, pen, pen, please. So that is the 
that is the board that I am marking now. Thank you. Then I am going to draw a line parallel to this line, but this time it is going to the center of the socket, roughly center of the socket. Okay. So I am going to extend it on the femur now, and you can see that that is a functional pelvic plane. Okay. So this we learned after the you know doing the computers. And it's such a, even if you don't have the computer, it's such an important, land, especially in revisions and stuff, where you don't have landmarks, this tells you the functional pelvic plane. Can you see that mark here? So I know what's my antiversion, whether I high or low, or I'm retroverted, it tells me exactly where I am. So all the table is all neutral. People is neutral. Yeah. Okay, ready for reaming, please. Give me a, that's great. Okay. So pretty standard reaming. I just hold on that that uh, camera is fine. I don't need anything else. Keep keep going, keep going, please. Yeah, uh, there's a question, Vijay. Can you tell us what is your uh, dimension of the cup, the size, and version and inclination? From the robo, what information what you I, got? What am I aiming for? That's what you're asking, yeah? Yes, yes. So, so the, the, the normal, suppose the patient didn't have any inclination, my I'll be shooting for 38 degrees on the computer and 33 degrees on my uh, inclinometer. That would be my value that I'll be shooting for. If the patient didn't have any pelvic obliquity, now the patient has got today a little bit of high side hip. So maybe, you know, 39, 40 on the computer and uh, 34 on the uh, inclinometer will be what I'm, what I'll be shooting for today. So you can see how refined we have become on the socket positioning. And anti-version. Nibbles, please, nibbles, please, nibbles, please. Give me a uh, Alice and a knife quickly or a thought is fine. Alice, please. Okay, what is the next reamer, please? Okay. Nice, great. Come, next reamer, please. Okay, that's fine. What is this? What dream is this? 42, 42, great. Okay, great. Nibbler again, please. And then give me the 43 remark. Yeah, Vijay, there are a lot of questions. Uh, Vijay, can you hear me? Forty-three. You have a probe, you have a long artist also. So we are also uh, taking yeah, account of the tile. It's not that we, we ignore the tile. Vijay, can, can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah. Vijay. Tell me, tell me, uh, Pradeep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of questions. Uh, can you just elaborate? Uh, is Robo helping you to give the direction and everything? Or it's your own... Uh, way you are doing it everybody knows you are perfect uh, but it's robo a, a navigation it's basically a navigation so we are not, the computer is not guiding me now anything okay I'm going to put the tile socket and then i'm going to find out what is the inclination and the version the computer is going to tell me that okay yeah so, so not guiding me now i'm not uh, depending on the computer for reaming and all that yeah i'm going to do now and then the final it's basically fine tuning what i'm doing already Okay. It's not, this is not a robot. This is only a navigation. So, 44, huh? Okay, keep going. Keep going. So, uh, only when I come to my trial, then the computer will tell me what is the angle of inclination and version. Okay. Forty-six, sir. Forty-four. Forty-six. Next, please. And then give me a trial. Forty-six. 
So usually we start trialing at the head size. The head we thought was around 46. So we start trialing at 46. Wanna give me the reamer, 46 reamer, please. Okay, now give me the trial, please. Jay, with your vast experience, after putting the cup, has the uh, Cori told you something different than what you were expecting? No, 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 not really. I mean, uh, we, we all can put a cup at the, at the ballpark, you know, roughly where it should be. I mean, we can all do that. Now, the computer is only for me to fine tune further. It's not telling me now what I'm doing. But only when I reach my trial reduction, it's going to tell me what's going to be my actual values. Okay, this is a very small. So we're looking at a 48 or a 50 cup. We'll get a 32 head, that's fine. Why did you? choose to put a 46 in C because we had already planned for 50. Is there just to get a feel of how it looks? So sometimes with the, when you have ossifies especially, you can you can cheat and go one cup smaller. It's really young patients. If I can get a one cup smaller, I would I would do that. It's all about saving bone stock. So I typically would trial with a in this case not much ossified, so we cannot cheat. But with ossified, typically I can get the one cup smaller. Right? 48 trial piece now. Okay. Yeah. So only have to put my trial reduction, I'll I'll be asking my computer what is the angles. What what is the size of the trial? 48. Mine is now 48. Hold that piece. Give me a skin knife, please. Quite tight the shoes. Vijay, you are uh, doing line to line rimming or under rimming? Uh, for the, uh, size. For the today, size. Actually, we would need line to line rimming, but uh, again, you know, for, depending on the patient, whether they have soft bone, sclerotic bone, I will modify okay. a little bit. But the ideal thing is, an ideal bone, if you say, I would be doing line to line, yeah. Okay, give me a mallet, please. Mallet, please. Uh, Vijay, there are some requests of some uh, delegates that they have not seen the pre-op X-ray. So I somebody can just show. I showed you the angles and all that. I showed you the spine film. Maybe they came late after lunch, I think. I'm just now gauging whether I should go 48 or 50. It's a call that you have to take now. <coughs> I don't want too much of overhang also. Okay. Now again, give me the same trial, please. Same trial, please. 48, that's good. Now I'm better off now. Yeah, it's going to be a 48 cup. Okay. Right. Sir, there is a question from a delegate. Yeah. Uh, Sir, we would yeah. like to know what is the inclination and version of the cup. Uh, Vijay, 
Yes, please. Try. Yeah. Um, everybody wants to know what is the size version and... Uh, I've not come to it, yeah. I'm just sizing now. As of now, I'm only sizing. I'll come to that in a second. Just give me a second, yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to find out whether... I yeah. don't want a lot of overhang with a 50 also. So this seems to be the most appropriate cup for him. The 48 or a 50. The choice between a 48 and a 50. AV, can you zoom into that X-ray, please? Okay. Now, yeah, give me that. Zooming in. Okay. I'll have the array later. Okay. Nice. Okay. Can I be array again? This one? The arrow. Thank you so much. The other array, please. The array. The, the, the India array. So now, guys, now is the time where I'm looking at my what is my inclination and version. So you can see the X-ray, uh, slight pelvic obliquity is there. The spine film can be seen now. Somebody's coming in the way. That is a lateral decubitus spinal film. It tells you what is the lumbar lordosis and the thing. And uh, screen now, please. Please focus on the screen. Oh, for two hours. <laughs> Way off. For some reason, the computer is showing uh, very high values. Mm. But of course, the posterior pelvic tilt is the, the, the violet one. I think the, the pins must have moved. Because it is showing 67. 67 and 66. The other the yeah. one is functional pelvic plane. That's okay. I mean, we can understand that we might have given it the wrong input, but I can't see why you should give me uh, uh, in the in the uh, violet one also the uh, the value that is uh, completely off the mark. So why is it in white now? What's that? Pelvic. So yeah. The, so the, the idea of the computer is that you can see the violet. Violet is the native, native version of the anterior pelvic plane. Okay. The anterior pelvic plane is what we generally refer to. That's what we showed the ASIS. So it was able to work out what was the uh, and green plane. is. The uh, based on the X-ray, we gave it the seven degree posterior tilt, and that's okay for me. But uh, even in the the violet one, completely uh, uh, off the mark. That's, that's okay. We just need to proceed and we look at the balance. So as we said, you know, we're still learning this system. Uh, sometimes it does show like this. Sometimes it's very accurate, extremely accurate. Sometimes it is off the mark. But you know very much we're off the mark. So we're off the mark, then you must not be using this parameter. Sometimes it is very, very, very accurate. We're still learning uh, um, uh, this system. It's been only a couple of months since we've been using this. Now, I have no idea. The, the socket seems to be in about 40 degrees of inclination, but what I can see. But I will show a digital inclinometer and I will confirm where I am now. So sometimes you need a backup. So today I have my manual backup. So I will use my digital inclinometer to find out what is my, uh, uh, what is going to be my inclination. So if, if in a digital inclinometer, we want about 34 degrees. So that's what I'll be shooting for today. Can you hold this Bible, please? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have to do it manually, if you, for the benefit of the audience, can you tell what, what landmark should they be looking at to position the cup better in terms of TAL, in terms of... Manually, the, manually, saying? Yes, manually. Yeah, so the manually, uh, the, the TAL is the native. So that's what we've all been doing. But now the question is whether you can refine it further. Whether you can, uh, you know, depending on the pelvic tilt, for example, can you incorporate that? And the, uh, I certainly want to in, incorporate the pelvic obliquity here. So slightly more than so all that you know we are refining what we are doing. Give me mallet, please. So go to the other other manual handle, please. Is there some loose contact or something? Why is it completely off the mark? I don't know. Okay. So I'll be shooting for a 34 degree inclination with the inclinometer. Give me that, please. So we are changing the technology now. From human to robot and now to a 
in kilometer so we we we'll see all the three yeah we'll i think the, the best three. is the human we'll technology the of three, yeah. when you have someone like dr bose <laughs> but still in giving you're giving other technology a, cho a chance We are not looking. Uh, yeah, that's better. Get the surgeon's view. Give me the intelometer, please. Give me the intelometer. The mobile phone. Please. Zoom this out, please. So late. So now I'm just using the intelometer to see where I am in inclination. The inclination says I'm I'm no, 30, 30, 30. Zoom uh, it out. Zoom this one out. The stop camera out, zoom out. So it says I'm I'm 35 degrees. So I'm not very much off the mark. I need to close it by one degree and then I'll I'll get my target. Mobile may decay. Sir, you switch this. Sir, you can flip this. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, it shows 36 degrees. Can you see that? So this is also a pretty accurate way of seeing what the inclination is. So uh, it's around 30, 35, 36. Now I'm shooting for 34. So that's the uh, the lead that I think that's fine. The inclinometer is, is there a normal phone and an app on it or yeah, yeah. is it just a normal phone and you have app in pre apps in Android as well as in iPhone. You can choose what you want to what you want to do that so the next thing is uh, what we do is uh, the manual way how do we look at inclination so we we now have the functional pelvic plane yeah so now what we do is uh, in a case like this not much deformity the tan is a good idea for inclination but you need to fine tune that so how do you fine tune that is we go to one cup lower size so, I, so i'm putting a 48 so i take a 46 cup please We just put a cramp up and then see if the... So Vijay, 48 is your final size? Uh, most likely. Okay. So I, I now you can see that uh, I'm, you can see the reason of doing this one size lower is you can, you can move it round and I'm now really parallel to the tan. I'm really ensuring I'm parallel to the tan. That's very important for me because in this case, I'm going to follow the tan as my native version. Because not, not a deformed pelvis. So that I have fine-tuned that. So I know my... Uh, uh, think, give me go to 48 again, please. Let me just see the 48. Yeah, more. Vijay. Yes, that, yes, please. Yeah, can you, how do you adjust the version clinically, intraoperatively? Yeah, that's what manually. I'm doing now. So, uh, we have uh, we have done the trial cup. Then I'm yes. going one size lower. I'm marking my transfer of the ligament and really fine tuning this and keeping the artery forces there. You can see the artery forces there. So okay. Exactly parallel. Exactly parallel to the uh, uh, the tan. That's what we're going to do now. No, no. What is it we done? Forty-eight, please again. So we have fine-tuned the inclination with the inclinometer. We have fine-tuned the thing with the tan, the uh, the anti-version with the tan. I think we need to go fifty. Give me fifty, Rima, please. Forty-nine and fifty. A couple slightly undersized. So we, we anticipate a 50 and we then we move to 48, we're going back to 50. 50, that's good. Another 50 trial, please. We can check with the rim as well. What is that? We can check once more with the rim instead of. Uh, I love this. Yeah, where I like good. everything to be. Yeah. Looks good, solid. In kilometer again. I don't know, maybe it's mine. Can open the 50 cup for me, please? Okay. That's exactly 34. That's exactly where I where I aim to be. So I love this. Capital that, please. Yeah. Once more, we can do that. So another technique that sometimes in Kori we can use is to just uh, remove the handle and, uh, and uh, show that. Show the, yeah. Let's just try if, if so, it yeah, works yeah. So I remove the handle now. Yeah, if you, if you remove the handle, 
Uh, we put the arrays back in once. Okay. Yep. And we can just see. We can go back and just say, just see. Cup access. Yes. Yeah. So we can take the probe. Pro, 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 pro. No, no, not the handle. Only the probe. Which the edges of just just around the rim. So there, now they've got a yeah. Yep. So it's an alternate way of checking our alignment. Let's see if the computer can gets it gets it right. So it's, we have placed the trial cup, removed the handle, and we are just doing it at the rim of the uh, the shell. Yeah, yeah. First, I had to start. Yeah. 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 Not the easiest thing to do on the cup rim. Slippery. We started first. Uh, can you let us know what exactly you are doing? Because the, the computer, rim, uh, whether it is whether working. Is it computer screen? So is it the, working? Uh, Another way of finding out, you know, asking the computer how is my trial is by painting the trial rim cup. But we can see, we can you show us on the screen what parameters you are checking? So so only the, the light the trial cup is in, inside already. The R3 trial is inside. So only the outermost part of the shell that's been the trial shell that has been implanted. So we are painting the outer border for that to see how they have. So that's a feeding information for the robot. Understand that, right? Not picking it up. It's a very tough way of doing it, I must say. Basically, It's a difficult task because uh, it does slip when you have. Okay, so we have done one segment. I'm going on the other one. Very slippery. Very slippery there. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's fine. Yeah, we not waste time because we're already running late. That's fine. They they they're already going late. Careful, careful with that, please. Careful with the array, please. Careful with the array, please. That's enough. Don't don't pull too much. Okay. The handle, please. I'm already assuming that. You want to see now? Okay, give me the other other handle, please. The, uh, yeah. So earlier the cup wasn't very stable with the 48. Now it's very stable. Let's see. Let's take this. Uh, I don't know. Two by two inclination. Let's check the functional and uh, this inclination again. Yeah. The screen now, yeah. Show the screen, please. Focus on the screen, yes. So again, it's showing the same thing. Okay, it's not waste time. Huh? It's not. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. It's not, no, it's not there. Cup, cup. Take it off, please. Cup. Give me the other handle, please. Careful, careful. Don't, don't break that thing. That, that's great. Cup. Give me the this thing, please. Other handle, please. That's great. Fifty cup is open. Uh, 
Okay, come on. Give me the, the, the cup, please. Give me the Ethereum again for a second. So the RT trial has to be slightly looser when you put the actual cup. So at this making going to make it slightly looser. Okay. Come, give me the cup, please. We're doing the R three original original R three. Uh, No, 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 don't, 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 no, what was the last streamer you used? So we need one of them reamers for sure. That's great. Give me the cup, please. So there's no point putting in the cup and then seeing what your angle is. You want to do it as you do it long. Take it in kilometer, please, the mobile phone. So I'm shooting for 34 degrees. So you can see that uh, I'm at 36 degrees. Can you see that? 36 degrees. I'm at 36. So I just close my hand a little more, make it 34. That's excellent. We got a rock solid cup there. So we shake the pelvis along with that. Give me the inclinometer again. And there are 34 guys. You can see that? So we shot 34, we got 34. Okay. So that's yeah. a very accurate way of doing it. Uh, Mallet again, please. Give me the poly, please. You love hooded poly. Okay, done. So, very solid, uh, perfect positioning of the cup. So, uh, Vijay, can you just elaborate exactly what is the position of the cup? Inclination and version, everybody wants to know. Yes, Size so I just told you the inclination is 34 degrees on the inclinometer. The computer will show typically this would be 38 degrees. So okay. Uh, uh, there's something that there was not showing, I don't know, some mistake, but uh, in the computer we'll find it will show 38 degrees of inclination. Okay. Uh, sorry, 39 degrees. So, it, if it's 33, it'll be 38. If it's 34, it'll be 39. Yeah, but so what is 38 parameter? It is... Then the, and then the, uh, today, because there's no deformity, we went by the tan, and that also gives the good functional plane. I've formed the functional pelvic plane, good antiversion as regards the functional pelvic plane. So, I'm very happy with that. So, you got the version of the inclination, yeah? Now, we'll use the computer for our 3D balance now. Right, give me the... Uh, okay. marker pen, please. So I'm using a hood. Now a hood uh, pen, yeah, pen. Marker pen. Posterior liner. Three degree hood that the artery comes with. The hood is a double-edged sword. Yeah. So if you place the cup correctly, the hood is a big advantage. But if you place the cup wrongly, it will cause open. dislocation. One more pen open. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So. Today we have very good positioning of the cup. Gently, please. Yeah. So I'm very happy to use a hooded liner. The significance of hooded liner is I'm using a 32 head now. Functionally, it becomes a 36 head because I put a hooded liner. Okay, point, please. Okay, that's excellent. So you can see that it's parallel to the trial, yeah? Okay. Uh, you can know, you can show a little better view? It's a millimeter uh, parallel to the trial. So the degree parallel to the trial, 
we got an inclination of 34 based on the public public goodies. We're very happy with that. Okay, so you're ready to go to the FEMA, please. Thank you. Where did you position the hood? Sorry, what was that? The hood went posteriorly or superior posteriorly? Uh, superior posteriorly, posterior superiorly. Yeah. Posterior superiorly, they kept the, uh, it's in about uh, one o'clock position, one o'clock position of the hood. Right, okay. Now we go to the FEMA. Right. So give us uh, this, uh, this thing, please. Uh, double prong. Right. Give me a copy, please. Uh, so I guess, uh, now probably the camera can show now nothing in the depth. So you now reflecting the capsule. So we're going to prepare capsule the capsule. The problem with putting a screw now for the femur, which is what the uh, uh, one of the ways to do it. Sometimes you find in you know, a small patient, the uh, the uh, rasp of the femur uh, hits the screw, and the screw moves. So that's the reason why we have gone to uh, just using a KY drill and using that point on the bone as your mark. That way you don't have that risk. You can see I'm reflecting the capsule to be stitched later. Put an alice here. Please just hold it gently, please. One more alice, yes, one. Right. So, um, so the uh, the other way you can become better in your hip replacement is to choose a stem based on the neck shaft angle. I think that's very important. That so far we have not been considering it. Uh, Nibbler, please. Nibbler, please. So uh, this patient has got a neck shaft angle of uh, 132. So I'm going to use a 135, which is fine. But suppose he had a neck shaft angle of 129. And then I'm using a 135. Then I don't think we are really uh, doing justice. We are not uh, creating the uh, uh, the ideal balance for this patient. Yeah. So nowadays we have a choice of four or five stems in our OR, and based on the next shaft angle, we would. Uh, the other parameter which will decide what stem I use is the AP diameter. The AP diameter is narrow or, or large. I would I would change my stem accordingly. So today we are going a pretty standard one. Hold that, please. On the side. Yeah. So, more than your cup and all that, the real value of the computer comes in uh, now. Right. No, that, 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 that's, that's correct. So the next thing I'm going to do is so very important point is that the combined version is very important. The yeah. computer does not combine. I mean, at least that so far the uh, query does not take the combined version into account. But I will tell you how to take the combined version into account. So the next thing that we do is uh, can the camera pick up this? Uh, what I'm showing. Like, uh, this thing, this? Uh, yeah. So I'm drawing the long axis of the. Uh, of the tibia, I'm drawing the long as the tibia. Good. And that is very important. That is your effective lower limb version, ELLV, which again we have described. So first thing I'm doing is give me the scale, please. Scale, please. So uh, if you can see that I'm keeping the camera showing something. Yeah, okay. So I'm keeping this on the posterior neck plane, which is no, the native. Somebody can show us the other version. view can show us the leg so that we can get the idea. Camera show the leg, 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 leg. leg. Second, second, yes, yes. Leg. Second, perfect. Leg. But uh, so okay, this is the native, just like your tile, this tells you what is the native femur. It may be low, it may be high, and we try and incorporate that as we go along. Today, it's standard. So, if it is standard, my entry point will be standard on the femur. If I find that the version is very low, my entry point will be anterior. If I find that the version, native version is very high, 
my entry point will be in the middle. So I'm, I, I'm altering that. And even with a non simplex stem, you can quite significantly change the version by 10 degrees. Now, 10 degrees is all that we want. We, want to, we don't want to change by 40 degrees. We're only fine tuning. We're not tuning. Okay, so today's standards are standard entry point for me. Fine. I, I want to make a comment. Uh, yes, Posterior approach, the leg is vertical is the best guide for femoral version. As against anterior, it is difficult to see the leg because there was some case uh, where there was a mild rotation of the lower end of the femur and if you just do proximal and if you don't take leg into consideration, it's a difficult. So posterior approach is excellent for version arrangement of the stem. Yeah, I fully agree with that Pradeep. I think, you know, uh, putting 20 degrees on every patient is not a great idea. I mean, it's okay. Now we're trying to make things better. We were doing okay, not that we're doing bad all these years, but now the goal is to uh, have power on this is to do better than that. Probably. So, we would typically change, uh, so the, the good way of looking at the rule of thumb is, is am I dealing with high antiversion, low antiversion? So, with the femoral stem, I want to decrease the native antiversion or increase the antiversion. I will do that in all patients. I will do that in all patients, okay? I want either bias on this side or bias on the other side. Give me a power on this, please. Power, please. The power, on the power. Power, on the power. Very slotic bone. I need power up. Power, please. I'll, I'll show you how I, I change the version. Okay. Do you have any power, Rima? Any sign of Rima? Rima, Rima, Rima. 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 Not Mallet, please. So the first thing I'm going to get is what is known as provisional stability of my stem. So give a rasp. So the rasp is okay. Use the rasp. Okay, now give me the polar drives, please. So the polar is an excellent stem. Now, morning we had a case of the uh, actus. So we use the actus, we use the corai as well. So the polar is in between the corai and the uh, and the uh, uh, actus. What do you mean by in between is that the, as the length decreases of the stem, the width of the proximal part has to increase. That's biomechanics. Now one cannot have a narrow proximal part and a short stem. It won't work. So you can get stability somewhere. So you can either make a narrow stem with a longer stem or a shorter stem with a broader thing. So the act is broad, proximally shortest, the corai is longer, narrowest, the polar is in between. It's in between the uh, act is as far as the proximal thickness, it's in between. Now all these have significance. You know the corai in our patients can have this door A failure mode. That never happens with the polar stuff. So if you have door A, polar is a much better way to you doing it, doing it. I think you made a very important point that we should make these stem choices based on the anatomy. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Give me some kind of a, you have a gouge piece. The gouge came from my set as well. Not this one, one more gouge. Would be there. Narrow gouge. Any opinion on the cylindrical stem, sir? Cylindrical step? Cylindrical stem? Like for a, a cone sleeve kind of. Uh, like the cone Wagner. Yeah, right? cone Wagner, yeah. The cone Wagner, uh, because of it is. Uh, uh, it's such a short stem, it's really, really uh, broad proximally. Mm -hmm. So for this patient, if I do a cone Wagner, I'll ream the GT off. It's not a great idea in this patient, but when you have sclerotic bone, uh, then that's the way to go. So if you want to have low size of the cone Wagner, excellent. But as the cone Wagner size increases, we're going to go into very difficult, uh, this thing, yeah. You know, no, done, done, done. Give me the polar, uh, this thing, please. Now all these patients are alternate, so they all have this uh, hard bone. Give me that uh, this thing, please. That gouge again, please. Uh, Vijay, burr use of burr is excellent. I use for every case. Sorry, what is that? Burr is burr, very yeah, is useful. useful. I use for every THR. Yeah, especially for uh, chronic bone, avian, alternate. 
Good idea to have the bar. Give me the rasp, please. And the crack also easily is alternate bones. So no force, gently. Again, the rasp, the gouge, please. So another very important point I want to make is that the socket size and the femoral size are very closely matched. So suppose you have sclerotic bone, if you undersize the femur, that's when you get your door A, and very common in the Asian population. So if you take the coral, for example, if you put a 52 socket, the minimum stem must be 11. Please note it down. Very, very important point. I find so many failures. The minimum must be a size 11 coral for a size 52 stem. Do a cup, sorry. So I got what is known as provisional stability. This may not be my stem size, but I got provisional stability. Now uh, give me the scale again. So now I look at my what is my actual version. Give me the inclometer, please. Okay, inclometer. Can the camera show that, please? So now I put a value on the on the femoral version. So now it's all about putting values. No, no, you're not holding correctly. Collect can hold, please. Leave, leave that, leave it. Ah, yes. Can you come to the back? And can you see that? So the tibia is at 90. The fever is at 74. That means my uh, lower, lower limb version is 16. It is, which is acceptable, but it's on the lower side. So I'm going to bias this patient into more version. Maybe I'll get 3 degrees, 4 degrees, but that's fine. I'm fine tuning him into more uh, area that's better. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is give me the gouge, please. I'm going to take the gouge and, and make my little more anterior. So just I can bias it a little more. It's only a few degrees, but that's all you're looking for. Only, only fine tuning. So the rasp, same rasp again. So now I'm going to turn anti clockwise. So this set of refining I will do in every stem. I'm turning it into more anti version. In some patients, I'll be decreasing the antiversion. Okay, that's that's good. So I like that. So I have a feeling that uh, we need to go more with this. So give me a saw, please. So the uh, the calca reamer is just being arranged for the uh, uh, for the uh, this thing. Calca reamer is very useful when you use the pori. We don't have the calca reamer today, so I'm just taking off with a saw. That's fine. Can you give me the, the, the next stem, please? Can you give me the next stem? What is the stem? Zero, one, huh? This zero? Zero. So now I'm going to the next stem. Now we'll start trialing. So I've increased the native version a little bit. Over there, friends, please. So now is what is is the uh, the computer very very useful? Huh? No, 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 zero, please. Zero. So uh, the uh, unlike the uh, the Corai stem, which is the uh, it's got a homothetic transformation. So all neck length will be the same, but here the neck length cha changes. So for zero, one is different. Zero is different, and one onwards is different. So I'm putting the zero neck. For the step, give me the minus head, please. Put the minus head. Action, please. Okay, that thing. Okay. So one thing I I never do. I've not done ten years. I've not looked for stability at trial reduction. That is furious instability of detecting. So I've not looked for last ten years. I've never looked at pair of stability. That's a long concept. Okay, put the thing please. So female patients will be more lax, male patients will be, so all that has to be factored in. We cannot just do the same thing for everyone. You can see that on the computer screen it turns green. That means that we have aligned to the same position that we were, it turns green 
when we were at pre pre dislocation mark this thing in pro please pro yeah that that there it is that's green ah uh, vijay yeah that means so robo is still active the values now i'm 1 mm longer and 5 mm medialized one second uh, vijay the true value of this uh, of this computer i'm not really interested in this cup positioning and all that that uh, this is the value for me it gives me a value of what i have done and you can note that it's not individual parameters it is combined parameters now watch this i'm going to go to a zero head give me the hook please so i'm not looking at stability at all is wrong to look for stability okay now see what happens when you go that's what you want to know because ideally in an ideal world i would like to have minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 zero head but in real life it doesn't happen so i have to make do with what's available which is minus 3 0 and plus 4 so i got to manage with that in all systems so how do you manage it by 3d balancing okay So in ideal world, if I have stems that that has an NSA of 130, 131, 132, 135 different stems, then you can argue that I am reproducing anatomy. And if I have heads like you know minus three, minus two, minus one like that, but that will not happen. So we have to make do with what we have. And how do we do that? By balancing it. What about the mid leg? Lift it up. Lift it up. Yeah. So just slightly lift it up. Yeah. Yep. It says it's two millimeters longer now. Okay. No problem. Vijay, robo is still uh, valid now. Yeah, yeah. One second. Yeah, can you see that now? What's happened? Uh, it's uh, it's saying it is uh, longer now, and it is lateralized now. Six millimeter. Can you see that? Three millimeter lateral. Take the bleeding again. It takes that here. Yeah, so you can see it's uh, from one millimeter it became three millimeter longer. So what does it tell me? It tells me that I need to go down on that. Okay, so I need to go down by a millimeter on the on the stem. Okay, right. Just let me hook, please. so that's your final uh, selection vijay so we're going to go down a little bit but you're going to use a zero the minus 3 is not enough now okay. i'll show you the same thing what happens with the uh, with our manual method can you see the manual method so the exactly the same concept individual parameters are not important and it shows i'm slightly longer can you see that i'm slightly longer okay slightly longer so it tells me i need to go down so the same concept is applies here Give me the uh, hook, please. So I need to go down a little bit. So give me a saw, please. First, I'll take the thing out. So each head that you use will give you values. What the, what's happening to the 3D balance? Give you concrete values, and based on the values, you have to decide which of whether you go down the neck. You are going to use an increase offset. Whatever I mean, what what are you going to do for that patient to get the ideal balance? So my idea is to go down by a millimeter.
in a saw place. If you have a call card, it will be very useful, but I don't have a call card, so I'm going to use a saw. <laughs> Uh, this uh, double pronged uh, refractor, please. Yeah, the fiber. Thank you. I've taken a thin slice of the neck off. Uh, give me the rasp again, please. Now, what you must remember is that. As you go higher in size, the offset will change. Okay, and that's why you need to have a chart. Now, uh, most likely I'll be ending up with a one stem higher than this. Let me just see whether this stem is the correct stem. This is a zero, is it? Okay. Give me the mark, please. And then hold and look at rotation stability. Yeah, that that that's very stable. So the uh, Marat please. Okay, no, sorry, we saw the, we need to go in Marat please. And give me the head again, another zero head please. Array please, array. Put the array to me. Okay, get the array please. Give me the this thing probe please. Uh, Vijay, you never taste the stability by and get some idea. Sorry, what is that again, Pradeep? Uh, you don't check the mobility and get the idea of stability. No, 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 no. You have to believe in yourself. No, no. That will give you wrong values. That's what I'm saying. No, uh, I, 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 that will give you wrong values. You'll be, you'll be doing wrong things. For example, if it's a very mobile patient, female patient, the shock test will be positive, and then you think, oh, I've done something wrong. Yeah, but that is one parameter we you know, and then you can adjust uh, other parameters. OK, now you see the value. So the, this one, please. And the computer screen. screen. See, we can see the screen. Yeah, yeah you can see that I'm one, I'm one millimeter longer, one millimeter medialized. Now the question is, how long do you want to chase this? It's very difficult to chase this because if you alter any parameter now, I don't have one millimeter increment of head. Yeah, this looks wonderful. I have to accept this, but you can see how refined you can go. Yes. I mean, if, if I put a say, for example, I put a minus three, I will go much. Uh, I, I cannot do. I'll go much. Uh, shorter so i would accept this i would accept a one millimeter discrepancy okay fantastic so, so, please. Thank, so should we uh, describe from this oh. yeah if, yeah if you guys want to go that's fine that's all i'm going to yeah why so, yeah so yeah i think it's a wonderful uh, we got everything yeah so the you can see that you know this one millimeter is difficult to address because I don't have incremental heads like that. So I got to be careful. If I go down on the neck, I will get even more medialized. I don't want to do that. I think one millimeter is perfect. Happy to, I'm happy to accept that. Okay, Fantastic. Have, uh, you know, neck sharp angles are different. We don't have plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four heads. We have yeah. only jump heads. So we need to know how to balance this, okay? Right. Yes. Okay, if you guys want to go to the lectures, uh, thank you very much. Okay, everyone. thank you very thank much. You. So now probably on the table try to see the stability success is all not necessary. From his side. Yeah, I'm asking you why I'm asking. I do it, you do it, he does not like to do it. I think I would do it. I would do I think this for the next sitting if you have just behind. Not any 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 option? गौरव को फोन करके पूछ सकते हैं लंच के लिए ब्रेक करना है तो कर सकते
Main patient has to have at least one. Power limits. I may under size. I will file this though. Can you guys do this? The trial has this. One level, the market. Hello, please. Longer, 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 minus, give me the minus. So, one thing that I found now with these probes, if you circulate it, it doesn't work well. If you just do this, it works very well. And this is what I found with this system. And also, the inclination matters a lot. If you keep it like this, if you slightly tilt it this way. What are values? Eh? The values also and 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 factor change. So otherwise, value should not change. I mean, the value right. should not change.
amount of subluxation or dislocation. So I'll just uh, you know let you know that uh, how we decide about this crow type one and type two. So suppose there's a unilateral hip affection. First, you draw the interior drop line and measure the height of the head and see that how much the head neck junction is displaced from the interior drop line and what percentage of it is displaced as compared to the height of the normal side of head. That decides your percentage of uh, dislocation or subluxation. Whereas in bilateral cases, you have to take the height of the pelvis and see that the 20 percent of the height of the pelvis is approximately equals to the height of the head and that is taken as the landmark and from the interior drop line again you see that how much the head neck junction is displaced from the interior drop line and as you can see in this case on the right side it is crow type 3 and in the left side is crow type 2 dislocation then anatomic changes in the acetabulum that is a shallow and you know sloping acetabulum the bone is deficient superolaterally as well as the anteriorly so while you are rimming the acetabulum please be careful not to violate the anterior wall or superolateral wall or else you will have problem of uh, unstable cup <clears throat> and it is a small dimension especially the anteroposterior diameter is you know much less compared to superior inferior diameter but your cup placement depends on the anteroposterior capture and hence that decides the size of the cup on the femoral side, head is small and deformed. There is marked antiversion. You do not have to restore that antiversion. You have to reduce the antiversion and do your hip. And uh, the canal is narrow and there is anterior bowing. And sometimes the mediolateral or anterior posterior diameter, who, whichever is the smallest diameter, that decides about the your femoral component. The soft tissue changes, almost all the soft tissues are contracted. The abductors are tented over the femoral head, except the abductors, you can release whatever psoas, adductors, rectus femoris, and which are contracted. And this is one of the conditions where you have to do the percutaneous adductor tenotomy first before giving positioning for your approach. Uh, all other, otherwise, you know, most of the cases, what you do, you do the adductor tenotomy at the end of the surgery, looking at the how much abduction was there. So here, you have to do first adductor tenotomy, then give the positioning, and almost you can release all the muscles except uh, the abductors. So pre-operative planning, you draw the intertier drop line. You see that how much shortening is there with respect to intertier drop line. Then you draw a line, you know, from the normal side of acetabulum, touching both sides and the upper surface of the acetabulum. These two lines normally remain parallel in a normal in condition, but here both the lines are converging or diverging. When you draw a line parallel to the interior drop line, and you can see that uh, these are the inclination of the cup, hence the this amount of uh, you know space which is there, which needs to be filled up with a graft or an augment, or you may you know afford to keep the cup exposed if it is possible. So that is the whole crux of the you know placement of the cup. If you draw the colors line, this triangle decides about the placement of the cup. So your cup placement has to be placed in this uh, triangle. So type 1, basically you need to need the rimming technique. First you have to do vertical rimming, grease the floor of the acetabulum, then give desired degree of inclination and inversion. Especially this is the direction where there is a good laser of bone or you know, buttress is there. There you can give a good capture of the cup. Sometimes you may have to leave the cup little horizontal in order to get a good uh, you know, containment of the cup inside the acetabulum. 62 years old lady, crow type 1. Here is a pre-operative X-ray. As we had decided that there is this much amount needs to be filled up, but uh, when you rim it medially, reach the floor of the acetabulum, that is the lateral view, then you get a good containment of the cup, hence you do not require the graft in this kind of cases. And that is almost 11 years follow-up of this patient, both AP and lateral view. Now in type 2 and type 3, you prefer to restore the hip center of rotation, but if it is not possible, mild elevation of the hip center is acceptable. You can accept a high center of rotation and structural femoral head is used as a graft in order to bring the center of rotation down. So here is the graphical representation, that is the hip. So first you dislocate, then you take the head and put the graft there, then fix it with a screw there, then put the acetabulum and finally you do the femoral side and reduce the hip. This is a short, very old video of doing a technique of the grafting. So this is a pre-operative X-ray, that is the lateral view. So this is after rimming of the acetabulum. Now you divide the head, take the head and divide. Now make multiple drill holes there because there, you know, the bone is very sclerotic. Put the graft, 
Now fix temporarily with K wires, then fix with the screws. This is a cemented cup I am doing because the host bone contact is much less. So these are the flanged OGE type of cup. So you put the template, cut it according to the template, and finally decide that to see then the trial. This is the pressurizer and make multiple drill holes, anchoring holes. Do a pulse lava, pack it with the hydrogen protected ribbon gauze pack there. Then put the cement in there, pressurize it with the pressurizer. And finally, you take a coated cup, pre-coated cup, and put it there and pressurize it and hold it in a desired degree of inclination and antiversion till the cement sets. If the host bone contact is almost you know, less than 50%, then you have to use a cemented cup along in the presence of a graft like this. And that's the final, you know, after putting the uh, graft and the cup. That is the post-operative X-ray. So here the crux is that your direction of the screws should be directed to the sacroiliac joint so that it is along the you know, bone uh, trabeculae in order to achieve a good compression of the graft. And no part of the graft should overhang beyond the margin of the curve because that graft is going to get reserved later on and that will lead to loosening of your screws, etc. So that is how you put the graft and prepare the graft bed very well. Here is a patient, you know, 22 years old male, bilateral crow type 3, where you have done a graft and a uncemented type of cup. If the host bone contact is almost 50 to 60 percent, then you can put an uncemented type of cup. Since the graft are projecting beyond the cup, as you can see here in three years follow up, how the graft is getting reserved. That is the lateral view, but the patient, uh, you know, function is good. There is no pain and complete restoration of the anatomy of the hip and restoration of the function of the patient. Whereas in type 4, you need to put ball graft or trabecular metal augments as necessary. And sometimes you may have to do impaction cancellous autograft, you know, medially intra-estabular area because there are porotic bone there. Now on the femoral side, antiversion is the main problem. You may have to do a little bit extra neck cut. In order, neck cut may have to be low so that in order to address the antiversion and you have to, may have to do a hand rimming. But there are three solutions on the femoral side. You can use an uncemented femoral component, which is modular like SROM type of component, and uh, do not increase the antiversion. So here, the independently the diaphysial and metaphysial part are independent of the, you know, <coughs> of the version. So you can place the desired amount of version and then put the final component in. Or you can use a cemented CDH type of processes like this so that you can give desired degree of version there. Or you can do an uncemented component with femoral derotation osteotomy, which is hardly practiced. Now, this is a crow type 3, again, 22 years old male, where a thin stem has been put, a size 6 of quarrel stem has been put, on cemented camber prosthesis. As you can see the fitting on the AP view, whereas in the lateral view, it is a three-point fixation rather than an interference fit. And here it is a crow type 2 in 25 years old female, where we have to do a hybrid type of hip. Here a cemented CDH type of component, which has been put, so that to give, you know, a, you know desired degree of antiversion, so that the center of rotation is restored. So if it is type 4 dislocation, either you can do a trochantric osteotomy or advancement, or you have to do a subtrochantric osteotomy. And these kind of stems like a Wagner cone, Wagner cone, or a SRAM type of prosthesis will be useful. The advantage of trochantric subtrochantric osteotomy is that it is it is very it is best for the deformity correction. You can bring the center of rotation down to a proper you know, anatomic center of rotation. It's an excellent socket exposure. You can restore the offset, and there is no trochantric osteotomy which is required. You have to go through a transfemoral approach. Whereas disadvantage is because of the complexity of the procedure and there's a possibility of non-union also. So there is a graphical representation. So you do a transfemoral approach, do an osteotomy of the femur, then open it, do the finish of the acetabular side, then prepare the femur and put your components in. And now give a traction, see that how much overlapping is there, then take excise that much amount of bone from the femur and finally reduce it and reduce the hip. So this is a patient with a three years follow-up after bilateral soft trochantric osteotomy, restoring center of rotation. So friends, take home message. The, you know, you have to address the problem depending upon the complexity of the situation, whether it is dysplasia, subluxation, or dislocation. There is stressed capsules, soft tissue contractures. You may have to do a adductor tenotomy from the beginning of the surgery, then do the surgery and do adequate release except the abductors. Restore the center of rotation in type 1 and type 4. You can accept a high center of rotation in type 2 and type 3 if you are unable to restore the center of rotation. 
you need to learn the SWL rimming technique that how to rim little, you know, superior medially so that to get a good ledge of bone for the cop maintainment. You must learn the bone grafting techniques, how to pass the screws directed to the SI joint and along the trabeculae of the ileum. You must remember the anatomic changes in the femur and if you can, you can do a subtrochantric osteotomy. I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Mohanty. Uh, thank you for a very elaborate presentation. I would request Dr. Marine to come to set up his, by the time you can have a question yeah. with Dr. Mohanty. Thank you very much, Dr. Monty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next on the dais would be Dr. Oliver Marin, getting the cup right, key landmarks and tips. Thank you so much for... There is some change in the order because some people want to leave early, so please bear with us, Dr. Marin. So thank you for the invitation to, to be here. It's my <clears throat> first time in India, and it's a great pleasure to stay in this uh, fantastic uh, meeting. Very practical with many surgeries, so it, that's, that's great. So I work in a public hospital in Madrid. This is my hospital. You are invited to come. There are many fellows from India that came before. And these are my disclosures that do not affect the following presentation. So the topic that I have to talk in the next eight minutes is about the cup in the correct position. So, but what is that? We have discussed previously about the lemoning zone, about all this topic. But first of all, just a very basic principles. So you have to do in the press fit cups to medialize. That could be very basic, but many times is the beginning of the end. I mean, if you do not medialize and remove the inferior osteophyte, you can reduce all the anterior and posterior walls and your cap will not do any press fit. So be very careful with the inferior and medial osteophyte at the beginning and uh, about this uh, standard problem. If you use a cemented cap, and usually in, in Europe it's used for older patients and you have to take into account different technical tips and tricks to avoid a bad position. Uh, mainly, you had to do these holes and, and rim a little bit this, uh, this socket, and then you had to pressurize the cement. Don't put the cement like a ball inside, and that's it. You had to pressurize and get this cement well fixed in this acetabulum. And with the Uncemented, you have to use these uh, techniques with one millimeter less or line to line, it depends on the patient, the bone, and also take into account which implant are you using. Remember that the rimers usually are more hemispherical and some caps are elliptical. That's important for the press fit. So uh, some people use this transverse ligament during the surgery, but to be honest, when you open the capsule inferiorly, as we have been shown previously in the surgeries, or you have a calcified transverse ligament, you cannot have this landmark intraoperative. So be very careful to take into account only this uh, reference. And also, what about this uh, safe zone that I haven't mentioned? So I don't really follow that. I use this kind of things intraoperative, as we have seen inside. Remember in the last surgery that they use the iPhone with this inclinometer. You can use these levels that can be sterilized for the OR and for the abduction at least, it will be very useful during surgery. Or you can use the new techniques like the navigation in any way or robotic to have a very accurate, in theory, uh, position of the acetabular cap. So uh, what happened with that? I mean, it has been mentioned here. I mean, the paper from, the, from Matt Abdel from Mayo Clinic, all the people or most people that have these locations are in the safe zone. And the explanation for that is because the position of the acetabular component is a dynamic problem. So the patient can have inclination of the pelvis or the pelvic tilt or any difference along the life of the patient that could change the final position of the cap. So be very careful 
because it's a dynamic problem with the cap position. I just want to say any tips and tricks with the liner insertion. It should be very simple to put the liner in, but be very careful because sometimes it's a big problem. Look at this case, 65 year old lady, left hip doing well the, during the first year. This is a standard cap, maybe a little bit vertical, maybe 45, 50. And uh, what happened that he was walking and feel like a clunk and pain in the left hip. And this is the x-ray. Look at that. The patient can walk, but with pain and with some kind of sound there. And this is what we revised this case. And we saw this liner dissociation. This is a pinnacle with a standard polyethylene marathon. And this is a dissociation that has been described in some papers. Sometimes it's because you put the liner in a not correct way. And sometimes it's because a problem of the locking mechanism of this liner. So be very careful during the surgery when you put on the liner, because maybe it could be the beginning of the fail of this implant. This is the, the case as I show you. Look at this ceramic head that was fitting with the metal back after the dissociation of the liner. And you can see in the lip of this liner that there is some kind of impingement in that lady. So be very careful. And especially when you are using ceramic on ceramic, maybe it's not very popular here in India, but the, with the ceramic on ceramic, the position of the liner is a key point during the surgery. You have to, to see very well the, all the acetabulum and try to seat this liner, ceramic liner, very nicely. When you impact the liner, the recommendation from the company is to impact with strength there. But if you have a bad position or bad sitting of this ceramic liner, you will have this problem. It has been described, described in the literature. This is a very gross one. I mean, you can see how the liner was not correct there. And there, there was a fracture, a post-operative fracture of the liner. But sometimes, if you impact not in the correct position, a very, very, very accurate position of this ceramic liner, you will break intraoperative this liner when you impact with strength. So be very careful and you can use different tools that we have in the market, like this one. So you have to assess all around the liner and then press when you are sure that everything is in the perfect center position. That's very, very important with the ceramic because you will have any breakage there. And then just a few words about the spinopelvic influence in this cup. Just, I will try to simplify it a lot, but just for dummies, you have to measure a couple of parameters, sacral slope and pelvic tilt. And mainly the pelvic tilt is the one who is important for an orthopedic surgeon that is focused in the hip, because the change in the pelvic tilt will change the position of your acetabulum. So, when you are standing, you can see here, the pelvis go forward and you decrease your pelvic tilt. That's the standard position. And when you sit in a chair, then your, pel your pelvis is going backwards and you increase your pelvic tilt. That's for two minutes, I told you, just a couple of concepts. The normal one, the change between sitting and standing between 10 and 30. And then you have different problems when you don't have this correction, standard or biological, mechanical correction moving from sitting to standing. So when your pelvis or your spine cannot do that, maybe your position of your component is not like you are measuring intraoperative. So maybe you have a very nice 45 degrees, but this patient in the daily practice can move. And then you have hypermobility, reduce of the mobility, or no change in one position. So if you don't have this compensation, you can get this dislocation of the arthroplasty. And you have an application like the one you see here, is free in internet, and you can check what happened if you change your pelvic tilt with your component position. That's important to know what are you doing during surgery related to this spinopelvic problem. So with the normal 
compensation, you have a normal position of the component, if you have a reduced motion, so the patient have a stuck standing, so reduce your pelvic tilt, then you have to do a little bit more anteversion to avoid the anterior impingement, and if you have the opposite, if you have a stuck in sitting position, that means that you have a posterior impingement of a risk of that, and then you have to reduce a little bit your anteversion. This is a very simple and just for dummies like me. So the take home message in my talk is the cup position is one of the key points of this total hip arthroplasty. Be very careful with the liner and with the position. And you can use the new technologies to personalize the cup position depending on the motion and the dynamic of this patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Marie. Uh, there is some change, Dr. Deepa Gautam, to come forward. By the time he sets up his presentation, you can have some questions with Dr. Marin. You have a, you mean you have a stuck position of the build, uh, tilt. I mean, no changes or uh, an abnormal change, you know? Yeah. Okay. So I, first of all, what preoperative evaluation you do? We, we do a standard standing x-ray, lateral one, and sitting. With these two x-rays. Every patient? Every patient. With these two x-rays, with these two x-rays, you can assess the main problem. Maybe it's not so accurate what I'm telling you, but very simple, very practical. AP standing lateral and sitting. With these two, you see if this spinopelvic problem is one category or the other. And when you go to the OR, as you told you there, I mean, it depends if the pelvic tilt is increased, stuck in this increase or decrease. In that situation, you chain a little bit your anteversion. That's it. Yeah, but the exactly quantification is very unclear, right? I mean, yeah. The difference is between five degrees, maybe your standard position, so maybe it's not so important, but you have to take into account that the problem is there. Yeah, but one more issue is there. Many times there's a stiffness of the hip, and after clearing that stiffness, after hip replacement, it also changes the version. I mean, I'm talking about the lumbar spine problem affecting the hip. So because the motion you are correcting when you put your trial, you put your trial in and you test it. Yeah. So you are checking there. You have to think what happened with the patient standing and sitting. That's the variation from the, but the most important thing is the checking intraoperative, your stability. If you have any concern about that, dual mobility. That's it. Fine, thank you. Great, thank you. And the patient is positioned, like standing only, right? If they have position, lateral position, You mean the position in the OR, right? Yeah, I mean, that's important. That's the reason because the new techniques, the new navigation of robots can add you some value about that. Uh, I always position my patient, always, and I have in my mind how is the position in the table because I do it myself in every case, because you are right. I mean, you change your pelvic tilt in the position in the, in, in the OR. So it's very important that the position always will be the same because your, your experience is based on this position when you do the surgery. So that's very important because they, they change a little bit, like five, 10 degrees, if you change the pelvic tilt in the position in the OR. Yes. No, no, I think uh, your question is, uh, how, how do you change when patient is in lying down position? So basically these preoperative parameters Standing and sitting gives you idea that how much extra inclination you add. And once you do, yeah, antiversion less, because if it is stuck in flexion, then you decrease the antiversion. If it is stuck in standing, then increase the antiversion slightly. Yeah. Now, this is on in relation with the TAL. 
so lebinek position is a base position on which you can add and alter and adjust the uh, pelvic tilt adjustment you have to do your surgery as you are doing now but you have to think about any change in this position that you think is correct in the OR, what happens when the patient is doing their activity. That's, uh, yeah. Can, can, can I, I just, just make, make sorry. Uh, yeah. Can I just yes. make two remarks? Unless you do it robotically, you know, just a couple of degrees more antiversion, you will not be able to pick up during <laughs> manual surgery. And the second thing with all of these spinal pelvic problems is, Patients are not static, you know, people will have more back pain or might have some spinal surgery in, in the future. So what we're talking about is only a couple of degrees change. So for, for very young surgeons or surgeons don't, that don't have access to robotics and navigation, try to forget about it. So fortification is most difficult. Thank you, Dr. Mara. Okay, Dr. Deepak, you can go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, this drowsy afternoon <laughs> after this lunch time. Okay, let's be direct, why and how to do DAA. <coughs> I have nothing to disclose, and I have been using almost uh, all of the DA instrumentation that is available in India, but I have no financial conflict of interest with any of these. But I have a disclaimer to make, DAA is not a new approach, and I am not here to sell DAA, and I am not against any other approaches we have been doing. Tried with all, all the tables that is available, starting from the HANA table up to the you know, fracture table that is available in the war, and having a Mayo extension in a normal table. And finally ended up doing in a normal table, sometimes with a break at the level of the uh, ASIS at the foot break. So the first part, why? Uh, you can see, go, if you go to the literature, you can find all those advantages from the proponents of DAA that is starting from lace, pain, lace, and then these all things. And I'm sure all those other operative surgeons also have the same result with this. And if you are doing for a long time, you will have the same result after some time. There's not much of a difference. If you go to the meta-analysis of the recent 2023, there is not much of a difference. But there are something that you cannot ignore, especially it's a muscle repairing approach. Second, the lesser hospital stay, which comes after because of the less pain in the early mobilization. And more importantly, the reduced your time when you are doing the bilateral cases. Especially when I go for the bilateral bony ankylosis of the hip, it helps during the uh, using of the fluoroscopy and DA, it becomes easier for me to delineate the depth, size, and sometimes the orientation of the acetabulum. And for me, if you tell me why, it's it started from learning an alternative approach from the, all the conversion approaches that has been I separate from the posterior lateral approach to the direct anterior approach. But the road was not that easy. After a lot of all those stiff learning and a lot of complications, you can see in the single lift going up to 1.5 liters and taking time after 168 minutes from the initial cases. And coming up to the 200 plus cases, after a certain learning curve, the most noted advantage that I have regarded it would be a predictable component position under the image and minimization of the war time especially in the bilateral cases. And we are doing all these cases from the simple primary to the complex primary with implants in situ. And we're doing the bilateral regularly. And we have recently contributed to the Indian experience of direct anterior approach in the book by Lee Rubin, the only book in the world for the direct anterior approach, the comprehensive test book. And the recent video of direct anterior approach in bony ankylosis approach was uh, played in the OVT medium uh, in the uh, WS this year only. And we presented our paper in the American College of Surgeons in 2022. <clears throat> now, basically, come to the how, how part, because most of the surgeons have their own, own way of saying yes or no for this. All the proponents will say that I'm happy with doing it, and the opponents will definitely say that there are some hindrances from the initial cases to till date that you are doing. So this is a 67-year-old male, active male, before the, <coughs> before the trauma, fracture neck of femur. I do it in a normal table with a, a provision of break at the foot end at some time, with limited instrumentation provided by this middle group. This is the standard incision in the anterior spec. The incision, the uh, proximal action of the incision to be to such that, that your distal pulp is buried under the skin while uh, palpating the ASIS. You expose the TFL muscles, you see the pinky sieve and the direction of the TFL fibers. Give a nick over the TFL muscle, and extend your incision proximally and distally. Creating the two flaps of anterior fascia. Hold the anterior fascia medial flap with the help of the tissue welding forceps and separate the muscle from the fascia. Once the muscle is separated, you can do a finger dissection and use the deep lang and vector. Now you are already in front of the anterior hip. The next step is to carefully delineate the 
vessels and carrier leaves. This is the place where I give maximum of my time. Because in my initial cases, if you see, there were up to 1.5 liter blood loss because of this one. I tried everything, tying them, coagulating them, and they dropped enzymes. After coagulating, the either ends inside, the next is inside the posterior fascia. And now you are over the fat of the anterior capsule. Move your finger superiorly, you will find a gap between the gluteus minimus and the superior capsule. Put your first detector in the superlateral aspect. Move your finger medially and inferiorly, you will find another gap as the inferior retract. Now the next step is to erase the muscle from the anterior capsule, the iliocapsularis and the EFL. With the help of the cuffs elevator, you erase the muscle, replace this with the help of the anterior retractor directing towards the contralateral kidney. See the direction of the anterior retractor. You find the beautiful white glistening capsule here. I usually do an inverted T-shaped incision here, sometimes converting it to the gas shape, just like you opening the capsule from this side. This, this was a case of fracture neck of femur. I tried to preserve the capsule. Not always I tried to preserve the capsule, but in certain cases, I tried to preserve the capsule. So creating the superior flap of the anterior capsule. Similarly, create the inferior flap of the atrial capsule. Secure it with the help of the tie suture, the superior capsule secured, and then reposition the superior retractor underneath the capsule over the femoral neck. Similarly, tie the inferior capsule and reposition your inferior retractor underneath the capsule over the inferior neck. And you can see it's not the case of fracture neck of femur, the femoral head is already moving. <coughs> just because it was a fracture, I just pressure the margins of the fracture so that I can create some space to remove the femoral head. Otherwise, in a normal case, I try to take out the napkin ring of bone from this part. Clearing the bone in between, uh, in, in the, at the fracture side. And now then you take a cock screw, <laughs> engage into the femoral head, rotate it sufficiently so that all the soft tissue additions, if any there are, got removed. You can see the movement, unless and until the femoral head moves, don't try to pull it off. Once it is moving, give a circular movement 360 degree, and by pulling it down, downside, you can remove the femoral head. Now reposition the retractor. The inferior retractor goes just outside that TAR. The posterior retractor, so that you push the proximal femur downward. And an additional retractor you can keep is the lateral retractor. Now for any approach, what you want? You want a 360 degree view of the acetabulum. And you can see the 360 degree view of the acetabulum. As usual, the first retractor goes deep, uh, the first rimmer goes deep, and using the successive rimmers, you come up to the desired position of desired size. The first rimmer is always deep, and then you can adjust your uh, 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 the uh, inclination in the version as a for <coughs> your desired position. In the meantime, when you are come to the desired position, you can always check over the X-ray. So the last thing I want to do under the X-ray guidance so that I will have my cup exactly in that position. This is what after the, see the screw position. The screw position should always be lateral to the ASIS level in case you have to put the screws. This was the case of fracture neck of femur, so I desire to put, put the screws in this case. And under X-ray guidance also you can just have a fill and you could impact the cup inside. If you want to do the additional screws also, you can see under the image guidance so that if you want. This is just for the purpose of video. I, I, taken these all these things. And since it was a factor neck of femur, I decided to use a dual mobility cup, so the metal liner goes in. Now your cup part is over. The biggest challenge is the femoral part. It's not femoral exposure, it's femoral mobilization. Holding the superior capsule, inside the capsule, just beneath the capsule is the labrum, capsular labrum release. And this release is important to bring your proximal femur away from the acetabulum. Then goes with the inferior release. The inferior release goes up to the lesser trochanter so that you'll be able to palpate the lesser trochanter there. So simultaneous external rotation of the limb and externally rotating and going the inferior release. The double point retractor goes medially, actually it's posterior for the femur. You can see the movement of the femur and this position you put the trochanter retractor to elevate it. So the sequence is first capsule labra release, second inferior release, then only try to elevate it. Now the superior release, 
just at the tubal o'clock position after just after the super capsule is your conjoint tendon so once you release the conjoint tendon there will be a piriformis split you will feel in your hand with the bone hook that you are holding you will feel that the femur is just coming up once this position is done then only add up the limb so now we are coming up the position that the femoral mobilization is properly done and elevating it rest of the procedures remain the same as the other box sigil so here we are coming up so there is one additional uh, instrument called canal finder here this the medical people have provided with this one so this helps both as a canal finder as well as the uh, lateralizer for me and since this i am using a libata system so it is just like a corel you always have to many of the times i have to do a distal limbing before for anything so because of the time i have cut at on part do a successive brushing uh, so this is the dual uh, component dual mobility component so all this cerebral part and the femoral part you can see this once you see in the check x ray you see the mobility you see the limb length and go for the definite implantation so the metal liner is already in now you have to assemble the femoral head inside the poly liner so during uh, reduction i would like to bring the limb into the neutral position didn't see it see the component check the stability at the end i would like to the during direct entry approach i would like to keep it in the figure of four position and check the stability because remember the most complication for posterior approach is posterior dislocation and for the anterior approach is anterior dislocation and not in all the cases i try i preserve this capsule this is particular case i had <coughs> preserved the capsule tie the capsule this is what up for the capsule closure and the only thing that you have to repair at the end is the anterior fascia of tensor fascia lata muscle so this is what at the end <coughs> like thank you for your kind attention sir yeah i have to leave so if any questions i'm happy to answer now or we can catch up sometime i know uh, many of us are not uh, yeah yeah i have a question why do you use dual mobility is so stable anterior okay okay it is in not all the cases i use the dual mobility here i have to forget tell in 2002 bell the patient son said that he had some weakness in the right lower limb some brain hemorrhage something like that but before the surgery i did all the investigation there were no any lesion thinking that maybe something in the future or something like that i just used it as a dual mobility for a added stability in a direct entry approach not with him not all cases i do dual mobility as a literature mention about 8 to 19% risk of damage to the anterior so that is that is the literature so how, comes uh, up from the literature come literature comes up from all those initial parts initial part once you have gone cross some certain numbers and those complications are not there and the anterior lateral parts sir oh, sorry sir. so so those all those things are from the initial cases sir I don't have been yes i showed that in initial cases we had all those complications that is written in the book that is not written in the book and after certain numbers then only it gets stabilized so nowadays almost all my primary ths are da okay any more questions thanks dr deepak thank you sir uh, please set up the screen in this team right this one
Okay. Uh, getting the stem right is basically there are many things which we have to look when you do a THR. Let it be the previous one. I like that. One. So we talk about how to execute a stem insertion. We talk about how to get the hip biomechanics right and how do you match that to the acetabulum which you have put because ultimately THR is not just putting a cup or a putting a stem. It is going to get a good stable hip in a patient so we reduce the risk of dislocation and get the limb length discrepancy etc. corrected as much as physically possible within the limits. So most of the surgeons are worried about cup placement in THR and we have discussed about uh, this in the last previous lectures. It's important, no doubt about it, but many times once you put a cup, uh, it is more important probably I think to do the stem placement right because we have much more variation in a stem placement than we can get in a cup placement. So <clears throat> basically we can put acetabular component in a certain position only, I'll, most of the cap we cannot change the position of acetabulum much. We can change the origin and inclination, but uh, stem component can be modulated in multiple ways. For example, if this is the case, uh, we have to put a cup. The cup would be put into this particular position, which will be anatomical uh, baseline to the teardrop point. We cannot make this cup go too much internally or medially or laterally. You cannot make the cup go too much up and down. We have got more or less a single position where you can put the cup. The variation is only in terms of inclination and version. But if you want to put a stem uh, in a hip, we can increase the offset of a stem. We can reduce the offset of a stem. We can increase the height of a neck. We can reduce the height of a neck. We can change the version of all that thing. And we can do this uh, very reasonably with most of the instrumentation system. So we must be able to understand and we must be able to use this variability in doing the stem implanting. So usually if you put acetabulum component inside and if you feel that there is some error or something which you are not very happy about, to some extent you can compensate that by using a slight change in the position of your component. Of course, this happens within limit and probably that is one of the reason what we talk about is the combined antivirgin concept of Ranavat where you put a cup inside and then if you are not very happy, you can change the version of a stem by few degrees to get more or less stable hip. Of course, this won't happen if you are grossly wrong in a version of your cup. So normally what we do is when we dislocate the hip, we look at the femur, look at where the acetabular uh, you know, femoral head is, we try to pay, put a central mark on the femoral head and then we take two fixed point marks on the tip of the trochanter and base of the lesser trochanter. These are not a very specific mark, one uh, arbitrary point at the tip you can take. We normally measure these points, uh, that is a vertical length between the lesser trochanter and the center of the head and we measure the horizontal, that is the offset. And then once we get those measurements, we go for the neck cut. Normally we take a neck cut as we have done previously. We take at 90 degree to the mechanical axis. So if this is a long axis of the neck, presuming you are doing a component like a coral, the, cup, uh, the, the cut comes normally at 90 degree to this long axis where the lateral end exits into the pyriformis fossa. Now once we have done that, we will prepare the femur. We have presumed we have put the acetabulum inside. The most important point to remember, remember is that the acetabul uh, the entry point for the femur head in most of the cases is quite lateral. It's not from the center of the cut neck. And uh, this is the point where we have to enter in about 80-90% cases. This changes only if you have got hip which is too much valgus neck where the entry point may come a little medially along the neck or if it is severely varus neck it may go still lateral. So we have to look at the x-ray before the surgery and then decide the entry point. Once we get the entry point right, we normally like to put a small rod along the neck to make sure that we are concentric with the femoral cavity. So when we broach, the broach comes in a coaxial fashion to the long axis of the femoral, uh, femoral length. If you don't do that, we end up putting a cup uh, stem which could be little varus or a valgus. Many times there is a small portion of a neck which is left on the lateral end of the femoral stem and this has to be removed by an uh, instrument called lateralizer. Most of the company will give you this rough uh, area which can lateralize and get uh, you a completely coaxial with the axis of the 
femoral uh, canal. Uh, once you have put the stem, normally, uh, especially for a stem like coral, we start broaching and we start increasing the size. Usually what we get in most of the uh, patient with a good quality is the first good fit. That is the fit where you start and put the brooch flush with the neckline and you hold the handle of the brooch, start rotating in medial lateral and if the entire femur start rotating with your handle, that means you have got a good grip. Usually, in most of the cases, you can still go one size bigger and put a bigger component uh, unless the patient has got a very large, uh, you know, very small medullary cavity. So normally in Corel we stop at the first brooch which is the first good grip because we can then have option of going to one size bigger even in a non stiffened component. Now once you have put the trial component inside, we put the trial head and then we put the center of the head and again make the measurement between the center of the head and the two marks which are done, along one along the tip of the greater trochanter which tells you exactly what is the intra-op offset which you are creating for that particular patient. Compare that with the offset we have measured in a pre-cut femur and you know exactly whether we have kept the offset same, have we kept it long, have we kept it short and at the same time we also measure the vertical length which is a neck length along the neck and that again you have option of changing if you want. So you know exactly whether this trial particular head with this trial component is going to give you a proper offset comparable to the previous one. Now many times what happens is we do not have to get back the original offset all the time because the femur may be distorted, the acetabulum may be distorted, there may be soft tissue problems, some hips are very loose and they are very lax and you try to get just recreate original form, the laxity is so much you end up putting a longer neck length and end up elongating, elongating the hip. So to prevent that we normally go by the first trial fit which is there, you go by the first trial cup and see how it looks. Now. If you find after reduction the hip is too loose uh, or too short, we can have ability to modulate this offset. We can go for a bigger offset or a higher offset or a smaller offset and accordingly. So for example, in a particular case like this, a dysplastic hip and that's the center of rotation of the femoral head. Now we have option of putting a bone graft or some augment in that area and put your cup to the normal anatomical level. And if you do that, then we will have to get the femoral head down, so we'll be elongating and depending on how much elongation you do, in some of the cases you may have to do subtrochanteric osteotomy to reduce the effect of elongation on a sciatic nerve. But many times in this particular patient, we uh, used a position of a cup which is slightly proximal and that is also accepted if you go within say a centimeter from the teardrop point and if you get a good quality bone, many times people prefer to go for a cup which is at that level because then you can put many times a primary cup even sometimes without requiring a screw if you got a good fixation. But when you do that your stem normally has to be adjusted to the cup position and you may have to use a slightly longer neck length otherwise the whole thing can become loose and you can see that in this particular stem we could do the primary stem we didn't have to do any kind of a uh, shortening osteotomy there and the stem has to be slightly longer than the height compared to the opposite side. So you have to modulate and when you do that you can get a equal limb length in the patient. So when you are talking about restoring the biomechanics, it's not just the offset, it's not just the neck length, it's the com combination of the two. The neck length and position of the acetabulum will give you a total limb length and there are ways how to correct that? We have we use normally infra acetabular pin and a mark on the trochanter that that is published in JOA and that we find quite accurate to get intraoperative assessment. So effectively, the stem preparation is not just putting a stem inside. We have to also think about how does your stem matches with the acetabular component which you have put before that. Now, this is a X-ray uh, of a patient. Now, if you can see. Pre-surgery to post-surgery, the position of these three points, the tip of the trochanter, the lesser trochanter and center of the head forms this kind of a triangle. It is converted to a different type of triangle and that exactly demonstrates that during the surgery, we do not have to recreate the normal, uh, uh, normal femoral dimension. We have a liberty to change offset, liberty to change the neck length and then accordingly match the position of these three things to the acetabular component so you can get a balanced tip at the end of the day. 
And if you realize that this is a two-dimensional representation of a 3D object, we can always say that in case of excessive version, if you don't get a version right, X-ray may appear to be a short offset because of anti version one egg. So on table, when you measure it, that effect is not uh, as effective because we are actually measuring a 3D component. So in nutshell, getting perfect stem is not just selecting a particular type of implant, company A, B, or C. It is not just trying to select, should I use a cemented or a non-cemented options. It's not just broaching it adequately or placing the proper version or adequate depth, it is matching your implant with respect to the acetabular component which you have put before that and then get a proper biomechanics so you get a stable hip, you get an equal limb length and you can get a happy patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions for sir? Uh, while others, please set up your screen. Modi, sir. Harish, yeah. how much lengthening can you get supratrochanteric in liblet equal inequality and what precautions would you take intraoperatively to see that sciatic nerve is intact? Usually up to one inch, that is two, maybe 2.5 centimeter lengthening is not so difficult and with that we may not need to do a subtrochanteric osteotomy. But if you have to elongate the leg more than that, then we may have to think about subtrochanteric osteotomy to release the tension on a sciatic nerve. Second thing is, if you have got a dysplastic, which is dysplastic from beginning, where the whole uh, left part of a, or that particular part of a patient is not developed very well from the childhood, so you can see a small pelvic uh, size, you can say small ileum, small ischium, you can say narrowed femur compared to the opposite normal side, then this sciatic nerve also has not developed very well. And in this situation, the entire dysplastic limb, if I want to elongate it, then I am little more liberal about using a subtrochanic osteotomy because the sciatic nerve has never developed. But if you get a cases like an excision hip, patient has been, uh, excision hip is done few years ago because of infection or some other reason. And now you want to elongate that patient. This side, the sciatic nerve has developed very well. So such hips can easily tolerate elongation up to one inch without any significant problem. Uh, yeah, Dr. Mari. Yeah, a very quick question. Yeah. You mentioned that you can correct the antiversion with this standard stem. You have a, a standard and cemented stem taper ones, the, the norm, the standard ones, well press fit with the correct size. How much can you correct the antiversion in that yeah. case? It's a good question. In a coral stem, if you've got a good quality bone, it is not necessary to get a very cortex to cortex fixation. If you get a first primary fixation, you can vary by maybe five degree plus minus. But if you find that you have to get more version change compared to what the femur has, then should not, you should not use coral to go for something like SROM, because then you get unlimited amount of version adjustment which can be done. Or you can go for a, something like a cone Wagner, where again you can rotate in whichever way you want. My question so, is, how many degrees can you correct antiversion with a perfect size standard taper stem. How much can you correct with a correct size? Primary coral, as I said, when we get to the first fit which I get, we can adjust by about five degree maximum, not more than that. five degrees, yes. Because that much amount of cancerous bone is there on either side of coral. We don't have to fill the canal with coral. Thank you, Harissa. Okay, others, we are waiting for you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's my third time to HN Alliance. I really love coming here. So I'm going to be speaking about stepping up the game with robotics in THR. I'm Dr. Adarsh Anapradi from Hyderabad. So robotics have entered every aspect of life now. Uh, you have things doing everything for you, uh, dispensing pills, following in the airport. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, medicine robots don't look this sexy. Uh, I think the other surgical fields came before the joint replacement. The Da Vinci has been gen in general surgeons since more than two, three decades. And one of the first robots for uh, surgery was the Neuromate for neurosurgery. I'll be specifically talking about the Mako robot. This is Trico Mako fourth generation. And we saw a beautiful surgery by Vijay Bosar with the Kori uh, today. And uh, so the first question is why? The, the THR is a forgotten joint, has uniformly great results. Forgotten joint scores have been good. Surgeon feels that he can do no wrong. So usually a hip surgeon is a superman. But then there's so many variables you really think deep. The antiversion, inclination, sizing, femur sizing. And then so many things that can actually go wrong. I have a talk again after a few sessions about uh, dislocation as well. So 
you put your cup wrong and then you can have so many different things going wrong. So then you start to feel a little worried. And then if you go even more depth, you have other things like bone stock, limb length discrepancy, offsets, and then you really start to feel nervous. So, and, and you also have studies showing that in a lot of these uh, cases, 50 to 75% of cases are not actually within the Luenic safe zones which we keep talking about. So this is all the amount of tinkering you need to do to get a really good total hip. So what if I can address all of these things at one go? You can do it with the robo. That's the advantage here. It's not the only way to go about it. I'm not going to try to say that. I think this whole conference is just to show the advantages of technology, not trying to say that it replaces the conventional method. So I'm again speaking about the striker Meko, and just a, a brief look at the evolution of um, uh, uh, technology in orthopedics. We have static planning, that is the templates in the 50s, then in the 90s you had navigation, and then you had the freehand uh, tools, like the, uh, the Cori uh, type of uh, robots in 2000. At the same time, the robot arm assisted surgeries came into, the, into uh, the field, that is a Mako. And if you look at the classification, I'm speaking specifically about the semi-autonomous robot, which is the Mako. Again, this is uh, what the difference from what we saw uh, pre-lunch. That was an imageless uh, robot, and this is an image-based robot. The difference, because here we need to get a CT scan. So if you go through the uh, process, first thing we do is get a CT scan. And all these films are taken together by the technician, and they're, made, they're segmented together. And we create the patient-specific um, 3D model for us on the system. And using this model, we can do all our planning. We can do all our cuts, and it helps us get real-time information onto the screen while we're operating. So you see the OT layout. I'm standing on, I'm a, I'm a posterior surgeon, so lateral decubitus. I, I stand behind the patient, and the robot comes in from the opposite side. There is a monitor here, which is at the, near the anesthetist's workstation. If you take a brief look, brief look at the workflow, you have the planning, then the landmarks, then you have replaced the pelvic array just like we saw in uh, Vijay Bosar's uh, surgery. You have to do something called a stable registration. Then the reaming and the cup impaction can also be done with the help of the robot. Again, it's not guiding you, you are, it's only assisting you. Then the femoral preparation and the trial reduction. So if you talk about implant planning, as uh, Harish Bendesar just mentioned, uh, templating is basically you're, you're using a 2D template for a 3D bone. So it's not going to be 100% accurate. So now we've shifted from 2D planning to 3D planning. So the first bit of information we get is we get to see the limb length assessment before the surgery even starts. So I can see in this particular case, I'm 3 mm shorter, so I want to get that 3 millimeters uh, after the surgery is done. And after you put your trial implants virtually, you can also see that in these particular implants, I'm able to get an exactly equal limb length. Again, you can also check the acetabular component placement in terms of the angle. So you can plan your angle, whether it's inclination or version. You can change this according to what you feel is right. You can change your cup size depending on the three. You can get the transverse cut, the sagittal and the coronal cut. Make sure that you're getting good columnar purchase. And in all the other views, you're making sure you have a perfectly fitting cup. And of course, you can use the robot to help re restore your center of rotation. And uh, as you know, the pelvic tilt and sacral slope is the latest you know, the talking point in all the conferences. Uh, if you have a stiff spine, you're going to have different um, cup positioning that you want to put in. So you don't really need to break your head about, okay, st sit, uh, stuck standing, stuck sitting, what, is it, what am I supposed to do? Here you enter your sacral slope values and LS uh, spine lateral, sitting and standing, you enter into the robo and it will tell you where your cup should be. So now you have something called as virtual range of motion in the latest iteration of the Mako robot, where I can just take my robot through my virtual limb through the range of motion. This isn't sitting. 90, 500, and then I can internal rate and see if there's any impingement happening in my particular cup placement. And then if you see this isn't sitting, and this isn't standing, if you see that in five degrees external rotation, five degrees extension and 30 degrees external rotation, if you see it's going to start impinging over here, you see the red dot over here. So then I say, okay, maybe my cup is too antiverted. So that's why it's impinging. So I can reduce my cup antiversion and get rid of that impingement. You see now I'm going to reduce the antiversion and that impingement has disappeared. So it gives me this extra bit of information as well. So that's called as VROM or virtual range of motion. Of course, you can also do femoral component sizing and offset adjustment with this robot. It tells you the right size. It even gives you an idea of where your neck cut should be, as well as your native femoral antiversion. It gives you a pre-op visualization of the post-op x-ray as well. 100% of the time, your post-op x-ray will look just like this. The reaming part, the beauty here is uh, we don't have to do sequential reaming anymore. Now it's a single ream once you've decided your cup size. You guys go in and then um, you bring it near your surgical field. And uh, I'll just quickly go through this. I don't want to waste too much time. You can see down there, I'm reaming. I still have control over the reamer, 
but it's within a funnel haptic. It's not going to let me go outside this green. It even tells me how much superior I need to go, how much medial I need to go. And once I start reaming, the green on the screen starts to disappear. I hope you can see that. And once I start reaming, you, should, you will notice that the green starts to disappear. There. And once all the green is out, we know that you're right. You got your perfect ream. So you don't have to do your serial reaming. You don't have the trial and error. You just know what cup size it is. If say it's a 52 cup, you go and put a 51 reamer in and go ahead and ream it. You don't even need to do your medial ream anymore. On the cup impaction also, it helps. So you don't... Yeah, you lock, lock it. Um, I attach the cup. It locks into my planned uh, angle, 40 degrees and 20 degrees. And then I start hitting it. You notice this number here. Uh, it records it saying that I'm eight proud now. Okay, then I slide my sleeve down and hit it again. Now it's come to two proud. I hit it again. And it's come to one proud. So then I make sure that I don't go too deep. So that's another beauty of this. At the end, I can also check what is my final value. Five points on the, con there's a concentric ring on the cup. And once you put your probe on the five points, it tells you in the bracket is what we planned and outside is what we got. It even tells you how accurate you have been. So we already know the x-rays are going to look like, as I mentioned earlier. And my procedure time is actually reduced. You may think that the registration and putting the arrays will increase your surgical time. But because you're saving time in the reaming, saving time, I don't trial anymore. So you're actually saving time. I do my robotic hips almost 10 minutes faster than my conventionals. What does it mean for the patient? Yes, the surgeon is feeling comfortable. Does it really reflect for the patient? It does. Reduce surgical time and blood loss, unparalleled accuracy. You can restore the limb length to pre-pathological state. I won't say it's a smaller incision. That's a wrong term. I have to remove that. But reduce tissue trauma, definitely, uh, because you're doing a single ream. And reduce trial and error, of course. And just a few examples, I just want to show you how accurate the x-rays look to the pre-op plan. And you can use it for a dyspastic hip. You know where the proper bone stock is. And you can just plan it and execute exactly what you want. Even in uh, cases with implants in C2, you can manage to avoid these cups, I mean, the screws and the plates, just by adjusting the cup height and position just by a few millimeters and get away without taking out the hardware. Even these protrusive cases, we can manage to not use a very big hip uh, cup. This case, uh, I just wanted to show you, this is a stem version was 20 degrees. It's a very antiverted stem. And usually our antiversion of a cup is 20, but it was causing a lot of impingement because of increased femoral version. So what we did is brought it down to 12 degrees. Now, normally, you won't even dream of bringing that cup antiversion down to 12 because you're scared of posterior dislocation. But bring it down, reduced my impingement. And my combined antiversion, if you add the two together, the brooch version, and it is still 32 within my proper range. So I went ahead, I took the risk, and I got a very perfect stable hip with a 12 degrees version of the cup. So there is a lot of literature. I won't go bore you with all this. But it's showing that accuracy does improve. And um, the pain levels have also been less with the robotic case. And I'd like to thank my, uh, my uh, Sunshine team for the support. So remember, not all robots are evil. We can have make friends with robots. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adarsh. I would request Dr. Vijay Bose. Uh, yeah, you can meanwhile have the questions to Dr. Adarsh. Hi, hi, Adarsh. Yeah, the question is about the CT register, the CT required before surgery. Uh, do you not have a problem with pre-existing implant? Oh no, we haven't had any issues. But the thing is, uh, till now the software hasn't come in for revision hips yet. So we haven't been using the robot for it. There are some the Chinese surgeons who are doing some crazy things. There are some jugards, as you can say. But as of now, it's not been FDA approved for uh, revisions yet. But it can be done. I mean, if you can just think of some ingenious ways. The robotic will give you an accurate reproduction of the anatomical anatomy of the you know, patient's body. Yes, sir. How does it tackle the soft tissue inequality? Like you have got a young lady Absolutely. with the avian yeah. and very flexible hips. Yes. And you create the same offset neckline on the on on the robot and the same position of this. Yes. But you reduce it; it's going to be very lax. Correct. And you get a elderly person with a severe OA with a lot of osteophyte formation. Yeah. You do the same reduction; that may be a little stiff. Osteophyte so, will show because it's bone. No, 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 no. But the, the soft tissue lacks. Yeah, exactly. So the soft it, tissue it will not it take is, into it will not take into consideration that. So it's so, still at the end of the day, it's your feel. But it gives you that much of guidance still there. So your cup part, it doesn't really depend on the soft tissue. But when you're reducing your stem, it again depends on your feel. So we don't stick to the stem exactly what it gives. Only as so for you your do feel. stem manually. Absolutely. We do the stem manually. Balance it gives us an idea of how much your antiversion you got. So your stem is still manual. It's not reamed, it's not broached with the robot.
and the reduction results also sometimes we give a, a little long we give a 127 degree neck instead of 132 or we give a higher offset head depending on the soft tissue so technically you still have to do manipulation of femoral side to a little prevent bit, yes. elongation of limb length at a cost of me getting higher offset right exactly sir. yeah uh, what about the cartilage thickness like in tkr what is the issue is there an issue of few millimeters no sir so it doesn't take into consideration the cartilage because it's a ct scan so it will show wrong thing uh, not necessarily sir, because we are seeing the, uh, the the cut views the ct cut views of the exact where the cortical bone is so we're reaming down to that directly so we're just disregarding how much cartilage is and just reaming down to where we get the perfect fit so the first part where your complete fit between your columns that's where we go for anyway so it kind of disregards we don't have to do our medial reaming now like we need to go for the to get to the cotyloid forces we don't need to do that now Yes. Sometimes uh, in your normal reaming also, there's a small sclerotic bone which doesn't allow us to seat your cup way down. Mm. Here you said you use only a single reamer. So does that sclerotic bone not uh, put your cup out? No, not necessarily because it's it's a complete hemispherical ream. You've gone down to where you need to go. So it takes out even that sclerotic bone which is there. So that's all part of that green. That sclerotic bone also goes in the green that you saw on the screen. So actually the reaming here is a little tougher because you have to put a lot of force to get all the way down there. So I usually use an assistant to push down while I'm rotating my uh, reamer. Reamers also have to be sharp. Reamers also have to be sharp. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Adarsh. I think, I, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, no, I think we're very late. We're two hours late. Dr. Bose. Uh, thanks uh, for the kind invitation. Been a pleasure to be here. So my uh, uh, job is to cover the acetabular bone loss so whenever we um, hear any talk on acetabular bone loss, usually the speaker will talk about the classification and then they'll go through the various options that are available today to deal with bone loss. But this doesn't help the surgeon who has got a case in his hand to how to manage his bone loss. So this just doesn't help in that way. So what we really need to do is uh, to find out what is the essence of the, of the classification. The Peperowski is the one that's most used. The reason we all like Peperowski is because it tells you what to do, not just theoretically classify it. So basically, uh, the difference between type 2 and type 3 is the columns are intact with type 3, and the proximal migration is less than 3 centimeters. So those are the two guidelines that you have. So when you find that the proximal migration is less than 3, then you're dealing with the type 2 where your management is completely different. The type 3, when your migration is more than 3 centimeters, your, your, your management is completely different. 4, of course, is pelvic discontinuity. So here is a Paprosky 1. You can see there is no bone, uh, not bone loss at all. So you can use any cup that you want. It's no big deal. It's just like a primary case. Uh, but it's important that in a Paprosky 1, especially, you should not exceed or must be very close to the native size. I keep talking about this, that in the native, you respect the native size. That's very important. Uh, that is um, Paprosky type 2. Uh, you see there's proximal migration here, but less than 3 centimeters. So your management is completely different. So we do what is known as the jumbo cup principle, which I'll cover shortly. So we have done a cup. Now you can see that once you come into the jumbo cup principle, the, the cup size is much larger than the native size. And that's the definition of the jumbo cup. The American surgeons use, uh, you know, like more than 60 or uh, 66, but that doesn't hold true for the Asian population. So uh, the jumbo cup by definition is much larger than native size, a significant uncovering, and therefore it, you must use an augmented porous surface. You cannot use any cup, you must use an augmented porous surface. That's what we mean by jumbo reconstruction. So you can see some examples of jumbo reconstruction. A lot of uncovering will be there by definition. That's why uh, when you have a highly porous cup, the, um, the percentage of post bone contact can come significantly down. So another uh, thing here also is a significant migration, but less than three centimeters. So we, again, we use a jumbo cup reconstruction. The principle of a jumbo cup is a much larger cup. There is some uncovering highly porous cup. Now, there are three subtypes as described by Paprosky, uh, but all you can see the migration less than three, and all that we use a uh, jumbo cup. So as long as the migration is less than three, our principle of management is jumbo cup reconstruction. You can see all these things have been managed with jumbo cup reconstruction. So what do you mean by jumbo cup technique is that we find that uh, a lot of people think that, you know, if you put a cup there, put a lot of screws, like a picture that you put on a wall, it will hang, it will not hang. You have to respect some very important principles of socket reconstruction. The first thing is, you have to get what is known as AP capture. AP capture, today I didn't show you, but AP capture means uh, one good test that we have for AP capture is that the cup, the trial must not be able to rotate. It will still toggle, 
but not rotate. As long as it engages one diameter, which usually is the most minimum diameter of the socket, the socket, the trial cannot rotate. And that's why you have established AP stability. That's your first step when you're doing a jumbo cup reconstruction. You must get your AP capture. Without AP capture, how many screws you put, that socket will fail. So the, once you've got your AP capture, the next point is to do is get what's known as three-point fixation. Now, any inanimate object must need three minimum points for fixation. Only when you spend energy, you can stand on two legs. But any inanimate object will need three points. The third thing, you can have 20 points also, that's fine. But the minimum that you need is three points. That's the biomechanical principle. So we have to go. So how do we get a third point? We expand the AP dimensions to, so that the cup can reach the superior point, which is your third point. And once you get a third point, the, the, you'll eliminate toggle. So that's how you eliminate toggle by getting a third point fixation. So basically, you'll be reaming into the columns. And that's why the cup is much larger. But that's the whole principle of the jumbo cup. You are uh, losing AP bone but in, to get your third point. And then once you get a third point, you put a much larger cup. And then you get your stability. You can put a lot of screws, of course, as an aid. But this concept of getting AP purchase and a third point fixation is absolutely critical for your jumbo socket reconstructions. So here is an animation of that. Typically, in all these migrations, the superior inferior diameter will be much larger than the AP diameter. So you start dreaming such that you first you get AP capture, and then you keep expanding, expanding till you go to your third point. And once you get a third point, you can put your screws. It's good to screw, put inferior screws as well. So that's your jumbo cup reconstruction. So examples of a, of a defect like that, you can see that we have put screws, and that's your jumbo cup reconstruction. So and what, then we go to the type 3. So now this principle of jumbo cup will not work. I'll tell you why it will not work. So an additional columnar bone loss is present. The, the discrepancy between the superior inferior diameter and the AP diameter is now very large. So the same principle will not work. 3A is up and out, and 3B is up and in, as described by Paprowski. Uh, so if you, uh, the, you, know, you know, a lot of examples we saw today with the you know, little high hip centers in primary dysplasia cases, that's fine, because the remodeling in primary dysplasia occurs in good bone. But remember that in, uh, in, um, in revisions, the migration occurs in the background of osteolysis in poor bone. So you must not put high hip centers. You must always, in revisions, bring the socket back to its native center. Because unlike primary here, it's poor bone, and you cannot put a socket there. So a reconstruction like this would be a bad point. So uh, please avoid putting uh, such high uh, centers when you're doing revision, when the migration has occurred on the background of osteolysis. So revision hip is not tolerant of high hip centers. High loosening rates, if, they, if the, uh, the, the thing that we go, index that we go is that if the inferior edge of the cup is higher than the apex of the teardrop, then you are likely to face problems. So how to address this problem? So, we, so because we can't go to the third point, we now have to have some kind of an augment. So that's how, so typically once you go from two to three, jumbo cup will not work, and we need to go into augment territory. We need to use some kind of augment to get the third point fixation. Just expanding the cup will not give you your third point fixation. Now I'll tell you why third point fixation will not work. So it's a similar case, but now the discrepancy between the superior inferior and the anteroposter diameter is bigger. So we now start off just like a jumbo cup. We go expand, expand, expand. But by the time we come to the third point, you've blown out the anterior of the posterior column. So that's not work. And that's the reason why a jumbo cup cannot be used in a Paprowski three, uh, uh, three type osteolysis. So what you should do, you must stop there when you're running out of columns. And because you can't go to the third point, you bring the third point down. And that's the principle of how we use the augment in Paprowski. Now we can see that we got a third point fixation. We brought the third point down. And that's how your augment works, biomechanically, yeah. So here's the Paprowski 3A defect. And we can see that how we cannot go all the way up there. The migration is more than 3 centimeters. So we have now put an augment and brought the third point down. And now this uh, reconstruction works very well. So using of augments, we have the classical mode of augment where we use the augment within the cavity. That's the classical mode. And then we can also use, uh, that's how we use the classical mode. We can also use uh, uh, augment outside the, uh, I will skip this. Yeah, so we can use as a flying buttress. Typically, you'll have a lot of uncovered cup outside. You can use it as a flying buttress. That's the other common mode that we use the augment in. And of course, when you have full columnar loss, we have to use the columnar augments. And rarely, we use the augment as a footing as well. Now, the one thing I want to cover today is the challenges that we have with current augments is that there have been times where I opened three TM augments or two augments, and I ended up not using any of them because they just didn't fit the defect. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's very tough to crack. And then also, the, all these augments, TM augments, are very big for our population. So uh, commonly, the screw holes do not match the areas of bone stock result in poor holes. So these are the problems that we have in Asian patients 
where you're not able to get a good reconstruction. So we had to do something about it. So we have devised this uh, CCD augment, which stands for the col Custom Column Knot Docking Augment. So this is very good for Asian patients, where uh, we find that we cannot use the standard augments. So we use these augments. Now, now this gets sort of a real good hole to the columns. So I get locking screws through the columns. Now we are drilling from superior to inferior side, both the anterior and the posterior column, and then we are able to get really a clamp-like fixation on the uh, on the, on the socket, and then you are able to achieve that. So it has been very helpful in Indian patients where the uh, custom, where the off-the-shelf augments have not been useful. You can see how we get the column knot fixation with minimal bone, and then we are able to get a rigid concept of the augment, and then we are able to do a good socket reconstruction. And we, in this augment, we get compression screws, we also get docking screws, and we also get dome screws, all the important principles of this augment. An example of the CCD augment, you can see uh, Peprowski 3 defect here. And that's the planning of the, of the custom augment, and you can see a nice reconstruction without uh, you know, you know, getting into trouble. And this is the planning that comes along with the augment. So you have to, all, you have to give all the, first you have to put the, your uh, compression screw, and then you have to put your divergent locking screw or your locking screw, and then we get the uh, augment in place. So, uh, so that's the other augment. The, the last one is the Peprowski 4, which is basically a pelvic discontinuity, and a lot of things have been described. In the interest of time, I will not cover that. Um, so that's how you use a cup cage construct for a, a Paprowski 4. So the, the uh, final slide is that if you, are, if you are up to a type 2, the mode of reconstruction is a jumbo cup. In type 3, you have to go to an augment. And because you can't reach the third point, you bring the third point down to using an augment. At type 4, you usually use a cup cage uh, construct for a, third, for a 4. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bose. <coughs> While Dr. B uh, Vijay would answer questions, I would request Dr. Oliver, Professor Oliver, to set up his relevant surgery uh, <coughs> for the same vestibular bone loss in complex hip. Meanwhile, you can ask, ask how much questions. of uh, uh, protrusion are you willing to accept in a revision scenario? Because you can use jumbo cups, you might end up causing protrusion, and actually the cup migrating inside. So where's your stop limit, you know? Well, it's all predefined by the uh, dimensions of the anterior posterior column. So you cannot, you know, put a... 80 cup in our patient, not work that way. So the anterior posterior bone available, and we yeah. safely put uh, that much protrusion which an anterior posterior column allows you. There should not be any problems. Even if you have to go to the middle periosteum, which I've done many times, nothing will happen. Uh, so when you are putting a jumbo cup, how much extra bite can we get into the columns? Really, a column is available as a mechanical support. In millimeters, three, four on each side? I would think about, you know, four to five, five millimeters at least. Suddenly, if it cracks, then your whole reconstruction is lost. So, as long as you, I think it's a good idea to feel for the anterior posterior column using a hemostat, how much column is left. As you're chasing the third point, you must actually feel. If the anterior of the posterior column cracks, then you are in big trouble. And, and does the quality of bone matter? I mean, the osteoporosis? Absolutely, it matters. Yeah. So, it's basically a mechanical, biomechanical construct, and you need to have that anterior posterior support. The triangle must be there. You must not lose that triangle. That's very important. So, once you think of closing, stop. Thank you, Dr. Bose, uh, Dr. Professor Oliver. I would, my only request is if you can run the video faster, as we are almost three hours late. Yeah, I, I don't have. Um, yeah, I have. Okay. I have some slides. Oh. Don't worry. <laughs> so I don't have. I don't have a video surgery. So I will put the technique that I'm going to show you as an option to manage this uh, bone loss. So these are my disclosures. And the technique that I'm going to tell you is not related with the metal of the companies, the supplements, or the almonds. I'm going to talk about something cheaper that is called impaction bone grafting. Maybe all of you know that, but it had been described by a sleuth in Nimega, Netherlands, in 1984. And I will describe you the technique that we used to do in some cases. You need these special impactors, and then you template the defect. I have been mentioned, usually you have this superior defect that you can assess templated like that. You can see the defect there. And some people in that position use this kind of metal elements here, but we use this superior mass to contain the defect. Then we start uh, fixation with the fixation of this mesh with the small screws one centimeter distance between them and then we start putting some kind of graft inside 
the graph from the bone bank. And uh, then sometimes you need this kind of uh, defects that you have medial defect, and then you put a medial mesh or anterior one, and you need anterior mesh to contain this defect. So the key of this uh, surgery, in revision surgery, is the graft. So many people use this kind of graft, take the femoral head, take a reamer, and use this graft. This is not the graft that the original description of the technique, and mechanically, this kind of graft, or graft maybe will not be very useful. So the graft you must use is with your ranger. You have to bite this bone and take this size that could be around one centimeter size. So that's important because mechanically, this graft is more stable than the graft you can use with the bone mill or with the reamer. So that's an important key point. So with this graft, you start doing the impaction. You push, put this graft inside, and a strong impaction is needed. First of all, you can fill in the gaps with a small graft inside, but the strong one is with the strong impactor. So that's the important, because you get the stability of the, uh, all the complex at the end. So with these strong impactors that are, uh, are designed for that, you can get very nicely this graft incorporate to this acetabulum, and you create a new acetabulum that should be at least with a five millimeters size of this bone layer. And then you cement the cap inside this uh, bone. You, you can size the, 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 the cap and cement the cap inside. That is a very simple and cheap technique that sometimes restore the bone in compare with this metal augments and, and replacement. So the results of, of the technique have been published all around the world, but there are some publications like that one that say that this is impaction grafting. This is not impaction grafting. You put bone graft in an uncemented cup. This is a different technique with probably different results. So you have to take into account that, because in these cases that the people publish, are putting graft in there and then uncemented cap. This is not the impaction grafting technique. The impaction grafting technique is the one where you cement that. There are some small variations like that one. You can use these augments inside this bone just to have a, a retention of the, of the cap and, and decrease the, the, the amount of graft that you need. But this is not the same technique. It's a different one. So we have a very good result. Look at that. 88% survival at 15 years with bone restoring. But you have a limitation in very high uh, defect. Defect, we can measure the defect. You can contain the defect with a superior mesh, put the graft, get a new bone there, and cement the cap. So it's a very demanding technique, cheap, and need experience of the surgery. But at the end, you have to revise these uh, cases, you will get more bone for the revision, and you can use it in very complex cases that this is continuity with a, a stabilization of the posterior wall, as you have seen in this, in this case. So take home message, good re long-term result, clinical result with a keep bone stock. And as I told you before, you, at least you will have more bone for the next revision, especially in very young patients. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Oliver. I don't think we have any questions because Dr. Bose has already. In case you have any questions for Dr. Oliver, you can ask it privately. Thank you very much. I will request Dr. Pradeep Bosle. Yeah, Dr. Adarsh, sorry, sir. You carry on. Thanks to the reshuffle, I'm back again immediately. So, um, right. so I'll be speaking about preventing and managing an unstable THR, which is like one of the biggest nightmares of any hip replacement surgeon. 
So as you all know, hip replacement surgery is all about the right balance. You've got all these lines floating around because we need to have a perfectly balanced hip, otherwise you're gonna end up like this guy. Always completely unbalanced, right? So hip is all about the balance. So as I showed in the previous talk as well, there's a lot of tinkering to be done to get a perfect DHR. You gotta get the right depth, you gotta get the right height, the right angular placement, and there's really a lot to look at. So what are the factors that contribute to hip stability? Just in a bird's eye view, cup antiversion and inclination, the cup height and depth also matters, center of rotation, the femoral antiversion as well, the femur head size and head neck ratio is very, very important, which I'll be harping on about later. Offset restriction is very, very important too because you need to get the right abductor tautness. Limb length discrepancies can cause instability as well. And of course, abductor sufficiency is one of the most important points for a stable hip. So when you come to the unstable THR, the incidence for a primary THR is, can be up to 3%. Of course, a, a, an unstable THR after revision goes up to almost 7%. And 60% of dislocations happen within the first five weeks of THR. So, and this is definitely something that every hip, hip replacement surgeon is always having nightmares about. So if you look at the risk factors for an unstable THR, you have patient factors as well as surgical factors. The patient factors, of course, females are more uh, prone to hip, uh, unstable uh, dislocations, uh, age more than 80 years, neuromuscular disorders, cognitive disorders, alcoholism, abductor weakness, and prior hip surgery. These are all the patient factors. But the surgical factors is where we can actually make a difference and reduce the risk. So you have the surgical approach, capsular repair, soft tissue tension, component malpositioning, femoral head size, impingement, and surgeon experience, of course. So I'll be just uh, uh, probably develop, um, presenting one or two slides on each of these particular points. So let's talk about the surgical approach. There's a lot of things have been said today about the direct anterior, about the posterior approach. There was a meta-analysis done uh, for 13, uh, 1,300 knee uh, hips and they found the posterior approach dislocation rate was about 3.23%. With the capsular repair, it came down to 2%. Transtrochantric was around 1.2%. Anterolateral was 2.2%. And again, direct lateral was, approach is only 0.5%. It's not really much of a difference over there. And most other studies show there's almost no difference if you have a proper soft tissue closure. End of the day, right now, I think, with the experience of the hip surgeons, the approach doesn't really matter that much. But if you're starting out, probably you want to make sure that you're doing something which is less uh, um, prone to dislocating, and of course you want to make sure that your soft tissue closure is very good. So soft tissue tension is the next risk factor. Um, how do you get a good soft tissue tension? Definitely by making sure your offset is correct. This can be by uh, having a higher offset of the head or having a longer neck, or more acute angled neck. So these are the different ways to get your soft tissue tension. Then of course component malposition, as I mentioned earlier, excessive antiversion, anterior dislocation, you can have posterior dislocation, superior and inferior, it all depends on the cup positioning. Now, again, Luvinex safe zones is something which keeps coming under the radar. Uh, we have acetabular antiversion should be 20 plus or minus 5 degrees. Inclination should be 40 degrees plus or minus 10. But I think most people are now coming to combined antiversion, which is around the range from 25 to 50, depending male and female, there's a slight difference over there. And the coplanar test comes and helps, it comes into handy when you're trying to find out the combined antiversion. At the end of the day, nowadays people are talking about functional placement of the cups, as I mentioned in the talk on robotics with the virtual range of motion. You can put the cup depending on that particular patient's anatomy, depending on his spinal anatomy as well. So again, component malposition, we keep talking about the cup. It's not just the cup, the, the femur can also be malpositioned. It can be retroverted, it can be highly antiverted. So these can also cause a uh, lot of dislocations. We've had a case where the femur was too antiverted and started dislocating anteriorly, so we had to go and change that. Of course, then we spoke about the femoral head size. A smaller head has a higher chance of dislocation. Bigger heads give an improved head-neck ratio, and this reduces the risk of impingement. So you have a better head-neck ratio, which reduces the neck, uh, the risk of impingement, and you have a better jump distance. That's the distance required for that head to dislocate from the cup. That increases when you have a bigger head. So nowadays, I think mostly acceptable is 32 millimeter head and above is probably much safer option in a total hip replacement. Then of course you have impingement when you have two surfaces rubbing against each other, it's going to cause a levering action and cause, cause dislocation over here. And this can be a bony impingement like this, or an implant to implant, sorry, implant impingement is this, and this is a bony impingement, and you can have cement also causing impingement. So what are the methods to avoid impingement? You can have properly uh, positioned implants, restoring the offset is very important, bigger head sizes do help, dual mobility does help to reduce the impingement, option. and removal of osteophytes is very, very important. Sometimes we neglect that after a tough case, you put in the astablum and then we leave those osteophytes there. That can cause impingement. And avoid big lip liners. 
And again, robotics, virtual range of motion does help you. Uh, I've already showed you this. I'm not going to go into this again. Um, so now let's go to what if you've done all these things, but you still managed to dislocate your hip. So how do you evaluate an unstable DHR? First thing is a history and a clinical examination. You need to know, was there really some big force which caused the dislocation, or was it just a mild, small rotation which caused the dislocation? Of course, imaging, you have x-rays, PBH, AP, and lateral, and CT scans definitely help. Try to evaluate the direction of dislocation, because that can give you an idea of what's going wrong, and try to determine the primary cause. That's where the crux, try to find out the primary cause. It may be multiple causes, but one primary cause may be causing this dislocation. So how do you treat this? So initially, you try a closed reduction. If it reduces very easily, it could also mean that it's going to dislocate again easily. So may not always be a good thing. Bracing, after you've done a closed deduction, you can try to brace that patient in abduction for a few weeks, but it may uh, dislocate again in the future. End of the day, most dislocations require surgical intervention. This is uh, the, uh, one of the landmark papers in this particular topic by uh, Paproski and Delavalli. Uh, classification and management of unstable total hips. If you classify, depending on what is the primary cause, you have six types. Type 1 is because of astabular component malposition. Type 2 is femoral component malposition. Type 3 is because of uh, abductor uh, complex insufficiency. Type 4 is because of impingement. Type 5 is because of late polywear. And type 6 is when there's no particular cause which has been found. So I'll just show you one side on each. So type 1, astabular component malposition. You can get a CT scan to check. It is defined as anything outside the luminic safe zones. And the, the treatment for this is to revise your astabular shell. Sometimes if it's a very well fixed stem, uh, cup, um, I meant established uh, cup, sorry. If it's a very well fixed cup, you can cement your liner in depending and get the right antiversion over there. Type two is a femoral component malposition. And here again, if the femoral antiversion is outside of 20 degrees plus or minus 10, here you have to revise the femoral stem. You have to take the CT views and uh, superimpose and see what your antiversion is. Type three, when you have an abductor complex insufficiency, uh, it could be a detachment of the gluteus medius or an absent or non-union of the GT. Uh, here, you have to convert to a constraint liner. So in this paper, they have considered the dual mobility of the tripolar as a constraint. So that's a mobile constraint, and then you have the fixed constraint with the locking ring. So either way, he says that a constraint is going to help if you have an abductor insufficiency. Type 4 is impingement. As I mentioned, bony component or cement impingement. It can uh, remo uh, you, can remo you have to remove the cause of the impingement. So you find out what the reason is. You try to take it to the arc of motion, see where you're impinging and try to get rid of that. And again, you have to upsize your femoral head, as I mentioned, it increases your femoral neck ratio, and increase your offset, horizontal offset will definitely help as well. Type five, delayed polywear. How do you see this? You see your x-ray, and you find that your head looks eccentric. This could be a patient who's been doing really well since the last maybe 10, 15 years, and suddenly he starts dislocating after 15 years. You see an x-ray, and you'll find an eccentric head like this, and you'll find after you go in that it's completely worn out the poly, and that's the reason for its dislocation. How do you uh, treat this? Modular component exchange. You try to retain a well-fixed cup and a well-fixed stem, and try to see if you can fit in a new poly and a new uh, femoral head, depending on the right taper, and increase the head size if possible, of course. Type six, an unknown cause. Then you have to maybe revise all your components. You have to end up using a constraint liner, otherwise it's going to fail again. But remember, in every single dislocation case, be ready for all six possibilities. That's very important. Be ready with all the six. Then once you go in, you can decide what you need to do. Um, there's a nice uh, algorithm here by, from this paper. So you have a recurrent dislocation, evaluate the cause. There are three types of causes according to this. Hip cause, which is visible on the radiograph. Hip cause, which is not visible on the radiograph. Or a non-compliant patient. This is, of course, not in our control. So at the end of the day, if all these things fail, it says you have to go for a dual mobility or a constraint cup if everything else fails. And as I mentioned earlier, accuracy. Again, I'm going to speak. I've already spoken about the robotics advantage. I'm not going to go through this again. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you have to make sure that you know that classification of the cause of the impingement or the cause of the dislocation and then treat it accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adesh. <coughs> now I will request Dr. Nirad Bengsarkar to come to the front. <coughs> Any quick questions? Maybe one or two. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, we are running very, very late, but I think this topic is actually very important. And we have touched upon it. I heard people talking about stuck sitting, stuck standing. Uh, when I was given this thought to this topic, that was my reaction initially, and that is me towards the end of preparing my talk. I was exhausted with all these terms and geometries and things. So we are going to have class in geometry. We're going to learn angles. We're going to learn a lot of terms like PI, SS, PT, APTT, PFA, SVA, LL, AI, CSI. Those who know all these terms can leave the hall. Those who are interested in listening, please continue. Uh, warning, be prepared to be a, be a little bit confused, and that's why I'm requesting if I can get a little more time, because some things will have to be repeated. If I just skim, up, skim on the topics, people here are just going to go and go like, what happened, what just happened there? So please let me reiterate a few things here and there. So most of us are our orthopedic surgeons, our hip surgeons, knee surgeons. We don't know these, the spine much. We know that there is, exists a thing like the spine, but we don't want to really deal with it. And we're sometimes confused which to operate on first. The patient comes with spine issues, knee issues, hip issues. And those are just the indications of doing surgeries. And now we actually have to have understand the spine to do a hip surgery. That's beyond most of us. The problem started with this. Most of our THR planning was based on the simple x-ray, which is a hip x-ray. Sometimes we did a lateral view. And sometimes we did CT scans to assess bone loss, not really to, or to understand how to position the cup. But we didn't really look at it as a point to or beyond looking at this. So we believe Levinick, whose name has been mentioned uh, many, many times today, that his, the standard zones for uh, safe cup placement was 40 degrees plus or minus 10, with the version as 15 degrees. And if we succeeded in doing this, we should be able to sleep well at night. Well, this wasn't true, and there were papers which said, what, what is a safe zone? Is this really a safe zone? This paper from the Mayo Clinic, which showed about 2.1% dislocations. The worrying part was 58% of these dislocations were for patients whose cups were implanted in the safe zone. So now what we need is like everything else, we have bespoke surgeries, we have bespoke, so we need a functional cup pla placement rather than a one size fits all. This paper was alluded to earlier, where they talked at why do hips dis dislocate? And I think probably the type six, where we are not sure of what was the cause, includes the spinal pelvic alignment. This other paper, they showed that in, seven, in, in uh, when they looked at 111 dislocating THAs, if you just looked at the PBH X-ray, 77% of the acetabular components where you felt were in the right position were actually not for that particular patient. So now, now let's come down to understanding what exactly happens. So we need to understand three positions of the pelvis. One is the neutral, one with the anterior pelvic tilt, and one with the posterior pelvic tilt. So this video is showing you what happens when the pelvis tilts anteriorly. You can see there's a relatively reduction in the amount of inclination and the antiversion, and when it tilts posteriorly, the inclination and the antiversion tends to increase. So what happens if you look at the picture on the left, when a normal pelvis, when you stand and when you sit, the pelvis rolls behind backwards, allowing the hip to get clearance for it to, to move. And, and if what happens if the pelvis does not move is that the hip comes closer to the pelvis, and hence there's a chance of the neck impinging on the cup or the, or the femur impinging on the pelvis, and hence levering off anteriorly and causing a posterior dislocation. There are also these studies which showed that probably the amount that Levinex suggested, which is 5 to 25, is probably undervalued, and we need to have more of an 18 to 38 zone for appropriate antiversion. We need to know some angles and to understand how the hip and work, a spine work. Larry Dodd talked about this pelvic gear system where the spine and the hip work as two interlinked gears. They usually both work together. If one stiff, stiffens, the other one compensates. The problem arises when both are stiffened, and the problem also arises when both are hypermobile. So about two-thirds of the movement when you flex your hip it actually takes place at the hip and one-third takes place at the spine. This is the relationship that you need to know. So in, in other countries where they have, most of them they are looking, kneeling with primary osteoarthritis, they're also looking at an elderly population who have osteoarthritis of the spine, which results in stiffness. Fortunately, in India, we're looking at a much younger group of patients. So our patients don't have stiff spines from degeneration, but they have stiff spines from other, other issues. Also, you have to understand this, that stiff spine is not, well, is not only the spine surgeon's fault. A lot of, most of the hips actually, which are, most of the spines, I mean, which are stiff, are actually the non-operated ones. And sometimes if your hip surgery undergoes, happens to undergo a spine surgery where he has an extensive fusion, this may result in changing the spinal pelvic alignment and may cause what are called late, late dislocators. So if the spine is, is symptomatic first, please refer him to your colleague, let him do a long fusion. It's easier for you to then adjust your pelvis, which is an act, act, uh, for you to adjust your hip placement, which is actually a better option than you doing the surgery first and him doing something else and causing a late dislocator. 
So what is the minimal workup that you need? Unlike your only your PB uh, pelvis with hip, which is done in the supine position, you also need a standing AP pelvis. You need a standing hip and lat spine, uh, standing hip including the the spine lateral and a seated hip and spine lateral. So the other ways that the X-rays are done abroad, they have the software called the EOS software, which is available. So if you look at the simple X-ray where you see a uh, a patient lying down in the supine position in a standing position, you can see the amount of change in the pelvis. So the person feels that his hip is positioned very well in the supine x-ray, this may just land up in him dislocating anteriorly when he stands up because of the relative change in the pelvic uh, curvature. The inclination and the antiversion both tend to increase. So now we come down to these interesting figures and values. So the, the minimum that we need to know are these, these, these uh, angles. One is the pelvic tilt, which is the anterior pelvic tilt, which is the line drawn from the pubic synthesis to the ASIS, uh, which is unlike the sacral pelvic tilt, which is a little different. Uh, is, I, I mean, it's different from the spinal pelvic tilt. Then there's also the sacral slope, the lumbar lordosis, which is the pub angle, and the pelvic incidence. You need to know what the pelvic incidence is because uh, it, it, it defines your sagittal balance. You have to know the difference, the relationship between the pelvic incidence and the lumbar lordosis. Most of the times, the pelvic incidence, which is the line joining the center of the hip to the center of the sacrum, is within 10 degrees of the lumbar lordosis. If the pelvic incidence is more than the lumbar lordosis by 10 degrees, it causes sagittal spinal deformity. And if it's more than 20 degrees, it causes a severe flat back and is responsible for a more than an 88% dislocation rate. Here are the other complicated angles which you can sit over tea or coffee or dinner maybe tonight if you're finishing that late uh, and decide and, and, and uh, talk about different angles that we measure here. But what you need to know is what I talked about earlier. If you look at these x-rays and see, so what happens to a patient when he's normally standing and when he lies down? If you look at the red line which indicates the sacral slope, that changes by more than 20 degrees and this is considered normal. So when it is at more, if it is less than 10 degrees of the, shift, that the change that occurs, it is considered to be a stiff spine. If you look at this hip, this patient who has been operated, if you, you see the difference between the left and the right, the, the amount of the pelvis is tilting and the anterior pelvic plane which is, which is delineated in blue here, changes is acceptable. So this patient is not at risk. We took a stand, take a standing x-ray view looking at these three different anterior pelvic plane alignments. The second one, the first one is a normal uh, alignment. The second one could be just from a stiff uh, hip which may correct after doing the surgery. And the second and the one on the last which is the which is negative pelvic tilt or negative uh, the retroversion of the pelvis is, is due to the spine surgery. So some of the values that you need to know, just keep them in mind, the important ones, the lumbar lordosis, sacral slope, pelvic tilt. This is the normal range in which patients tend to be in. And a good sagittal balance, as I said, is where the PI minus LL, that's pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis, should be within the 10 degree. And if they're hyperlordotic, it results in the, the uh, spinal vertebral line falling behind, which is a negative variance. And a person who has a flat back or a kyphotic spine leaning forward, which is a positive variance. These are the sagittal imbalance. Those are the dangerous ones. You also need to know what are the spinopelvic parameters which place a patient at risk. So there's something called adverse spine, uh, pelvic mobility, where there's a difference when the, when the patient stands, the pelvic tilt from standing to supine when it was less than 13 degrees, or from standing to sitting, if you ma minus the pelvic tilt from seated position to the standing position, if it's more than 20 degrees. And this little busy slide which shows you that a large pe posterior pelvic tilt of more than 15 degrees, a stiff lumbar spine, a severe PI minus LL mismatch or a high or a extremely low pelvic incidence increases the risk for, uh, for dislocation. So as I mentioned earlier that not all surgically fused spines are stiff. We may have non-surgically fused spines which may be stiffer other than pathologies that's like dish and ankylosing spondylitis which we know are stiff. Spines typically fused to the sacrum or to the pelvis tend to be stiffer and when you have more than three levels of spinal fusion this is associated with the risk factor. You also need to understand two concepts. One is spinal alignment and spinal mobility. Spinal alignment we spoke, talked about was the, the difference between the PI and LL, which may be positive or negative, and spinal stiffness. So this is what your spinal uh, alignment is about. And spinal stiffness is when there's a less than 10 degree difference in the sacral slope. Because this forms, uh, and just to give another example, so the, the picture on the left is just to show you the difference, what happens to a good hip when it's going from a standing to a sitting position, and what happens to a fused spine when he's going from a standing to a sitting position, you can see how close the pelvis comes to the hip and you can imagine there's very little space for this person not to dislocate if he flexes his hip even more. 
uh, Dr. Anavath has to have his uh, say in all hips. So he had his, this concept of the closed eye and the open eye. So what happens in the closed eye concept, when the, when the hip is anti-vertebral, when you take an x-ray lying or standing up, sorry, and you see the obturator foramen is open, this is called the cat's open eye concept, which means that the pelvis is actually retroverted and the pelvis is already in, in, in increased antiversion. So these cups will have to be placed in less antiversion. And the ones which are the closed eye, where the obturator foramen is closed, these may be just because of a hip flexion deformity. You may not have to do anything particularly, because if you, once you correct the hip, it tends to open up automatically. You may have to open the, the acetabulum a little bit, but definitely not close it more. Uh, this paper from 2021 from the Hospital for Special Surgery talked about, they looked at a prospective study of posterior approach hips, where they found of 99% uh, survival-free dislo dislocation, and they came up with this hip spine classification. For those who love classifications, this is for you. <laughs> There's a spinal alignment, you have a normal alignment, and you have a spinal deformity. So in the normal alignment, which we talked about, is where there's a very minimal change in, from the pelvic incidence to lumbar lordosis. You can have people with normal alignment and normal mobility. You can have people with normal alignment with a stiff spine. You can have people with deformities, that is, with the spinovertebral axis falling in front or behind, with normal mobility and with a stiff spine. So let's explore, explore some examples for each of these. So the first one, which is normal alignment and normal mobility. That means this person has a good as you can see from the standing to the sitting position, the pelvis tilts adequately. This person, your target inclination and antiversion of the top can be your 40 and 20. The second group, which is the, the second one, which is the normal alignment with the stiff spine. Here, if you can see on the right, the spine does not tilt backwards. The sacral slope is not changing. This is less than 10 degrees. So these are the ones which are called stuck standing because the same position isn't sitting like he is in standing. That is why it's called stuck standing. Your, if you have to, if you put your, you have to open your cup and you have to antivert it more to prevent the impingement and preventing, prevent the hip from dislocating posteriorly. So this is your classic stuck standing. The type 2A, which have the normal, uh, sorry, which have the normal mobility but a loss of balance, this could be just because of the hip flexion, because of the hip contracture. So these patients can be targeted with the normal anatomy, which 40, with a 40 to 40, 20 degree aversion because these usually tend to correct as they the hip stretches out you have to be aware of these the two b ones which are the stuck sitting ones in which case they already have an increased antiversion and these have to be positioned in a different way so your actual positioning is in a standing x-ray should be a 40 to 25 40 degrees are inclination and 25 degree version these are the stuck sitting ones these are the most dangerous ones so if you look at their data from the hospital of sexual surgery most of the dislocators, about 6.8% were the type 2Bs, and these were despite dual mobility being used. There are other classification systems which have pretty, pretty much preceded this classification system, which is from FAN, which they looked at other, which looked at the same balanced and flexible, balanced stiff, un unbalanced and flexible, unbalanced and stiff, and get, had some recommendations. I'll come to this a little bit later. So if you look at the suggested cup positionings, now these, this and the next couple of slides are important for those who want to take the pictures of how the cup should be positioned, these, these slides are for you. So 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. If you notice in all of them, the antiversion is a lot more than what your 15 degrees is. If you look, most of them are 25, 25 to 30 or 25. So what we probably thought as being the correct antiversion is probably what we, are un we underestimated. There's also this, uh, this um, the slide which shows you the combined antiversion is also important, where you can go from a 3045 to a 40 to 50 also in a type 1B. In this, if you look at, when you look at stiff spines, the recommendations for dual mobility, dual mobility, dual mobility, dual, dual mobility. So sometimes you wonder that after all this talk, is it just safer to do a dual mobility, if you're going to, rather than rack your brains and, and figure out the angles. That's what they all seem to suggest. And this was interesting that it showed that an eight degree version, a eight degree difference in version can make, sorry, an eight degree difference in the, it, it, it's, oh, sorry, it's eight degrees that makes a difference between an unstable and a stable cup. Now we talk about robotics and spinal pelvic alignment. So yes, robots do definitely help us place a cup because a surgeon error has been documentedly to prove to be f between five to 10%. So when, when we are putting a cup and we think it's in 4020, it's not necessarily going to be 4020. You ask your assistant, he may feel something else, you may feel something else. This reduces to 1% with of the calculated value with robots. However, soft tissue balancing is still not in the purview of the robotics. 
I was hoping to summarize this and make it, but I think since you're running out of time, I think uh, I just wanted you to understand this, that the pelvis rotates importantly when you go in from a supine to a standing x-ray. So if you look at your supine pelvis x-ray to a standing, the pelvis normally rotates about 10 to 15 degree backwards. And from a standing to sitting, it rotates another 20 to 25 degrees. So keep that in mind if you don't remember anything else. Cat's eye open pelvis, you need to verticalize the cup, which are the closed pelvis. The cat's open eye pelvis, which are open ones, you need to close the cup. Remember the at risk signs. Offset, large heads, approach, soft tissue balance, combined antiversion are also more important. Remember that in a, in a hip fracture patient, we are not going to be able to do a spinal pelvic alignment x-rays. We cannot make a hip fracture, fracture patient sit and take standing x-rays. So there, this spinal pelvic alignment goes totally out of the window. And if in doubt, stick to a dual mobility hip. This is another one that for those people who are interested in taking a picture, which gives you a sort of a summary of all that we have talked about, about the inclination and antiversion. So just to revalidate it, I did these x-rays the other day for a patient of mine. This was operated in the past, and he needed a hip on the left side. So the, the x-ray on the left is your standard supine x-ray, and we did another one standing up. And you can see how much the pelvis opens out in just a standing x-ray. So for the non-believers, this is it. And post-op, once the hip was loose, his supine x-ray pelvis, which is, which, is done on the, which is on the extreme right, this one, you can see the pelvis is, looks similar to the one here. That's because probably the flexion deformity has, has corrected. And another one with, which we did the other day, the pel this had actually a reverse pelvic roll. So the picture on the left is the supine x-ray and the picture on the right is the erector x-ray. So this guy actually leans forward on taking the x-ray. So it just gives you a spine mobility. And we did this x-ray to just look at him. And you can see the difference between his sitting and standing. And he had actually no at risk signs. So we did all the angle measurements and there was actually no risk signs. So we went ahead with the standard surgery. This is just again for you to know through the things in case you forget the, the degrees and the angles. And if you are hungry for more, these two papers, which are actually open for review, these are, I mean, which are full uh, text uh, pic, uh, uh, documents available. These are from 2023, and this one's from 2023, also from Anthroplasty. And thank, and if you have any more questions at the end of this long talk, please go ahead. Thank you, Nirad. I don't think. Anybody would dare to ask you any questions? I would request Dr. Pradeep Bosley to shed more light. Thanks. Uh, fused rib ankylosing spondylitis is very common in India and Asia. So, you know, the fused rib reasons are rheumatoid, TB, septic arthritis, some dysplastic. And difficulties are ankylosing spondy spondylitis. Anesthesia is a difficulty because spine is fused, GA, and spinal is a little difficult. Exposure, gluteal muscle has to be preserved. You must avoid damage while doing surgical approach. Uh, you have to do a clean neck osteotomy. If you do incomplete osteotomy, there is a chance of splintering of the neck. And identify the true acidobulum. Cup placement, version, it's a complex you heard now. And restoration of the biomechanics is the main aim. And prevention of heterotopic ossification in ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, even after 15, 20 years of fuse scape, no mobility. Once you achieve mobility, we have seen that the muscle progressively improves. And uh, unlike uh, now injury where the motor units are completely damaged. Pre-op planning is very important, especially restoration of the true acetabulum, center of rotation, and pelvic obligate, spinopelvic uh, functional position. Even in fuse cervical spine and entire spine in ankylosing spondylitis, uh, we have done um, our anesthesia team. They could negotiate the spinal and epidural anesthesia because the ligamentum flavum is never ossified in fully ankylo spine. So the triangle is available for safe spinal or epidural anesthesia. And we have tried in 82 patients. 
our anesthesia team there is no need of tracheostomy and uh, most many patients with ankylosing spondylitis bilateral fusive they have a external rotation deformity young patients and uh, it is a really challenging because when you do posteriorly uh, it's a difficult challenge because the posterior approach the trochanter comes quite close to the acetabulum sciatic nerve is also very close and there is a high risk of injury so we worked in anatomy almost uh, 34 years ago and uh, uh, dissected so anteriorly whenever there is external rotation deformity the hip is completely open you know you can directly access hip very easy and select dissect the neck i'll show you and just resect the neck once you resect the neck you get mobility and you can go posteriorly from the same incision and release all the tight external rotators and do safely thr there is no need of trochanteric osteotomy or gluteal medius de detachment so single incision front and back exposure you can see the acetabular inclination very clearly and uh, avoid impingement better soft tissue balancing less instability prevent impingement better implant placement and there is a less chance of dislocation so abductor position you can see the gluteus medius is preserved and this is a anterior exposure you can see the fuse mass also you can put spike medially and under direct vision you resect the neck once you resect you get mobility and d slowly remove the thing and complete the thr after releasing the soft tissue so this is anterior exposure and one point i mentioned that leg position is the best guide for femoral version because in anterior approach leg goes down so these are the few points for identify the true acetabulum margin of the neck resection remnants of the glenoid rim transverse ligament and ligamentum teres there is always fat pad in the pulvinar and you can drill uh, with a small uh, hole uh, uh, drill bit and measure the depth of the medial and anterior wall rarely you require x ray so version and inclination is a very important and ligamentum teres is very a uh, basic guide to give you all the uh, access without robo so whenever the cup inferior part of the cup is inside the tall the inclination has to be less than 45 degree and version is anatomical to the pelvis there is one more small parameter mac column has described a line imaginary line from asis to sciatic foramena and you should rim this is very good for rimming perpendicular to it gives a anatomical guideline for the cup placement very important is that there is no capsule for closure when in external rotation deformity so some soft tissue especially quadratus femoris can be extended and some scaffold of the soft tissue is created so that fibrous capsule will form over it so that's very important because there is no capsule for closure in external rotation deformity single stage has many advantages because unless in bilateral case unless you do bilateral thr patient will not walk safely because uh, there are deformities and uh, there is a chance of dislocation so there are other advantages like uh, single anesthesia rehab is early better and safer hospital stay and cost most deform you should do first and then do the other one so i have a uh, extensive experience of 251 hip last 34 years and uh, single stage was done in 58 patients and my approach was used selectively when there is only external rotation deformity in 118 patients complication also lot of complications splintering uh, dislocation in phi transient femoral nerve palsy which recovered 
implant loosening 30%, heterotrophic 17%. Uh, this is a recent publication in this book about totally parthoplastin complex scenario. Few examples, tackle deformity. India is filled with all these cases all over India. You get young patients with, uh, you can see, it's like a log of roll. And he's just absolutely difficult case. And he walks with bilateral total hip. Bilateral abduction deformity, both side abducted, but he's walking. Zero movement. And you can, uh, it's pleasure to do it. Young patient, 18 year old patient, hardly able to stand, walk. And now after 10 years, we can see him sitting on the floor and getting almost near normal mobility, sitting and getting very comfortably. Rheumatoid, uh, this female, you can see the pelvis, the eyes are closed. So flexion deformity and after 14 years, Almost she's got the almost similar mobility. Pelvic obliquity, it's a very important. So one important thing is most of the patients are uh, stuck standing. Uh, there's a pelvis is absolutely, I mean, uh, it's uh, hardly any mobility and you need to increase the antiversion. But there's one more also, there's a pelvic obliquity is a different aspect. And here is one example. This is a, a TB, tuberculosis of the hip with fused hip and there's a spine fusion and pelvis is oblique, you can see, and hip is fused. So there's an eight degree of pelvic tilt. So on that side, anatomical inclination is of the cup is 48 to create functional inclination of 40 degree. So these are all preoperative planning. Bilateral flexion deformity. This is a nine year post-op and you can correct everything. Pseudokyphosis. Patient is walking as if there's a kyphosis, but it was a flexion deformity and gets corrected completely. Sometimes knees also ankylose in apart from the both the hips. And uh, you can see young patient, knees fuse and may require a higher constraint. So this is one 34 year old page, follow up, bilateral fuse hip, pre-op after 16 and 14 years required revision. And this is, you can see four years and 34 years, activity is well maintained. He, and the best part is uh, we had to do ET uh, on both the side and it's beautifully remodeled and solid and patient is walking. This is a 34 year old follow up of bilateral fusive. So conclusion, gluteal muscle function improves once mobility is achieved. New uh, Bosley's hip approach is very useful in selected cases where there's external rotation deformity for safe neck resection and avoid gluteal medial, medial damage. Cementless THR has got excellent osteointegration, even the bones are osteopenic. We have seen there is no sinke, there is no subsidence and good osteointegration. Single stage bilateral THR has got many advantages and results of spine, spontaneous ankylosis is better than arthrodesis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosley. While Dr. Wolfgang Klauser would set up his presentation, any questions for Dr. Pradeep? So I think I'm going to be the last speaker here, and thank you for holding on at the last speaker in this session. Thank you to the moderators. Excellent. Well done. I'm trying to actually not keep you up too long. I was asked to talk about peripathetic fractures, and, uh, and I think this is a growing concern in Europe and also in, uh, especially in Germany, where we have seen a doubling over the uh, 
past 10 years of the cases, and that's going along very well with uh, figures that we get from the United States. Um, the problem, and I apologize for the German picture uh, here, but I think the problem in these patients is that they have a lot of comorbidities. They often come at uh, midnight uh, on a Friday afternoon or Friday late night, and uh, you don't want what to do and uh, if you can really optimize these patients. So you need to be careful about how to treat these patients, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I'm also going to talk about technical issues. So um, we have uh, a good paper here that I've actually listed up, and, and, and you see the incidence of uh, fractures, cementless versus cemented prosthesis, um, depending on the age group where you actually place your primary implants. You have, um, of course, a higher incidence in revision cases, which I was really surprised to see. I mean, if you look at uh, the revision cases that we're doing in our institution, I think that uh, we don't see 20% of peripathetic fractures intraoperatively, but uh, they do occur, of course. Then postoperatively, we have to take into account that uh, patients actually suffer from fractures as well, and that's the number that I was talking about, those doubling of the figures in 10 years frame time. And then only a tenth of these periprothetic fractures are acetabular fractures, so I'm not going to really talk about that. The Vancouver classification, I'm not going to go through very much. Um, I think you're all aware of that. I think the big problems are the B2, B3, and those are the cases we are going to talk about. The C cases are the ones that we are not yet really fully resolving, but I think there's new um, implants on the horizon. Which fracture, which procedure? Again, I apologize for the German publication, but I think this is a giving you a very nice overview of how you should treat peripathetic fractures, and we are going to talk about those ones the ones where we do a hip revision or a hip revision along with additional procedures like a strut graft. So that's, those are the cases that I was asked to talk about. The other classification that I would like to mention is the one that actually is now um, becoming more and more familiar. We are not really using that one. Um, it's still the Vancouver classification that we are using in my hospital, but uh, the classification from uh, Farris Sadat and Clive Duncan uh, is basically coming up uh, in the literature. You can actually find that publication free for download in the, uh, on the Google website. The key messages I would like to give you in this presentation is that uh, we treat these patients probably more often according to the surgeon's experience, which often varies when treating these. And um, if you go to Germany, we have people that are specializing in trauma surgery. And then we have people that are actually specializing in revision surgery. And, and probably if you end up in one of either groups, then you're going to actually um, get a different treatment in a lot of these cases. The point being made, though, is that uh, you should be aware of the fact that according to the literature, uh, more often the implants are loose when the patient arrives in the hospital. So what you consider to be initially maybe to be a stable implant in the sequence of radiographic follow-ups frequently presents as a loosened implants already at the time when the, fract at the, time when the fracture occurred. So um, I'm a revision surgeon, so um, probably I'm the right one to talk about that. Patients should be classified and treated adequately, I think. The challenges, of course, are not only the comorbidities, it's also the post-operative regimen for the patients. How do you treat these patients after surgery? How old are they? Can they partially weight bear, or do they need full weight bearing? right after surgery. Did the prosthesis work before the fracture occurred? Is the prosthesis, of course, fixed or loose? I think you all agree that this revision prosthesis will be loosened. And can the fracture be reduced at the time of surgery, no matter if you do a revision hip or a femoral component or not? And if you look at bone like that, then you're probably all aware of the fact that not all of these patients can be treated in a cementless way. My suggestion would be in preoperative planning wise um, that you actually suggest to perform long radiographs in two planes because there's always a bowing of the femur. You want to actually see the deformity. You want to look at the type and location of the fracture, get proper implants, look at what you got in stock if you have all the implants available that you think that you need, but you need additional things. I was speaking about that. You might need plates, cables, wires, depending on, on what you prefer to use. I suggest you use fluoro during the surgery and think about the approach. I think uh, that's one of the key issues and that's one of the problems that I'm having with the DAA in revision. Um, I've seen patients, uh, quite a few of our surgeons in the neighboring hospitals are now doing DAAs, but as soon as they suffer a complication, 
there's a big mess because then all of a sudden they have to do swinging, skin incisions and whatsoever and then actually get those irritations of the, of the nerve that we all know about. So, so I don't think that this approach is a recommendable in those bigger surgeries. So those are cases that are just coming up and, and my preferred approach of course is, I must say quite, quite honestly, the posterior approach which I don't have a problem with. The preoperative planning actually includes the quality of bone. I think I'm looking at the isthmus here. I'm looking at where I want to place my components. Is the isthmus still intact? Is there still good bone stock here where I want to actually place my implant? Or is the fracture running down there so that I don't have any proper place to fix a new <coughs> revision head? I would like to actually get a good proper fixation of around about four centimeters of my new implant inside the isthmus. So that is required. It used to be eight centimeters, but I think with the uh, modular implants that we have available nowadays, or monoblock implants even, we can easily get shorter on the fixation. In Europe, we are very much pursuing the concept of Wagner, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, the distal fixation and the sort of remodeling, um, with the concept of rotational stability and integration distally has been well proven. The problem with Wagner's stem was actually that he was actually placing those um, stems very much distally and that actually led to the fact that uh, they were frequently subsiding or did have three-point fixation. So nowadays we actually see better implants, they are modular or uh, maybe even a sort of bent or having a kink which actually allow them to be used in also slightly deformed um, fractures or uh, femurs. This is an example, you see the follow-up and, and it shows very nicely how the bone of that comminuted fracture on the proximal femur can really very nicely remodel. The concept behind that is that you don't try to strap the bone from the soft tissues, but you try to leave everything intact very much like you would do in a fracture fixation. This is another case, fall in the bathroom two weeks post-surgery. This is this portornal stem, which is really dangerous when it jams into the uh, femur and actually causes these fractures. Quite easy, you do the planning on the opposite side because that's where you get the better idea of what the um, fracture fixation should look at. A cable, a couple of red wires around it. Uh, you take a cementless, maybe modular stem. Doesn't matter if you want to do a monoblock or a modular stem. And then actually fix that fracture and it's gonna heal without any major issues. That is a quick surgery. You go in there and the patient can walk day after surgery, get out of the bed. Another case, and this is just to, uh, show you that there is um, monoblock stems out there that you can actually utilize to actually do anatomical reconstruction. I think all of you would agree that this stem was definitely loose. So I, as I suggested to you that you should use those two long-standing x-rays because very frequently you see those cases coming in where you actually have had a failure of a fracture fixation. You see that there is bowing in uh, three planes not only the virus, but it's also a rotational problem and also uh, the anticorvation. And that, if, um, what you see on the right side is often what you see in the books, a straight femur, but that's not true. I think we all need to be aware of the fact that there is a significant amount of bowing on the femur. And the prime problem that we are seeing with those longer stems, cementless stems, is that they actually might run and jam up against the anterior cortex if you have that bowing. So I would suggest you that even when you're using fluoro, uh, when you do post-operative x-rays on these cases, you better take uh, a very close look because what you see here is a crack on the femur once you have taken care of the fractures that actually ran down, but that's a fresh fracture that occurred intraoperatively. And if you don't catch that, patients will get up and walk and then all of a sudden you will have a mess and you will have to take that patient back into the OR if you treat them conservatively and you've seen the fracture, then they will heal without any major problems. What about bad bone? And that's uh, basically the final picture that I'm going to show. This is a guy that actually had a, a slowly increasing fracture periprothetically, and you see that this is a very poor bone stock um, elderly patient. Um, you ask yourself, what are you doing? Once again, you can see there is this bowing of the femur. There is also virus remodeling of the femur. And in those cases, what I normally do is I like to actually um, go back and take a selection of broad and longer cemented stems. And the one on the right side I would like to point to you is the one that I actually prefer in those situations because it gives me the permission to 
straighten out the whole femur, make it straight, and actually take a very long cemented stem and actually drop cables around it and fix these patients. And again, you see that there is uh, dual mobility in, in this patient because these patients, as I mentioned before, often present with comorbidities. Another case, he fell, and that's one again that I wanted to show because I wanted to point this arrow down there. I was planning for a um, cementless implant, but then uh, when looking again on the x-rays, I'm going to go back. You see that this fracture, which I thought was going to end further up, was, was actually winding down all the way to the distal femur. And that made it actually again necessary to actually use uh, a long cemented stem. You see that the fracture is actually up, ending up down there, which then actually allowed me to do anatomical reduction and a long cemented stem. So my conclusions would be you have to optimize the patients. These patients I think you should not treat around midnight and, and uh, you have to have a well-rested team. And that gives you time to prepare these patients properly for the surgery. You need to get adequate radiographs. You look at the bone, you make sure that you have um, the right implants available in the OR. You prepare for plan A, B, C. You need to pick the right approach. I, I have seen more than one failure because colleagues of mine tried to use um, the wrong approach and you need to pick your implants carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wolfgang. Uh, you can carry on with the questions. I would request, meanwhile, Dr. Vikas Jain to come to the dais, and I would request panelists Dr. Oliver, Dr. Sachin, Dr. Peter, Dr. Rohit, and Dr. Darius to come to the front and carry on with this panel discussion on 3D printing. Only request again with Dr. Vikas is to print faster. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, and uh, with the constraint of the time, we'll not have half an hour, but we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to discuss a very uh, paradigm shift that we have as far as technology is concerned and as far as complexities is concerned to the defect side that you see in lots of cases of hip arthroplasty. So we're going to restrict ourselves to hip arthroplasty. So we have uh, around three panelists out here and so we'll ask them a few questions. Uh, this would be in regards to your experience as far as the revision hips is concerned and as far as your uh, experience is concerned using any 3D printed acetabular cups. So you would all be seeing in your day-to-day -day practice uh, a stage where you have a complex defect on the side of the acetabulum and where you would like to get something customized rather than the acetabular cup which is available. So what is your experience, sir? So when I see a problem where, which I don't think I can address with the normal off-the-shelf implants, um, I do phone a friend. So in, in, in the UK, we still have got some friends and the colleagues, and some of these friends have got far more experience than we have. So I contact uh, one of my colleagues in London, um, send them the CT scans over and ask him to take over. That's what I do. And uh, thereafter, suppose you have a big acetabular defect. Sir, Dr. Sachin. In predominantly using uh, 3D printing will be for the defects in the middle column, seeing the middle column, and also for the maybe the extended uh, indications could be a complex fracture and uh, sometimes the tumors also. Yeah, so uh, we're restricting ourselves to the acetabular side of the defects, you know. Uh, when do you think you have to get a tri flange acetabular cup made? Uh, which is a customized cup because you cannot address that defect per se using any off-the-shelf cup available. Any experience uh, from any of the surgeons in the audience, please? Dr. Klausner. Yeah, we are routinely using that in big defects like uh, type 4. And we have had a very good, uh, good experiences with that. We've been using it for about 10 years now. And... Um, we are seeing these patients quite frequently, and indeed, um, they seem to do very well. There's very nice bone remodeling. There's different companies now out there that actually manufacture these devices. I think in my eyes, you actually need to be uh, very careful about asking for the price because these uh, implants are costly. Yes. But uh, if you look at the fact that uh, you have uh, 
uh, patients that have had multiple failed uh, acetabular revisions uh, and they are still sometimes quite young, like 60, 65 years, you want to make sure that you get them out of um, the wheelchair. Um, two points here I think you need to consider um, maybe to think about coating, um, like in order to protect against uh, infection. That's what I would think because this is like a big, big implant. And, and the second is that um, you need to actually pick the right company because not all companies provide very proper preoperative plannings and 3D uh, models and all that that help you as a guidance at the time of surgery. Yes. So uh, to give an answer to what you are saying, we in India now have started doing that. Uh, we are doing a good preoperative plan in such case of complex defects. We create bone models. Now, any one of you have an experience having a very uh, complex deformity with a bone model, one is to one bone model that you have created. So you do get it created, right? So, and so when you create such bone models, which are 3D printed, it actually gives you a good idea about what you are going to see intraoperatively in a patient, right? And the second thing is, then you also would go in for a solution. And that solution, again, suppose you're thinking in terms of a cup, which is a tri-flange acetabular cup. First, you put it on a model, so you create a prototype. And then you know that this is the type of a prototype or a cup. This is the fixation. You can decide on the trajectory of the screws that you would want to put one into the ileum. You can even put a screw into the superior pubic ramus or ischium. So that, that's the way you can also do a good fixation provided you can't get a good column fixation in the cup there. So that is one of the things that we wanted to say there. So uh, uh, I also would like to show experience of, in India, who has put a tri-flange cup in cases of a big acetabular defect. Uh, maybe someone in Sunshine was there or? Uh, uh, sir, can you please uh, elaborate as to what was the case and what did you do? Yeah, you know you can you can stand up and maybe for the audience. Pelvic discontinuity. Yeah, yeah. So there was pelvic discontinuity, and uh, also the cup is attached to that. There's a company called Permedica, okay. which do, does this one. Okay. So that's what I've tried, and now the patient is well. It's been now more than two years since I've done that, so patient is doing well. So you got a met, uh, titanium triflange acetabular yes. cup. Yes. Which was 3D printed. No, it was not printed. It was uh, uh, attached to that. I mean, this is a product that comes on itself. It's not printed. Okay. So we were talking in terms of a the technology where now we have a titanium powder which goes into the 3D printing machine. And that 3D printing machine can actually print a very customized tri-flanged or a cup which could actually take care of the defect. So the whole idea behind the technology or this 10 to 15 minutes of presentation is to give you an idea that yes, uh, Dr. Bose, he said about up to Paprosky 3, but then going beyond that, where it's a nightmare for lots of uh, hip arthroplasty surgeons, you know, when they're going to see huge big defects, probably when we are into an era of having a, a revision hip arthroplasty coming, and where you would be seeing a big uh, defect on the acetabular side. So, uh, anyone has an idea about uh, osteo integration? So, uh, why we are talking about that and when I'm talking in terms of 3D printing, uh, uh, sir, would you tell us something about what is it that we find it challenging in osteo integration as far as an uncemented cup is concerned or a uh, uh, femoral stem is concerned when you're doing an uncemented one. So, well, you look for osteointegrations, integration, so you have to have, first of all, stability. So your, your, your implant, whether it's an acetabular implant or a femoral implant, it needs to be stable. And then the, uh, we know that the, the bone likes titanium, but also tantalum. Um, but you need to have some kind of a mimic of the natural bone structure, as well as a living bone on the other side to, to make sure that there's some ingrowth. So, uh, again, uh, addressing the osteo integration, uh, again, 3D technology has enabled us to create something known as a lattice or a trabeculae. Now, when you create lattice or a trabeculae as an interface uh, on the uncemented side, predominantly for an acetabulum, so now we have 3D printed 
acetabular cups which are available, they are titanium, and when you use them predominantly as an uncemented, the thing you get or you confirm more sure about the osteointegration than actually what you have in an HA coating or a porous coated cup. So this is one message that we wanted you to have as far as 3D printing is concerned. So we'll, I'll be just showing you a few examples of what we have done. This is just to give you what trabaculae that we could create for a lateral condyle. And uh, we could do a 3D printed lateral condyler implant. This was a tibial plafond, again a 3D printed, which we had already put one year down the line, doing well. Osteointegration and metal on cartilage. Metal on cartilage is something which is surprising everyone. But then, yes, we have been doing this. Anyone who has any other experience as far as 3D printed implants are concerned. So not only jigs or using those customized jigs or using bone models, but any implants. Yes, sir. Placement. Okay. Using a 3D printed uh, model as well as a joint. Okay. So that, what joint was that? So it's an XLO. They give. It okay. So they give you an MCP joint. XLO has an MCP. Oh, so they customized it. They customized they it. They did a CT scan. They got the exact dimensions. Yes. Then they made a bone model first, yes. and then they made the 3D printed design made of titanium. Okay, and it's doing well. That's good. So that, that's what is a message that we want to pass on as far as the technology is concerned, that the information that we get from CT scan, uh, three-dimensional information in cases of uh, complex cases where we don't have an off-the-shelf implants that you can think of using, you can think in terms of customization and you can get a 3D printed solution. Anything that you would like to add, sir? I just would like to, to add a cause for concern. Um, all the implants we normally put in are in Europe, they're called CE marked. So they're, they're proven that they're proven technology, they're safe. Um, so with the new technology, the 3D printing, that is not the case. So who's gonna be accountable for if there's some failures of the implant? Yes, sir. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, you have to be very open to the patient and you, they will have to take their own risk. So they have to sign a waiver of responsibility. But what, what the companies in general try to do, they actually want to actually put everything or shift everything to the surgeon, you know. And, and so you have to, as a surgeon, you have to say, okay, this is an option, we can try to do that. And then you shift everything to the patient. This is the only option you have. <laughs> That's... Uh, uh, Dr. Raj Gopalan, sir, would you like to add anything to the technology and to it, sir? Ashok, sir. I must confess I have no experience of uh, 3D printing and stuff. I, I think I would <clears throat> extend the concerns uh, that have been mentioned. Science concerns. Yeah. yeah um, I, I'd be a little reticent to using something that is not certified, clarified. It's not gone through the due diligence process. We just. But I'm, I'm sure there are cases that demand this, and you know I think uh, you people who are in the forefront doing this wonderful work, I think you guys have to show the, show the world the way forward. Okay, thank you very much, sir, and uh, thank you. So uh, I think we can conclude this session yeah. here. Uh, it was a short session. We had a lot to say in that, and thank you very much for patient listening. I can take one or two questions. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. Uh, so nice of you to finish it in time. I thank Dr. Uh, Peter. And Dr. Sachin can ca stay here for the next session. So we'll start with the next session of debates. Uh, uh, the first debate is direct anterolateral and direct anterior approach. Dr. Michael and Dr. Nabil are there.
and then take the pro one. Just pick another one then. So let's talk about the anterolateral approach. Um, you've all seen the direct anterior and the anterolateral in OR today. Um, let's compare them a little bit. What's the perfect approach? I think the perfect approach should not have any kind of patient selection, not any kind of implant selection. You want a good visualization of both acetabulum and femur. It should be easy extendable in case of complications, but you shouldn't have any specific complications due to the approach. And actually you want a muscle sparing approach. You don't want to cut anything, destroy anything, and especially for the patient, you want a quick recovery. So if you look at the different approaches, the most common approach is the posterior approach. 80% of the hips worldwide are done posteriorly, and it's lateral, and the difference between the direct anterior and the anterolateral approach is just that it's a different interval. The direct anterior goes in front of the tensor fasciolata and behind the satarius, and we, with the anterolateral approach, we go between the gluteus medius and the tensor fasciolata. Well, the DAA needs, and the company tells you it needs a special table, probably needs special implants, special instruments, and it's not for every patient. You want, don't want to do the really obese patients. It's not that easy extendable, and you don't want to do every single revision with that approach because of that. But you actually want an approach that you can do with every patient. And of course, a minimal invasive approach with this guy is a totally different thing than with this young lady. But we've shown that in terms of positioning of your implants, there's no difference in this approach. There's no implant selection. You can do shorter stems, short stems, bigger stems, longer stems, zweimuller type here. You can cement, you can do screws, you can do it all. The anterolateral approach, you can do in supine position or like we do it in lateral position. And the important thing is for the femur that we put the femur posteriorly in extension adduction, and 90 degrees of external rotation. Setup is easy. You don't need a special table. All you need to do is have a split leg table. You can bend it down, or you can take it out. Skin incision, as I showed this morning, and I hope you were aware of that, and you could we are able to see that, is the anterior of your crater trope. And then it's a digital preparation to find the interval in front of the gluteus medius. You put your retractors around your neck. You do your capsule incision. You present the neck. And you can cut the neck, put the leg in 90 degrees of external rotation, do your definitive cut, take out your parts, and then do the acetabulum. And you have a good visualization of the acetabulum as well as for the femur. For the femur, again, femur goes posteriorly, hyperextension, adduction, and 90 degrees of extension. And we use the sac, as you saw this morning, to position the leg to keep it sterile and to go really far in hyperextension. And that's the key. You have the easy access because you can go so far. If you do it in supine position, you can't put the leg that far down, and sometimes it's difficult to access the femur. So with that, to rest the femur, the most important part that the femur comes up is the preparation of the posterior capsule, the release of the posterior capsule, and then the, your femur comes up. So the advantage of this approach is that you can do it in supine and lateral position. And it might be easier for some of the surgeons if you want to switch 
to this approach. There's no patient selection, no implant selection. It's easy, extendable in case of complication, and you have a good visualization for both femur and acetabulum. And for the patient, it is a true minimal invasive approach, no muscle damage, you have less bleeding, it does have a lower dislocation rate, and less trauma leads to a quick recovery for the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next, I'd like to invite Dr. Nabil for his presentation. So after the two presentations, there'll be a two minute rebuttal from both the speakers. So <laughs> my retired boss used to say that a good surgeon can, can make a bad implant good and a bad surgeon can make a good implant bad. I agree the same for the, in, for the approach also. I'm not going to try to convince you to choose the direct anterior approach. I think that a surgeon should choose that it's not a matter of an ego. You should choose the approach that makes you give the best result for your patient. I come from beautiful city of Haifa in Israel. And during my residency and uh, also uh, uh, during my, uh, my residency, I did the posterior approach. During my fellowship in Canada, I did only anterior lateral, anterior, actually direct lateral. Now I hear that from the doctor that's not anterior lateral. The anterior lateral is, you, we used to call it the anterior lateral, but all of the surgeons there cut the anterior part of the gluteus medius. But then, in 2014, this, this paper from the Norwegian, uh, it was published, and it showed that anterior, ant lateral approach is, is very bad for patient reported outcome measures. So they, the patient used to complain about limping. They, it's a, it was a simple paper, actually, they just approached the patient after one to three years and asked them how do, you, how do they feel. And that made a shift, a big shift towards the direct anterior in, in Scandinavia and also in other parts of the world. When I started practicing and for the direct anterior, at the beginning I did it because the patient asked for it. Okay, so in, in Israel, it's a very small country. Anything published, everyone wants it in, immediately. Just like robotics now, back then, like seven, eight years ago, it started with the direct anterior. So I started <coughs> learning the, the, the approach and visited local surgeon in Israel and did several cases with him. Then I approached for the leaders of this approach in the world. So I visited Professor Cortain in Belgium, which actually he the most one who influenced my uh, work. Uh, Professor Joel Mata, which which is he was one of the developer of the ACT stem. Professor Nogler is considered like the pioneer of this approach in, in Europe. He has been doing it since the year 2000. And in France also, I took a course with the Professor Lude, who does it also with, he does it with the traction table. The Professor Mata and Professor Lude does it with a traction table. Professor Cortain and Nugler do it without a traction table. After the, these courses and visiting centers, I continued doing it with my colleague, and cases took between 90 to 120 minutes. And with Professor Cortain, the, he did, I think he's the developer of the superior release, which has changed a lot the way I do um, 
the surgery and if as you have seen this morning once you master this release and it's very very simple way of mobilizing the femur it will lower the fracture rate and the complication rate in the direct anterior this is the active stem which i started using in 2019 when uh, a year to 18 months after starting doing the direct anterior the surgery time dropped very low uh, a complication rate including the minor trochanteric fractures that sometimes people tend to ignore as not complication they are also complication and they are they uh, they are caused because of lack of superior release and most important thing i had satisfied patient and i think now i have passed the 1000 cases of direct anterior since 2016 till today i have people doing ironman swimming going back to skiing playing basketball and even I managed to do some revisions with the direct anterior. Now, I agree and I don't do femoral revisions with the direct anterior. It's not possible. And I don't, I'm not worried about the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. I'm worried about the femoral nerve in these. So if you injure the quadriceps muscle and injure the uh, fibers of the femoral nerve, you will have non-functional uh, muscle. But what we can do in direct anterior, so this is a case of mine, which after, shortly after surgery, I discovered that the, if you, you can see here that the right side, so I did the left side, and a, a year after did the right side and discovered that it was severely antiverted cup. And what, that's one of the advantages of the, of the approach. So though it was about 70 degrees of antiversion, the patient didn't dislocate. But she had many clicks and many subluxations. And after four years, she finally agreed to do a, a revision. So this is how I measured the uh, antiversion. And you can see how, how antiverted the cup is. So I did it. This is the only case I did dual mobility in a direct anterior. Because if you're going to do a direct anterior, there's no sense in doing dual mobility. A other lady, which I did both sides, but she still complained about the leg. She had a shorter left leg from the beginning, and I operated on the left leg first, then after couple of months I didn't did her right which was longer before operating so when, once I put in the total hip I couldn't make her shorter on the on the right side see so she kept, kept complaining about uh, her left short leg so I used this implant from uh, the bio ball and uh, elongated the hair and she now is extremely satisfied. She's a 40 years old lady. You can also do a conversion. And what I, this is the only case which I did a conversion from a fused hip to a total hip. And it was much easier than I expected. So in, you are worried with these cases about dislocation and you, you are worried about injury to what's left from the abductors. So in this case, it was a, a very a, a satisfying and easy relatively case. And what's also good in direct anterior and supine position that you can put in the fluoroscopy and aim the reaming of the acetabulum. In these specific cases, you should do it because you don't know how, how much bone you have and where is the center of, because you don't have any bony landmarks, any anatomical landmarks. 
So in, in a latest survey for the doctors who actually answered the survey, 55% of the uh, American doctors stated that they are doing a direct anterior. I don't think that we should recommend an approach according to the result of the best surgeon. Like if a best surgeon does, says I do a, a lateral approach or I, I do a, a, in a very good way, that doesn't mean that, that the standard surgeon does it. You should have an approach that the standard surgeon can uh, reproduce, do it in a, a good manner to lower complication and give best results for his patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so, so any specific, specific comments from uh, Dr. Michael to Dr. Nabil or Dr. Nabil to Dr. Michael? Actually, I want to say that I was uh, extremely surprised with his approach and uh, I think it's very good approach. Uh, I liked it very much. I watched the videos and uh, we yesterday we talked about it. It's, it's totally different from what I thought was the anterolateral because I was raised and also did and told that the anterolateral, uh, you had to detach the abductors and that's not the way he does it. The problem with the American data is that they don't distinguish between the two approaches. They call both of them anterior approaches. So um, as it is from anterior, as it's just a different interval, they don't distinguish. Right. So actually but yesterday we, <laughs> we kind of agreed that we're friends anyway. <laughs> and there's not much of a difference because uh, they're both muscle sparing and, and that's the key. You don't want to destroy anatomy um, and if you keep it intact, there's a quick recovery for the patient. So you, you guys are not debating, you guys are agreeing. No, I'm sorry, we're not really, we're not really fighting. <laughs> Professor Closer? No, I was just saying, I mean, one of, the, one of the concerns that I hear when I go to the ES and speak to the surgeons there that are training fellows, <clears throat> they now say either the anterior or the anterior approach, either of them, people, their fellows only want to do the DAA and they stop learning the posterior approach and then they run into problems if they have a crack in the posterior column when they impact the cup or whatsoever, or if they have a fracture of the femur. So they don't know the posterior approach anymore. That's, that's what I think, uh, what my message would be. I think they are both very, very good approaches. I'm really liking them. We do the DAA as well in my hospital, but, uh, but I think I'm just concerned that people start to for, forget about the posterior approach and how to extend these things, you know. So I wanna comment about that. So before I started doing the anterior approach, People used to say, oh, I'm afraid of the posterior approach with no relation of the direct anterior because they are afraid of the sciatic nerve and they are afraid of dislocations. So you, they used to do the direct lateral. So you will always have those people who are afraid of surgery no matter what, if it's a direct anterior or if it's a posterior. So people also fear from posterior, not just, uh, not just uh, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So luckily, like this, uh, we have a fellow uh, a resident who was uh, trained in our hospital. Now he went to Australia and did only posterior. So we are lucky to have him back. <laughs> Dr. Peter, any, any remarks? Any comments on this? So the only comment I would have is uh, I'm very disappointed that um, we didn't discuss the posterior approach. I still believe it's the best, uh, most extensible approach that you can use for primary revision, very complex stuff. You can even extend it all the way to the knee if you want to. Um, but, you know, guys, well done. Um, but you haven't convinced me. If you go to the, to the videos on YouTube and you see the lectures that have been filmed by Parvizi, because he's auguring, he's suggesting you should go like, like an S-shaped skin incision, go laterally if you have your femoral fracture and all that. And I've seen these cases, they come into our hospitals because they're being performed elsewhere. 
and you have these patients with uh, neuralgias and all that. I mean, this is this is open for debate, is it? I mean, it's like uh, maybe not in your case because you're doing it in the lateral position, but uh, if you if you have these patients coming in, they suffer for the rest of their life. I think it's an issue. You know what I mean? The problem is some of the guys think that the minimal invasive technique is the small skin incision, and then they do something like iceberg surgery, where you try to stay really small and down. To I have the mic. <laughs> and underneath that, they destroy everything. And I think surgery is about the tissue. It's soft tissue management. And you can't just do this tiny skin incision and then try to find your way around. And that's when complications arise. I think a point my colleagues said here before is like to have a possibility to escape from a dangerous situation to extend without doing zigzag. So I think my friend, she showed well on the anterolateral approach, if you, it comes from the Watson-Jones, which was already a long approach, and you can extend it down really if you do the, like the slightly diagonal incision, you can go down the trochanter down to the femur, but again, to your point, which you are right, if you have specific complication on the acetabulum and anything, you will never get a nice view like with the posterior approach. Um, the short anterolateral one, and I must say this, like it is, I mean, if you try to clean out the posterior guard on the hip, from anterolateral or even from anterior, it's just not possible if you do try to do something like a single stage or something like that, you know what I mean? But then if you have an infection case, you should use the same approach as the, the one before, right? Yeah, but if you're not possible, it's not possible going through a DAA to cleanse out the pus from behind around the sciatic nerve. So you have to open up anterior in order to cleanse the soft tissue. It's like the Bosale, Bosale um, approach. Exactly. So yeah, but you have to go both ways, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because you detach just the capsule and the posterior part. Once you, once you don't have the stem inside, it's easy. Although I do, for many revisions, I do the posterior part. Yeah, no, no, I'm just not criticizing. I'm just uh, pointing that out where I have my problems with it. OK. But the hype about the DAA was also pushed by different companies trying to sell their tables trying to sell their short implants and uh, taking care of the surgeons and pushing them further into the direct anterior. And that's, uh, I think that's what we've seen the last, let's say, five years. Um, it's going down. <laughs> but, but. Still, so we'll start on the second debate now. Yeah, I'll call Dr. Mohan Desai, sir, for dual mobility. Sir, is for dual mobility. <laughs> so it's not that we don't do uh, uh, the standard. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> on the right side. This was an angst pond. This was done by me only by, uh, in 2002. And that those days, we did not know about all those uh, sp spinopelvic uh, mobility and stability. Uh, it was 22 mm head. Now, at this point of time, we would uh, shudder to do this, uh, use this 22 uh, head monoblock stem. It was something like Chanley's uh, stem, which was matte finish, conventional poly. But because of his condition and limited mobility, it uh, worked for 20 years. And then I had to revise this. Uh, the stem was well cemented. And then at the time of revision, now I thought with the present knowledge, I converted uh, this into a uh, <coughs> dual mobility stem and uh, cement within stem, a uh, new stem. So uh, this was how he was walking 20 years back and uh, now. So uh, to begin with, uh, I'm not averse to using single articulation, large ball articulation presently. Uh, we do uh, ceramic on ceramic, sometimes oxygenium on uh, excel highly crosslink uh, poly, but uh, dual articulation or dual mobility has, uh, has its place is here to stay and I think it is a ar surgeon's armamentarium. It's uh, uh, good to have this in uh, in certain situations. The Take for example, I think we had uh, extensive talk on this. 
stuck in standing. These are likely to dislocate in seating position, the posteriorly, and, and uh, we do not know how, we know sometimes uh, the version has to be increased, but how much to increase, we don't know. So uh, there comes the use of this dual mobility. It is for two purposes in angst pond. It is for the stability mainly when the spinopelvic mobility is at stake. And it's also for the mobility because it's a large ball. It really gives a large range of movement. Uh, we have this famous uh, uh, paper by Dan Berry from Mayo Clinic. We have head uh, and the approach. And uh, when you have posterolateral, which many uh, surgeons in India uh, do it, the rate of dislocation is very high. And uh, uh, we now know that most of these dislocations are actually in the Luinex safe zone. So where do we go wrong? It's a uh, anti-inclination is a dynamic concept. Perhaps uh, we resolve, try to resolve this uh, anti-version and inclination in two separate vector planes. But uh, if to put it combined, it's a dynamic concept and it's not a static value. It keeps on changing in sitting, st standing, and perhaps uh, if you put this in the safe zone, uh, uh, almost 20% are out of this uh, safe zone in standing, almost as high as 31% are out of this uh, in the flex sitting position. And if you see this graph, almost uh, from supine to standing, supine to flex seated, or supine to flex seated, almost 30 to 60 degrees of variation and uh, you can go wrong even when you are trained. So when do we do this? When the patient is high risk for dislocation, elderly patients with frail muscles and they are prone to dislocation, obese patients when thigh, th uh, both the thighs impinge and there is a tendency for lateral uh, shift of this and they have high uh, <coughs> degree of uh, dislocation. Substance abuse, alcohol abuse, neurodegenerative uh, diseases or Parkinson's, fracture cases when the capsule is not stiff, it's re really very pliable, almost 10% rate of dislocation. When, whenever we have to convert hemiorthoplasty to THR, conventional THR, because hemiorthoplasty you are using a big ball and suddenly with the single articulation you have a smaller ball, the capsule is stretched, you have a higher uh, degree of dislocation, revision scenarios, uh, and of course, multi-level spinal fusions or in a degenerative, without fusion, patient has a lumbar spondylosis but a stiff spine and uh, on, uh, oncological indications. So there are many indications. It's not that every case we would do a, <coughs> a dual mobility. It has a favorable head to neck ratio, larger arc of movement as opposed to uh, uh, conventional single articulation when the neck impinges, actually that is the third articulation for the dual mobility and it starts moving. That's our, uh, so it's a, such a huge case. First articulation, second articulation, third articulation will be between the neck and the poly impingement. When it impinges, actually it's, that's the, and we have large heads here. What happens, we have used Bilox, we have experience of uh, Delta ceramics and when they, in the adverse condition, when they dislocate, they, you have, you call them uh, stripe wear, or you can uh, call them a uh, metal uh, transfer, whatever it is, I mean, uh, it's bad. As regards the wear, if you see the ceramic or ceramic, the best possible condition, the wear rate of uh, the uh, uh, dual mobility is not really bad. And compare this with the uh, large head, single articulation, almost as high as 40 mm, the dislocation rate is hazard ratio is almost 3.2 as compared to the dual mobility. When it's considered for re-revision for dislocation, again, hazard ratio is 7.1, re-operation for any cases, so, so on and so forth. Consider <coughs> case like this, angst pond, and uh, we have so many, uh, many uh, uh, apps to tell us if you have a change of anti-inclination less than five degrees in sitting and standing, it's a risk for dislocation. And this is just one of the apps you can have on the mobile, and it will tell you that uh, this is a high risk, and you use an alternate uh, articulation. That's this we we have we have had a lecture. And I won't go into these uh, details of this. So we uh, statify uh, the risk uh, factors for dislocation. Uh, Cost-wise, it's actually cost-effective as compared to the large ball uh, survival. We have uh, now almost 15 years data. 
95% survival. Uh, 22 years is the previous version of uh, dual mobility, almost 74% survival by Filippo. And uh, using it in young patients, we have again the data, 12 year data, almost 98% by Sofcourt uh, society. Uh, so in summary, we had to stratify the risk. If there are no risk for dislocation, I think uh, your one, uh, one can go ahead with the uh, alternate bearing or single articulation, but then you have intermediate risk factor and high risk factors. So intermediate risk factors two, two or more and high risk factors one, more than one. Say spinal fusion, one level, more, uh, more than 75 female patient, uh, hip fracture, neurological, this is a intermediate risk factor. Spinal fusion, more than three levels, uh, it's a high risk factor. So more than two intermediate risk factors or more than one high risk factors, one should consider dual mobility. If it is no risk factor or less than one, uh, I mean only one intermediate risk factor, one can do. That's the rough algorithm which has been described. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. I will call Sanjay Dhar for against dual mobility. I think Dr. Mohan has already conceded because he has said that he will do only in these cases. I thought, yes, come here to promote it for every case. Well, all of us agree that dual mobility has a role. Yeah, so all of us agree that dual mobility has a role, particularly in last few years with second, third generation dual mobility coming, that uh, it definitely has a role. So uh, it is the concept, I am not going to spend time on this. All of you know the concept is low friction plus Mackey-Ferrar concept for larger heads. The goal is in, uh, to achieve the greatest possible range of motion in a stable environment in addition to reducing wear. Uh, this debate, of course, it is not created by me, it is created by the organizers of T uh, TTJR. I, am, uh, do, I do use dual mobility, I am not against it, but I use it very judiciously. So DMTHR is not a panacea for what ails a bad craftsman. So if you are worried about dislocations, if you are worried about uh, revisions, then uh, you probably need to also look at your own self. It may not happen in every case. Dr. Pradeep Bosle has been using uh, in ankylosed hips and stiff spines for the last 500 cases and I, he would not have been presenting that paper in every conference otherwise. So it is a limited remedy, not a panacea. So we all go under this follow, this is for the youngsters sitting in the back, uh, fear of losing out or fear of um, uh, missing out. All these companies, they promote their, even very recently one company told me that you will be the first one to do their dual mobility cup, which I used, luckily, unfortunately, I even succumbed to that pressure. So uh, we all know that it gives more mobility, the inner ring moves and it gives you more range of movement. <clears throat> and there are papers which present and there are um, uh, registries which have proven that you get much more range, 154 to 130 as compared to a THR. So, but if you look at the literature, how many of your own THRs have dislocated? In la I have been practicing THR for the last 25 years. I have seen only one dislocation so far. It's not, I am a very uh, middle of the road surgeon. I'm not the best of the surgeons. So early dislocations vary from two to 3%, which increase in the long run, ranging from 4.8 to 10 years at 7% with 25 years follow up. Biomedical studies have shown that instability can be addressed by increase the diameter of the head, which has happened. It is now the diameters have changed. We are using regularly 32 millimeters heads, now even 36 millimeters heads. Uh, so uh, to compare the literature of um, old uh, uh, dual mobility with 22 millimeter heads and 28 millimeter head is not the right thing. It is apples and oranges. So DMT versus 32, 36 millimeter heads, you will find almost similar dislocation rates. Unless, of course, it is used in very special circumstances like Parkinson's and other, and where you don't really understand how to uh, you get the antiversion correctly. Like in stiff spines, you may use them much more. 
So uh, there are so many, uh, with this uh, presentation, I try to look into the literature. So the rates are more or less similar. From 32 onwards, if you go higher, the rates of dislocation more or less remain the same. So uh, all the literature shows almost similar rates of dislocation. So no difference in dislocation rates comparing large diameter jumbo hemorrhoidal heads and dual mobility. It's very common to see these, this literature. It definitely has a role where you can use it in revisions. Neck femur, this was my own case where their uh, FNS was to be replaced. So it was an old lady where I didn't want to take any chance. So we did a dual mobility. This is the case the company forced me to do it, uh, to do the first case in Mumbai. So I did it just because of FOMO. So dislocation is something which is very similar, as I told you. The rates of complications remain more or less similar in both the cases. If you compare head and head, 36 to dual mobility. So then we also have that this Indian scenario, Indians want to squat, Indians want to sit cross leg. But I could not find any literature where they have shown Indians sitting in a yoga and doing with dual mobility heads. So far, only reference I could get hold of was this. And if you look at this, mean room, uh, ROM was 120 in flexion, 10 in extension, 30 in abduction, and 45 degree in abduction, 25 internal rotation. And then he says that all his patients could squat. So with this range, how could all his patients squat? These are all trick moments which my patients with THR also do it. Uh, with uh, And you can see there's a pillow behind and he's trying to mimic sitting cross-legged. So but this is the same patient which I showed in the earlier classification, which showed anterior dislocation. And I revised him. Within six months to one year, he started doing this. So this is all how we project it and how we promote it. Then coming to the next thing, modularity. So modularity is bad. We have, been, we have grown up like this, that more modular you have the implant, more chances of failure, more complications. So same happens with the dual mobility also. We still have, don't have the registries which show us all this data for last so many years. This is all recent data. So component loosening, polyethylene wear, intraprosthetic dislocation, severe crevice and fretting corrosion, all this is possible with dual mobility and we have yet to report it. So all these reports have now started coming. The risk of revision is higher for DMCs than uh, six years after the index implantation. So if you keep using them for each and every case, you will probably see them much more. So these are all, so backside wear is a very common uh, thing. We were so um, uh, enamored by the metal on metal and then you could see the results over a period of time. And similarly, this is going probably to come in future. Of course, the metabology has changed, the metal on, metal, uh, uh, this mechanics has changed, the polyethylene has changed, so we might have much better implant. I don't deny that we'll have better generation dual mobilities, which may probably have a big role in our armamentarium. So mechanically assisted crevice corro corrosion, uh, arthrofibrosis, we don't even see, we just show intra-op that both dual mobility cups are moving, but actually does it really happen in the long run, six years, there's a arthrofibrosis going all around the rim, and whether the really inner ring really moves or not, we are not very sure. So uh, intraprosthetic dislocation is a uh, concern which will keep coming now over a period of time, and it's very difficult to diagnose it. And whenever you have this, you'll have to revise the whole cup. So currently, most joint registries provide detailed data on prosthesis characteristics, such as data on hip resurfacing orthoplasties, but none of them gives a very clear thing about DMCs. So conclusion, contemporary DMC has demonstrated excellent short and midterm results. DMC is used with high-risk patients. It should be used in high-risk patients. It may be an excellent op op uh, option for salvage surgeries, and longer follow-up and systemic uh, presentation in registries is much more needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So any specific point from Mohan, sir, to Dar, sir, and Dar, sir, to Mohan, sir? We already said that it is only for few cases. <laughs> so we more or less agree. It's, I mean, the science is the same. We don't uh, disagree on the fact. But uh, the thing is that uh, putting all types of uh, dual mobility in one single basket is, would not be correct. The original, <coughs> the guy uh, Buske was a monoblock cup which was stainless steel and coated on the uh, on this, and the, it was modified to make it modular. Uh, if when you have introduced the modularity, the size of the poly ball 
reduces and then there would not be much difference between that and the large ball. Between 36 and 38 mm, 36 mm head and 38, there would not be much difference. So to say that uh, dislocation rate of dual mobility and large articulation ball is same would not be correct because you are combining modular and non-modular dual mobility in one single basket. So we are, cons I am talking about specifically in monoblock, non-modular dual mobility. <coughs> we have uh, data on the wear rate. It's a convex poly on the concave metal, not the other, other way. So wear rate is not different. And we have, I think, Sovkot study. Philippo has almost 15 years plus result. So it is a, though it is not registry because it was no adopted very late by the Americans. It did, I think it got FDA approval very late. So Americans adopted it very late. It was a French concept. They were doing it since 1976. And if you see the uh, their uh, use, I think almost many patients from after 60, 60, 65 would receive regularly a dual mobility. That's the usage that French uh, registry of, but they don't right. have a registry, but the French uh, record goes in. Yeah. <laughs> so any comments there, sir? No, I think in the short term, I agree that the uh, dislocation rates are much different. But in the long run, after six to eight years, they tend to be more or less plateau. In, uh, in fact, it's the other way. The, as uh, the Dan Berry said, uh, with the conventional poly, the dislocation rate of the monoblock, if you are using a poly, would increase as the years go by, but the dual mobility remains at a low level. Yeah. But they have been considered intraprosthetic dislocations. Intraprosthetic in dislocation, yes, it's a, it is a hyped one. one. Yeah, it was uh, there with the previous design, but they, with the newer design, it is not, I mean, it is really a hyped, uh, it, it is, it, it, it is a uh, complication, but uh, the rate is not more than perhaps two or three percent. Right. Daria, sir, any comments? Yeah. Yeah. Both of them, actually. For a young patient, you prefer ceramic on ceramic or a dual mobility? I mean, That's you have sir. dual mobility ceramic as well, but... I would not even prefer ceramic on ceramic because the present polyethylene is quite excellent. If you really put it to test, it can last 200 years. So ceramic on poly is the right uh, choice for me, not ceramic on ceramic. A patient without risk factor. An angst one, I would use a dual mobility, but otherwise I would prefer a ceramic on ceramic. ceramic, on ceramic. Thank you very much. So we move on to the third debate, the alignment conundrum, and Dr. Peter is here to put forth his views. So I, I'm I'm very aware of the of the time issues, and I'm, I'm think we're creating more and more problems for our future patients. But one of them is the alignment conundrum. So um, thanks again to the team um, of TTGR for uh, for having me. Um, it all started with a uh, uh, meeting in uh, Muscat a couple of years ago where I was considered a small Belgian. So it, this is uh, French for Le Petit Belge. Uh, so where I met uh, Weibach and uh, we, we started discussing the future. So if we talk about alignment, um, I, I, is, is Weibach around? Is he, is he here? Oh, there he is. So uh, just for you to be aware, I went around on the ward this morning and I saw your post of patients. I, I would say I'm a little confused. Yeah, I don't think that can be right. So when we talk about alignment, what are we talking about? So the knee, I think we need to understand this is a complex machine, six degrees of freedom, complex kinematics. And if we do a knee replacement, we start cutting ligaments out, usually only one, but sometimes a little bit more than one. So we change the kinematics anyway. So you know, just keep it simple. We talk about 2D, 3D, 4D, we talk about coronal plane, we talk about satchel plane, we talk about axial plane. Are we talking about single stands, dual stands, gate patterns? You know, it is a very complex material. I would like to compare it to your car. Wheel alignment and tire balancing. I've seen lots of cars driving around here, and if you look at the tires, they're not that great. So, um, so just, just make sure that we're talking the same language. And, we don't really know what the goal is of all of this. What we want to do in, the, in arthroplasty is we want an implant that outlasts the patient. So we want a long lasting implant. We are getting there. The NGR, the Australians, they feel now that our implants 85% last 25 years plus 
if you use Kaplan-Meier um, statistics. And most of the patients, they want to forget about the surgery and they want to forget about the prosthesis, so the forgotten joint score. But we know that knees might not be as good. So they want stability, they want physiological motion and alignment, and they want balance. So bone restoration, alignment, and balance is what we aim for. But we don't know what alignment, and we don't know what really the balance is. So they also want any level of activity. And I think it is about talking to your patients, because any level of activities, we saw the previous speaker talking about uh, running marathons or doing triathlons. You know, knee replacements should not really run marathons or triathlons. If they, if they walk up a hill and if they play golf, go swimming, I think that should be, that should be the maximum. But asking them to run, I don't think is the right way forward. So what is a conundrum? So a conundrum is an intricate and difficult problem. So it's one of the many problems we've got in knee replacement. Do we replace the patella? Do we resect the PCL? Do we do the tibia first, femur first, cement, no cement, PS, CRCS? Which implant is the best navigation robotic standards? Alignment. There's many conundrums of, of, in, in knee replacement surgery. There's different types of alignment. You know, we all know the CPAC. We all know the CESI's uh, paper um, in the page, BJJ. So, you know, <laughs> what do we do? When I was training a long time ago, Three implants. We talked about them yesterday. Profix, Genesis 2, Next Gen. These were the implants I was trained on. We all had to do full extending and me mechanically aligned knee. So we had to measure all the X's before. Um, I was also given three books. Ligament balancing. I still, I still open it now and then. Built knee replacement, a guide to better performance. And then the controversies. And I think, you know, if you do knee replacements, these are three books that you should at least have on the shelf and, and have read before. But I, there was also a bit of robotics, a bit of navigation, and like everything in life, everything moves on. So, histories of alignment, Sir John Insull, mechanical alignment. This is what I was taught to do, it's a fixed alignment. But then came the anatomic alignment, also a fixed alignment. Steve Howells came up with a kinematic alignment, then there was a restricted kinematic alignment, then there's cons constitutional alignment, then there's functional alignment, then there's restricted inverse kinematic alignment and adjusted mechanical alignment. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And I think nobody knows really what to do. Um, why, why, is, why is this so complex and so complicated and how can we get there? And first of all, why do, we, why do we look for different alignments? And, you know, it's the quest for the patient satisfaction. We talked about it yesterday again. 80% of the patients are unsatisfied with the knee replacement. But if you look at the 20% that are unsatisfied, 10% are unsure, and it's maybe only 5% that are truly unsatisfied. So do we know whether the specific alignment methods needs on the basis of the variation in human anatomy, or should we stick to the trial and test the mechanical alignment? So... If, we, if we're going to go for the newer alignments, I think there's three prerequisites. First of all, what you do needs to be reprodu reproducible. It's not having one of those three pictures every time you do an x-ray. So you need to say, I want to put a knee in valgus, and it's going to be in valgus. I want to put it in varus, it needs to be in varus. And then second of all, we talked about outcomes. You know, these new alignments, and I'm not sure how we're going to do it, they need to be supported by long-term survivorship. And I'm really unsure whether registers will give you the answer because registers do not record the alignment strategy for the surgeons. They might record in the future whether you use robots or not, but they don't use your alignment strategy. And also, are we really doing something for the patients? Are we improving their, their PROMs? And are the PROMs validated enough? And are they sensitive enough to do so? So, so far, reprodu reproducible techniques, and we've had some examples here, they can achieve alternative alignments quite easily. It's possible to be technically achieved, However, you can only do it with enabling technologies. You can only do it with PSI, navigation, or robotics. And everything comes with a cost. Uh, we've jumped on that bandwagon. This is my team in the hospital. So we, we started doing Mako knees and Mako hips. If you look at the outcomes, register support, long-term survivorship, there's absolutely no evidence that a target of 95% 10-year survivorship is going, to, is going to be improving. I think we've, we've reached that ceiling. The long-term outcomes, of outcomes of any of the new alignments is still missing. And as I said before, I don't think alignment can be studied by, by registers. What about satis patient satisfaction? And I think we're going to get clashing with my, um, my opponent here. Um, I'm really not sure where there's much evidence out there that it's really that much better. So uh, very small studies, 
uh, no difference in Oxford knee score, Womack forgotten joint score. And what they say as well is we're unable to demonstrate an advantage in, uh, to uh, key A in terms of pain or function that would justify the risks. So risk benefit, very minimal. So then a meta-analysis, MAKA are a restricted kinematic analysis, similar ROMs, similar PROMs, and su surgeons should choose surgical procedures carefully, and further trials are warranted to evaluate efficacy, safety, and subsequent revision risk. So there's a warning sign there. MA versus KA, no significant difference in any outcome measure between KA and MA and TKA. And these are all systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So big studies, big data, well, big data, as far as the big data can be concerned, is certainly not uh, registered data, but there's no real big evidence that we can make it better. So my suggestion would be, we all want to have great results. You know, nobody goes into surgery. I, well, I don't know any of, the, of my colleagues that have gone into surgery to make a patient worse. So we all want to have reprodu reproducible surgery and not have off days and make sure that every time we want to do something, it's, it's you know, plans versus achieved. We achieve what we plan. Whilst we all love technology, all the new techniques and technology should be reliable and reproducible. We're not sure about that. So in my conclusion, mechanical alignment might remain the gold standard for a bit longer, or could I be convinced that an alternative alignment, reconstructing the knee to a little more anatomic position on the tibial side with technological support is the aim. So I could compromise for that. But as long as I don't have the technology and the technology is not tested and trialed, mechanical alignment to try to get at zero is the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll call up Dr. Suhas for the against mechanical alignment. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Suhas from uh, Sunshine Hospital, Hyderabad. Uh, so here I'm talking about uh, why mechanical alignment cannot be the only way forward. Um, I was really uh, intrigued by uh, this one word, only way forward, because my job here is not to discount and discard mechanical alignment, but clearly make you understand what are the deficiencies in mechanical alignment. And is there scope for these alternate alignment strategies which can be pursued in order to make this operation better? Uh, nobody can discount the achievement that we made with mechanical alignment, which is survivorship, which Dr. Peter alluded to. But if you look at a normal knee, and if you look at this perfect harmony between the morphology of the knee, the alignment, as well as the soft tissue which runs the biomechanics and the kinematics of a knee, in an ideal world where everything is black and white, if we can design an implant which mimics the morphology of the knee, if we can put the knee back to the native alignment and also mimic soft tissues which are very similar to that particular patient, we will have absolutely the best possible outcome for that particular patient. When it comes to mechanical alignment, let us look at each of these three aspects, anatomy, alignment, as well as normalizing soft tissues what is being achieved by mechanical alignment and what is not. So first let us look at anatomy. If you look at the principles of mechanical alignment and cut the tibia and the femur at 90 degrees, you can clearly see that you're distalizing the lateral joint line and elevating the medial joint line. And this creates this change in the anatomy for that particular patient. And then you can see as you lateralize your joint line, uh, you will create tightness on the lateral side, the patellofemoral joint, kinematics are altered, the tibial tubercle has to move more far away, uh, and then that puts pressure on the patella, and then you have this tightness. The second problem with 90 degree cuts is this unequal gaps that you create, both in flexion and extension, and because of this, the amount of release that needs to be done is almost mandatory in most of these cases. So here you can see that you're altering both the soft tissue envelope, as well as the hard anatomy of a patient while doing mechanical alignment. Now let us look at normal tissue. So uh, this is how the normal knee works. If you see the dynamic MRI on the medial side, it is a ball and socket, it, is, it pivots on the medial side, and then you can see that there is a big rollback on the lateral side because of the PCL and laxity in the LCL ligament. 
if you are trying to create equal gaps uh, in, uh, and we also know that women are more lax as compared to men, lateral collateral ligament is more lax compared to medial, and uh, the flexion is more lax as compared to the extension. Given the philosophy of mechanical alignment, which proposes that you have equal gaps, both in flexion and extension, and the polys that we have right now. The first one is a CR poly, which is plagued because of the paradoxical motion. Then you have the PS insert, which has an obligatory flexion because of the cam and post, where both medial as well as the lateral condyles move, hence you have a lot of peripheral femoral issues. Or the ultra congruent design where uh, you can have a dual pivot, either you can have a lateral pivot or a medial pivot based on uh, what is the ligament tension. So all these three designs with mechanical alignment, you can clearly see that none of these actually create the rollback that you can see in a normal knee. Now let us look at alignment. We all know uh, we have very individualized alignments in our patients. Uh, Bellman spoke about it and from there on, you can see that we all have some amount of constitutional virus. It's around two degrees in the Caucasian population. It goes on to more around three to three degrees in the uh, Asian population. And then you can see uh, many phenotypes have been developed. One of the most classical uh, ones that has been in vogue is the CPAC classification. We presented and we published our data on CPAC here in India. And uh, you can see, and probably this is the most compelling uh, uh, picture which convinced me to look at different alignment strategies. You can see here, you have five knees, all of them showing that there is some amount of varus, but if you can see the long leg film, each of them have different phenotypes. So like how uh, Dr. Peter said, if, uh, the, if you have a complex problem, you need to deal with it, you have to look at it, you have to see how you can find solutions. So instead of mimicking each of these alignment strategies, if we have a strategy where you're pushing every knee into that central uh, type five, which mimics mechanical alignment, I think we will have different uh, outcomes. So here you can see in a CPAC one knee, if you can compare the KA versus MA, you can see that if you do mechanical alignment in a knee with a CPAC type one, look at the amount of pressure that you're creating here. So it is at least five to six X more pressure created on the medial side because of mechanical alignment. Similarly, if you move a type two from, uh, from type two to type five, again, you can see that there is a big difference in pressure. Uh, the other study that I want to talk about is McDessie's study where he's shown in each phenotype, if you do mechanical alignment versus kinematic alignment, here you can clearly see that the amount of uh, soft tissue releases are less, the amount of knees balancing on their own without any soft tissue releases are much higher in kinematic alignment as compared to mechanical alignment. If you look at gait analysis, the black one is a normal patient. Uh, the green is uh, a patient who has mechanical alignment and red is uh, kinematic alignment. And also if you look at the knee adduction moment, which is a surrogate marker for the amount of tibiofemoral loading, you can see on the, uh, on, on the left of your screen, you have mechanical alignment, which has a longer knee adduction arm and you have a ground reaction force, which is more horizontal than vertical. So this puts a lot more pressure on the medial side as compared to a KNE and e for uh, all the people who are concerned that you give so much varus in your tibia in a kinematic alignment, they actually have less pressure when they are walking on the medial side as compared to mechanical alignment. So here is uh, the, the conflict. Do you, will you pursue mechanical alignment where you, where you alter the anatomy, where you ignore every alignment phenotype of that particular patient and recommend equal gaps both in flexion extension or you want to use technology wherever it is available to shape match the femur maybe use patient specific implants if they are available phenotype every patient and decide which alignment philosophy that you want to follow and simulate laxity patterns while trying to recreate and uh, uh, preserve your pcl using a medial pivot knee so this is how we normally now do our knee replacements where we phenotype every particular patient. Uh, we select what type of uh, alternate alignment we want to follow. We also have the range in which we want to put these patients in and what laxity patterns you want to put these patients in. So here is an example of a patient who is having uh, a pure kinematic plan where you have four degree valgus on the femur, 
six degrees varus on the tibia, and then you can see there is four degrees of internal rotation on the um, um, axial plane, and you can see how well the posterior condylar offset is recreated both on the medial side as well as the lateral side, and you can also see that the trochlea is very well matched. So this is how we shape match the femur in our patients, and then in these patients, as you ligament balance, we are very wary of not changing the alignment of this patient, so we don't touch the valgus on the femur so that we can create the obliquity in the joint line. And you can see at the end of the balancing, we have lift some amount of laxity on the lateral side as compared to the medial side. So the take home message is either we continue to do mechanical alignment, fully knowing the drawbacks, and take solace in the fact that our knees are surviving. And like how Dr. Peter already said, uh, ask them to moderate their expectation and not worry about the change in the anatomy or the biomechanics or the kinematics of the patient. Or if you have access to robotics, uh, take this problem on the chin, be open and be progressive in your thinking and try to take a conscious dive into the world of personalized arthroplasty. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Suhas. I'm sure Dr. Peter has some comments. So not all of us have access or will have access to robotics. Uh, hopefully in the future we will get more and more technology, but that, te that technology is not proven yet. And I would really be very careful putting, putting a tibia in four or five or six degrees of virus. There are some limits. Um, we don't know how the stress levels are under that cement if you use cement. And I think you might have some problems with, with loosening um, very early on. So like I said, in the most ideal world you would uh, uh, I, I do concede that uh, there are issues with alternate alignments, and there is uh, there's a lot more research that needs to be done. One in how do we define the safety limit for our boundaries, and number two in knowing what laxity patterns are amenable for which particular patients. And also the native alignment, if you have to know the native alignment, you have to use the image guided uh, image gui uh, guided like CT based thing and. If you have to irradiate that patient with 200 uh, chest X-ray equivalent of irradiation, isn't it? So the amount of uh, radiation is 3.4 uh, millisieverts, uh, which is well documented. Uh, I do see these numbers of 200 uh, X-rays, 300. I've even heard 2,000, but I, the exact amount of radiation is 3.4 millisieverts. So as can I make a comment? My biggest misgiving about the CPAC is it's really a coronal alignment distribution. And as everybody, I think five of the six debaters have talked about, this has the six degree freedom and it has coronal sagittal rotational. And I think the real sort of issue is if you take a CPAC five or CPAC four, and you believe that that should be converted into a CPAC two, or one, whatever your philosophies are, based entirely on robotic intervention. You cannot do CPAC without, conversion of CPAC without a, a technology-based medium. Um, yeah, you do. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the, the sort of ultimate outcome of a knee replacement is a marriage between several things. And I, Again, I mean, we've had this sort of uh, banter going on forever, and I think it will continue until I retire, and I'll do that a lot earlier than you will, so I'll get out of your hair for sure, is the fact that all of you, all the people who talk about these so-called functional alignments to, and talk about not releasing soft tissues, explain to me one question, and I, I'll ask this with humility. How do you subluxate that tibia in front of the femur without releasing soft tissues? You have to release. You can say we minimize soft tissue releases, and I get that. And you know, in my own practice, we have reduced substantially, maybe 70%. But releasing is mandatory. And you have 30, 35, 40 degrees of flex of various or valgus deformity. Soft tissue releases, releasing the osteophytes getting to the back and taking out the posterior osteophyte, it's a mandatory algorithm to balance that knee. Uh, you want one or two degrees, and again, I, to, with, to, to Peter's point, six degrees of varus on the tibia, 
Uh, I've worked with John Insull, and I'm a great sort of uh, subscriber to, to that philosophy. I'm wedded to uh, what I call the adjusted mechanical alignment. We did this yesterday in the, in the Rosa surgery. Um, one or two degrees, absolutely, no question about it. Going all the way to six degrees, I think the interesting thing is, will be 10 years or five years or seven years out from today, I think we'll need to have another TTGR to find out how long, how many of these really stood the test of time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I think there are five or six questions that uh, everybody has asked. Uh, let me start with uh, the first question. Is this just coronal alignment? Are we not worried about sagittal as well as axial? So I will tell you two points regarding that. Now, McDessey uh, recently came up with another paper where uh, in the CPAC grid of nine phenotypes, they also looked at the sagittal as well as the axial sections to see if there was any pattern. There was no pattern. So mostly the pattern you see was mainly the coronal alignment. So that is the first question. Second thing, when we are doing robotic surgery, we are completely aware and cognizant of the fact of what we need to do to the sagittal as well as the axial pin. And I, as I clearly showed you, we are trying to recreate both the posterior condylar offset on the medial side, the lateral side, as well as the axial. So it is not just about recreating the coronal plane. So that's the first thing. Second thing you talked about is the soft tissue releases. So we've written a paper where, uh, in a bilateral setting where we did mechanical alignment with the robot and functional alignment with the robot in the same patient. And we've shown that the soft tissue releases come down by 50%. Having said that, even in the functional alignment cohort where we had 100 patients, we had to do soft tissue releases in more than 40 of those patients. That is because of the type of deformities that we see in our practice. The third point about dislocating the tibia. So if you're trying to dislocate the tibia right after your approach, uh, where you have no bone cuts, then as you dislocate the tibia, I completely agree, as you dislocate, you have that stripping that goes right posterior. But in robotic surgery, when we do pre-balance and we take the cuts, that's the first time we are actually dislocating the tibia. So anything beyond the mid-coronal plane is nicely secured because you already have the cuts, you've decompressed the joint, and as you dislocate, you don't have to touch that particular soft tissue. It doesn't strip and the knee is already balanced. That is the reason where if you do the dislocation right at the beginning of the surgery, I understand that you can have some stripping of the soft tissues. Can I ask something about the CPAC classification? Yes. You know, it's been described. But what we see is an arthritic knee. And this classification is described on the normal knees. So would it not be, you know, something that is we are missing there in the CPAC It's uh, described both in the young as well as the arthritic population. Hmm. Where CPAC of, uh, loses favor is hmm. when you start having bone loss, right? Hmm. In In... Caucasian data compared to our data when we saw uh, the incidence of CPAC 2, 3, 4 uh, was very consistent in the Caucasian population between the young as well as the arthritic population. But when you look at our data, you can see that we have more CPAC 1s than CPAC 2s. And one explanation could be is the change in the MPTA that happens over a period of time. And then maybe a lot of CPAC type 2s have moved to CPAC 1. And then I do get this question a lot, what happens in all these gross deformities? Can you do CPAC classification? What happens? So most of them are actually CPAC ones to begin with. And as the deformity progresses into those grotesque x-rays, the CPAC doesn't change. It only moves further and further deep into CPAC type one. Right, okay. What do you think about the uh, patient specific, you mentioned about it. So how much time does it take for you people? Uh, uh, I don't do use PSI, uh, we, we do robotic, but on an average, our uh, surgical time is around 35, 40 minutes for every case. And one of the biggest problems that I have with uh, the um, alignment issues is we're talking about primary orthoplasties here, but being mostly a revisionary surgeon, uh, all of a sudden I have to tell my patients, um, you know what, we are going back to mechanical alignment and we're going to do it exactly like we always used to do it because we know it's working. And I have now the first patients that have had kinematically aligned knees that are suing their surgeons because they walk in the practice, they still have knees that are not straightened out. So they are suing the surgeons that did their knees 
because they did not properly explain to them the concept of kinematic alignment. So if, how do you deal with these patients? Yeah, so if, if you do a pure kinematic alignment, you should have a HK of zero because you're matching the MPTA of, yeah, so, so if you're doing unrestricted, you should have an absolute straight leg. And, and I forgot to ask, uh, um, to the point Dr. Dr. Raj Gopal made about six degrees varus. On an average, the amount of varus we give is around four. I put that up because of how I uh, wanted to show up your kinematic plan. But you have around 15 surgeons in Australian registry who are going up to six degrees of varus. And their data is around seven years now, where they have around six patients, 600 patients in the Australian registry who are between six to seven years uh, and they haven't seen failure yet. But we need, of course, wait for more than that. But one what step. about these patients when they come back in 15, 20 years and they will need their first revision? That concept with the current implants won't work anymore because with the stems and everything, we won't be able to put six degrees of virus. So, yeah, once, once you are going back and revising, uh, none of these concepts will work. Yeah, so we have uh, Stephen Hall's data, which is 20 years old. He hasn't shown any difference in survivorship. You have, yeah, you have. You have Dossett's data, which is around 15 years old, and you have Mayo Clinic's data, which is 25 years old, where they have shown that HK axis less than three and more than three have equal survivorship. So, as if I may ask, uh, you did an interesting study of around 100 patients where bilateral had one side functional, the other side mechanical. Yes. Now, what was the subjective difference in the recovery of the knees that you found in the initial period, say at six weeks, three months, and maybe a year down the line? Yeah, so we are waiting for the two-year uh, uh, outcome data to be seen. Uh, in the immediate term, uh, the first 24, 48 hours, there was a perceptible difference in pain. Uh, the amount of swelling that usually starts right after conventional surgery is much delayed in the robotic patients. So we saw a difference in pain scores in the first 24 and 48 hours. But, it, but in terms of pain, it seems to homogenize. But there is a different difference in the rehab protocol as well as the rehab parameters that these patients have uh, achieved. Uh, in, uh, that is from a different study. But if you look at straight leg raising, uh, the bending of the knee, they are pretty similar. Uh, uh, so we are waiting for the two-year outcome, and then probably we will use FJS, and it's uh, still blinded. Uh, if we find a difference, it will be great. If not, uh, then we would just publish as it is. I, re I request everyone to take a break. I think uh, this conference is all about alignment, so we can discuss much more, because we'll get late for dinner and tea and everything. So I request Dr. Amit Pispati, last lecture before tea break, because there are very hot samosas waiting outside. So, Dr. Amit Pispati, if you're there. Yeah, the tea, tea and uh, snacks are served outside, so you can all one by one go and come back.
Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I think previously we had two excellent speakers uh, who had a debate on the dual mobility THR. So I tried to restrict the content of this talk and uh, merely focus uh, on a few key points uh, to summarize. And uh, we're all meeting here today because uh, total hip is one of the most successful procedures in orthopedics. And the key things that uh, DM wants to try to provide are uh, pre prevention or reduction of instability. And uh, as uh, Mohan Desai mentioned, the procedure was invented in France uh, towards the end of the 1970s. The sole idea being to reduce the risk of uh, total hip arthroplasty dislocation. Uh, the whole idea of the DM concept is increase in stability, but without compromising clinical outcomes and to enhance implant longevity. The USFD approval came as late as the year 2009. And the commonest problems as are now documented are instability or dislocation, and thereafter mechanical loosening and infection. Again, if you look at the Australian registry, prosthesis dislocation is a big uh, problem that we all face. And significantly more patients are being revised for dislocations in the plus 70 age group. Uh, in, the two, in the 2000s, one found that as the incidence of dislocations was going up in the modern world, uh, in France there was a paradox that was noted, the paradox being that the incidence of dislocations were actually reducing. And later people found out this French paradox was simply because of the use of the dual mobility system. The concepts then that were being used were interesting. It was a mix and match. It was the Chandler's low friction principle in use combined with the mackey farrar principle where they used a large diameter mobile component in a highly polished acetabular liner. So the advantage of the Chandler concept being that there were small diameter heads using a low torque principle and using the mackey principle of a large diameter bearing and more stable with a, than a smaller head. <clears throat> so basically that's how it works as compared to a conventional implant where you initially have a small head which works within a retentive polyethylene and eventually the polyethylene starts to move within the metal back shell in a non-retentive way. The idea being that you get stability which reduces the risk of dislocation, increased amplitude of movement reducing impingement and reduce shear forces which reduces the implant uh, dislocation. The results were shared by some of the speakers and these were not uh, just small numbers. They were numbers like 400 cases, 1000 cases, 2500 cases. And we know that at 15 years survivorship can be as much as 81 to 96% with a low rate of dislocation. But for the uh, <clears throat> intraprosthetic dislocation, the incidence could be as much as up to 2 to 3%. The use has been phenomenal even in revision THR, and the survivorship for that can be as much as 94 to 98% at five years. Even in tumor resection, they now have a significant role to play. If you conserve the abductors, then the dislocation with the DM system could be 3.5%. But if you section the abductors, the dislocation rates do tend to go up even with a DM system. So even looking uh, back at a recent paper, there's been a tremendous uh, rising trend in the use of DM systems. In primary total hips, people use them up to 12%. In the revision system, there's a tendency to use them up to 30 to 31%. Clearly, they're not cut out for everyone, but certainly in a patient who's at a risk of instability, you could use them for a recurrent total hip dislocation, neuromuscular disease, spasticity, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive dysfunction. Older patients about 75 years with prior hip surgery, high BMI patients, <clears throat> a good indication is the primary fracture neck femur in the 60s, undergoing a total hip replacement, stiff spine, fixed spinopelvic alignment, and the DDH patient. However, we need to take care for the use in patients under the years, age of 50 years because of the chance of increased polyethylene wear and osteolysis, because less than 50 years, you could get as much as 13% osteolysis. What we do know is that if you put it in a patient over the age of 70 years, that patient probably is unlikely to ever need a revision. Uh, in the modern world, people use XLP and vitamin E infused polyethylene, and that probably will now reduce the wear. The long-term results of such uh, polyethylene usage is uh, still awaited. The standard common practice now means that dual mobility socket is now an option for patients of 60 years and older, but for younger patients, use with caution in specific select scenarios. The specific complication people discuss is the intraprosthetic dislocation or what is called as retentive failure. And this is because of wear of the polyethylene in line as retentive chamfer. <clears throat> and that's the classical way that is diagnosed, seeing the bubble sign where you can make out that the polys go are moved upwards and you can see the eccentric position within the acetabular socket. If you recognize it early enough, the treatment may be very, very simple, where you can just get out with a liner exchange. But if it's a late diagnosis, then you need to do a full house acetabular revision as well. 
Uh, <clears throat> the third joint, which is marked as point C, is a, a perennial problem in the later years of life of the dual mobility system, where the friction between the metal neck and the rim of the insert, that begins to form a third joint, and once that forms a third joint, there's further wear that sets in. This happens in extreme movements, which are infrequent in normal walking, and there's wear of the rim of the poly insert, and there's deterioration of the ring, giving rise to intraprosthetic dislocation. So like we saw yesterday, there's tons and tons of robotic systems, and you may want to ask similarly, which DM system should I be using? Clearly, one may wish to think, which system should I use? There's companies and companies now making them in India. So there's two kinds of DM systems. Those with the acetabular component is modular having screws and those which are monoblock systems. If you have a doubt in terms of the stability of the acetabular component and you think of that in advance, you may wish to use a modular component. But in that case, you're likely to come out with a smaller size of the polyliner. And if you wish to use a monoblock, your chances are that you'll come out with a larger head. So to give you an example, this is an example of a modular system. You're putting in something like a 4850 shell, but unfortunately, you're coming out with a poly which is only 38. So the, that means the difference is that from a conventional LIPO of 36, now you got in a 38 poly. On the other hand, if you use a monoblock system, if you put in a 44 cup, what you get is a 44 poly. You put in a 48 cup, you get a 48 poly. So clearly you're likely to get a much thicker poly. Or now you have something else which is available here, the BioRad also, which works similar to the Evolutus. So for two sort of cup sizes, you'll get one kind of poly. So for 44 and 46, you get a 44 poly. Again, a reasonably large head, so enough poly. So if you look at this uh, busy slide over here, you can make out if you study it from the left to the right, the kind of poly thickness that you get with monoblock versus uh, something else. So in conclusion, uh, DM demonstrates statistically significant reductions in the dislocation rate. And uh, from an economic perspective, it's useful in select uh, scenarios, but due diligence or long-term performance is needed before its use can be justified in young patients. But use carefully selected uh, patients, if you use it, then uh, it's certainly a winner. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Amit. I request Dr. Pramod, I think. Mudit is not there.
modify and you have to go with either AI or some tensioning device, which is I think on the way. So these are the different kind of robots we can see out here. And the image-based uh, knee, I'm not going to talk about much, but requires a preoperative CT scan to recreate the radiological anatomy and a robotic arm, which is an interactive system to plan, which can be modified, as you just mentioned. Now, there are possible artifacts that can happen in imaging, which is my question, which I asked you, I think, about uh, pre-existing hardware, not you, sorry, someone else, about pre-existing hardware and getting, you know, CT scans with pre-existing, say, metal plates out there. So they call a lot of artifacts and make it difficult for you to actually get a proper CT scan and therefore have a proper radiographic anatomy. So there, you will have to shift to image-less so robotic TKRs. So in short, you don't really need a pre-operative image. There is really no radiation, whatever minimal radiation you're talking about. You can use the anatomical landmarks. You have to use more of them. You have to take many more points or you have to take the whole surface and then extrapolate it to the uh, 3D model and then use any semi-active system, preferably to uh, use reamers or burrs or saws, saw blades to get your precise bone uh, resection in accordance with the plan. The advantages, of course, will be that you don't have radiation preoperatively. There's a real-time feedback that's happening when you're doing your bony landmarks and you require a lot more points to get registration, which is again validated to prove that it is actually as effective and as uh, good as the image-based uh, totally uh, plan. The soft tissue balancing is actually a component of this plan and, and it is made ideally after doing some amount of tough, uh, soft tissue tensioning. You can actually change the plan while you're doing it and see its effect real time. You can actually predict what's going to happen with your implants position out there and the soft tissue release is minimalized. Of course, for personalized alignment techniques, you have to use some form of assistance, whether it is robotic or some uh, formulae, and the patient outcomes have been reported to be better. The learning curve is there, of course. Sometimes you, you may have difficulty in making sure that the trackers that you're positioned don't move out of the way or they are uh, you know, uh, shifting around a bit, so you need to sort of fix those pins well. And the bone registration is really the key. If you don't get the decision right, then you're going to have problems. The garbage in is going to get you garbage out. So in kinematically aligned knees, especially, implant positioning with respect to soft tissues when attempting to reconstruct the individual anatomy is actually challenging. So you may end up altering your uh, implant position to a kinematic alignment uh, if you're not uh, planning to do any soft tissue release. So the key takeaways can be divided into pros and cons for the imageless system. We are removing the need for any preoperative imaging. Uh, you obviously should not go there like a hero. You should do an X-ray anyways, but you don't need to do a CT scan. Uh, you uh, decrease your pre-operative healthcare resource utilization. That again uh, implies the CT scan and the amount of planning you need to do through the CT scan uh, by the system that you use. Radiation is again the same thing. You implement an interoperative plan which is very precise, real time with feedback and you get very good sagittal, especially tibial alignment. And where there is a pre-existing hardware, then of course you have a problem with image-based uh, sort of robotic system, so you actually have that advantage over there. Uh, probably uh, with people who are using or used to using uh, navigated total knee replacements, for them shifting to an imageless robotic system is very easy because they're already used to the workflow. Uh, severe deformity, unfortunately, still needs special mention and care to provide accurate plans, whether it is image-based or image-less, and uh, more so because, uh, the, like I said, if you don't feed the points incorrectly and you don't have a range of motion shown to the uh, computer, it'll give you a wrong plan. And there is, of course, a learning curve. Even though functional outcomes may not be really superior, we don't know about survival rates. The future really is what we're looking at. We're going to have a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning in uh, arthroplasty, and I think uh, Murali discussed that yesterday. But we're looking at AI-based tools to, man to sort of help in not only preoperative and interoperative, but also postoperative um, care of the patient. And something like this is what we're going to be seeing very soon. I think you must have put this slide up as well, right? Okay, I wasn't there yesterday, but I'm sure you must have put up this slide. So these are my references, and I hope I finished on time, sir. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, next, we'd like to invite Dr. Siddharth. Please set up your... My one question, Rajiv, what is the role of preoperative scanogram now? <laughs> so I think um, if you're... Um, um, what is the word for it? If you're very brash or if you're very um, aggressive and you want to just do any knee replacement surgery, you're going to fall in trouble someday if you don't do a pre-op scan. Because you will miss out on some Boeing, you'll miss out on some 
pre-operative hardware in some other site, which complicates the plan. So I think it's still required, at least today. No, I think like robot and both scanner, it forces you to introspect. I think what I, I, I do, Corey, I perhaps don't need it to execute it, but it just makes me think more. I can look at the CPAC, as he said, you can just start visualizing, because eyes don't see what mind doesn't know. So once you have a look, you can't, and when, when you have seen it, you can't unsee things. So since the time, CPAC always, I mean, the phenotypes always existed, but because someone put it across so vividly, that you now, every time you look at the x-ray, you automatically kind of start thinking in terms of RS valgus, the joint line orientation. So I think that is how these scanograms also work. Yeah. So now one question to now, you're talking about robotic and all the alignment, and I believe all five you company users are here, surgeons. Okay, one on, I also use it. Can you tell me how accurate it's any of you in sagittal alignment? No, it does help. So it's not as accurate as it would be for um, for the coronal plate, and uh, we. But you can tweak the flexion extension gaps. You can also change the recurvatum. So it's not accurate, but it does give you some pointers because you are able to rotate the components. Okay. So the overall alignment. Do you ever calculate a lat Do you ever take a lateral standing X-ray? Have you taken in life before no. before the robot came in? Before Nobody. robot does has anyone. No, know I'm the existence of a standing full intra, leg. Intraoperatively, you use Corey, Rosa, or whatever. The fact that the sagittal elements were never in the domain of our mind. As I said, eyes don't see what mind doesn't know. We have never ever taken a lateral standing scanogram. I have never taken in my life. I've never seen one take. So did we ever give weightage to a sagittal alignment? No. Is the question. No, th no it is supine recurvatum. See, recurvatum is disabling. Any of the robotic system cannot accurately define recurvatum. If you, any of you, we have to manually correct it, okay? No. Yeah. Uh, why? It does, it so does. It, it gives it, you flexion it, degrees, it gives you hyperextension. Never correct. No, that is how so, you place your pins. No, that is, I'll tell you the reason for that. There is some discrepancy in how much the hyperextension looks and what the number is seen. Exactly, the, point the reason is, is because as the hyperextension is calculated from the center of the head of the femur down to the knee, which accounts for the amount of antiversion that is there in the hip. Yes, exactly. That is the reason the leg looks much more hyperextended than what the number is seen. So we are doing a study to understand the normal antiversions in the femur, the anterior bow, and its effect on how much hyperextension actually happens. You have to extrapolate that in your Ex uh, Exactly. So, no, so no. I'll, I'll answer your question to you. That, sir, my question is you have to manually adjust it. No, 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 you do not. The point is... No, no the point... So, two things. Five, six degrees always. No, I think two points. One is what Suhas made rightly, that you have to integrate with machine, that you have to know that the five degree flexion it shows at the end of the surgery, and when you are seeing that it is no extension, there is no flexion, but yet it's showing five degree, it's probably not an accurate reflection because of the anti version and number two before you start the case i think you may judge okay this patient has got little five seven degree hyperextension, but the computer will tell you actually that it is a 15 degree hyperextension, and then you have an opportunity to alter your cuts to ensure that you give what is right for that patient so so again as i say mind doesn't see because if it shows you a 20 degree hyperextension deformity you know how to alter your distal femoral cut and we do it always so my cuts, and as I said, the, what robotic has done is made me completely non-dogmatic about everything in arthroplasty. Only one dogma, balance forces all across the joint, patellofemoral, medial, and lateral component. That is the only dogma that remains true. Whether you are a CR, PS, whether you are giving more slope, less slope, I think all that has become non-dogmatic today. I think the sagittal planning is so much more profound because we're doing robotics. The postercondylar offset, the amount of flexion that you give on the femur, the ability to recreate the slope on the lateral side, these are all non-entities in conventional surgery. I agree completely. See, two, part, two things in TKR. One is your alignment, and second is the balancing of a knee. Among the two things, which do you think is more important? I mean, if we have to get one to sacrifice the other one, which one would you get? So my, my talk is actually about this. I always call it the concept of house and home. Do you want a stable house or a happy home? 
in your life. So you would want. You My would question want, is very specific. No, so I, I'm coming to that. If you want to come, we are chasing two things: survivorship and proms. We all agree here in that. Okay, your proms are better if your balance is good. Your survivorship is good if you are not deviating too far away from your mechanical. Alignment. That's a presumption, right? Because that that's three a, degree fact. bar is giving more that's uh, a fact failure today. with the article by. Uh, as of today, it uh, is a fact that if you have deviated, see for all. Those level five series are part of the kinematic alignment. The registry series shows that if you are too far away from your mechanical alignment, for last 30 years I've been told that. I have studied that. There are certain evidence which suggest that it may not necessarily be true, but as of date, overwhelmingly, if you compare the data available for non-deviation of mechanical alignment, it exists that the survivorship is directly correlated to your not deviating too far away from mechanical alignment. That means you agree that we should not worry too much about what alignment you are looking, no, no, we, like kinematic and... Uh, see, my, my take on that is, sir, your choice between balance and alignment. Since we still don't know what is the native alignment accurately, if I have to default to something in this date, I would go with balance. Because at least I have survivorship on my side. But the day we know... Survivorship. He said against that. He said survivorship is not for... That is for comfort. No, no. Proms is physical comfort now. Survivorship is how long it will last in future. So the reason why all conventional knee surgeries, though they were deviated from the normal axis, have survived because they were balanced knees. That is, the Mayo study is the biggest example of that. Though there was some deviation beyond 3 degrees, why did these no, those knees survive? Because they were balanced well, and there was no overloading on one side as compared to the other. A malaligned, unbalanced knee Pond, will he... fail. A malaligned, unbalanced knee will fail. A knee which has slight deviation but balanced will survive. This is very key, and it has been proven. Prior, so prior you time. said the balance is more important than the actual final alignment. What you get because I, virus, because virus. as of today, I don't know what is the native alignment for every single patient. I would at least default to balance, and this is the exact study we are doing in a bilateral setup where we have this conundrum: should we go towards alignment or should we go towards balance? So we have a cohort of patients where we've done functional alignment, which is more balance-driven versus restricted kinematic, which is more alignment driven. And we'll we want to that see that what the, happens to At the Wellington prompts. Club, we'll have it. We'll have it for two years. We'll give you a stage. Less balance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, Siddharth. Thank you, uh, organizers, Vavo, for giving this support. So I'll be talking uh, on very basic, because uh, Patela is responsible for a lot of happiness. And patellofemoral complications are almost 20%, despite of robot and all the technology. So I'll discuss, uh, I'll make it as brief as possible. So I'm going to talk very basic, uh, which will not going to change. So without a merchant view, uh, we cannot start this talk. So I always do merchant view, and you should also do, and that gives us very basic about the patella classification, which we are now forgetting. So type one is very friendly patella, type two is most common, and notorious is type three, Weiberg, Weiberg type three. So if you see in your x-ray this patella, and it has three millimeter tilt or five degree, uh, the three, three to five degree deviation. So it is published in literature, you, they will require later release. And if type three, and it has, after orthotomy, and it is subluxating like this, they call it J-sign, then it is published that these patella, if not resurfaced or balanced, they have very poor outcome, despite of your best alignment by robot or whatsoever. Another thing is the prediction is in valgus knee. In valgus knee, as there's a hypoplasia or a small lateral condyle, and that you can make, make error while registering manually or by robot, then you have to really clinically adjust it. And uh, another thing is this IT band. IT band, the super superficial fibers, they are extending to the superficial lateral retinoculum. And when the valgus get corrected, th that pulls the patella. So this is one of the factor for uh, maltracking. Patella dimension, you, there are various study, but they always study about the center of the facet 
the difference. And we know the center of the lateral facet is thinner than the medial one millimeter. But we did study in Indian patient and we studied about the border because uh, medial and we found difference between median and lateral border is up to three to four millimeter. The lateral border is three to four millimeter thinner than the medial one. And the female patella, they are thinner than the male and the direct correlation with, with the height of the patient. So once you know what all implants are available and what are the thickness 6.5 to 9 millimeter, important thing is to know we, what we know is about the maximum thickness of the patella. We talk about it's 8 millimeter or 9 millimeter. But you should also know about the about the dimension of the pack, how much it is going inside, and so how much patella you have to uh, leave if you are resecting it. Also, the margin. If you see this is a oval type patella of depu, its margin is four millimeter. And normally, as a dictum, when we resurface patella, the lateral side is almost zero cut. So if you are doing a oval patella or dome patella, most of the time you are overstuffing this lateral facet. And this is more significant when you have a tight retinoclum due to tight knees, they have flexion less than 90 degree, femur size is increased, there is an anterior offset increase, and lateral condyle hypoplasia, when then we are replaced by a normal condyle, so the lateral, collateral, lateral side of retinoclum, retinoclum becomes tight. If you are using a oval patella, uh, if you are using a round patella and you have medialize it, then you have to do a facetectomy. In this way, there will be slightly less forces on the lateral side. Now, newer patella like this of Etune, the lateral margin is two millimeter. So there are less chances of loading, but whatever patella you use, there is always better to always measure lateral facet and lateral side because the lateral facet thickness, not the center, that is the deciding factor whether you want to resurface or not resurface. Because if lateral facet is 10 millimeter and you are going to use any patella, there is going to be lateral facet thickness and that will give you the mal tracking or lateral facet syndrome. Another thing is thin patella with osteoporosis or in high BMI is a deadly combination. It is published like BMI or BMD of patella is always lower than the tibia and femur in ONEs. So this patella is going to be, is, is going to be uh, much osteoporotic than the, than the femur or tibia. Yeah. Now, none of the company except all they say they are patella, they are femur, they are patella friendly. But it is more significant when you do this preoperatively, you know which kind of patella it is. Because any, patella, any kind of femur would go with type 1 patella or type 2, but type 3 is difficult. Now, a patella friendly femur, normally it accommodates the asymmetrical patella very well. And if you see this left side is one design, I wouldn't name, and the right side. Right side patella, it is not so friendly. And patella do mold, but it takes up to two years to get molding. So these patients may get pain maybe up to one and a half to two years. Now, I wouldn't uh, describe, this is a golden thumb rule. What are the adequate or perfect alignment of tibia femoral, which are patella friendly? Another thing is if you do a best kind of alignment, but still if you have increased tension parapatella due to anterior offset increase or femur, femur uh, dimension increase or medial lateral increase, increased patella thickness, hypoplastic condyle where the original implant condyle will be bigger or tight ITB band, that may cause lateral patella tracking. One more thing which is not discussed is about the flexion stability. Now, coronal flexion stability, if the knee is loose laterally in flexion, that also causes patella mild tracking. And also about AP anteroposterior stability, which, which happens sometime due to increased tibial slope, decreased posterior condyle femur offset, or distalization of joint line, or rupture PCLCR. Now, if your anteroposterior stability, many times we accept it because knee doesn't dislocate, the jump distance is so high. So many times we accept anteroposterior stability or up to more than five millimeter. These knees, they are painful. They, are, they have weak quadriceps if it is more than five to seven millimeter. And this is also responsible for uh, patellar problem. Now, patellar tracking, we should 
check at least four times after orthotomy, whether it's pre-existing or not. Second, after femoral tibial trial, whether you have made any or error in component rotation. Then after patellar trials, if you are doing patellectomy, whether your osteotomy is correct. And the final implant after release of tunicae. Now, surgical tips for patella is always clear. In the clear all the parapatellar tissues, remove osteophytes. To avoid patella clung syndrome, remove synovium from the quadriceps tendon. Always try to be always, we have been taught to measure the maximum thickness of the center of the patella, but we should try to do the medial lateral facet also superior inferior. That gives you a lot of idea. It's called patella mapping. And if you feel your lateral facet thickness is less than 12 millimeter, then if you go, then after the osteotomy, it will be 10 millimeter, and that is not ideal for any resurfacing. Now, also by doing patella osteotomy, it is very common to get an uneven cut, and we should able to evert it properly. Either you do osteotome or remove your tibial insert to make it loose. Also, try to do osteotomy from both sides, that you'll get equal side, and focus on the lateral side because that's the area which always get uh, always get uh, thicked or uneven. Now, we should do the sizing not to oversize or undersize, but the maximum coverage, because if it is undersized, then they give a lot of problem, facet impingement is common. Uh, also, if it is an oval patella, then try to do perpendicular to the axis. Cementing is, as, is very important. Now, coming to maltracking, we sometimes accept a tilt. Subluxation and dislocation, nobody accept. It's very obvious, but tilt is accepted. After releasing tunicae, we should not accept any tilt. Whenever required, do outside in release. And before release, we should know about this basic, basic anatomy. The first superior, the initial superior fiber, they are the extension of IT band. They call archiform fibers. And after that, the deep reticulum layer and then the synovium. So even this kind of tilt, if you see from the side, the entire patella is seen. It means that your patella is not sitting in the groove and it is out. This is also should not be ignored. These kind of patient, they get less flexion, they get lateral pain and require a lot of physiotherapy. It depends on patient to patient, but some of the patient. So lateral patella release, I do always from outside in. And at 90 degree, the assistant hold the patella and then with just feel the tight fibers, either they are archivum fibers. And after an initial nick, you put a, a mosquito and see which are the tight, tight fibers and like you release, do the carpal tunnel release, you release layer by layer and try to preserve the inner synovium, never open the inner synovium. In between, you can leave the patella and see whether it's sitting well and proximally and laterally till you release all the tight fibers and your patella sits well like in this picture here and then you can stop in full range of motion. So this is... What we do, uh, I do is a uh, quick video for that, uh, just 30 seconds. Important thing is not to open uh, the synovium, otherwise your giant, there's nothing after the synovium layer, the knee implant is. And you have to go layer by layer slowly, just like you do carpal tunnel. So, Take home message, watch out, always do a good skyline or a merchant view. Watch out for Viber type 3 patella. Patella tracking is more important than resurfacing. Flexion stability, we overlook it. We, we are not many times, we just don't pay attention. Both in coronal and sagittal plane is important. Deciding factor for resurfacing is the lateral facet thickness, not the center of the patella. If resurfaced, then always there is tendency of lateral side facet overstuffing and do not accept any tilt. Do outside in sequential release whenever is required for a happy patella. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siddharth. I'll invite Dr. Mohan Desai for his talk next. Meanwhile, any questions to Siddharth? So Siddharth, I assume you are resurfacing all patellas. Uh -huh. You resurface all patellas and you will recommend that is, is for the... See, if patella uh, is thin, 
I don't resurface. Except, yeah, except yeah. when you can't. But yeah, otherwise lateral facet. Face. Because earlier we were, and sometimes lateral facet is thin in majority of the Indian patient. And then you overstuff lateral side, and sometimes you accept the tilt and then gives. But it is proven, like patient, those who have uh, resurfaced patella, their satisfaction rate is more. Otherwise, in RCT, there's no difference between resurfaced or non-resurfaced. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Any more? And, and which type of patella, you said uh, the shape of patella, we described that. But not all companies have um, choice of this. But given a choice, which implants do you think have the best patellas? Patella, I think anatomic is... Uh, is Towards a fag end, I think TKR in a previously high table osteotomy scenario. We have so many uh, types of oste uh, osteotomies, and uh, when it comes to the conversion of these to the knee replacement, there are multiple problems. One is alignment. So, why does it fail? It has failed, and the virus has recurred. Then sometimes it's overcorrected in valgus. So, there is an extra articular or a zigzag type of deformity, what, what is described as craco type 3 valgus. Then, uh, because of the uh, osteotomy, the slope has reversed anteriorly, uh, uh, or there is a translation laterally and medially, diameter mismatch, and the worst thing is the osteotomy has gone into non-Indian. Uh, there are soft tissue problems. The, <clears throat> there are previous scars. They may be tethered. If there are longitudinal uh, scars, uh, especially the lateral one, it's a problem because you don't want to do a take a, a railroad type of incision, the uh, supply, you know, the blood supply comes from the medial side. And if you take a, a medial incision with the previous lateral incision, there may be problems. But transverse incision uh, do not create problems. They can be crossed at the right angle. Uh, take, for example, a case like this, you have multiple incisions and uh, then it's a problem. So it's a long incision in the, this was a very old uh, uh, slide. And those days we did not know and uh, we actually did a sham incision first and then closed it and then let it heal and uh, this was almost 20 years back so, and uh, then we did the total knee replacement so ideally we need to choose the lateral most incision no uh, subfacial no superficial dissection subfacial in, uh, incisions small lateral incisions can be uh, <coughs> ignored you have to have bridge of around 7 centimeters or uh, you know four fingers like this uh, this section has to be strictly subfacial and uh, many times uh, because of the previous high tibial osteotomy there is a patella baha and then exposure or uh, retraction even subluxation may be difficult and you may have to resort to a quadriceps snip. Uh, see this is a classical uh, example you can uh, uh, cross it at around 45 to 60 degrees or at 90 degrees or continue the same incision there. Uh, there is the same thing, uh, the bridge should be wide enough. This is one of our uh, patient with the uh, incision like this before. And uh, this is a very old, uh, so small incision can be ignored and we took a adequate bridge and uh, the healing is healing was good. You can see it's an old implant, very uh, kinemax, no, it is obsolete now. So it is uh, more than 50, 20 years back, uh, uh, this, uh, this thing, uh, surgery. Previous hardware, staples and plates, uh, uh, it, they pose a problem. Uh, sometimes you may opt for two stage. First stage you remove. Uh, the advantage is you can send the relevant cultures and uh, uh, sometimes frozen section at this time to rule out infection. Uh, these sort of uh, uh, staples that, uh, like this with the altered slope create a lot of problems because the distance from the tibial tuberosity to the articular surface uh, is uh, very less and there is l very less 
that you can uh, <coughs> you can resect. Uh, again, this extra articular uh, deformity like this, which is Krakow type uh, three, uh, there is a valgus at the metaphyso uh, diaphyseal junction, but varus at the uh, articular surface, which poses a problem. And uh, patella baha again, we uh, what a extensile approach needs to be. Uh, achieved uh, needs to be taken and sometimes you may require an offset tibia okay so what is described as uh, one of our friends uh, dr gp jain he has described this tbl flare index uh, so you take this a and then b and the ratio of a and b and if it is more than index is less than 2.5 then you anticipate the difficulty that tbl tray uh, the <coughs> the stem may perforate and you may have to use a offset uh, stem. Just one of the example, uh, actually this is uh, this is how the patient presented to us 10 months post injury. Uh, this was, these were valgus and va va varus x-rays. Actually it all began with uh, this, this was the sort of injury where it was plated only laterally, medial thing was left and uh, then uh, the patient was painful and the surgeon decided to do a sort of osteotomy and he fixed it with staples. So it had gone into non-Indian. So the incision was lateral incision and this required a total knee replacement. So we had, we took a cableist sort of a approach and this was how it was reached and uh, there was, we used the metaphyseal uh, sleeve there so, and this was sort of an incision at that end. So we had to modify the incision according to the previous survey. This was the, and this sort of, this was a metaphyseal sleeve with the uh, stem that we could use it. Okay, so that was eight months and all, all these, uh, this was, this healed. So non-union of the previous STO is a problem. Similarly, a very low medial osteotomy, again, patient was painful. And uh, <coughs> this was uh, previously uh, someone had done a femoral osteotomy also. This had gone into non union Again, this is uh, uh, underneath the superficial MCL. And we know that if you release the superficial MCL, the flexion gap is going to open. So uh, it is during the exposure unnecessarily the gap opens. So either one, you, one can choose to do it in two stages or if you are doing in one stage, then you have to be careful. So we decided to do it in one stage, uh, use the, these were the incision scars, uh, separate scars, so you had to modify the incision accordingly. And you put in a uh, extra length stem and then it united. Just uh, another case, I will just go rapidly on this. So the incision is usual. That's the staple here and we take a separate incision there transverse which was transverse these, these are the staples to require uh, you have to be prepared because these these are coventry staple uh, staples and uh, actually those days no they are no more available but uh, the staple removal is a separate instrument so you have to keep it so we have to do some juga to remove it but you have those instruments so you have to keep these instruments ready and then that's the so that's the uh, this these were the incisions and that was a post of excess so thank you thank you dr mohan any questions quickly before i invite dr saurabh shukla <coughs> The next talk is by Dr. Saurav Shukla. Sir, uh, one question. So we all know the STO has a joint line uh, reversal or joint line alteration, and we talk about so much about CPAC now. Uh, so it's not the original joint line. How does it? How will it impact to someone who is uh, doing it robotically or even conventionally? You know that the joint line has now probably reversed, but the original joint line was in a particular direction, probably CPAC 1 or 2, but now it's become the other way around. Both SWAR sensors are there. So I don't have any much experience in robotics, but uh, what we used to do is, this, we will do a classical CR surgeon, so we will keep 
you don't mind giving some slope and we balance it we ignore the we try and restore the uh, uh, you know uh, restore the previous uh, sort of a joint line or a slope you know and balance it try and balance the knee basically so again the balance i don't have much i don't i don't have much experience of doing it robotically but perhaps i think you can Plus, any yeah. comments about doing HTOs with technology? So we've done a couple of cases. Uh, again, the fundamentals remain the same. Once the, there's alteration in the phenotype or the alignment, uh, and you don't have uh, something to fall back on, we rely on balancing the knee well. Uh, you know there is reverse slope in this particular patient, so you have more amount of bone being cut anteriorly as compared to posteriorly, so you have to be very cognizant of that. So we capture the gaps really well. Uh, make sure that the amount of bone being removed is accounted for in the balance and try to balance these knees and only aim for mechanical alignment in such cases. Yeah. Fair yeah. Um, evening, everybody. Uh, it has been a late evening for you guys, uh, but it has been a very intriguing session uh, for, for me as a learner. Uh, my talk is about uh, how I do I mean, again, it's a controversial topic as to how I do a, a manual calipered balanced kinematic alignment. Uh, we don't have a robot. We can't afford a robot at the present moment with a hospital. So, uh, and I've been doing hinging upon a pure kinematic robot for most of my uh, cases since 2018. So this is my uh, collective talk as to what my experience has been. So. Uh, the mechanical alignment primarily uh, converts all the deformities of the knee uh, because of arthritis into a, a neutral mechanical alignment, right? So if the implant survival has been reasonably very, very good and the patients and the results have been good, the question we have to ask is why do we have to reinvent the wheel? Why are we talking about alternative alignments? And the reason behind it is probably because our way of seeing success and the patient's way of seeing success is probably different, right? When the mechanical alignment came into picture, uh, the things were pretty simple, but now as we know, there have been several phenotypes which has been described. And what we are doing by mechanical alignment is primarily we are converting all these alignments and joint lying obliquities into a neutral mechanical alignment. So when we are doing that, we are inducing soft tissue releases, ligament releases, which might lead to limited function and some discomfort on the patient's part. And because of these reasons, there are questions and they, we are trying to find an ideal answer to a total knee replacement. So ECOF in 2007 described an axis, a cylindrical axis, around which the tibia flexes and extends at the back of the knee. So the principle of kinematic alignment is to restore the pre-arthritic joint line without ligament release, that's number one. And how we do it is primarily align the implants and components uh, axis with the native kinematic axis of the patient. Now, goal number one for uh, performing a kinematic alignment is to achieve a pre-arthritic uh, joint line. And this is done by replacing the bone cuts by the metal after compensating for the cartilage wear and the thickness of the blade, both on the femur and the tibial side. Goal number two is, by doing so, we might be restoring back the constitutional alignment. We know that the LDFA and the MPTA angle remains the same despite the progression of arthritis. So if we restore the pre-arthritic joint line, the constitutional alignment will be restored in these patients. Goal number three is to restore the pre-arthritic timbial compartment pressures and laxities. We all know that the, the, the femur or the knee joint is rectangular in extension, but becomes trapezoidal and opens up a bit in flexion. Now, kinematic alignment respects that, and with minimum ligament release, it actually gives a compartment pressure which is very similar to the native knee. And because we are not releasing the ligaments, it actually allows the natural laxity of the ligaments in all range of motion. 
Because of these reasons, and also because we are maintaining the vastus medialis obligatory tone, the Q angle is not changed. And because of these reasons, the patellofemoral kinematics are better as compared to the other alignments. So the first step in doing a kinematic alignment is we approach the femur. And how do we approach? The first step is we measure the anterior offset. This is the relationship of the distal femur to the anterior margin of tibia. We measure it at the start of the surgery and then compare how have we achieved at the end of it. If we are approaching the knee in varus, we take out the, the osteophytes on the distal medial uh, femur side and then uh, and also of the uh, and also the osteophytes at the intercondylar notch. And then we make a pilot hole which should be about 0.5 to 1 centimeters superior to the intercondylar notch. This hole should be perpendicular to the joint line and should be parallel to the anterior cortex of the femur. This is important so as to minimize the flexion of the femoral component. Once that is done, we then move on to the distal femoral uh, cut. The cartilage loss, it has been shown by multiple studies, is to be about two millimeters. We compensate that by using a metallic offset. We put it on the distal femoral jig and attach it firmly on the distal uh, surface of the femur. And then we do an osteotomy. Now most of the femoral component, the distal thickness is about nine millimeters. The thickness of the blade is about one millimeter. So on the unworn side of, 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 the, of, of, of the arthritis, we osteotomize eight millimeters. In a varus knee, we then take, take out eight millimeters of the distal lateral aspect. In the medial side, the worn out cartilage thickness uh, is about two millimeters. So we take out about six millimeters. In this case, we measured and we found that it was five millimeters. So basically we feather at a one millimeter away apart from the distal medial aspect. Once that has restored, we then go on to, to measure the and, and do the AP and the rotational check of the femur. We all know by our, our experience that in an, in an arthritic knee, the posterior condyle wear is minimum. So we keep our rotation zero degrees to the posterior condylar offset. And after protecting the collaterals and popliteus, we then osteotomize the posterior condyle. Once we have done that, we then go on to checking whether the cuts, the, the cartilage compensation, as well as the thickness of the blade actually matches that of the trial tibial component or not. Multiple studies have shown that if it has been done precisely, then it actually, uh, the, the femoral component actually coaxes with the, the kinematic alignment axis of the femur. Then we move on to the tibial component. And the first thing is we measure the anteroposterior plane of the native tibia. For, we, for putting the jig on, we put the stylus on the unworn tibial base, unworn tibial base, and then move the distal part of the jig to about 10 to 15 centimeters lateral, so as to compensate for the varus. Once that is done, we then place the angel's wing, and we try to mirror the slope of the natural tibial plateau. Then we osteotomize the tibia, the, the tibia and then measure it from either side of the base of the tibial spine. If that is fine, and if we are matching the posterior tibial slope, we then move on to our other, other the next section. In some cases, there is a significant posteromedial osteophyte present in the tibia. In these cases, we mark the boundary of the trial tibial component, and we remove the osteophytes either by means of uh, osteotome or by means of saw. Again, the studies have shown that these methods have reliably corrected the varus as well as the posterior slope in these tibias. We do not balance these knees by means of ligament release. All balancing is done on tibia after making the femur coaxial with the femoral axis. The prerequisite of balancing this way is that the PCL should be maintained because if the PCL is cut, then the flexion gap increases significantly. And then we follow this decision tree 
as to whether there is a flexion, tight flexion, tight extension, if we need more, a slight more varus cut or valgus cut on the tibia. So the first, there are few balancing steps we do after we have made the native bone cuts. The first balancing step is to see whether the, the, the flexion gap is trapezoidal or not. We put the tibial spacer in and see if the pivot is medial or not, because in a trapezoidal space, obviously the, 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 the pivot will be medial. The second balancing step we see is that when you are putting a spacer in extension, there should be very little or negligible varus valgus laxity. That is because in a native knee, the rectangular space is rectangular and equal. The third balancing step is that we, we, we align the tibial base plate along with the axis anteroposterior axis of the tibia. And then the, the final balancing step takes place in terms of trial. It, the, 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 with the trial on, the, the knee should be slightly hyperextended, if not fully extended. At about 30 degrees of flexion, the knee should open by about 2 to 3 millimeters laterally. At 90 degrees flexion, there should be about 10 degrees internal and external erosion of tibia. And then at 90 degrees, we actually now measure the anterior posterior offset. Now, this offset measurement should be about 2 millimeters less as compared to the original anterior offset because we have compensated for the cartilage loss in this case. We did, although, uh, we, I mean, we did a small trial, a small audit of our study. It was not uh, for two years follow up. And we found out that Oxford knee score had improved significantly and they held for the next two years. We did not have any tibial failure in varus. We did have one revision, which was due to infection. And this is just a case study in which we had a significant posteromedial osteoarthritis in this knee. The patient could not walk. And in this knee, when we opened up, there was a significant medial osteophyte present in the tibia. We marked the tibial boundaries. And then after marking the tibial boundaries, we did a varus reduction osteotomy. And this is two years follow up his, his, his scanogram. So in valgus knees, do we do a kinematic alignment? Yes, we do, but only in those cases where there is no femoral uh, remodeling. In such cases, we, I prefer a mechanical alignment because these cases involve not only remodeling, but extensive contractures and soft tissue attenuations. There have been various clinical outcomes and meta-analysis which have suggested that despite the, the femur being in, in valgus and tibia being in varus, the results are functionally and uh, good and survivorship is, 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 is comparable. None of the tibias have, none of the studies have suggested that the tibia actually has failed in varus. And the reason why the tibia doesn't fail in varus and kinematic alignment is because that when the patient is, is, is in a single gait phase or a dual gait, dual gait stance, the joint line becomes parallel to the ground and thereby reducing the ground reaction force as well as the adduction force on the, on the component. So now there have been increased interest and the, and, the, and the study in the kinematic group is now moving towards the robotics versus manual. There have been a couple of studies which have suggested that although coronal alignment has improved, but it is yet to be proven that robotics have given better functional output. There's a very interesting protocol study which is coming up by MacDessy in, in, in Australia, which results probably will be coming out in 2025, which will probably give some more picture, of, some more light into this. So to summarize, if done precisely, whether we are doing kinematic alignments by, by manual or by a technology, it can give better results and the, the implant survivorship is definitely equivalent as compared to the mechanical or other types of alignment. The tibia particularly doesn't fail in varus. If it does, yes, there have been cases where tibia has failed. If it does, it will fail because there has been an increased posterior slope or the PCL has been injured. And the reason why kinematic alignment is probably getting success is because it respects the joint line obliquity as well as, align, as, well as the orientation of the joint line rather than seeing the alignment overall. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay. okay. So okay. we'll, we'll take, take questions and, and club it together with the next talk as well as the panel. So I'd like to invite Dr. Webo to give his talk and the panel, Dr. Suhas, Dr. Gaurapalikar, Dr. Ravi Kumar, Dr. Nabil, Dr. Saurav Shukla, please join us here. And Dr. Mohan Desai, sir, please come and join us. So first of all, apologies for this delayed thing. I thought I'll drop my talk, but then Ashok uh, nudged me so that we can combine both the things. So what I've done is uh, I've combined the two panel discussions and also my talk so that um, we can um, have some discussion. I know there are people there and they're divided into first half and the second half. So can everyone come forward so that we can have more interaction and I would want it to be more interactive. Uh, Ravi, Ravi is here. Yeah. So we'll please, please come, come in. in. Dr. Nabil, please join us. So now uh, it's the end of the day. So, but if you look, um, I think all the talks, I think the majority of things were about three things alignment, CPAC, robotics, and something which is which we are all striving for happiness. Okay? So what are we chasing? So what are we chasing, sir? Yes, sir. <laughs> I have written that, but but as a surgeon, what, what we chase? And I'll ask this question to everyone who is here. Uh, what, what do we think is the most important um, aspect? So please pardon me, it's not a very formal talk, so I'm mixing both formal and informal things. So if it seems a little bit out of sync, please pardon me for that. Uh, we'll start with the last man standing, Dr. Murli. What are we chasing in life and as a surgeon? Okay, patient satisfaction and surgeon satisfaction? Okay. Surgeon satisfaction and patient satisfaction. Anyone, anyone else? Uh, Ronak, what are we chasing? What are you chasing in life? I know you chase pretty girls or in fact the other way around, pretty girls chase you. But uh, apart from what is there? <laughs> So, do you think we leave a lot of unhappy patients? Sir, what do you think? What would be the percentage of our unhappy I think patients? this uh, patient satisfaction is not only the surgical outcome, it is holistic way, means uh, it is hospital uh, response, reception response, how were they explained. So, we try to do this, uh, if that satisfaction, this thing includes, we think that it is only after pertaining to the surgery, it is not that. How much response uh, that a, how early were they answered whether whether they were counselled the ambience everything is counted in that patient satisfaction it is not pertaining only to the surgery so let us remove that misconception from our mind that they are unsatisfied because of the surgery they are not unsatisfied because of the surgery they may be unsatisfied for some other factor so, so yeah, yeah. yeah um, just uh, extension to what so, sir said. Uh, there are multiple demographics which decide the patient reported outcomes, okay? And so many of them are actually related to the patient and are not modifiable. What are modifiable are the surgeon-related factors. But the question that intrigues me always is, why are my hip patients so happy and my knee patients are unhappy while you have the same demographics? They're all from the same community, same age group, but the hip patients are so much happier as compared to the knee patients. So this tells me there is scope for improvement in order to get our knee patients to be much happier. So sir, there's a direct accusation from him saying that you are trying to shift blame on others when probably you are responsible. Professor Nabil and Gaurish, I'll take so Professor, one, yeah, Gaurish. one more thing, other than the happiness that I'm looking for is longevity. So longevity, yes. Uh, longevity of the implant, normally when I implant a patient, I want the implant to last for the end of the life. That is what I'm looking for. And patient satisfaction is, I would say, number two, at least for me. Okay. Professor Nabil, I know in India, we, we, we put too much emphasis on the care. And patient expects, as Dr. Rajgopal was saying, sympathy as well. So if you do not give adequate sympathy from the family members, from the doctors, from the staff, 
they'll be unhappy no matter what alignment philosophy you have chosen. How is it there at Israel? How you think? I think it's all over the world. The patient is looking for sympathy, is looking for a good word. We were talking earlier that why, why should we uh, not release the patient day surgery? And because you want to visit them the next morning and talk to the patient and give him this satisfaction. Uh, what I'm looking for the patient is not a salvage procedure. I don't want the patient to do an operation just to partially satisfy him. So if I have a, an AVN patient at 20 years old, I don't tell him suffer for 20 years because then we'll do you a surgery that will last for life. I would like him to enjoy his these upcoming 20 years and we'll worry about the next 20 years later. Probably in 80%, we know he will live all his life with, with the same prosthesis. Maybe he doesn't need another surgery. Same way with, with, with knee surgery. I want patient to be happy. And uh, for now, the mechanical alignment isn't giving that to the patient. Great, great points. What, what do you think, sir? Has, has the implant survivorship in general improved over years since we started? Or is it only the talks that have improved? Last, uh, you know, the, there are many factors, as you said. The ex patient's expectation may be greater, but they are not met, one. Second thing is knee joint being a superficial joint as compared to the hip joint. The pain, this thing is different. The other thing is there is something like a somatization of the pain or centralization of pain. Patients who come to us, they come in a delayed manner. By that time, there is a centralization of pain. It is like a phantom pain. So long after the your source of pain is removed, patient may still perceive the pain. All these factors will count. And if there is a pain, there will be unsatisfaction, not satisfaction. This is one. In fact, the knee is the longest surviving as compared to the hip. And then comes the shoulder and then the elbow. So knee is a best surviving uh, this thing. We I have no better. No, yeah. see, those those are primitive designs. Now we have be, we have understood it better, and uh, now survival is quite good now. So yeah, so sort of you've not spoken. So pain somatization is that an issue with these unhappy patients? You think that's an issue? Uh, I think, uh, and what uh, can we do about it? I, I actually uh, don't have a, a right or wrong answer, but in my experience, what I've seen is that that uh, if we do not have any uh, uh, known reason for the pain to happen from surgeon's point of view, then I think uh, choosing the right patient, if a patient is very active in life, we have generally seen that these patients are generally happier after surgery. If a patient is not that mobile, if the patient is homebound, and if the patient has got any issues which make her more, him more depressed, they start complaining of pain or, or unsatisfaction after the surgery. So I don't know what is the right and wrong answer, but what I've ex experienced is that if we keep our communication lines open, if we are there for the patient to reach out, and if we choose the patient, right patient for surgery, probably the results will be a better ones as compared to cho choosing every patient, seeing just the x-rays and, and, and treating them. Yeah, I heard of, uh, it's a very valid point and one of the lessons that we have been taught in cave is the patient do not care how good you are. They care how good you care. So I think if you, they'll perceive that if you are caring for them, even if something has gone wrong or they are unhappy and that you are genuinely caring for them, and that, ha that cannot be feigned. It has to be genuine. So I think that's an important part of patient satisfaction, their trust in the yeah. person who's treating them. Yes. And, and I think even patients' perception of how well they're doing is all over the place. When, when you see them at six months and a year, and when you're talking to them, they're doing everything they can do. Their OKS is very good. But still, they at the end of the discussion, they'll ask you, Dr. Saab, my surgery successful or not? See, because even though they're doing everything, they don't know they're doing that well. So and you have made that a very important point. When I just met the patient outside, they said it's same around the world, and I, yeah. I agree with it. They just want to be reassured that everything. The validation has to come from. Yeah. 
the validation comes from one patient refers you the other patient. I agree with completely. I think that is the biggest and validation. And that's why I, you put up the slide of MCID, which is so uh, relevant right now, because so many of these scores are not able to pick up differences. So we've almost stopped taking OKS scores anymore. I agree. We are completely relying more on FJS and other scores and more leading questions. Like now we are asking, will you get the, get the second knee done or not? Will you recommend this surgery to another patient or not? I think these leading questions have more weightage than looking at functional scores. I agree. So another slide, uh, as I said, I had not prepared it formally, it just here a few minutes back. So TK, UK, why, why the difference? I mean, all of these factors that you mentioned are same for this. Why do you think that there is a difference in uh, the survivorship, difference in this? Is it because of the patient selection alone, design selection? TK is a two in two sense of the kinematic. Yeah. So you are resection, nothing is altered. Here, there is no need till date which mimics the natural native uh, native knee. Yeah. So okay. there is, we are not restoring back whatever we may say. Provided it's done well. Yeah. So I think important point. So kinematic alignment good at making patient happy and probably the survivorship is questionable. I think that is what, if there is one case control study in my mind between kinematic and mechanical alignment, it is between TK and UKs. TK we always did mechanical alignment, UKs we always did a kinematic alignment. TKs have high survivorship, UKs have comparatively low, and we can debate whether it was done well or not, but they have definitely high patient satisfaction. So actually, the debate between kinematic and the, uh, the alternate alignment philosophy is actually a debate between the survivorship and prompt for TKs and UKs. So robotics now, I know how many uh, are exposed to robotics here? Show of hands. Well, yeah, so yeah, still, 50-50, that's a good number, that's a good number, but being a TTGR, I expect it to be 50%. And I believe on panel, everyone is exposed to robotics, almost, no, no, two, two, it's again a, a divided panel. It's it's a bit biased because the uh, we are sitting in a TTGR, in a I metropolitan agree. city and, and here the, the, the socioeconomic strata is high patient demand here. Once you go to a B-class city, obviously, uh, the, the, the needs and the demands obviously are not that much. So it's a skewed picture which you're looking, if you're looking at, at India as such, where people are, uh, I mean, you're looking at elite class when you're looking for robots. If you go to an, in, in a place like Lucknow and if you ask say, that, that are normal people that you have to spend about 60 or 80,000 rupees more in a robot, he, he may come to you because of robot, but he will not give that much of an amount of money to get the surgery performed by a robot. I'll just make a very interesting observation. It is doubly skewed, it's double negative. Because in Mumbai, you'll be surprised that the only robot to exist in the entire city of Mumbai till a year back was only one. Only one robot. And compared to Pune, Hyderabad, all the cities. So it's not, it's a doubly skewed. The fact that the, and that's how our biases creep in. Just because it's Mumbai, we assume that they'll have maximum number of robots, the first to come in India. Neither the Mumbai had the first of robot. Neither it has the highest number of robot, and a year back it probably only had one robot. Okay, so again, uh, we 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 perceive our biases creep in in every aspect of world that we do that. Okay, uh, yeah. So can we do better? How can we do better? Rather, I'll I'll frame this question. Of course, there is controversy to some amount of consensus alignment, avoiding errors in execution and validating. I think all of this is. Uh, there and I think this slide I like be stubborn about your goals but flexible about your method. I think that one takeaway that we had today uh, among all of us was this. We've talked about mechanical thing, uh, yeah, tibial component. I think this is one important thing that uh, is important. How do you perceive in UKRs? Any tips for better tibial positionings? Robotic UK. So, okay. uh, so because I think in unis you have to be very precise to avoid complications and avoid the early loosening of the tibial uh, tray, I think uh, you should uh, use robotics. So that's why I use Cori for the unis that I do. I don't do much, so that's another reason. So if I don't do much, I will probably not be accurate as someone who does a lots of, of unis. That's another reason why I use robots for unis. 
I think unis are uh, the also kinematic approach for, for the knee. That's why I think uh, I do it sometimes in early uh, stages of osteoarthritis, medial osteoarthritis, maybe uh, uh, meniscal medial root injuries also uh, so, I do unis. Yeah, so he's a bit dogmatic by, like me that unis should be done robotically in today's day and age. Any, any, anyone who's contrarian to that? I know, Gorish, you want to speak? So, uh, I've been doing unis for now seven years or so. And uh, the, 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 the trick is basically to align the tibial plate along the knee axis. So the flexion extension axis. Second is that uh, whenever I've done, the, once you cut the tibia, I use the Oxford. Make sure that the posterior part of the femoral cut is parallel to that. So I think that gives me a very good satisfied patient and a long lasting uni. And I agree with it. Well done unis is that. And I always say, when I say that, it's like the era of image intensifiers. I, I started my residency when the image intensifier had just come in. And there were some people who were very, very good at positioning a center central guide wire. When we discussed this center center, we used to develop x-rays and say, yeah, this person doesn't even need an x-ray. So there are people who will execute complex surgeries because they've always done it without technology and they'll be very good, perhaps better than having an image intensifier. But in today's day and age, would how many of us will be actually doing an intertrochanteric fracture without an image intensifier is the question because we have neither been trained. And I see that happening in a decade's time. And this is a slide I've put because I think there is so many uh, alignment philosophy. That means that everything works or nothing works to the level that we desire. And I call that as intelligent alignment because that means that you incorporate the best of all the world without giving a particular name to it. And you'll see that there are all kind of uh, thing. I think what we should do and what we are doing is changing our way. And I think that's the measure of our intelligence. Uh, we know that all patient pathologies are not same. The patient expectation are not same. And whether or not, whether you choose one over the other, uh, the registry is equivocal and data that I think one of the things that is often overlooked in all the discussion is what the big data will do to our thought process. I think all these robotic systems are collecting huge amount of data, which are at the moment lying in some data house, but not being analyzed. So once the data is here, you cannot just say that in my opinion. Yeah. So, so uh, what I want to add to that big data is right now there is so much spread in thinking and in application and how patient uh, how surgeons are doing surgery so i think it's very important like even when i was in australia they have started putting surgeons into different cohorts and they are supposed to and will contribute to the registry in that particular aspect of replacement for example there are certain surgeons who have accepted they will that they'll only do restricted kinematic they'll follow the principles and they will execute it if we have individual surgeons' preferences creeping into all these, we'll end up having a, a, a huge amount of data which doesn't make any sense. So it is very important that surgeons, even here in such meetings, uh, adapt and then agree that they will follow one particular philosophy in one particular phenotype and do it consistently so that we have more refined data which makes sense later. Very interesting that you brought up the point because I'm, I'm working on the second generation of robotics that I currently use. And one of the things that we are doing is to have a screen where you have an ability to for the computer to tell that, okay, based on what you have done in the past, this is the alignment probably that we will be doing. But then you can switch, over, switch to another screen saying that, okay, what will be the surgeons in India do? And then you'll have what will be the world do? And probably you'll have an elite group of experts in the world and in, for this particular thing, it's called as the Asimov Club. What will an Asimov Club do? So the yeah, Asimov so Club manager will do it. For that time. to be really accurate, these compartments have to be very tight exactly. to begin with. Yeah, I agree. And with the data, it's only about computational power. Okay. So I'll take someone, Dr. Londe. You are there in the back. You can come in front. Uh, do you routinely use CPAC classification nowadays? And what I follow is more like a functional alignment, you know, means I was a mechanical alignment guy, but uh, after the advent of robot, I think we can validate whatever we have. And I try to be within that 
plus 2 degree valgus to plus 3 degree varus alignment. So I said that is some phenomenal work on CPAC classification. If you could just tell in few seconds, 20 seconds of what you found in your study about CPAC for India. Yeah, so this is Magdesi's data and then the main difference that we found as far as Caucasian population versus the Asian population is the incidence of CPAC type 1, which is more, followed by CPAC type 4, and then it goes to CPAC type 2. So we have more constitutional virus and more apex distal joint line, probably because of the evolution of deformity and some amount of bone loss which cannot be ruled out. So most of our work is on CPAC 1. And one thing about CPAC is, please understand, it is only telling you where is the, where is the patient at that particular point in time with consideration about constitutional virus and obliquity of the joint line. It is not telling, to, it is not telling you to... Uh, it's, it's not a guide where to go. It is only your starting point. And it also tells you your finish point. So it is a research tool for us. For example, if I'm doing CPAC 1, and then I alter the alignment, and then I remeasure my CPAC, and I see whether this patient is in CPAC 1, or did I move him to 2, or did I move him to 4. That's how we are able to do research and communicate with other surgeons. So it is only tells you where you're starting, and where you're finishing, and what is your constitutional virus, and what is your obliquity. Very interesting, because a very similar study we published in JBJS, in one in seven patients had an extra-articular deformity. And for the first time, we defined what is extra-articular by telling anything outside the insertion of SMCL should be called as extra-articular. While Bellman's paper actually said about constitutional virus, but it didn't quantify when to call it in extra-articular or constitutional. So this is something that if anyone wants to read, can see. So you'll see that this is the insertion for us, I always ask this question, what is a joint? And joint means different for different people. For a deformity surgeon person, it's a line. For an arthroscopist, it's the area between capsule. But for us, arthroplasty surgeon, it's the area between the SMCL we are talking about in varus. So it's very important to kind of know how to define what is constitutional. And for us in this paper, we drew the intraepiphyseal line and dropped the epiphyseal axis, drew the diaphyseal axis. And if it was more than seven centimeter away from this, these are the ones that are truly constitutional. And these are the ones where you can potentially leave certain degree of virus and have better prongs. So this is the pr argument that we put across. Again, our understanding has changed. I know that the gaps are not necessarily rectangular. We knew that we were planning so far in two dimension and only static things. So I think what we have done is we have objectivity and experience. This is a slide that I like to put to say that what had we, we had been taught originally is not true. This is a scopy image. The medial compartment clearly has less space than a lateral compartment. So gaps are not necessarily rectangular. And that is a recent study that I evaluated as an assistant editor for a Japanese publication is that the only thing that mattered in improving PROMS was the amount of lateral opening. That's the only thing that had a difference. So the people who had more lateral opening had significantly higher prompts compared to those who did not. So it's coming back to basics. So I think what we are doing is all of this align, alternate alignment philosophy is probably aiming. Yeah, it's at the AP stability on the medial side, both in flexion, flexion extension, extension and, and the lateral, lateral opening on the opposite yeah, side, so which gives you a better FJS score. Yeah, so that is what it has shown. Yeah, not a lot consensus on how much lateral opening should be more in say 90 degree flexion and in full extension. Next slide. So this is from my dear friend Seb Parrott who was there. He has shown this in cadaver that this is how the normal cadaveric knee behaves. So it can open up to 6 millimeter at deflection. But I believe Rajiv has some point to say. I just want to say that in that case and the next thing would be naturally to evolve towards just the medial pivot knee. Exactly. Yeah. I, so, uh, most uh, sorry, I think I think Steve Howell has done wonderful work into it. So what he has done in the polyethylene change is that he has reduced the flexion uh, space. So he cuts about and measures about seven millimeters in the medial side. He does a medial pivot, and on the lateral side, he has removed the lateral edge because as a natural knee, the lateral side he says when you're flexing, it overhangs the lateral edge of the, of the bone, of the tibia. So he has actually removed the lateral, post, posterolateral edge 
So that 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 edge which used to restrict the, the rotation and the flexion no longer existed in his second phase of kinematic alignment. Uh, this thing. But come, it's very interesting because that's what I feel. That what we are talking is when we look at biomechanics, we look only at biomechanics. When we look at biology, we look at isolated biology. As Kopi surgeons talk about biology, arthroplasty surgeons so far only talked about biomechanics. I think once you marry biology with biomechanics intelligently, using common sense, I think both of them will work. So our aim, of course, is to know that we are hitting a moving target, which is different for different people. And one sacrosanct thing, despite all the controversies, if you balance forces all across the joint, you will have both good survivorship and good uh, patient outcome. I do it by doing this, and I, as I was telling, you should have a well-aligned near, for me, and I know there is still controversy, is a near perfect alignment, so your pillars should be correct. It's like house and home. I would not change pillars of my house to make my home happy. But I, if there is certain changes I need to do by making a room smaller or longer to accommodate my son's wishes, I will do that. So, so happiness and stability. So this is what I call, so you should mimic nature by having well-balanced, but nearly mechanically aligned. Yeah. That's what I, was I think what history has shown us in these 30, 40 years is a balanced knee survives. So I'm just reiterating what I just so most said. Most of the time, if you have a balanced family, you'll have balanced knees. Yeah. So, so even if <laughs> they'll be happy, happy family. While we were doing we mechanical alignment, you. <laughs> yeah, while we were doing mechanical alignment, we did introduce error. We are only 60% accurate, right? Correct. That's the point. So while we did that and balanced the knees, those knees survived. Yeah, so uh, nearly mechanically aligned knees survived. That's the point. So that's what I've written. Nearly perfect aligned knees. <laughs> but I know there are controversies, and we can have the whole day on it. Uh, for the masses, how do we do it? Is because we have got six degrees of freedom. We can move components, varus, valgus, internal rotation, external rotation, flexion, extension, and this. And together, they have nearly 824 permutation combinations. So when you have that many combination, either your experience can tell you which 10 is best, or you can use data to do that. Again, the goal is not same for everyone, and you can leverage technology. For me, the philosophy is 175 to 182. Pardon me for the error there. And individual component varus valgus not to exceed three degrees. Balance, as I said, is more important. Again, balance when I keep when I'm looking at a male patient with a larger knee, I keep it slightly loose in extension. When I'm doing a UKR slight loose in flexion, of course, no notching, no minimal overhang and preserve joint line. So these are some of my non-negotiable, and I think every one of us can have different non-negotiables and negotiable. But it also gives you an opportunity to tweak certain things. You can shift the femur up uh, anteriorly or posteriorly, you can downsize, upsize, dial in varus valgus and rotations. All of these boundaries at the moment are arbitrary, but you can do that. Uh, for me, my happiness scale is this, because this talk is about happiness. So the happiest one and the sur most surviving one are the one whose alignment will be in this range. I'm still happy with these ones, but I'm happy if I'm doing extensive release, getting deviating too far away from my, my alignment. My balance is mismatched by a greater degree and I have to do significant release. So this is what is my personal algorithm, but I'm sure everyone will have different one. Uh, we have no time for these, that what we do, but robot allows you to do a lot of things in that sense where you can change, you are just changing, you are just checking the balance. This is the Cori system that I use, um, collecting all this, and you'll see that this large gaps will be balanced in a few seconds. And uh, always uh, I leave certain amount of tightness on the abnormal side. I always say the key is to balance, number one, inflection, the normal side. So out of this, at least two should be zero. So the, in the order of priority, lateral side, if it's a varus knee, lateral inflection followed by lateral in extension, followed by the minimal releases that you need to perform. Anything below four, ignore. Again, uni has similar principle. Again, no time for it because we are at the end. So for us, the arthroplasty intelligence is in pre-execution. I think either using image-based or image-less, reconstruction of native coronal alignment, restoration of dynamic sagittal alignment, maintain joint line obliquity and height, implants mesh to the patient anatomy, and a balanced joint throughout the flexion extension range. If we are able to achieve all of this, irrespective of what technique we use, what technology we use, both technique and technology will use to this. It's an evolution and not revolution. We still have a lot of 
debates about uh, image versus imageless, semi-auto versus automatic, haptic feedbacks, and uh, science is never settled. You know, this guy had received uh, a Nobel Prize for lobotomy. At that time, the science was settled and he was given a Nobel Prize, but science will keep changing and will keep evolving, and that is why we need TTGRs. And thank you all of you to be here because the best way to predict what future brings is to create it. And the best way to create is to discuss and brainstorm. So thank you for staying back so long after the 7.30. We are two hours late, but I think it may have been time well spent. So thank you. A big clap for all of you present still here. So we have a dinner at Willingdon. Every one of you here is invited. It will be a fun night. We are late but I think we shall make up with a good thing. It's rare to have such a beautiful place in Mumbai, in the heart of city. It's a British club. It's a beautiful place to be there. And Gaurav has some more announcements. Yeah, so uh, bus is ready uh, from gate number six. I'll, I'll accompany you guys. We'll have, we'll have a photograph. Dhar sir, sir, Sachin sir, Sachin sir. Please come. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Thank you. 